1. It was morning in Gindine's capital city, though that fact was scarcely evident to anyone on the surface. The rising sun, when glimpsed at all, was a blanched disk behind roiling smoke belched from flaming forests and buildings. Sounds of battle reverberated thunderously from the surrounding foothills, and a hot scouring wind swept down across the landscape. A crepuscular darkness, ripped ragged by flashes of blinding light, ruled the day. The artificial light was supplied by warriors and war machines, coursing over scorched ground, streaking through the racked sky in orbit above the madness. Through leaden clouds, allied and enemy fighter craft pursued one another doggedly, adding sonic claps to the strident score of combat. East of the beleaguered capital, beams of energy stabbed mercilessly at the surface from on high, fanning out like shafts of profuse sunlight or concentrated into dazzling curtains that set the horizon glowing red as a frozen dawn. Loosed by advancing enemy contingents, missiles of superheated rock assailed what remained of the city, holding surviving towers and toppling those already gutted by fire. Hunks of shattered ferrocrete and twisted plasteel tumbled onto cratered streets and clogged alleyways. A few civilians dashed desperately for shelter, while others huddled, paralyzed with fear, in gaping fire-blackened maws that were once entryways and storefronts. In some quarters, ion cannons and nearly depleted turbolaser batteries answered the missile barrage with darts of cyan light. But only in the environs of the New Republic Embassy were the enemy projectiles deflected, turned by a hastily installed containment shield. Dangerously close to the shield's shimmering perimeter, a thousands-strong mixed-species throng, massed behind stun fencing, pressed to be admitted. At the edges of the crowd, droids perambulated in a daze, keenly aware of the fate awaiting them should the invaders overrun the city. Were the stun fence the sole obstacle to safe haven, the crowd might have panicked and stormed the embassy grounds. But the perimeter was reinforced by heavily armed New Republic soldiers, and there was also the force field itself to consider. An umbrella of energy, the lambent shield had to be deactivated before it could be safely breached, and that occurred only when an evacuation ship launched for rendezvous with one of the transports anchored in local space. Ashen faces masked with cloth against the mephitic air, Gindine's would-be evacuees did all they could to ensure their survival. With arms extended protectively around the shoulders of terrified children, or clasped tightly to tattered bundles of personal belongings, they pleaded with the soldiers, tendered bribes, inveigled and threatened. Ordered to remain silent, the grim-faced troops offered neither comforting looks nor words of encouragement. Only their eyes belied the seeming dispassion, racing about like Toril or angling imploringly toward the one person who could accede to the entreaties and demands. Leia Organa Solo caught one such glance now, aimed her way by a human soldier, posted close to what had become the communications bunker. With her face smudged and her long hair captured under a brimmed cap, it was unlikely that anyone in the crowd recognized her as one-time hero of the Rebel Alliance and former chief of state. But the sky-blue combat overalls, bloused sleeves emblazoned with the emblem of cell corps, the Senate-elect Committee for Refugees, identified her as everyone's best chance for rescue, their purveyor of deliverance. As it was, she couldn't venture within five meters of the stun fence without having wailing infants, necklaces of prayer beads, or rushed missives to off-world loved ones extended to her in dire urgency. She didn't dare make eye contact with anyone, lest in her gaze someone read hope or evidence of her anguish. To provide some measure of equipoise, she drew deeply on the force. But more often than not, she paced unswervingly between the bunker and the leading edge of the shield, eager for word that another evacuation ship had landed and was waiting to be filled. Ever in her wake moved faithful Olmach, whose native gray ferocity made him appear more stalker than bodyguard. But at least the diminutive Nogri looked at home among the chaos, whereas C-3PO, his normally auric gleam dulled by soot and ash, was positively dismayed. Lately, though, 
the protocol droid's apprehension had less to do with his own safety than with the larger threat the Yuzhan Vong posed to all machine life, often the first to suffer when a world fell. A forceful explosion rocked the permacrete under Leia's feet, and a swirling globe of orange fire mushroomed from the heart of the city. A searing wind laced with droplets of even hotter rain tugged at Leia's cap and jumpsuit. Created by the energy exchanges and conflagrations, microclimatic storms had been washing across the plateau all night long. Hail mixed with cinders lifted from Gendine's ruined surface pelted everyone, blistering exposed flesh like acid. Even through the insulated soles of knee-high boots, Leia could feel the ground's aberrant heat. A loud, sizzling sound made her swing toward the shield in time to see it evanesce in undulating waves of distortion. Evac ship away, a soldier reported from the communications bunker, both hands pressed to the outsized earmuffs of his comm helmet. Two more headed down the well. Leia raised her eyes to the tenebrous sky. Defined by running lights as oblate in shape, the departing ship raised itself on repulsor power, then shot upward on a column of blue fire, escorted by half a dozen X-wings. Lying in ambush, a cataract of coral skippers vectored in from the foothills to give chase. Leia whirled to the soldiers posted at the stun fence. Admit the next group. Crushed shoulder to shoulder, cheek to jowl, folks at the forward edge of the crowd, humans, Sullistans, Bims, and others, were funneled through the embassy gates. With the shield lowered, enemy projectiles that would have been deflected plummeted like fiery meteors, one of them striking the east wing of the Imperial-era embassy and setting it ablaze. Leia clapped the evacuees on the back as they streamed toward a shuttlecraft idling on the landing zone. Hurry, she urged, hurry. Shield repowering, the same comm officer relayed from the bunker. Everyone back. Leia gritted her teeth. These were the worst moments, she told herself. Soldiers at the gate resealed the cordon and scanned the vicinity for evidence of field disruptors. In response, the crowd surged forward, railing against what had to seem the inequity, the arbitrariness of it all. Folks closest to the front, fearing they would miss their chance at salvation by one or two persons, tried to worm or force their way past the soldiers, while those in the rear shoved and scrambled, determined to fight their way forward. Leia saw that it was futile, and yet the crowd refused to disperse, hoping against hope that New Republic forces could keep the invaders at bay until every civilian and non-combatant was evacuated. Mistress Leia, C-3PO said, approaching in haste, with his hands raised and his photoreceptors glowing. The deflector shield is weakening. If we don't leave soon, we're sure to perish. As many would that day, Leia thought. We'll leave in the last ship, she told C-3PO. Not before. Until then, make yourself useful by cataloging names and species. C-3PO lifted his arms higher and skittered through an abrupt about-face. What's to become of us? Leia exhaled wearily, wondering as well. The bombardment had commenced two days earlier, when a Yuzhan Vong flotilla had arrived unexpectedly in the nearby Sir Karpus system from enemy positions in hut space. A slapdash attempt had been made to fortify the sector capital, but with fleets and task forces already committed to safeguarding major systems in the colonies and the Corps, the New Republic had little to offer worlds of secondary importance like Gindine, despite its modest orbital shipyard. By the same token, there was no rhyme or reason for the Yuzhan Vong attack, beyond continuing to sow confusion. With the recent fall of several mid-rim worlds, Gindine, because of its relative remoteness, had been thought ideal for use as a transit point for refugees, and indeed many of those outside the fence had been shipped in from Ithor, Abroaskai, Ord Mantell, and a host of enemy-occupied planets. It was becoming clear that the Yuzhan Vong delighted in pursuing displaced populations almost as much as they delighted in sacrificing captives and immolating droids. Even the ground assault on Gindine seemed to be their way of proving themselves as adept at seizing worlds as they were at poisoning them. The voice of the comm officer put a quick end to Leia's musings. Ambassador, we've got a live surveillance probe feed from the field. 
Leia hesitated, then ducked into the bunker, where a reduced-scale hologram, dazzled by noise, had the attention of the several men and women gathered there. It took her a moment to make sense of what she was seeing, and even then part of her refused to accept the truth. What in the name of... Fire breathers, someone said, as if anticipating her amazement. Rumor has it the Yuzhan Vong stopped off at Mim Bam so the things could fill up on swamp gas. Leia's quivering legs urged her to sit, and as she did, she brought a hand to her mouth. Parading out of sunrise, like the harbingers of a new and dreadful dawn, came a legion of enormous bladder-like creatures. Supported on six stubby legs, and equipped with arrays of flexible proboscises, from which gushed streams of gelatinous flame. The methane and hydrogen sulfide have to be mixing with something they carry in their guts to produce that liquid fire, a woman at the controls of the hollow projector commented, more intrigued than horrified. They're also exhaling anti-laser aerosols. Yet another example of the enemy's genetically engineered monstrosities, the thirty-meter-tall fire-breathers didn't so much march as loll over the terrain like loosely tethered lighter-than-air balloons, incinerating everyone and everything in their path. Leia could almost smell the niter of the carnage. Whatever they are, they've got thick hides, the comm officer said. Can't be taken out by anything less than a turbolaser beam. Unable to slow the advance of the deadly blimps, Gindine units were abandoning entrenched positions and falling back in droves toward the city. Strewn about were fire-blackened war machines of all variety. Tank droids, aged Lorinar mobile turbolasers, even a couple of AT-AT walkers, tipped over, headless, collapsed on the ground with legs splayed. They're withdrawing, Leia said harshly. Who issued the retreat order? Even as the words left her mouth, she was sorry she had uttered them. Those officers who weren't scrutinizing her were suddenly studying their hands in unease. Could she blame the troops for retreating when that was precisely what the New Republic had been forced to do almost from the start of the invasion? Withdrawing toward the core, as if the density of the star systems there afforded protection? Who could say any longer which actions were just and which were dishonorable? Exiting the bunker without a word, Leia found a shaken C-3PO waiting for her. Mistress Leia, the most distressing news has reached me. Leia could barely hear him. In the few moments she had spent in the bunker, the battle had advanced to the outskirts of the capital. The crowd was more agitated than before, surging forward and from side to side. Through a gap in the city skyline, Leia thought she could discern the bobbing form of a Yuzhan Vong fire breather. It seems, C-3PO was saying, that Gindine's citizens are laboring under the impression that you are deliberately discriminating against folks of former imperial persuasion. Leia's jaw dropped and her brown eyes flashed. That's absurd. Do they think I can pick out a former imperial on sight? And even if I could... C-3PO lowered his voice conspiratorially. In fact, there is some statistical justification for the claim, mistress. Of the five thousand thus far evacuated, an overwhelming percentage have been inhabitants of worlds whose early loyalty to the Rebel Alliance is well documented. However, I am certain that owes to nothing more than... C-3PO's explanation was swallowed by a deafening explosion. Electricity danced wildly along the periphery of the energy dome, and the shield disappeared. At once, the telltales that lined the stun fence flickered and went out. A frightened gasp rose from the crowd. The field generator has been hit, C-3PO said. We're done for. The crowd surged again, and the soldiers closed ranks. Weapons powered up with an ominous whine. C-3PO began to back toward the embassy gates. We'll be crushed. With lethal efficiency, Olmach moved to Leia's side. She was about to caution him to remain calm when one of the soldiers panicked and fired a sonic weapon at point-blank range into the crowd, dropping dozens and sending the rest rushing in all directions. Without thinking, Leia ran to the dazed soldier and yanked the weapon from his lax hands. We're supposed to be rescuing these people, not injuring them. She threw the weapon aside. Drawing her hand across her forehead, she inadvertently dislodged the brimmed cap, spilling her hair to her shoulders. Wending her way back to the bunker, she grabbed the nearest comm link and demanded to be put through to the task force commander. Ambassador Organa Solo, this is Commander Ilanka. 
A basso voice responded shortly. We need every available ship, Commander, immediately. Yuzhan Vong forces are entering the city. Ilanka took a moment to reply. I'm sorry, Ambassador, but we've got our hands full out here. Three more enemy warships have exited hyperspace on the far side of the moon. Whatever craft are on the surface will have to suffice. I urge you to load and launch. And, Ambassador, I strongly suggest you get yourself aboard one of them. Leia thumbed the comm link off and scanned the crowd in alarm. How can I choose? she asked herself. How? A storm of blazing Yorick coral meteors battered the embassy and neighboring buildings, setting fire to all they touched. The inferno triggered an explosion at a fuel dump near the landing zone, fountaining shrapnel far and wide. The right side of Leia's face screamed in pain as something opened a furrow in her cheek. Instinctively, she brought her fingertips to the wound, expecting to find blood, but the airborne fragment had cauterized the wound in its white-hot passing. Mistress Leia, you're injured, C-3PO said, but she waved him back before he could reach her. Peripherally, she saw that a tall, sinewy human was being ushered forward, his arms viced in the grip of two soldiers. Beneath a soft cap he wore low on his forehead, the man's face was bruised and swollen. Now what? Leia asked his custodians. An agitator, the shorter soldier reported. We overheard him telling people in the crowd that we're only extracting New Republic loyals, that anyone with an imperial past might as well kiss his... I understand, Sergeant, Leia said, cutting him off. She assessed the captive briefly, wondering what he could possibly have to gain by spreading lies. She had her mouth open to ask him when a meaningful sniff from Olmok put her on alert. Leia stepped closer to the man and peered intently into his eyes. As she raised her right forefinger, a low growl escaped Olmok. The captive recoiled when he realized Leia's intent, but his reaction only firmed the soldier's resolve to hold on to him. Leia's eyes narrowed in certainty. She thrust her finger into the man's face, striking him just where his right nostril curved into his cheek. To the soldier's utter astonishment, the man's flesh seemed to recede, taking with it his expression to reveal a look that combined pain and pride on a face incised with brilliantly colored designs and flourishes. The flesh-like mask that had taken flight at Leia's touch disappeared down the throat of the man's loose-fitting jacket, bunching somewhat as it flayed itself from his torso, only to pour from the cuffs of his trousers like flesh-colored syrup and puddle on the ground at his feet. The soldiers leapt back in shock, the sergeant drawing his blaster and putting repeated bolts into the living puddle. Free of their grip, the Yuzhan Vong also took a step back, tearing open the front of his jacket to expose a body vest every bit as alive as the Uglith Masker had been. With his lashless eyes fixed on Leia, he lifted his face and howled a blood-curdling war cry. Doroic Vong Prat! And woe to our enemies! Down, down, Leia screamed to everyone nearby. Omak drove her to the ground, even as the first of the thud bugs were bursting outward from the Yuzhan Vong's chest. The sound was not unlike that of corks being popped from bottles of effervescent wine, but accompanying the lively explosions were the pained exclamations of soldiers and hapless civilians who hadn't heard or heeded Leia's counsel. For ten meters in all directions, men and women fell like trees. Leia felt Olmok's weight lift from her. By the time she looked up, the Nogri had ripped out the Yuzhan Vong's throat with his teeth. Left and right, people lay on the ground, groaning in pain. Others staggered about, with hands pressed to ruptured bellies, compound fractures, broken ribs, or smashed faces. "'Get these people to the battle dressing station,' Leia ordered." Yorick coral missiles were continuing to rain down on the embassy in the landing zone, where a dozen soldiers were overseeing the loading of the final evacuation craft. The crowd had long since pushed through the gates, but stun batons and sonics were keeping many from reaching the waiting craft. Groggily, and with Olmok falling in behind her, Leia began to move that way herself. She spied C-3PO, whose chest plastron had been deeply dented by one of the thud bugs, just above his circular power recharge coupler. Are you all right? she asked. He might have blinked if he could. Thank the Maker, I lack a heart. As the three of them were closing on the evacuation ship, a vintage at-sat limped into view, blackened along one side and leaking hydraulic fluid, its grenade launcher blown away. 
a lightly armored box perched on reverse articulated legs. The all-terrain scout transport wheezed and clanked to a halt, then collapsed chin first to the permacrete landing apron. In a moment, the aft hatch lifted, loosing a cloud of smoke, and a young man crawled coughing but otherwise unharmed from the cockpit. Worth skitter, Leia intoned, folding her arms across her chest. I should have known it was you from the brilliance of your entrance. Blonde and sharp-featured, Skitter jumped agilely to his feet and threw off his smoldering Jedi Knight cloak. The Yuzhan Vong have overrun our defenses, Ambassador. The fight's lost. He grinned smugly. I wanted you to be the first to know. Leia had heard from Luke that Skitter was on Gindine, but this was her first contact with him. She had had trouble with him during the Romamulian crisis eight months earlier, when he had downed a couple of Rodian-piloted Osarian starfighters intent on interfering with her then-diplomatic duties. At the time, she had found him to be reckless, insolent, and overconfident in his abilities. But Luke insisted that the Battle of Ithor and the injury Skitter had sustained there had changed him for the better. No doubt because he reveled in being able to put a lightsaber to constant use, Leia thought. You're a little late with your update, Worth, she told him now, but you're in time for the final flight out of here. She nodded in the direction of the landing zone. My brother would never forgive me if I didn't see you safely back to Coruscant. Skidder returned an elaborately chivalrous bow, extending his right arm toward her. A Jedi avoids argument at all costs. He held her gaze briefly. Nothing in the Jedi Code about having to answer to civilians, but I'll comply out of respect for your celebrated sibling. Fine, Leia said sarcastically. Just see to it that you get aboard. Someone tapped her on the shoulder and she twisted around. Ambassador, we're holding space for you, your bodyguard and droid, a male flight officer reported. But you'll have to come now, ma'am. The new Republic envoy is already aboard, and we've received orders to lift off. Leia nodded that she understood, then swung back to Skitter, only to see him running toward the embassy gates. Skitter, she yelled, making a megaphone of her hands. He stopped, turned to her, and waved a hand in what at least appeared to be a genuine acknowledgment. Just one small task to perform, he shouted back. Leia frowned angrily and turned to the flight officer once more, cutting her eyes back and forth between him and the sizable crowd gathering at the foot of the ship's boarding ramp. Surely the ship can accommodate a few more. The officer's lips became a thin line. We're already at maximum payload, Ambassador. He followed her gaze to the crowd, then blew out his breath. But we can probably cram in four more. Leia touched his forearm in indebtedness, and the two of them hastened for the ramp. Behind a barricade of soldiers, at the head of the line of evacuees, stood a group of tailed, spike-haired, and velvet-furred aliens, attired in colorful, if threadbare, vests and wraparound skirts. Rin, Leia realized in surprise, the species to which Han's new friend Droma belonged. Four, the flight officer reminded, even as Leia was doing a head count of the Rin. Some of them will have to be left behind. Six Rin, to be exact, she told herself. Even so, four was better than none. She edged between two broad-shouldered soldiers closest to the ramp and beckoned to the aliens in line. You four, she said, pointing to each in turn. Hurry. Expressions of relief and joy appeared. The chosen four turned to exchange embraces with those who would be abandoned. A swaddled infant was passed from the rear to one of the females up front. Leia heard someone say, Melisma, should you find Droma, tell him we're here. Leia gave a start and glanced about for the one who had said the name, but there wasn't time to seek out the Rin. Already the soldiers were backing their way up the ramp, taking her with them. Hold on, she said, coming to a sudden stop and refusing to be moved. Skitter, where's Skitter? Is he already aboard? She leaned forward to gaze across the devastated landing zone and spotted him dashing for the ship, dragging a human female behind him and cradling a long-haired infant in his left arm. The sight gave Leia pause. Maybe Skitter had changed after all. Make certain they get aboard, Leia instructed the officer in charge, pausing when a coral skipper delivered projectile impacted the permacrete only meters from the ramp. 
I don't care if you have to use a shoehorn to do it. Two. Death pursued the shuttle to the edge of space, spitting fire from below, needling with fighter-launched missiles, clutching with Dovin basils housed in warships anchored just inside Gindine's envelope. The X-Wing escort had to blaze a route through swarms of coral skippers and take on a frigate analog, five pilots sacrificing themselves in the attempt to see the evacuees to safety. Leia sat in the cramped cockpit watching the battle rage, wondering whether they would reach the transport in time. A ship that had launched before dawn hadn't been so lucky. Hull perforated in several places, the oval craft drifted lazily in golden sunlight, venting atmosphere and debris into space. Wherever Leia's eye roamed, New Republic and Yuzhan Vong vessels assailed one another with lasers and missiles, while enemy dropships fell obliquely into the well, wing-like projections extended, and ablative coral blushed crimson red. Farther from the planet were the new arrivals Commander Ilanka had mentioned. Two of the ships had tent-like hulls fashioned from some sort of diaphanous material from which protruded a dozen or more lightning-forked arms, as if dendrites from an insect-spun nest. The third resembled nothing so much as a cluster of conjoined bubbles or egg sacs waiting to hatch. In the shuttle's passenger cabin, Gindine's refugees conversed in hushed tones or prayed boldly to sundry gods. Fear rose off the group in waves that stung Leia's nostrils. She was circulating among them when a familiar shudder passed through the ship, and she recognized with relief that a tractor beam had possession of them. Moments later, the shuttle was pulled gently, almost lovingly, into the docking bay of the transport. But even there, death reached for them. During the deboarding process, a pair of coral skippers that had somehow duped the transport's energy shield came streaking into the hold on a suicide run, skidding across the deck and exploding against a blast shield raised in the nick of time. Several refugees and crew members were killed, and a score more were injured. Two of Leia's female aides, who had remained aboard the transport, hurried to her as she was picking herself up off the coral-littered deck. She made plain what she thought of their attempts to comb her hair back from her face. You're worried about my hairstyle, she fulminated, when people here need immediate medical attention. But your cheek, one of the women said, chagrined. Leia had forgotten all about the shrapnel. Of its own accord, her hand reenacted the movement it had made earlier, fingertips tracing the raised edges of the furrow that had been opened. She exhaled wearily and dropped cross-legged to the deck. I'm sorry. Silently, she allowed the wound to be ministered to, suddenly aware of just how exhausted she was. When C-3PO and Olmok came within earshot, she said, I can't remember when I last slept. That would be fifty-seven hours six minutes ago, mistress, C-3PO supplied. Standard time, of course. If you'd prefer, I could express the duration by other time parts, in which case... Not now, 3PO, Leia said weakly. In fact... Maybe you should immerse yourself in an oil bath before your moving parts freeze up. C-3PO cocked his head to one side, arms nearly akimbo. Why, thank you, Mistress Leia. I was beginning to fear I would never again hear those words spoken. And you, Leia said, glancing at Olmok, see to washing that Yuzhan Vong's blood off your chin. The Nogri muttered truculently, then nodded curtly and moved off with C-3PO. Fifty-seven hours, Leia thought. Truth be told, she hadn't slept soundly since Han had left Coruscant almost a month earlier. A day didn't pass when she didn't wonder what he was up to, although ostensibly he was searching for Roa, his one-time mentor, who had been captured by the Yuzhan Vong during a raid on Ord Mantell's orbital facility, the Jubilee Wheel, as well as for members of his new Rin comrades' scattered clan. Was it possible, Leia wondered, that the Droma mentioned on Gindine was the same one Han was suddenly running with? Reports would occasionally reach her that the Millennium Falcon had been spotted in this system or that one, but Han had yet to contact her personally. He hadn't been the same since Chewbacca's death, 
not that anyone or anything had, especially occurring when it did, at the start of the Yuzhan Vong invasion, and largely at their hands. It was natural that Han should mourn Chewie's passing more than anyone, but even Leia had been surprised by the direction he had taken, or the one his unabashed grief had driven him to take. Where Han had always been cheerfully roguish, there was an angry gravity to him now. Anakin had been the first target of his father's outrage. Then everyone close to Han had gradually fallen victim to it. Experts spoke of stages of grief, as if people could be expected to move through them routinely. But in Han, the stages were jumbled together, anger, denial, despair, without a hint of resignation, let alone acceptance. Han's stasis was what worried Leia more than anything. Though he would be the first to deny it, vociferously at that, his grief had fueled a kind of recidivism, a return to the Han of old, the lone Solo who guarded his sensitivity by keeping himself at arm's length, who claimed not to care about anyone but himself, who allowed thrill to substitute for feeling. When Droma, another adventurer, had first entered Han's orbit, Leia had feared the worst. But in getting to know the Rin, even slightly, she had taken heart. While not a replacement for Chewie, for how could anyone replace him? Droma at least presented Han with the option of forging a new relationship. And if Han could manage that, he just might be able to see his way to re-embracing his tried and true relationships. Time would tell about Han, about their marriage, about the Yuzhan Vong, and the fate of the New Republic. With her cheek sporting a strip of itchy synth flesh, Leia took hold of her aides to wander forward into the passenger hold, where many of the refugees were already claiming areas of deck space. Despite the battle swirling around the transport, an atmosphere of chatty relief prevailed. Leia spotted the New Republic envoy to Gindine and went over to him. A man of distinguished handsomeness, he sat with his head in his hands. I promised I would get everyone off-world, he told Leia solemnly. I failed them. He shook his head. I failed them. Leia caressed his shoulder in a comforting way. Awarded the Medal of Honor at the Battle of Kashiik. Cited for exemplary service during the Yavithan Crisis. Former member of the Senate Advisory Council to the Chief of State. Leia stopped and smiled. Save your recriminations for the Yuzhan Vong envoy. You did more than anyone thought possible. She moved on, listening in to scraps of conversation, mostly devoted to the uncertain future, rumors about the horrors of the refugee camps, or criticisms of the new Republic government and military. She was happy to see that the Rin had found space for themselves, until she realized that they had been banished to a dark corner of the hold, and that no one of any species had deigned to sit within a meter of them. Leia was forced to take a meandering route to them, in and through, and sometimes over family groups and others. She addressed the female Wren who held the child. When you were boarding, I heard someone mention the name Droma. Is that a common name among your species? I ask only because I happen to know a Wren named Droma, slightly at any rate. My nephew, the only male among them, answered. We haven't seen him since the Yuzhan Vong attacked Ord Mantell. Droma's sister was one of those you... who chose to remain behind on Gindine. He gestured to the infant. The child is hers. Oh, no, Leia said more to herself. She took a breath and straightened. I know where your nephew is. He's safe, then? After a fashion. He's with my husband. They're searching for all of you. Ah, sweet irony, the male said. And now we're further divided. As soon as we reach Raltir, I'll try to reach my husband. Thank you, Princess Leia, the one named Melisma said, catching her completely by surprise. Ambassador, she corrected. They all smiled. To the Rin, the male said, you will forever remain a princess. The comment warmed and chilled her at once. The Wren wouldn't have been on Gindine in the first place if Leia had not relocated them there from Bilbringi, and what of the six she had been forced to leave behind to face imprisonment or death. 
Was she princess or deserter in the eyes of Droma's sister? The flattering comment had sounded sincere, but it might have been more sweet irony. Leia was heading for the bridge when the transport sounded general quarters. By the time she reached the command center, the ship was already being jarred by concussive explosions that tested the metal of the shields. Ambassador Organa Solo, Commander Ilanka said from his swivel-mounted chair as violent light flashed outside the curved viewport. Glad to have you aboard. It's my understanding that you were last to board the evacuation ship. How much trouble are we in? she asked, ignoring the sarcasm. I'd classify our situation as desperate, verging on hopeless. Other than that, we're in fine shape. Do we have jump capability? Never computers working on coordinates, the navigator said from her console. Coral skippers in pursuit, an enlisted rating added. Leia glanced at the target assessment screen, which displayed twenty or more arrowhead shapes closing fast on the ship. She turned to look out on Gindine, and again she thought about the thousands she had been forced to abandon to fate. Then it suddenly occurred to her that she hadn't seen Worth Skidder aboard the shuttle or during her passage through the transport. She was about to page him over the comm when the evac craft's flight officer stepped onto the bridge. He remembered Skidder along with Leia's orders. But when you told me to make sure they got aboard, I thought you were referring to the mother and child, not their rescuer. He showed Leia a docile look. I apologize, Ambassador, but he didn't have the slightest interest in coming aboard. Who is he? Someone who thinks he can save the galaxy single-handedly, Leia mumbled. On Gindine, explosions began to blossom along the transitor and deep into the planet's dark side. A fiery speck in the night, the planet's orbital shipyard slowly disintegrated. Leia became dizzy at the sight and had to steady herself against a bulkhead. The explosions didn't so much stir memories as prompt a troubling vision of some event yet to come. A tone sounded from the Nava computer. Hyperspace coordinates received and locked in, the navigator announced. The ship shuddered, starlight elongated as if the past were making a desperate bid to forestall the future, and the transport jumped. Crouched in the shadows of the smoldering embassy building, Worth Skidder watched the last of the troop carriers take to the scudded sky. Thousands of Gindine's indigenous forces had fallen back to the gated compound on the off chance of being evacuated with New Republic effectives. Few had been taken, however, and many of those who had were officers with political ties to Coruscant or other core worlds. There was still some furious fighting going on in the city, but the majority of ground troops, realizing that their hopes for salvation had left with the last ship out, had tossed aside their repeating blasters and stripped off their uniforms in the belief that the Yuzhan Vaughn would go easier on non-combatants. Which just went to show how slowly news traveled to remote worlds, Skidder thought ruefully. When it came to sacrificing captives to their gods, the enemy drew no such distinctions. In fact, in some cases a uniform, or at least evidence of a fighting spirit, could mean the difference between the mercifully quick death the Yuzhan Vong offered those who measured up to their warlike ideals, and the lingering death they reserved for those taken into captivity. They had heard rumors about captives undergoing dismemberment and vivisection, others about shiploads of captives being launched into the heart of stars to ensure victory for the Yuzhan Vong as if the invaders needed a helping hand. The gas-bag-fire-breathing abominations that had torched Gindine's forests and turned lakes into boiling cauldrons were gathered on the eastern outskirts of the capital. Flame-carpet warheads couldn't have done as much damage. Yuzhan Vong infantry units, reptilian humanoid Chazrock warriors, had followed the fire-breathers in to clean out pockets of resistance and generally mop up. The sky had actually brightened slightly, but what light filtered in through smoke and scudding clouds was blotted out by descending dropships. One of them, a mesh tent pierced by crooked sticks, was hovering over the embassy grounds now. 
Skidder had just changed positions to get a better vantage on the ship when its tent-like hull suddenly burst open, releasing a dozen or more huge, rod-shaped and bristled bundles that fell straight to the ground. Skidder didn't understand that they were living creatures until he saw the bioluminescent eye spots, twitching antennae, and the hundred pairs of sucker-equipped legs that sprouted down the length of the segmented bodies. He observed the creatures in undisguised awe. They had the capacity not only to ambulate forward and backward, but also to skitter sideways, which they commenced doing at once, creating a living perimeter around the embassy grounds and moving slowly inward as a means of forcing everyone toward the center. The sight of the creatures was enough to strike fear in the heart of the most valiant, but Skidder had the force on his side and was undaunted. Large as the creatures were, he was not without his own grab bag of abilities, and he could easily vault his way to freedom if he wished. After that, it would be a simple matter to conceal himself from the Yuzhan Vong. He could set off into the countryside, away from the devastation, and live off the land, as many of Gindine's residents had opted to do when word of the imminent attack had spread. But Worth Skidder wasn't a forager, and he certainly wasn't a deserter. The fact that so few had lived to speak of their experiences as captives made it imperative that someone elect to be taken, someone with more interest in winning the war than in understanding the enemy. As Kamasi Senator Alagos Akla had attempted to do, and been butchered for his efforts. Danny Kui, an ex gal scientist who had been captured shortly after the Yuzhan Vong's arrival at the Ice World Helska IV, had told Skidder of the final days of another captive, Skidder's fellow Jedi and close friend, Miko Reglia. Kui had recounted the psychological tortures the Yuzhan Vong and their tentacled Yamisk, their so called war coordinator, had inflicted on quiet and unassuming Miko in an attempt to break him, and of Miko's death during his and Kui's escape. Vengeance went against the Jedi Code, as the Code was taught by Master Skywalker at any rate. Vengeance, according to Skywalker, was a path to the dark side. But there were other Jedi Knights, as powerful as Skywalker in Skidder's estimation, who took issue with some of the Master's teachings. Jedi Master Kip Duran, for one. It was whispered, even on Yavin 4 in the wake of the Yuzhan Vong invasion, that there were times when darkness had to be fought with darkness, and the Yuzhan Vong were nothing if not the blackest evil since Emperor Palpatine. Skidder was astute enough to recognize that he was motivated in part by a desire to show Skywalker and the rest that he was not some brash kid, but a Jedi Knight of old willing to put his life on the line, to sacrifice himself, if necessary, for a greater cause. He rose from the shadows. The outsized, insectile creatures loosed from the dropship had succeeded in hurting everyone to the center. Some of the creatures were beginning to curl themselves into rings, corralling their captives and employing their numerous sucker-equipped legs to prevent anyone from making over-the-top escapes. Skidder tossed aside the lightsaber he had fashioned to replace the one he'd lost at Ithor, along with everything else that might identify him as a Jedi Knight. Then he chose his moment. As one of the creatures approached, pushing a score of beings in front of it, Skidder rushed forward, infiltrating the fleeing group before the creature had made a complete circle of itself, and much to the bafflement of a group of Rin in whose midst he landed. As the bioengineered creature joined its head to its tail parts, Skidder found himself pressed face to face with a Rin female whose oblique eyes mirrored her terror. He reached down and took her long fingered hand. Take heart, he said in basic. Help has arrived. 3. Handles just as well as she always did, Han announced confidently, as the newly matte black Millennium Falcon left behind a lush little world of green and purple forest. A simple coat of paint and you're feeling invulnerable, Droma said, frowning. Who would have guessed? Han had made adjustments to the Falcon's drives. Next stop, Srelor. Somebody once described it as the source of every foul wind that blows through the galaxy, but... 
You figure they were just being kind, Droma completed. Han glanced at the wren, absurdly small, and the oversized chair that had been Chewbacca's. Haven't I warned you about doing that? Anyway, quit your worrying. I've been to Sri Lur more times than I can count. And let me tell you, dodging Imperial bulk cruisers was a lot harder than dodging Yuzhan Vong battleships. Han Solo has been to Sri Lur, Droma pointed out, growing more agitated. Unless you plan on revealing your true identity, you're just another scruffy spacer with a freshly painted ship and a death wish. Han scowled, stroking the mostly gray growth on his chin, as he tried to catch a glimpse of his reflection in the closest of the cockpit's transperisteel panes. Quit your worrying, Droma mimicked him. The beard looks fine, but it's not going to keep us from arousing suspicion when we start asking questions about Yuzhan Vong prisoner ships. Maybe not, but Sri is worth the risk. The weak ways might not be the most attractive folks in the galaxy, but they're real good at keeping an ear to the ground. And if anyone can tell us where to start looking for Roa or your clanmates, it'll be them. Droma tugged nervously at his mustache. Let's just hope your pheromone levels are up to it. Han waved a hand in dismissal. They only communicate like that among their own kind. I always manage to get by with basic. He smirked. I'd like to see you second-guess what a weak way's about to say. Scent. Huh? What a weak way is about to scent. Han put his tongue in his cheek, nodded slowly, and threw switches on the Nava computer. Maybe we'll get lucky at Sri Lur and have to put down in a sandstorm, he said in a casual way. Extra concealment for the ship? Han snarled at him. No, so I can see how much sand it takes to plug that perpetual motion machine you call a mouth. Droma grimaced, then sighed with purpose. I guess I just don't like the idea of venturing so close to hot space, with or without Yuzhan Vong in the area. There's no love lost between huts and Rin. Many of us were enslaved by them to provide entertainment in one court or another. Some of my ancestors were required to prognosticate for a desolidic hut. When predicted events didn't come to pass, the hut would have a wren killed by his henchmen or fed to a court beast. True to form, Han said, but you've got my word. No hut'll stop us from locating your clanmates. We'll have your family back together soon enough. Then we can make a start on yours, Droma mumbled. Han threw him an angry glance. You want to explain that? Droma turned to him. You and Leia to begin with. If it weren't for me, you'd be with her now. I only hope she can find it in her heart to forgive me. Han compressed his lips. You've got nothing to do with what's come between us. Heck, it's not even between me and Leia. It's between me and... He flicked his hand at the star field beyond the viewpoint. This... Droma didn't speak for a moment, then said, Even friends can't be protected from fate, Han. Don't talk to me about fate, Han snapped. Nothing's fixed. Not these stars and definitely not what happens to us in life. He clenched his hands. These are what determine my fate. And yet even you end up in situations that are not of your making. Like my being with you, for instance. Droma frowned. I've lost friends and loved ones to tragedy, and I've tried to do exactly what you're doing. Han looked up at him. What I'm doing? Trying to beat tragedy by outracing it, filling your life to the brim even when it puts you in danger, burying your heartache under as much anger as you can muster without realizing that you've shoveled love and compassion into the same grave. We live for love, Han. Without it, we might as well jettison everything. Despite himself, Han thought about Leia on Gindine, Jaina flying with Rogue Squadron, Anakin and Jason off to who knew where with the Jedi. When he considered, even for a split second, where he might be without them, the angry words and recriminations that had spewed from him since Chewie's death pierced him like rapid fire. If something should happen to them, he started to think, 
only to feel a great black maw opening beneath him, undermining everything he believed in. Protectively, he tugged himself from dark imaginings. I got along just fine without love for a lot of years, Joma. Love is what starts things rolling downhill. It's like being sucked into a gravity well or being caught by a tractor beam. You get too close. There's no escape. Droma nodded as if in understanding. So your mistake was in befriending Chewbacca to begin with. You would have been better off keeping your distance. Then you wouldn't be grieving now. Befriending him wasn't a mistake, Han said. But if you'd kept your guard raised all those years, you would never have grown as close to him as you did. Okay, that was a risk I took, but that was then. Let me suggest an alternative error. You didn't see his death coming, and you're angry that you let your guard down. You're right about that. I should have been more vigilant. So let's suppose you did everything you could and still failed. Would you be grieving now, or would doing everything have satisfied you enough so that you wouldn't miss him? Of course I'd still miss him. Then who are you angry at? Yourself for the things you didn't do, or fate for having snuck up on you? Han swallowed hard. All I know is I won't make that mistake again. I'll be ready for anything fate dishes out. And if you fail again? Han glared at him. I won't. Deep in one of the fathomless canyons formed by Coruscant's soaring superstructures, Sulliston Admiral Seen Sov switched off his private comlink and relayed the tragic news to the twelve officers seated in the recently ready New Republic Defense Force war room. Gindine is lost. The uncomfortable silence that greeted the announcement came as no surprise. The planet's fall had been a foregone conclusion from the moment it had been identified as a target. Filling the silence, machines whirred and hummed as they received and processed intelligence updates from all sectors of New Republic space. In projected light, virtual battle groups of starships moved lazily among virtual worlds. For allowing this to happen, we are all diminished, Brigadier General Aton Abbott remarked at last, voicing what many in the room were thinking. And yet the silence lingered. While I number myself among those who in the end voted against dispatching a force of suitable might to safeguard Gindine, the aubergine-skinned Dornian went on, I wish to reiterate the remarks I made during the arguments preceding that regrettable decision. By all but surrendering worlds like Gindine, we reinforce widespread conviction that the New Republic is interested only in protecting the core and in doing so we play into the enemy's hand by weakening ourselves from within. A scornful muttering rose from across the oblong table, and all heads turned to Commodore Brand. Perhaps it would have been wiser to send an entire fleet to Gindine, and thus deprive Kuat or Fondor of any defense. Abbot stood his ground, meeting the dour human's gaze. Will that be your justification for allowing the Yuzhan Vong to occupy the entire Inner Rim? Is the Inner Rim the price we're willing to pay to protect the core? He paused for effect. A wise action, Commodore, would be to cease this exercise in selective defense and begin sending forces where needed. Abbot glanced around the table. Doesn't it disturb any of you that threatened worlds have begun to surrender without a fight? that former allies have refused to allow us to use their systems as staging areas out of fear of reprisals by the Yuzhan Vong? He continued before anyone could respond. Even a cursory look at the situation reveals that those populations who, at our urging, mounted a resistance have seen their worlds poisoned or devastated, while those like the Huts, who have struck deals with the Yuzhan Vong, have escaped bloodshed entirely. You disgrace all of us by bringing the huts into this, Brand said angrily. Was their capitulation ever in doubt? Abbot made a placating gesture. I offer them only as an example, Commodore. 
but the fact remains that now Hatta has been spared the ruination visited on Dantooine, Ithor, Abroa Sky, and countless other worlds. My point is that populations throughout the Mid-Rim and the expansion region are fast losing faith in our ability to put an end to this war. And I use the word intentionally, since few of you seem to realize, even at this late stage, the great peril we face. Events are reaching a point where it's every system for itself. Abbot gestured broadly to the hollow projectors and screens. Even this space reflects our denial to embrace the depths of our peril. Instead of meeting openly for all of Coruscant to see, we wind up down here, as if in hiding from the truth. No one is hiding, Brand objected. Thanks to the ineptitude of the Intelligence Division, we came close to escorting two saboteurs into our midst. Or doesn't it matter to you that our security has been compromised? The saboteurs were after the Jedi, not us. Director of Fleet Intelligence Adar Neely Kirka interjected. Abbot swung to him. And why? Because, until Ithor, the Jedi were the ones who were leading the campaign. Now either we assume that role, or we allow the New Republic to splinter beyond repair. We must demonstrate our commitment to stopping the Yuzhan Vong, and we must do so before additional worlds fall. He adopted a more affable tone. I'm not saying that security isn't an issue, only that we set a proper example. By relocating to Dome Town, we have encouraged everyone to think in terms of concealment. A kilometer-wide cavern of homes and buildings, Dome Town had originally been financed by a consortium of investors, including former General Lando Calrissian. But the hundreds of thousands expected to abandon the frenetic surface for underground tranquility had never arrived, and the enterprise had gone bankrupt. Repossessed by banks and various credit unions, the would-be community had ultimately become the property of the New Republic military. Already there are new hotels and restaurants being opened on the lowest levels, Abbot was saying, in anticipation that those currently fortunate enough to live in Coruscant's lofty towers will have nowhere to go but down should the Yuzhan Vong attack. And mark my words, there'll be no survival even here. For if what is occurring at Cern Padal and Abroa Sky is any indication, the Yuzhan Vong will remake Coruscant in their own image, entombing any who have fled to the depths. Has any thought been given to just where we will go should Coruscant fall? Azidro Lagorbaru asked while most of the officers were mulling over Abbot's dire prediction. A native of Mahaili, Lagorbaru was director of the New Republic's Battle Assessment Division. That will never happen, Seen Saab assured, then lowered his voice to add, Nevertheless, we're exploring options for relocating key government and military personnel to the Kurnacht cluster. Or, should worse come to worst, the Empress Tata system in the Deep Core. Key personnel, someone said leadingly. The Sullustan Admiral frowned. It's a moot point in any case, since most of the proposals have met with opposition by certain members of the Senate. Knowing glances were traded around the table. General Abbott's point about honoring our commitment to secondary worlds is well taken, Sav said, but I'm certain that even he would be willing to concede that sending a flotilla to Gindine wouldn't have slowed the enemy's advance. When everyone looked at Abbott for confirmation, he nodded, though with obvious reluctance. The attack on Gindine indicates a change in the enemy's battle campaign. Clearly, they are probing for weaknesses, perhaps roots into the core. At the same time, there has been a marked increase in their mining of select hyperspace routes, which has narrowed our access to several outlying sectors. In other words, they're attempting to contain us, Brand said. The diminutive Saab stood and directed everyone's attention to a hollow map that projected from the table's center, showing the current disposition of Yuzhan Vong forces. This is what we have been able to piece together from direct observation. In addition to stasis probe reconnaissance and hyperspace orbiting scanners, 
As you can see, their fleets are concentrated between Ord Mantell and Abroa Sky, and now between Hut Space and Gindine. Should they move Corward from Abroa Sky, Bilbringi, Borlias, Venjaga, and Ord Mirit are imperiled. From Gindine, Kaminor, Kuat, and Corellia are vulnerable. Analysis suggests that the conquest of Gindine was effected to ready the way for a two-pronged attack. Logic dictates that... You err in believing that they strategize as we do, Abbot interrupted, when in fact they are waging a psychological war. The destruction of natural beauty and repositories of learning, the pursuit of refugees. Such tactics are meant to confound and dishearten us. The Yuzhan Vong are as much as saying that the civilization we have fashioned means nothing to them. All that we hold sacred is imperiled. Impatience coaxed Brand out of his seat. Spare us the rhetoric, General, and come to the point. With such keen insight into the Yuzhan Vong, you no doubt have some foreknowledge of where they will strike next. Abbot squared his shoulders. The next targets will be Bathawi and Kaflis. Everyone regarded the Dornian for a long moment. You have evidence to support this, Sav asked. No more than what you present to support your belief that they will push for the core. With their forces in hot space, they are practically at Bathawi's door. So this is what he's been getting at, Brand muttered. He's finally gone over to Borsk Phalia's side. Phalia the warrior, the hero of Ithor. Abbot refused to speak to the remark. I propose that elements of the third and fourth fleets be relocated to Bothan space as soon as possible. Bathawi is where we should draw the line and launch our counteroffensive. Brand snorted derisively. And if you're wrong, if the Yuzhan Vong should decide to assault Bilbringi, Kuat, or Mon Calamari instead? Abbot glowered. Are you suggesting that those worlds are more important than Bathawi? I'm saying precisely that. If any of our shipyards fall, the new republic will topple. And if Bathawi falls, we will mourn the loss, but the new republic will survive. Abbot shook his head in dismay. Times like this make me wish that Akbar could be persuaded to come out of retirement. Sav held up his hands to silence half a dozen separate conversations. Contrary to General Abbot's assertions, no scenarios have been ruled out. Based on current intelligence, Bathawi is just as likely to be targeted as Bill Bringy. But more important, we are not simply standing by, waiting for the Yuzhan Vong to strike. Two plans have already been put into action. He looked at Brand. Commodore, if you would be so kind. Abbot leaned forward in interest. The first plan involves inducing the Hapes Consortium to join the fight, Brand said. The Hapens are not only well-armed, but well-positioned to outflank the enemy. Indeed, the Yuzhan Vong may have skirted the Hapes Cluster in order to avoid having to engage them. Then why should the Consortium Worlds elect to get involved now? Abbot asked. Why wouldn't they secure their own space, as the Imperial Remnant has, or cut a deal? as the huts appear to have done. Because the consortium has allied with us in the past. Sav explained calmly. Following the Battle of Endor, they captured several Imperial Star Destroyers, but instead of holding on to those ships, they donated them to the New Republic. Additionally, the Hapen Queen Mother's homeworld of Dathomir is threatened. More to the point, Brand interjected, the Jedi recently did the royal family a favor by foiling a coup directed against the Queen Mother. It is hoped that Ambassador Organa Solo can persuade the rulers of the noble houses to repay us in kind. Abbot feigned a look of confusion. The Jedi did them a favor, and yet you've asked Organa Solo to intercede? To the best of my knowledge, she is not a true member of that order. Or is it perhaps that she was once courted by Prince Isolder? Brand fielded the question. I won't deny that that didn't influence our decision to approach her. And she has agreed? 
For a price, we had to promise to back her in seeking added funds for CellCore, refugee relief. But yes, she has agreed. She will leave for Hapes immediately on her return from Gindine. Abbott allowed an uncertain nod. And this other plan? Brand adjusted the fit of his collar. We're hoping to lure the Yuzhan Vong into attacking the Karelian system. For a moment, even Abbott was too surprised to speak. Then he said, Corellia is in Gindine, Commodore. If it's your aim to make that system a battlefield, to avoid fouling Coruscant space lanes, you will never have my vote. Wasn't it enough that we stripped the Corellians of the ability to defend themselves after the Centerpoint Station crisis? Sav put his small hands on the table and leaned toward Abbott. Centerpoint Station is the very reason we hope to lure the Yuzhan Vong there. Larger than the Death Star, the artifact had been discovered to be a hyperspace repulsor used in the dim past and by an unknown race to capture and transport planets to the Corellian system. The station was also a weapon of unparalleled power, both Starbuster and Interdiction Field Generator, and eight years earlier had been employed as such by a group known as the Sikorian Triad. In an unsuccessful attempt to achieve independence from the New Republic. Are you telling me that Centerpoint is operational? Abbott asked in disbelief. The last I heard, it had been shut down. It shut itself down, Brand snapped. But as we speak, several hundred scientists are attempting to return it to operational status. If the Yuzhan Vong can be encouraged to attack Corellia, we will use a Centerpoint-generated interdiction field to prevent their ships from going to hyperspace while our fleets attack from the rear. Much to the dismay of the species of the Corellian sector, I would imagine, Abbott said. After all, we didn't win many friends by interceding in the system's attempts at self-governance. If memory serves, the blowback from that interference is what prompted Organa Solo to resign as chief of state. Sav nodded. But Governor General Marcha is a New Republic appointee, and she has given her conditional approval. As a Corellian citizen, her word carries a lot of weight, not only on her native drow, but on Salonia, Corellia, and the double worlds. What's more, we haven't made the full extent of our plans known. Abbott stared at him for a moment, then looked at Brand. As far as the Corellians know, we're readying Centerpoint as a defensive weapon in lieu of stationing a flotilla there. How very noble of us, Abbott said in obvious disgust. Here they've been supplying us with strident-class star defenders, and we withhold the fact that we're planning to use their system as a battleground. Just how do you plan to lure the Yuzhan Vong into attacking? By making Corellia appear too attractive a target to pass up, Brand said, by leaving the system essentially unprotected. Abbott stroked his jaw in thought. It's bold. I'll grant that much. But have failure and the advisory council members been apprised of this plan? They know only what Corellia knows, Brand barked then softened his tone to add, Failure would never sanction the rearming of Centerpoint, if only to prevent Corellia from reaping such power. He laughed shortly. Even in the remote chance he did support us, how then could we ensure that word of the plan wouldn't leak? Once that occurred, every world in the Corellian system would rise up in revolt. Abbott snorted in displeasure. Failure's isn't the only voice in the council. He can be overridden by a majority vote. Brand and Sav traded looks. From what we have been able to determine, the Admiral said, three of the Council members would certainly follow Failure's lead. Four of the others could very well support us. Abbott considered it. In response to the clamor from far-flung sectors for increased representation, two additional senators had been appointed to the Council since the poisoning of Ithor. That's four against, four in favor. Who is the unknown quantity? The council's newest member, Brand said. Senator Viki Shesh. Has anyone approached her? Abbott asked. 
Unofficially, of course. Brand shook his head. Not yet. Sav pressed his hands together. Then I suggest we do so, Commodore, before our window closes. Isidro Legorbaru spoke up. Is there any hope that the Huts can be persuaded to join us, actively or indirectly? Intelligence agents on Nal Hutta and Nar Shada have reported that the Hutts' decision to ally themselves with the Yuzhan Vong is a ruse, Sav said. They apparently wish to serve as conduits of information for the New Republic. You accept that? Abbot asked. Given their history of alliances, they wouldn't align themselves with anyone without having a contingency plan in place. Sav ran his hand down his prominently jowled face. Even the Huts can't risk being caught on the wrong side when the Yuzhan Vong are defeated. When, not if, Commodore Brand said around an arrogant grin, I find such optimism refreshing. Abbot frowned. I find it wishful thinking. 4. From the waiting room of the great spired and onion-domed palace of Nalhada's ruling hut, Nome Anor gazed out on a despoiled landscape of feculent swamps, mold-covered stunted trees, and parcels of wan, vermin-riddled marsh grass. Stained by a melange of industrial pollutants and spotted with flocks of ungainly birds, the sky was a brooding ceiling frequently lamenting its wretched state with lackluster showers of grimy rain. The stilted destitute precincts, so abundant in the vicinity of the spaceport, were nowhere to be seen, but the terrain itself reeked of impoverishment and decay. What a vile world this is, Commander Malik Carr commented as he joined Nome Anor at the bay window. The huts know it as glorious jewel, the executor replied nonchalantly. But it's not without potential. The moon, Nar Shada, is far worse, completely encased by buildings and technology. Malik Carr grunted. I see no potential, but perhaps your one true eye sees more clearly than my pair. Nome Anor quirked a smile. I have been in this galaxy for some time, Commander and have learned to look beyond appearances. He turned slightly in Malik Carr's direction. Imagine Nal Hutta as, say, a laboratory for genetic experimentation. Malik Carr smiled slowly. Yes, yes, even I can envision that. Taller than Nome Anor, the commander was displayed in all his glory, without Uglith masker or cloaker. Malik Carr's incised face and bare upper torso told of an illustrious military career. Cinched around his backward sloping forehead was a vibrant headcloth whose tassels were braided into lustrous black hair, forming a tail that hung nearly to his waist. Recently arrived from the galactic edge, where Argosies awaited eagerly for the warrior caste to complete the invasion, the commander had been charged by Supreme Commander Nas Choka with overseeing the next phase of the conquest. To keep his own identity concealed, even from the huts, as well as in deference to Malik Kar, Nom Anor wore an Uglith masker that obscured the scars, augmentations, and like evidence of his sacrifices to the gods, along with a prosthesis in the empty eye socket that normally housed a venom-spitting Playerian bowl. Malik Carr swung from the window and planted his fists on his hips in anger. How dare this creature keep us waiting? Is he completely unaware of what he risks for himself and his pathetic world? She, Commander, Noam Anor corrected. Currently, at any rate. Huts are said to be hermaphroditic. That is to say, male and female characteristics are combined in each. Malik Carr looked at him askance. And just now this one is female. Fully female, as you will see. As for the prolonged wait, it's nothing more than tradition. But the precedent. Don't concern yourself with precedent. I have a plan for dealing with this outmoded formality. 
As the two Yuzhan Vong walked toward the center of the antechamber, an entourage of ten honor guards and as many attendants snapped to attention. The guards wore Von Doom crab armor and carried living amphistaffs and double-edged kufi knives. The female attendants were attired in veils, tunics, and cloaks that left visible only the sinuous markings that adorned their bared arms. Malik Kar acknowledged the guards' brisk salutes and sat down on a cushioned bench. Nom Anor remained standing. The waiting room's high ceiling was supported by a dozen stately, if moldy, pillars. The floor was made of cut stone, polished to a dazzling sheen, and woven textiles of intricate design graced the walls. A bright green, orbide biped of medium size entered the antechamber. The creature's lumpy head featured twin horn-like appendages, pointed ears, and a narrow crest of yellow spines. Its long, tapered fingers appeared to be equipped with suction cups. A Rodian, Gnome Honor supplied quietly, a bellicose species given to warfare and bounty hunting. This one is the hut's major domo, Lenik. Lenik approached his master's guests, his stubby snout twitching. Borger the Almighty is prepared to grant you audience now, he said in basic. Malik Kar shot Gnome Anor a vexed glance. The entire Yuzhan Vong entourage stood and began to trail the Rodian through an enormous doorway, flanked by thick-set churlish guards, whose pointed lower teeth and forehead tusks were perfectly matched. I suggest you take a deep breath before we enter, Gnome Anor advised the commander. Is the hut odor so unbearable? Picture bathing in a reopened grave. Malik Kar grimaced and sucked in his breath. The vaulted ceiling of the opulent court was even higher than that of the antechamber, and floating midway to the ceiling on a bolstered anti-gravity couch was an outsize, bulbous-headed slug, whose disproportionately short arms might have been vestigial were the small hands they ended in not beckoning imperiously to Malik Kar and Nome Anor. Atmosphere exchangers were working overtime, but there was enough residual rankness in the air to make the commander's eyes water. Sybaritic toadies sprawled about on couches and carpets. Musicians, gunsoles, and scantily attired dancers, all of diverse species, Chained to one wall, though obviously a pet, was a ferocious-looking beast Gnome Anor knew to be a Kintan Strider. Borga favored Gnome Anor with a look. How pleasant to see you again, her deep voice boomed. Come and sit beneath me. Gnome Anor, whom Borga knew as Pedrick Cuff, and who claimed to be nothing more than an intercessor between the Yuzhan Vong and the Huts, smiled without showing his teeth and remained where he was, a good distance from the repulsor platform. At his hand signal, the attendants conveyed to the center of the room several ornate boxes of the sort that might contain tribute. Gnome Anor went to the closest box and opened the lid. Almost immediately the levitated couch gave a shudder and crashed loudly to the stone floor, nearly spilling Borga the Almighty into her coterie of shocked sycophants. I'm terribly sorry, Gnome Anor said, as the chagrined hut struggled to regain her former composure. I didn't realize that the Yuzhan Vong had brought along a finely tuned Dovin basil for your amusement. The creature was apparently offended by your couch's attempt to outwit gravity and decided to rectify the imbalance by catching hold of it. Gnome Anor was proficient at mimicking the subharmonics that furnished the hut language with nuance. Even so, Borga had difficulty establishing the sincerity of the apology. Her oblique, heavy-lidded eyes blinked in confusion, then she quickly propped herself up, putting a curl in her muscular, purple-patched tail, and gestured for two of her attendants to bring chairs for her guests. The commander and the executor seated themselves with decorum, careful not to demonstrate too much smugness over their small victory, though a fleeting smile did escape Malik Carr. 
the Yuzhan Vong have brought other wonders as well, Noam Anor said finally. Once more, at his signal, two attendants placed an aquarium well within Borga's limited reach, its murky waters hosting a variety of fist-sized life forms, the likes of which the hut had never seen. Borga whispered something to Lenik, and the major domo fished one of the creatures from the tank, sniffed at it, and took a cautious bite. At the Rodian's mildly enthusiastic nod, Borga snatched the thing from Lenik's long-fingered hands, swallowed it whole, and loosed a resonant and lengthy belch of satisfaction. Another, she ordered. This time Borga opened her jaws so wide that Noam Anor could almost hear the living morsel plop into her enormous stomach cavity. She belched again and ran her powerful tongue over her lips and nostrils. A bit like a Carnovian eel pup, but with just a hint of the resistance one expects from the finest Nala tree frogs supplied by Fanark and company, she said as only a gourmand could. All in all, on a par with some of the classic droke appetizers fashioned by Zubindi Ebsuk. She turned her gaze on Noam Anor. How did you come by these, Pedrick Cuff? On which world can they be found? None in this galaxy, Noam Anor smiled pleasantly. They are bioengineered. The hut glanced at Malik Carr. He created them? Not personally. A Yuzhan Vong shaper did so. And this, this shaper could replicate the product? I'm certain he could. Noam Anor stood and gestured respectfully to Malik Carr. Borga, permit me to introduce Commander Malik Carr. Who will be overseeing this sector of space? The hut blinked. Overseeing? Head canted slightly to one side. Malik Carr regarded her for what seemed an eternity. You speak for all of your kind? he asked in passable Hatties. Borga's blubbery body stiffened proudly. I do. And I have been vested with the power to negotiate with your species. By whom have you been vested? By the leaders of the voting Kajitics, as well as the Grand Council. Kajitics? Malik Kar said to Noam Anor. Criminal syndicates, Noam Anor told him in their own tongue. Malik Kar continued to appraise Borga openly. Yours is the ruling Kajitic, then? I am Borga Basadi Diori, cousin of Durga Basadi Tai, son of Eruk the Great, brother of Zaval, wealthiest and most powerful of the Basadi Kajitic. I lord over the Desiligic, the Trinevii, the Ramesh, Shell, and all other clans. All the three billion of this world pale be. You are male or female, Malik Kar cut her off. Borga blinked. Just now I am with child. She indicated a pouch low in her bulging abdomen. You birth live offspring? Malik Carr said in obvious astonishment. When Borga nodded, the commander's jaw dropped ever so slightly. Like one of our lowliest caste women, he remarked to Noam Anor. Borga's broad forehead wrinkled in uncertainty. Let us talk business, Malik Carr said abruptly. As Pedrick Cuff has undoubtedly apprised you, the Yuzhan Vong have need of some of your worlds for purposes of resource gathering. To effect this, we may be required to remove entire populations, and in some cases remake those worlds we select. Yes, so Pedrick Cuff has explained, Borga said after a long moment. In fact, we huts know a good deal about remaking worlds. When we arrived here from Varl, for example, Glorious Jewel was not the paradise you see now, but a primitive world of dense forests and untamed seas. There was even an indigenous species called the Avosii, who we were obliged to relocate on Glorious Jewel's moon, where the pitiful creatures gradually died out. By then, of course, we had replaced all of OCI structures with proper palaces and shrines. Malik Carr glanced at Noam Anor while Borga prattled on. 
She looks like something our shapers might have cooked up. Noam Anor laughed shortly. It's true. I thought the same thing when I first laid eyes on her. Borga had stopped talking and was eyeing Malik Carr with misgiving. I'm afraid you have me at a disadvantage, Commander, she said with cheerful servility. While I've made some progress in the tutorials Pedrick Cuff supplied, I'm not yet fully conversant with your language. Noam Anor cleared his throat. The commander was just saying that he loves what you've done with the place. Borga managed a dubious smile. In that case, let us return to talking business, as you say. Malik Carr nodded politely. In exchange for granting you the use of certain worlds, one of which we have already provided as a demonstration of good faith, we huts are obliged to ask the Yuzhan Vong to keep clear of rimward hut space in general, as well as to avoid the worlds Rhodia, Ryloth, Tatooine, Kessel, and certain planets in the Cyclata Cluster and Cathal Sector. Borger raised her voice in anticipation of objections. I'm well aware that you have a fleet of ships anchored at the edge of the E-Tube system, but we huts are not without our resources and weapons, and a war against us would only sidetrack you from your principal goal of defeating the New Republic. She stopped herself. That is your goal, is it not? Malik Carr and Noam Anor exchanged brief looks of bemusement before the commander replied, Our goals should not concern you at this point. Furthermore, it would be premature to decide which of us has rights to which worlds when we have yet to see whether our partnership will succeed. That decision, in any event, will ultimately be made by Supreme Overlord Shimra. In the meantime, I suggest you broach the matter with my direct superior, Supreme Commander Nas Choka, who will certainly wish to meet with you when he arrives in hot space some days from now. Borga nodded. I will gladly grant him an audience, and I will do as you suggest and discuss terms with him. I do, however, wish to propose something for your immediate consideration. In addition to other enterprises, we huts have both a fondness for and a long history of slave trading. With our expertise and our well-established network of space lanes and hyperspace routes, it occurs to me that we might best serve the interests of the partnership, as you say, by overseeing the transportation of captives, laborers, servants, and fodder for sacrifices, a task for which we are uniquely suited. That way, the Yuzhan Vong needn't employ their own ships for the lowly purpose of conveying inferior beings to their well-deserved castigation, enslavement, or immolation. In return for what? Malik Carr asked mildly. Your promise not to interfere with the movement of spice and other prescribed goods. Spice? Malik Carr asked Noam Anor. Recreational euphoriance some of which are arachnid byproducts. Borga followed the exchange, then clapped her hands. Human servants appeared bearing trays mounted with crystalline powders, varying in both composition and color. Here you see examples of glitter stem and the core grade of the mineral rill, Borga said, indicating one mound after the next. And there you see carsunum, lumni spice, grease spice, and andrus. She paused to regard Malik Carr. If he would care to sample any one of them. Malik Carr lifted his hand in a negative gesture. Some other time, perhaps, Borga said graciously. But what of my proposal? Noam Anor turned to Malik Carr with purposeful excitement. It does suit Supreme Commander Nas Choka's plan to gather resistant populations onto a few select worlds for indoctrination and security, Commander. Malik Carr nodded noncommittally, then looked at Borga. You have no qualms about betraying the sundry species who embrace the tenets of the New Republic? Borga loosed a sinister guffaw. Certainly no more than Pedrick Cuff has. After all, Commander, business is business. And if anyone is to profit from the galaxy's new circumstances, it may as well be the huts. So be it, Malik Carr said with finality. 
Borga grinned broadly. One more small item, Commander. Since it would be to our mutual advantage that hot supply ships refrain from unintentionally bumbling into your operations, is it too much to ask that we be advised of any imminent uh, activities? Malik Carr cut his eyes to Nome Anor. Exactly as you predicted. Nome Anor returned a barely perceptible nod. Negotiation is also part of their tradition. You do have a keen eye, Executor. A practiced one, Commander. Borga watched them without comprehending. We were just discussing the terms, Nome Anor explained. Consider our request an accommodation, Borga said offhandedly, a show of confidence. What you ask seems harmless enough, Malik Carr allowed. As you say, Borga, we certainly wouldn't want your spice vessels inadvertently disrupting our activities. As I say, Commander. Until further notice, then, you may want to consider avoiding the Tinani, Bothan, and Karelian systems. Tina, especially so. Borga's broad grin returned with interest. Tina, Bathawi, and Karelia. As it happens, Commander, we do limited business in all of those systems. Malik Carr sniffed arrogantly. I suggest you reduce your business to zero. No sooner had the Yuzhan Vong entourage left the palace than three huts hurried into Borga's court. A young hut, uniformly tan in color, slithered in on his own power. An older one, with a stripe of green pigmentation running down his spine and tapered tail, was borne in on a litter supported by a dozen leathery-skinned weakways and an even more aged one, sporting a wispy gray beard, made use of a hover sled. The latter hut, Pazda Desaligic Tior, uncle of the celebrated Jabba Desaligic Tior, was the first to voice his outrage. Who do they think they are, making demands of the huts, as though we were some trifling species, concerned only with escaping bloodshed? That Malik Kar, he reminded me of the worst of Palpatine's imperial moths. And the one who calls himself Pedrick Cuff was equally treacherous, speaking out of both sides of his mouth. Pazda showed Borga his most austere expression. The Desaligic would never have permitted such indignities to take place in their court. Jabba would have fed Malik Kar and Pedrick Cuff to a rancor and taken his chances with the Yuzhan Vong fleet. Like he took his chances with the Jedi Master Skywalker? The young hut, Rhonda Basadi Diori, remarked. Personally, I always felt that Tatooine's aridity wreaked havoc with Jabba's judgment. Elevating himself on his powerful tail, he nodded at his parent, Borga. You handled them expertly. Impertinent pop, Pazda wheezed. What do you know of judgment or strategy, growing up as you have in wealth and privilege? One thing I know, old hut, is that I will never lose my wealth and privilege, Rhonda told him now. Enough of this, the littered hut. Gardula the Younger chimed in, impaling Rhonda with his gaze. Respect your elders, even when you don't agree with them. He ordered his muscular bearers to steer him closer to Borga, nodding in regard as he neared the chief Basadi's levitated couch. To deceive an enemy, pretend to fear him. The grin Borga had worn for Malik Kar and known Anor had been replaced by a look of narrow-eyed fury. Better to have the Yuzhan Vong overestimate our subservience than our shrewdness. Gardula laughed without mirth. You succeeded in tricking them into revealing their next targets. As I promised you I would. Such intelligence is potentially invaluable. Do we now inform the New Republic of the invaders' designs? Borga shook her head. New Republic intelligence operatives have already been making overtures. Let us wait and see what they bring to the bargaining table. It had better be an offer of great worth, Rhonda said. Gardula ignored the comment. No doubt the Yuzhan Vong will expect us to reveal their plan. No doubt, Borga agreed. That's why we will make no move. The New Republic will have to come to us. She lowered the couch to the floor. 
When Zim the Despot and his droid legions attempted to invade hot space, the great Cossack defeated them at Vantor and sent them fleeing for the Tyan hegemony. And when Moff Sarn Shild attempted to blockade Nal Hutta and destroy our moon, the great clans set aside their differences to manipulate weak Imperials and send their forces fleeing as well. She paused to glance in turn at Pazda, Rhonda, and Gardula the Younger. We have weathered many storms, and we will weather this one as well. With care, we can play the new republic against the invaders for the betterment of the huts. And we won't need a bungled Death Star to do it, Pazda muttered in reference to Durga's failed Darksaber project. Borga glowered at him. Insult my family again, and this court will no longer be available to you. Pazda mustered a chastised look. Excuse the grumbling that comes with advanced age, your highness. Gardula shook with sinister laughter. As my parent used to say, there's always enough to divide, enough to keep, enough to spread around, enough to be stolen. As long as you're first to get to it. Borga laughed with him. For the time being, let the word go out to our subcontractors to exercise caution in their transactions and deliveries. She glanced at Lenik. Who manages our affairs in the targeted systems? The Rodian dipped his head in a curt bow. Boss Bungie oversees shipments to Corellia, Krev Bambasa to Tenna and Bathawi. Borga licked her lips. Inform them to suspend all business to the threatened systems, and to double their efforts elsewhere. She clapped her hands loudly, awakening those sycophants who had dozed off. Let us have music and dancing in celebration of this day. Five. Leia paced from bulkhead to bulkhead in her cramped cabin space aboard the New Republic transport, head moving back and forth, servos whining and whirring. C-3PO tracked her movements, while Olmach and Leia's second bodyguard, Baspa Khan, stood vigilantly to either side of the curved hatch. An illuminated planetary crescent of blue and brown dominated the view from the cabin's transperisteel observation bay. A tone sounded from the communications suite, bringing Leia to a sudden halt. Ambassador, a raspy voice said, we have the Rautiri minister on Channel One. C-3PO pressed a lighted tile on the console, and the head and shoulders of a gray-haired man resolved in life-size hollow. Madam Ambassador, the man said as Leia positioned herself for the visual pickup. To what do I owe this honor? Leia frowned in anger. Don't trifle with me, Minister Shirka. Why have we been refused landing privileges at Gralia Spaceport? Shirka's deeply lined face twitched. I'm sorry, Ambassador. I thought you'd already been informed. Informed of what? The Rao Tiri Secretariat has vetoed the proposal that would have allowed us to accept any displaced peoples. I thought so, Leia fumed. And just what am I supposed to do with six thousand refugees who were promised temporary shelter on Raltir? I'm afraid that's not for me to decide. But the Secretariat agreed to this last week. What could have changed since then? Shirka looked uncomfortable. It's rather complicated, but to be concise, the idea of accepting refugees didn't sit well with several of our more influential off-world investors. That, of course, led to the central banks to pressure the Ministry of Finance, and... I assured you that the New Republic Senate had approved the allocation of funds for Raltier. So you did, Ambassador, but the promised funds have not arrived, and to be frank, there is rampant talk that they never will. As it is, investor confidence has been shaken. And as I'm sure you're aware, what happens on Raltir affects market response all along the Perlemian trade route. Leia folded her arms. This isn't some stock issue, Minister. This is about everyone pulling together to help. What's happening in the mid-rim might not seem of pressing importance here in the core, but you're fooling yourself if you think you can hide from this. Have you already forgotten what the Emperor did when Raltir lent its support to the Alliance? Shirka bristled. Is that meant to be a threat, Ambassador? You misunderstand. 
I'm only suggesting that you consider the heinous actions of Lord Tyen and Governor Denix Graber as prelude to what the Yuzhan Vong are capable of doing, and without provocation. Remember what it was like to be denied relief, minister? Remember what Alderaan risked for Raltir? Shirka worked his jaw. Your mission of mercy at that time has not been forgotten, but then the Alliance did receive something in return. Shirka's allusion was clear. A wounded Imperial soldier Leia rescued had been the first to tell of Palpatine's superweapon, the Death Star. Regardless of who gained what, she said after a moment, is it Raltir's intention to remain neutral in the coming storm, to avoid disturbing the privileged lives of its wealthy residents and investors? Anger mottled Shirka's face. This conversation is over, Ambassador, he said, and terminated the connection. Leia glanced at C-3PO and blew out her breath. Of all the... Ambassador, the same raspy voice interrupted. Governor General Amer Tariq of Rinal on Channel 4. C-3PO pressed another tile, and a miniature image of Tariq rose from the holo projector. Leia, the elder statesman and noted physician, began. I'm so glad to see you safe and sound. Tariq wore an impeccably tailored suit, whose mix of colors was too vivid for the holo. Thank you, Amer. Did you receive my message? I did, Leia, but I'm sorry to report that I don't have encouraging news. Reynold cannot possibly accept additional refugees at this time, even on a temporary basis. Leia was confounded. Amir, if this is about funds... He gave his head a firm shake. Don't confuse Reynold with Raltir, my dear. It's simply that the ten thousand refugees we received from Ord Mantell have strained our resources to the breaking point. Just yesterday we were forced to reroute more than two thousand to the ruin system. Leia's eyebrows went up. Ruin is still accepting exiles? More than accepting, Ruin is actually soliciting. In fact, I'm certain that Ruin would be willing and able to accommodate everyone you evacuated from Gindine. One of a host of agricultural worlds managed by Salish Ag Corporation, Ruin, on the edge of the deep core between Coruscant and the Empress Tata system, was by galactic standards only a short jump away. Let's hope so, Amer, Leia said. My humblest apologies, my dear. The transmission ended abruptly, and Leia collapsed into a chair. She brought her hand to her mouth to stifle a yawn. Maybe I'll get some rest after ruin, she started to tell C-3PO when the calm tone sounded again. Yes, she directed to the audio pickup. A transmission of unknown origin, relayed from Bill Bringy. Leia sighed wearily. What now? I believe it's your husband, Ambassador. A snowy image appeared on the communication console's display screen. Leia recognized the forward cargo hold of the Millennium Falcon, though it took her a moment to recognize Han behind the beard. How do you like my new look? he asked, stroking the salt and pepper growth. Han, where are you? He swiveled the Nava computer chair. I'd rather not say just now. She nodded in a galled but knowing way. How did you know where to find me? I heard about Gendine. Wasn't too difficult after that. You're still well known, whether you like it or not. So are you, Han. And for all anyone knows, the Yuzhan Vong could be hunting for you or the Falcon. Han's brows beetled and his mouth formed a puckered O. I'm not a complete blockhead, you know. That's why I grew the beard and had the Falcon painted. Leia's eyes widened. Painted? Anodized, actually. A lovely shade of matte black. She looks like a mortician's delight. What system are you planning to sneak into this time? Sneak? You heard me. Oh, I get it. You mean maybe instead of frolicking around out here, I should be devoting my time to saving planets? Leia huffed. I'm not interested in saving planets, Han. I'm interested in saving lives. 
Well, what did you think I'm trying to do? This is all about finding Droma's relatives and Roa, Leia. It has nothing to do with Ord Mantell or Gindine or anywhere else. Besides, a man's good for only one promise at a time, and I gave mine to Droma. Leia exhaled slowly. I'm sorry, Han. I understand what you're doing. She smiled thinly. At least we still have something in common. Han averted his gaze momentarily. Speaking of which, was it you who arranged for Ord Mantell's refugees to be transferred to Gindine? Yes, regretfully. Han gave her a lopsided smile. You're complicating my search, sweetheart. Leia's frustration returned. Am I? And who created such a muddle on Vortex that the local governor decided to renege on his promise to accept any refugees whatsoever? I was only trying to... Han's image suddenly tilted to one side, as if the falcon had been stood on end. Hey, Joma, watch what you're doing up there. He turned back to the cam, jerking a thumb in the direction of the falcon's outrigger cockpit. Guy claims to be a pilot, but you never know it by the way he handles a ship. Leia took her lower lip between her teeth in disquiet. "'How are you two getting along?' he snorted. "'If I didn't owe him my life, I'd probably jettison him right here.' "'I'm sure,' Leia said quietly. "'By the way, you might want to pass along to the fleet office "'that a flotilla of Yuzhan Vong ships was spotted near Osarian. "'Couple of destroyer analogs and—' "'Han,' she said, cutting him off. Droma's sister is on Gindine. He sat bolt upright. What? How do you know that? Because some of his clanmates are among the group evacuated from Gindine. There wasn't time to take everyone, and his sister was one of at least six Rin I was forced to leave behind. I didn't know until we'd already transferred everyone to the transports. Why didn't you say so in the first place? Han demanded. "'because there's nothing either of us can do about it. "'Gindine's occupied.' "'There are ways around that,' Han mumbled distractedly. "'Leia compressed her lips. "'You are infuriatingly predictable. "'And you worry too much. "'Someone has to. "'Leia, will you be there for a while, on Raltir?' "'She shook her head. "'We'll be leaving for ruin, if I have any say in the matter. "'Then I'm going to Hapes.' Hapes? Han said in incredulity. And you accuse me of putting myself in the thick of things? Why there of all places? With any luck to enlist the consortium's help. The New Republic fleets are spread too thinly to defend the colonies, let alone the Corps. And now with Bill Bringy, Corellia, perhaps even Bathawi endangered, we need all the support we can rally. Which reminds me, Han, Admiral Sav has asked Anakin to go to Corellia to help in re-enabling Centerpoint Station. He snorted. It's about time the New Republic started considering Corellia's defense. Then you're all right with his going, without either of us? How old were you when you agreed to carry the technical readouts of the Death Star? Which of us is watching over Jaina when she flies with Rogue Squadron? But... Besides, Anakin's a Jedi. I suppose you're right, Leia said, clearly unconvinced. Han smiled ambiguously. Be sure to say hello to Princess Solder for me. Why don't you come with me to Hapes and tell him in person? He laughed at the idea. What? And spoil your fun? What's that supposed to mean? He started to reply, but bit back whatever he had in mind to say, and began again. Is there any hope for the folks you couldn't extract from Gindine? Leia shut her eyes and shook her head. I'm not sure any of them even survived. I am Kainkal, commander of the vessel you find yourselves aboard, the Yuzhan Vong officer announced in expert basic as he meandered slowly among the immobilized and shackled beings captured on Gindine. Slender and of towering height, he wore a turban in which a winged creature was nested, its round black eyes mere centimeters above Kainkal's own, and identical to them. His command cloak, too, had a mind of its own, not so much trailing along the hold's pliant deck as in tow. 
the designs that twined around his forearms were of a decidedly beastly motif, though of a menagerie unknown to any of the captives, and the fingers of his elongated hands sported curving talons. This vessel, which answers to the name Kresh in your traitor's tongue, is to be your world for the foreseeable future. In time, the purpose of its sphere cluster design will be made clear to you. But even while you grapple with its mysteries, I want you to think of it as your home, and of myself and my crew as your parents and teachers. For you, all of you, have been selected from Ord Mantel's and Gindine's defeated multitudes to execute a singular service. Kind Call stopped in front of Worth Skidder, perhaps by chance, though Skidder preferred to think that some of his true nature, a touch of the force, bled through the metal blanket he'd thrown over his identity. Behind the commander walked the tunic-wearing priest who had supervised prisoner selection on Gindine's surface, as well as the immolation of thousands of droids. Skidder and the hundreds of unclothed others in the ship's cavernous organic hold were literally fixed in place by dollops of binding blorash jelly and fettered by the pincers of living creatures. To his right stood an elderly man, clearly a captive of some earlier campaign, made to appear younger than his years by cosmetic treatments. To his left, two of the half-dozen Rin, who had also been selected for a singular service aboard the Yuzhan Vong ship, which from space had resembled a bunch of grapes. Elsewhere were other veteran captives, some left haggard, some strengthened by whatever ordeals they had been put through. You have no doubt heard rumors of what occurred on the worlds you know as Dantooine, Ithor, and Abroa Sky, Kind Kal said, back in motion. And you have no doubt heard rumors about how the Yuzhan Vong treat their prisoners. I can assure you that all you have heard are lies and exaggerations. We are only trying to bring you a truth you sadly overlooked in your climb from the primal muck. Met with resistance, we have been left with no option but to force that truth on you. Met with acceptance, we have been far more charitable than your new republic overseers would have been to us. Because of political affiliations and other alliances, worlds don't often have a choice in whether to accept or decline our offer of enlightenment. The voice of a few decide the destiny of many. But on this vessel, you are individuals first, and each of you has an opportunity to decide for yourself whether to resist or to accept. You have a hand in determining your destiny, in governing your fate. Flanked by well-armed guards and still trailed by the priest, Kind Kal came to a halt alongside a tall statue of a creature that could only have sprung from some Yuzhan Vong bestiary. Its convoluted body might have been modeled on a human brain, and yet the body possessed two large eyes and what appeared to be a mouth or wrinkled maw. Arms or tentacles extended from its base, some stumpy, others gracile. I don't want you to think of yourselves as captives or slaves, but rather as collaborators in a grand enterprise, the commander continued. Serve me well, put your hearts into your work, and you will be rewarded with your lives. Fail me out of weakness, and I may be willing to forgive. But fail me with design, and punishment will be meted out swiftly and without mercy. In either case, I will be rewarded by the gods, though I'll be forced to look elsewhere for collaborators. Skidder cut his eyes to the man beside him. How long have you been aboard? he asked out of the corner of his mouth. Losing track, the captive answered in a low voice, A couple of standard months. With subtle movement of his chin, he indicated the emaciated man to his right. My friend and I were captured on the Jubilee Wheel at Ord Mantell. Got sucked out of the facility by some kind of space worm. First we were taken aboard a slave galley. Thought for a while we were going to be launched into a star and sacrificed. Then we were transferred to this vessel. The man shot Skidder a glance. You? Captured on Gindine. Soldier? Indigenous ground force. The man turned ever so slightly in Skidder's direction. But you're not native to Gindine. From the core, I'd say. On what basis? Hairstyle, for one thing. The way you carry yourself. 
Intrusion specialist? Intelligence officer? Neither. The man glanced downward. Those aren't the feet of an infantry soldier. I didn't say I was. Operated an ATSAT scout. The man nodded. Okay, have it your way. What's your name? Skidder asked. Roa? My friend is Fosco. You? Kane. Any idea where we're headed, Roa? None. What about this singular service? Roa snorted softly. You'll see soon enough, Kane. Kine Kahl's preamble had resumed. It's time you had a look at the centerpiece of our endeavor, he was saying. Think of it for the moment as a work in progress, but one that all of you will help to complete. Behind the commander rose a membranous partition, beyond which, Skidder was certain, lay the nucleus of the ship. When Kine Kahl turned, the membrane parted like a stage curtain. Though Skidder had never seen one in the flesh, he knew immediately that he was gazing at the living model for the statue that adorned the hold. A maturing war coordinator, the grotesque biogenetic creature the Yuzhan Vong called a Yamask. 6. A cool mist obscured the flowering crowns of Yavin 4's tallest trees. The steep stairways of the ancient temples the Rebel Alliance had claimed so many years before, and that had since become a training ground for the Jedi Knights, climbed into the mist and vanished. Chuck Lux and Chitter Webs, ordinarily raucous at that time of the morning, perched on the low branches of Masasi trees, waiting for the sky to clear. Stinger lizards and stinteril rodents sat motionless as statues. Even the gas giant Yavin was not to be seen, though it backlighted the mist a deep orange color. Stopped in a pathway that meandered to the great temple, Luke Skywalker drank in the stillness. The force, ordinarily lucid, seemed blanketed by the mist as well, and could manage little more than a whisper. Somewhere in the ghostly, virid surroundings, a belly bird cooed. But Luke knew that what struck his ear as melodic was only the bird proclaiming its territory, warning others away. He listened more intently, catching the sounds of creatures foraging or on the hunt for food. It was the way of the Force that some should survive and others perish. Death without malicious intent, for nature didn't have a dark side. One couldn't compare the crystal snake's search for prey with what the Emperor had done during his cruel reign and what the Yuzhan Vong were doing now. But Luke had been asking himself, almost since the start of the invasion, how did life reveal itself to Yuzhan Vong eyes and ears? He stared into the mist. It was as if someone had thrown a gauzy veil over his eyes. Images came to him of insects disguising themselves as leaves, twigs, and flower blossoms, and of small animals mimicking the variegated litter of the forest floor. Camouflage, Luke thought. Deception, stealth, misdirection. The Yuzhan Vong had swept into the galaxy like one of the unpredictable storms that blew across Yavin 4. Their faith in their gods was like Palpatine's faith in the dark side of the Force, and yet for all the evil they embodied, they were not Sith. They were not emissaries of the dark side. Blind obedience provided justification for even their most hideous actions. What made them servants of evil was not their faith, but their need to force that faith on others and to destroy wantonly any who stood in their path. They failed to recognize light or dark because in some sense they saw existence as an illusion. Lacking any intrinsic value, life was to be lived in service to the gods, and the reward for that service waited in a life beyond. When Luke or other Jedi had tried to peer into them, the Yuzhan Vong had been found to be voids in the Force, absent the animated luminosity that embraced all living things. But if the Force did not flow through them, was it possible that the Force was likewise non-existent in the galaxy in which they had evolved? Could the Force be specific to one place and not another, as if the result of an evolutionary occurrence unique in the universe? 
Or was it rather that the force was lacking only in the Yuzhan Vong, and in their living weapons, of course, which were little more than extensions of themselves? In all likelihood, Mara had fallen victim to one of those weapons, an illness the Yuzhan Vong had introduced, and while her strength in the force had held the illness in check, where it had overwhelmed others, Luke wasn't absolutely certain that the force would have been the ultimate victor in Mara's battle. Not when her recent return to better health owed to an antidote introduced indirectly by the Yuzhan Vong. Deception, stealth, misdirection. For all his intense curiosity, Luke understood that it was imperative that the invaders be defeated. If defeat could be accomplished short of exterminating the Yuzhan Vong, so much the better, for then some of his questions might one day be answered. But until such time, the Jedi were obligated to aid and abet in the war that had been thrust upon the galaxy. How best to execute the Jedi obligation to peace and justice was an issue he was still grappling with. The cryptic murmuring of the Force returned him to the moment. He recognized that his visitor had ceased talking some time ago, and he swung to face him now. "'I'm sorry, Talon, you were saying?' Talon Card smiled faintly, but instead of picking up where he'd left off, he smoothed the ends of his dark mustache and continued to observe the Jedi Master with candid interest. "'You know, Luke,' I can't tell you how often I've wondered what the universe looks like through the eyes of a Jedi. I used to tell myself that you weren't all that different from a Hakig priest or an Ithorian who had heard the call. Only instead of revering Hakig or nature, you looked to the Force. But the comparisons never held up. You see things the rest of us don't see, or can't see, and those things aren't just the products of a mindset the Jedi have cultivated as a separate reality. You see into the heart of reality, and that ability informs your actions. Card's blue eyes sparkled. I've seen you make decisions I couldn't fathom at the time, but later turned out to be the right decisions. I used to watch Mara do the same thing. And as someone who has always prided himself on making use of privileged information, I had to ask myself whether those decisions were based solely on data I didn't have access to, or if the Force gave you the ability to tug reality this way or that as needed, as required by your visions. I sense the latter's true with you, but I'm not sure if it applies to Mara. Card uttered a short laugh. I'm sorry I never knew you when you were fresh off Tatooine, before you turned into a deep thinker. I'm not saying that Mara isn't a deep thinker, but the Force seems to compel her to act more on intuition than deliberation. Ceremoniously, Luke lowered the cowl of his Jedi robe. Mara and I are different but complementary, in the same way Anakin and Jason are. There are different aspects to the Force, and not all Jedi focus on the same one. My masters admonished me for always looking toward the future without really seeing it. Could your father see the future? Talon asked carefully. My father was not the seer, but the lens. Luke grew introspective for a moment, then smiled enigmatically. By the way, if Mara had known you were coming to Yavin 4 she would have postponed her visit to Coruscant. Another evaluation? On the contrary, she refuses to be scanned, examined, or evaluated by anyone. Then it actually cured her, this magic elixir Solo was given? Not an elixir. Tears. And no one will use the word cure, even Mara. I urged her to hold off on taking the antidote until we could be sure it wasn't potentially dangerous, but she refused. She insisted on taking the risk. Talon nodded. Her intuition. But you're not convinced? Luke gazed at the jungle. The Yuzhan Vong priestess who claimed she wanted political asylum was a weapon sent to assassinate as many Jedi as she could gather. The being who traveled with her, Vergeer, was not Yuzhan Vong, but that doesn't mean she wasn't serving their interests. The elixir could have been part of the plot, Talon said. The Yuzhan Vaughn could have wanted to make it appear this Vergeer was on our side to erase doubts about the substance she gave Han. 
Luke said nothing. But Myra's better. Healthier than she's been in almost a year, Luke admitted. Joyous, as I am. If she does slide, if the effect turns out to be temporary, whatever is contained in Vergeer's tears can't be replicated. The chemical action is as puzzling as anything we've seen from the Yuzhan Vong. We can only hope the effect is permanent. Card considered it. You know I'd do anything to help Mara. I'll track down Vergeer. I'll wring more tears out of her if I have to. Luke smiled. I appreciate that, Talon. I'll tell Mara you said so, though I suspect she already knows. They resumed their walk to the great temple. Off to one side of the path, a dozen young Jedi, varying in age from four to twelve, were watching Tion and Cam Salusar demonstrate a force technique. Luke paused to observe one of the older children. Tahiri, attempt to mimic one of Cam's manipulations. Yavin 4 has remained undetected, but with the Yuzhan Vong as close as Abroa Sky, we may be forced to remove everyone to safer surroundings. I'm surprised they haven't targeted Yavin already. Luke turned to him. We're projecting an illusion, something I learned from the Falanasi. Talon's eyes narrowed in revelation. So that's why you insisted on guiding me into the Yavin system. Your eyes would have contradicted what your ship's instruments were telling you. Talon put his tongue in his cheek and laughed. If I'd had a line on that technique, I wouldn't have had to base out of Mirker, where the trees had a way of tricking scanners. He grinned broadly. But, of course, you remember that. Yes, Luke said flatly. And even then, Grand Admiral Thrawn found you out. As Jedi commitment to the conflict increases, there won't be enough of us here to maintain the illusion. The children will have to be sent elsewhere. Talon glanced at the kids. Let me know if you ever need help with that. I will. They hadn't gone another ten paces when Card asked, Is it true a Jedi died on Gindine? You're referring to Worth Skitter, Luke said. But we don't know for certain that he's dead. Leia was there to the end. She insists that Worth deliberately remained behind. To allow himself to be captured? Perhaps to go undercover on Gindine. Card shook his head. I don't know, Skitter, but I've heard rumors. Is he the person for the job? He's skillful. Skill's good, but is he lucky? Luke didn't answer the question. Just now, like so many of us who have lost friends and family, he's driven by vengeance. He was close friends with both Nico Reglia and De Sharakor. Well, there's nothing wrong with being motivated by vengeance if it gets you results. Luke's expression said otherwise. Wrong? Let's just say that we don't see the world in precisely the same way. They continued walking. Over the cascading sounds of the river that flowed past the great temple came voices raised in impassioned debate or argument. Sounds like there's some division in the ranks, Talon remarked as they neared the temple's common room. That would be Jason and Anakin. Complimenting one another, no doubt. Jaina, with arms outstretched, was positioned between her brothers when Luke and Card entered the dimly lighted space. A handful of other Jedi, including Kip Duran, Ganner Rysod, Streen, Lobaka, Kenth Hamner, and Kilgal looked on. Sensing Luke, R2-D2 began to bounce from foot to foot, churring and warbling. They were just... Discussing Anakin's invitation to visit Centerpoint Station, Jaina explained. Luke glanced from Jason to Anakin and back again. Finished the discussion. Jason scowled at his younger brother. I'll say it once more, then I'm done with it. Centerpoint is this. He grasped the hilt of the lightsaber that hung from his belt on a gargantuan scale. Assuming the station can even be made operational, it should be used only for defense. Anakin exhaled wearily. And I'll say this one last time. I completely agree. Then keep away from Corellia, Jason said. Don't have anything to do with enabling Centerpoint or any of the hyperspace repulsors. 
You were a kid the first time. We all were. You didn't know any better. Anakin snorted. You're leaving out that my ignorant actions ended up foiling the Triad's plans to detonate another star and annihilate every ship the Bakarans sent against them. That was defensive. Your tinkering with the repulsor on Drahl prevented Centerpoint from firing. Tinkering, Anakin repeated, snickering. Let me ask you something. Are you against Jaina flying with Rogue Squadron? Jason glanced at his twin sister, who was on temporary leave from the squadron she had joined only four months earlier. Not in theory. Are you against Mom and Tenel Ka going to Hapes? Not in principle. Not in principle. The New Republic is hoping to bring the consortium into the war. If you think of Rogue Squadron or the Hapens as weapons, an extension of that, Anakin said, gesturing to Jason's lightsaber, then what's the difference between what Jaina or Mom are being asked to do and what I've been asked to do at Corellia? I said I'd help enable the station. I didn't say anything about firing it. Jason made an exasperated sound and swung to Luke. Where do you stand on this, Uncle Luke? Luke folded his arms. As I told the Defense Force command staff, I'm opposed to re-enabling Centerpoint on the grounds that its power is too unmanageable. And you all know that I was against Deshara Corps' attempts to resurrect another Eye of Palpatine. But if there's even a chance that Centerpoint Station can be used to defend Corellia and spare the fleets for service elsewhere, we're obliged to do what we can to help make it operational. Jason pressed his lips together and swung back to his brother. All right, Anakin, have it your way, but I'm going with you. Anakin shrugged. Glad to have you along. The debate decided for the moment, the teens settled down, and everyone gradually formed a loose circle around Luke and Card. Talon has a proposition for us, Luke said. I haven't heard it yet, but knowing him as I do, I'm sure it will be interesting. Or at least entertaining, Kip Doron mumbled, drawing laughs. Card took the jesting in stride. As I'm sure you know, the Huts have struck some sort of bargain with the Yuzhan Vong. By bargain, I mean just that, since the Huts would sooner go to war than roll over for an enemy, no matter how commanding. So it stands to reason that in exchange for allowing the Yuzhan Vong into their space, the Huts asked for and got something in return. To figure out what that is, all anyone needs to do is follow the spice. Card paused briefly. I've been doing just that, and I haven't noticed any signs of interruption in the flow of spice, except in three systems, Tenna, Bathawi, and Corellia. He waited until the murmuring died down before continuing. The huts wouldn't suddenly cease deliveries to three profitable sectors unless there was good reason to avoid them. I'm willing to bet that the reason has to do with intelligence the Yuzhan Vong provided as their part of the deal, namely that those systems have been targeted for invasion. The fact that no one has moved in to pick up the slack suggests that the Huts have advised all their partners and subcontractors to steer a wide berth around Tenna, Bathawi, and Corellia. But even this doesn't add up to a case good enough to present to the New Republic. To do that would require proof positive that avoiding those worlds isn't just the result of the Huts speculating about where the Yuzhan Vong will strike. Why not approach the Huts and ask them directly? Kent Hamner asked. Tall and well-born, Hamner had been a Defense Force colonel before resigning from military life to follow the Jedi way. Easier said than done, Card said, and in fact, the New Republic is trying to do just that. But if someone outside the military could furnish corroborating evidence, the Defense Force would have what they need to catch the Yuzhan Vong completely by surprise. Why do you come to us with this? Streen asked. You've been liaison between the Imperial Remnant and the New Republic since the peace accord. You certainly don't need us to get the attention of Admiral Sav. I know why he's come to us, Kip Duran said, keeping his eyes on card. Because the New Republic left him out of the loop when they asked Leia to approach the Imperial Remnant about joining the fight. Card snorted. 
It wasn't my place to approach the remnant assembly. I'm a broker, Kip, not an ambassador. Then what makes you think it's your place to approach us? Kip retorted. The fact is, I don't know who else to trust with this. Judging by the way New Republic intelligence handled that bogus Yuzhan Vong defector, I'd venture to say that the intelligence division, maybe even the advisory council itself, has been infiltrated. What's more, the defense force can't act without the approval of the Senate, and the Security and Intelligence Council isn't likely to back Admiral Saab on the word of an ex-smuggler. You still haven't clarified why you need us, Ulaha said. Abith, she was delicate-looking and musically gifted. After Ithor, we're hardly in good stead with the Senate ourselves. That's the point. You need to get them listening to you again. You'd think they would have learned their lesson from Ithor, but old habits die hard and they're still reluctant to trust you. They don't want to be perceived as indebted to the Jedi. It smacks of old Republic thinking. Ganner grimaced, wrinkling the facial scar he had incurred at Garky. It warms my heart to see that you're thinking about us, Card, but the Jedi don't need a public relations person. You're wrong, Ganner. You're too trusting. Anti-Jedi sentiment is spreading. Some folks think you're holding back. Others think you're incompetent. A lot of people wish that Emperor Palpatine was still around, because they feel he'd know how to deal with the Yuzhan Vong. If you want to go back to being monks, that's your choice. But if you want to serve peace and justice, you need to smarten your image. And one way to do that would be to provide intelligence that ends up giving the New Republic a major victory. The best defense against treachery is treachery. What role could we play in this? Jason asked impatiently. Talon looked at him. I can facilitate a meeting with one of the hut's spice smugglers. We can find out for ourselves why no one is willing to deliver to Tina and the rest. Jason rolled his eyes. This is center point all over again. He glanced at Luke. The Jedi shouldn't have any part in this. It demeans us. It doesn't demean anyone, Anakin argued. We can help without having to raise a hand or a lightsaber. You, if anybody, should be in favor of that. Everyone looked to Luke. Images came to him of insects disguising themselves as leaves, twigs, and flower blossoms, and of small animals mimicking the variegated litter of the forest floor. The Force whispered to him once more, Deception, stealth, misdirection. He realized that he needed to tread carefully, for fear of dividing the Jedi further. Where many lauded Corin Horn's individual actions at Ithor, others favored Kip Duran's stance that aggression should be answered by aggression. What's more, at Ithor, Luke had renounced responsibility for spearheading the Jedi Knights. I'm not interested in repairing our tarnished image, he said at last. The New Republic isn't eager to sanction our actions in any case. But if we can help provide information that will prevent the fall of another world... The choice is clear. I'm willing to go with Talon, Jaina said. Kip made a face. A seventeen-year-old spice buyer? I doubt the Hutt's people will buy it. He looked back at Card. I'll go. You'll need someone to sort the truth from the lies. Unlikely, Card said, but I appreciate the offer. Then count me in as well, Ganner said. He glanced at Kip. Just to be certain, we're getting the full truth. Card glanced around him. It's settled then. Only Jason remained unconvinced. Center point. Enlistment. Espionage. I never thought we'd come to this. Kip Duran grinned and clapped him hard on the shoulder. Cheer up, kid. Things are bad all over. Seven. The sign hovering between formidable guard towers read, Welcome to Ruin Refugee Facility 17. But just below the greeting, someone had scrawled, in a tiny, almost undetectable hand, Last chance to turn back. 
crushed in among the rerouted mixed species, thousands offloaded from the transport ships, and still wet and possibly poisoned from ruins cursory decontamination process, Melisma read the sign aloud and aimed a worried glance at Gaff, who had Droma's nephew balanced atop one of his shoulders. Last chance to turn back? Someone's idea of a joke, Gaff said in dismissal. Come, child, how bad can it be? We have pleasing countryside all around, fresh air in place of scrubbed oxygen, the promise of food and drink, ten thousand melancholy sentients for company. He grinned and lowered his voice to add, And where there are melancholy sentients, there are opportunities galore for the wren. Melisma smiled uncertainly, though what Gaff said about the surroundings was undeniably true. For ruin was nothing, if not one of the Corps' beauty marks. One of eighteen agricultural worlds administered by Salish Ag, ruin, or at least that part of the planet the refugees had been delivered to, had the manicured look of a park. The undeviating road that linked the planet's bustling spaceport to Refugee Facility 17 was bordered by tall topiary hedges, and beyond those hedges... As far as the eye could see, stretched scrupulously maintained fields of crops, in varying states of maturation. Unlike Oran Three, Yukio, Tanab, and most of the other breadbasket worlds on which the Wren had sought employment from time to time, Ruin did not merely rely on axial tilt and fertile soil, but was climate controlled and ag reformed to maximize output. Also, there were far fewer harvester droids, agrobots, and work droids than Melisma had expected to see, which meant more occupational opportunities for sentience. She breathed deeply of the sweet air. Gaff was right. Arriving on ruin, especially after spending more than a standard week in the cramped and fetid living conditions aboard the transport, was like being delivered to paradise itself. But vague concerns continued to rankle her. How long would they be required to remain on ruin, and where would they end up afterwards? Princess Leia had made it clear that their stay on ruin would be temporary. But with the Yuzhan Vong already in the expansion region, how long before they carry their invasion into the core, and what then? Processing the newly arrived exiles was a painfully tedious business. With everyone pressed so tightly together, there was nowhere to sit, much less recline, and no escape from the potent sunshine that climate supervision had apparently ordered for the day. The crowd seemed to extend endlessly to the front and rear. But at last the five of them, Gaff, Melisma, her two female clan cousins, and the infant, reached a processing checkpoint attended by armed security guards sporting Salish Ag arm badges. A human male with a scarred jaw appraised them from the window of the checkpoint booth. "'What in the galaxy are these?' he asked someone out of view. Instantly, a no less sinister-looking uniformed female appeared at the window and aimed a spherically shaped optical scanner directly at Melisma. "'Could take the system a moment to recognize them,' she told the first guard. When the scanner emitted a single tone, she glanced at its display screen. "'Ren!' Wren? What rock are they from? The woman shook her head. Planet of origin unknown. But what's the difference? They arrived from Gindine. See if we've got any more like them. Melisma's misgivings returned. Selcor advocates and ruin officials at the spaceport had been cordial and accommodating, but these guards, both in their bearing and manner of dress brought to mind the Espas who, years back, had policed many of the corporate sector worlds. "'Yeah, we actually do have some others,' the first guard was saying. Thirty-two at last count.' He sneered down at Gaff. "'Sec 465, Wren, behind the communal refreshers.' Gaff heard Melisma's sharp intake of breath and turned to her. "'All right, so forget what I said about fresh air.' We'll still have food and drink to slack our appetites and a roof over our heads. We could have all that in jail, Melisma groused. Gaff wagged his forefinger. Trust me, child, jail is no place for the Rin. Here at least we'll be able to sing and dance and revel in our good fortune. Follow the droid, the guard barked, and no lingering or wandering off, 
or you'll have me to answer to. Ah, good fortune, Melisma said sarcastically. Let's just hope for a roof, Gaff. The droid, a squeaking, limping protocol model, ushered them into a warren of ramshackle dwellings slapped together from aged harvester and spaceship parts. Bulkhead hatchways, harvester blades, foils, and the like. Elsewhere were prefabricated duraplast huts anchored to slabs of ferrocrete, tents and A-frames, primitive lean-tos, self-standing blister shelters, elliptical huts sided with animal hide, and conical ones wrapped in lubricant-stained tarpaulins. Facility 17 was built on the site of a former junkyard, the droid said proudly. Everyone has been very inventive in the use of obsolete equipment. In unlighted interiors or on muddy ground or patches of lifeless trampled grass sat species native to sectors as remote as the imperial remnant and as close as the Kornacht cluster, all uprooted from the worlds they had called home, some of which the Yuzhan Vong had rendered uninhabitable or destroyed outright. In a half-circle scan, Melisma's eye fell on Rurians, Gans, Sahilandili, Bims, Weequays, Minirshi, Tamerians, Gotals, and Wookies. Absent, though, was any indication of fellowship. In its place, a sense of impending riot tainted the air. Beings glowered at one another or stood sullenly with jaws clenched and hands balled into fists. As if reading her concerns, the protocol droid provided commentary in basic. With everyone crammed together without regard to differences and distinctions, some suppressed prejudices and hostilities have on occasion boiled to the fore, resulting in contentious seizures of territory or sustenance, or melees that have spread throughout the facility. But, of course, those incidents were quickly quelled by Salish Ag's well-trained staff, who employ physical force only when absolutely necessary. As had happened on the transport, the Rin met with looks of suspicion and repugnance from all sides. Fathers safeguarded family valuables, and mothers gathered children within arm's reach. Some made religious gestures of self-protection, and others voiced outrage that Rin had even been allowed into the camp. Melisma stared straight ahead. She was accustomed to such treatment, and she understood that the Rin's penchant for wanderlust and secrecy was at least partly responsible for the fictions that had grown up around them. Ostracized by many societies, the Rin had grown only more transient, secretive, and self-sufficient over time. And as outsiders, they had become keen observers of the behaviors of other species. Second guessers of what many beings, humans especially, often had in mind to say. And so their fondness for song, dance, and spicy foods, and their adeptness at forgery and fortune telling, lacking any true psychic abilities. The gambling game that had come to be known as Sabak had its roots in a deck of cards the Rin had invented as a means of disguising their mystical doctrines. We're now approaching the distribution center, the droid announced. I wondered what that smell was, Melisma said to Gaff, who chided her for being overly critical, only to change his tune when they got a good look at the situation. Cued sinuously at makeshift stalls, hundreds of beings were waiting to receive squirts of an off-color, paste-like synth food squeezed by droids from enormous pliant containers. Other lines, snaked to the patched-up hulls of vintage riverboats, filled to the gunnels with foam-covered water. For paltry sums, the droid remarked, many of Salish Ag's well-trained staff will gladly provide foodstuffs to please the most discriminating palates. Superior housing can also be secured for reasonable fees, as evidenced atop Noob Hill. Melisma followed the droid's metal finger to a parcel of high ground, surrounded by stun fencing. Isolated from the rest of the facility, twenty or so Ithorians could be seen going about their business in open-sided, thatch-roofed pavilions. To one side, deep drainage ditches separated them from a waddle of Gamorians, who were living in bungalows made of sun-baked bricks. To the other side, beyond a wall of thorned shrubs, a rumpus of Wookiees had constructed a log tree house. 
Deeper in the camp, things were even worse. The mud that had been a nuisance earlier on became ankle-deep for long stretches, and the shelters, a ghetto of unroofed sheds and slat-sided shanties, clustered at the base of a hill that saw scant sunlight and funneled runoff rainwater directly into the food distribution area. In place of prefab tents and blister huts stood hovels more suitable for livestock than sentience. Here a trove of resourceful hollow-boned vores had made use of starship maneuvering vanes to construct a kind of stilted bower for themselves. And there a nest of Batrachian ribet had fashioned a spacious hutch from empty cargo crates and support pylons off Y-wing engine nacelles. Nearly everyone else was living in filth. A new stench in the air told Melisma that they were nearing the communal refreshers. Maybe it's only when there's no wind, Gaff remarked. Then maybe we should petition climate supervision to whip up a hurricane, Melisma said from behind the hand she'd clamped over her mouth. As promised, just past the refreshers was section 465, announced by a sign to which someone had added the words, Rin City. More than half the thirty-two were on hand to greet Gaff and Melisma's quintet as they trudged into a courtyard that might have struck some as uncommonly sanitary, but was in fact normal for the Wren, who were by nature almost ritualistic about order and cleanliness. The leader among the ensconced group, a tall male named Ravana, welcomed them with bowls of tasty Wren food and a slew of questions about the circumstances that had brought them to ruin. Gaff started at the very beginning, explaining how they had just fled the corporate sector when their caravan of ships had been set upon by a Yuzhan Vong patrol. Scattered far and wide as a result of emergency hyperspace jumps, many had ended up at Ord Mantell's Jubilee Wheel, where they had been caught up in another Yuzhan Vong attack. Refugees by then, some had found transport to Bill Bringy, others to Rennell, and still others to Gindine. Then Ravana told his story, which, while it began in the Tyan hegemony, had much in common with Gaff's tale of woe. One of the women showed Melisma and her cousins to a dormitory. Leaving the infant in the care of her cousins, Melisma rejoined Gaff and Ravana, who was in the midst of painting a vivid picture of life in Facility 17. The water is rarely a problem. Our overseers simply create rainstorms as needed. Food shortages have begun to occur on a regular basis, and disease is rampant. The diseases could easily be eradicated, of course, and ruin is capable of supplying all the food needed just from what the labor droids allow to rot in or on the ground. But it's to Salish Ag's advantage that everyone in camp remain as miserable as possible. How is that to Salish's advantage? Melisma asked. And why would Princess Leia praise the company for its unconditional generosity if we're a burden to everyone? Salish is desirous of refugees, child, but not for the camps. They want us in the fields. As workers? Of a sort. Ravana paused to tap a wad of charred tobacco from the bowl of a hand-carved pipe. The New Republic is genuinely committed to relocating everyone to populous worlds. But with the war and all, the chances of relocation are slim, even though you won't hear mention of this in the familiarization classes. Familiarization, Melisma said. For what? Why, to prepare us for our new lives among the civilized peoples of the core. You'll soon see for yourself. But as I say, chances are slim. Some of those living on Noob Hill can afford to purchase forward passage with private transport companies. But not everyone is so fortunate. In any event, no one wants to be here any longer than necessary. So many have accepted offers by Salish Ag to work their way off ruin. In the fields, Gaff said. Ravana nodded. Except that very few manage to earn enough to purchase onward passage. Most of the camp's earliest arrivals have been forced into indentured servitude here on ruin or on other Salish-administered worlds, and rumors persist that those who refuse Salish's benevolence often disappear. But it makes no sense, Melisma said. Sentience will never replace droids as workers. 
Sentients need more than the occasional oil bath and data upgrades, not to mention that production would be drastically reduced. Ravana showed her a patient smile. I said as much to a Salish representative who visited Rin City only last week, and do you know what he told me? That the hiring of sentients not only eases the refugee problem, but allows the company to advertise its products as retaining hand-picked freshness. Gaff mulled it over for a moment. So our options, for the moment, are either to go to work for Salish Ag, or remain mired here. Melisma glanced around the courtyard and at the masterfully built dormitories and kitchens. How have you managed to do so well? Walking through the camp, I was afraid we were going to be attacked and killed. If folks could find a way, I'm sure they'd hold us accountable for the Yuzhan Vong invasion. Ravana smiled sadly. Life has always been thus for the Rin, but not everyone fears or distrusts us. It's thanks to those few that we've done so well. Charity? Bite your tongue, child, Gaff said theatrically. The Wren do not accept charity. We work for all we get. Melisma looked at Ravana. What sort of work can we do here? The sort we're best at, apprising people of their options, allowing them to see the error of their ways, providing them with helpful tips to see them through the complexities of daily life. Telling fortunes, Melisma said, mildly disdainful. Reading Sabak cards. Gaff was grinning broadly. Singing, dancing, the rewards that come to those who dispense good advice. Life could be worse, child. Life could be much worse. Aren't you the one who said that help had arrived? The red-maned wren named Safa asked Worth Skitter aboard the slave ship Crash. I might have said something to that effect, the Jedi was willing to concede. Heat of the moment and all that. Roa regarded Skidder with interest, then glanced past him at Safa. When was this? On Gindine, she told him, when he rushed to be captured by the multi-legged creature that was hurting us together. He said, take heart, help has arrived. Roa looked at Skidder once more. He rushed? Safa shrugged. It looked that way from where I stood. Side by side, the three of them were standing to their waists in the viscous, sorrel-colored nutrient in which the young Yamask marinated like an excised brain in an autopsy pan. The cloying odor, like garlic roses bathed in Nalora perfume, had taken some getting used to, but by now almost all the captives were beyond the retching stage, though a male Sullustan had fainted moments earlier and had had to be carried out. One of the more gracile of the creature's manifold tentacles floated in front of Skidder and his comrades, and their hands were busy massaging and caressing it, the way the Bims did with certain breeds of nerf to assure stakes of extraordinary tenderness. Roa's worrisomely Juan, Pal, Fosco, and two Wren were doing the same to the other side of the tentacle. The arrangement of six to a tentacle was repeated throughout the circular basin, except at the Yamisk's shorter, thicker members, where two or three captives sufficed. He rushed, Roa said, more to himself this time. Then he fixed Skidder with a gimlet stare. Safa almost makes it sound like you wanted to be captured, Kane. To wind up here, Skidder said, a guy would have to be either deranged or dauntless. Smile lines formed at the corners of Roa's eyes. I've known a few in my day who were both. I can't put my finger on it, but something tells me you fit the bill. Two hose-thick, pulsating ducts projected from the Yamask's bulbous head to disappear into the arching, membranous ceiling of the hold. Skidder assumed that at least one of them furnished the creature with a required mix of respiratory gases, though Kind Kyle assured that Yamisks became oxygen breathers as they matured into actual war coordinators. At the moment, the cluster ship's commander was completing a circle on the grated walkway that ran around the lip of the Yorick Coral Basin. 
concentric to the basin stood a company of lightly armed guards. For all the revulsion it seems to invoke in some of you, the Yamask is an extremely sensitive creature, he was saying. One effect of its powerful desire to bond is empathy of a high order, which later culminates as telepathy of a sort. As part of its early training, the Yamask is conditioned to regard select Dovin basils as its children, its brood. The same Dovin basils that provide thrust for our starships and the single pilot craft the New Republic military refers to as coral skippers. When, then, we enter into engagements with the forces of your worlds, the Yamask sees its children as threatened and attempts to coordinate their activities to minimize loss. Kynkal came to a halt close to where Skidder and the others stood and gestured to the ceiling. The darker blue of the throbbing arteries that enter the Yamask just above the eyes is linked even now to the drive of this ship because the Yamask is still in the process of familiarizing itself with the Dovin basil. The kinder you are to the Yamask, the more affection you show for it, the better you make it feel, the better its link with the Dovin basil, and the better the ship performs. The commander pivoted to face one of the membranous walls. In a blister visible to all the captives sat a pulsing heart-shaped organism. Here you see a small Dovin basil. Approximate in size to the ones housed in the noses of the coral skippers. Its color indicates how well you are succeeding at your task. And its current pale red tells me that you are doing reasonably well, but not as well as you might. So what we're going to do is increase the pace of our strokings in time with the count provided by the Dovin basil. If we're successful, the ship will respond in turn. So let us begin. Skitter braced himself. It wasn't so much that the handwork itself was fatiguing, but intense and constant tactile contact with the tentacles quickly left everyone exhausted, almost as if the Yamask was feeding off the captive's expended energy to somehow enhance itself. It was easy enough to refuse participation, but holding back led only to someone being singled out and punished. As the Dovin basil began to pulse more rapidly, the captives increased the speed and force of the strokings and kneadings, struggling to find a rhythm. The pulses grew even more rapid. The manipulations grew more urgent and frantic. The count quickened once more. Many of the captives were breathing hard, some of them wheezing. Rills of sweat coursed down faces and arms. Those who couldn't sustain the pace collapsed, doubled over atop their assigned tentacles, or slid down into the gluey nutrient. But the rest had found a collective beat the Yamask responded to by sending ripples down its tentacles. Skidder could almost feel the cluster ship surge. Then the Dovin basil slowed and gradually returned to a gentle pulsing. Good, Commander Kind Call said at last. Very good. Skidder swallowed hard and calmed himself. Safa and Roa were panting, and Fosco looked delirious. Kynkal began another circuit of the organic walkway. As some of you have already learned, battle coordination is only one of the Yamisk's talents. When I told you earlier that its empathy bordered on telepathy, I was not overstating things. Also, as part of its training, the young Yamisk is conditioned to establish a cognitive rapport with the commander in whose custody the Yamask will serve. In fact, this Yamask and myself are already on familiar terms. But we're going to attempt something that has never been done, the truly extraordinary part of this joint endeavor. We wish the Yamask to become familiar with you, with all of you, so that we might bring this invasion to a speedy and relatively painless conclusion. Skidder glanced at Roa. Did you know about this? The old man returned a grim nod. As the Yamas becomes more accustomed to your touch, Kind Kal was saying, it may wish to touch you back, especially on the chest, upper back, neck, and face. You will allow it to do so. It may take no interest in some of you. With others it may find a deep affinity. In either case, I caution you not to resist its telepathic probes. 
for you risk injuring yourself as much as the Yamisk. Resistance could very well result in madness or death. Laugh, cry, scream if you must, but do not resist. He's not kidding, Roa said with sudden solemnity. He looked intently at Safa, then Skitter. Try to keep your mind blank, otherwise it will pursue your thoughts like a predator chasing the first meal of the day. That's where you can lose your way. Believe me, I've seen it happen more than once. Skitter had been doing his best to hide his Jedi-ness, his strength in the Force, the events that had motivated him to be captured, his wish to avenge his fallen comrades. Faced with Kind Call's revelation, however, he suddenly couldn't help but recall what Danny Quee had told him of the way the Yuzhan Vong had used a Yamisk to break Miko. Nor could he suppress his urgency to make contact with his fellow Jedi and apprise them of the enemy's latest plan. He turned slightly to gaze at the Yamisk's eyes, and those ink-black organs seemed to gaze back at him. The tentacle beneath his hands rippled, and its blunt tip rose from the nutrient to wrap around Skidder's shoulders. Roa, Safa, and the others fell back in surprise. "'Why, Cain, you fortunate soul,' Roa said after a moment. "'I do believe the Yamisk has taken a liking to you.'" Eight. From the rear of Laurel Hall on Hapes, Leia was a bright white speck against the blue-black of the night sky, visible through the towering panoramic windows at her back. Rising at a sharp angle from the ramparts of the sandstone bluff that dominated the capital city, the assembly hall enjoyed a breathtaking view of the transitory mists and, just now, four of the planet's seven moons. So seamless was the illusion that people seated in the lower-tier seats might have easily imagined themselves aboard a space vessel advancing on the star that was Ambassador Organa Solo. Esteemed representatives of the Hapes Consortium of Worlds, she began in a voice that surrendered none of its resolve, even in the farthest reaches of the hall. Eighteen years ago, following the New Republic's conquest of Imperial Center, I came before you to solicit financial support for a fledgling government bankrupted by war and plagued by an insidious virus that was killing thousands of non-humans with each passing day. That visit unlocked a gateway between our respective regions of space that had been sealed for the previous 3,000 years, but has remained open ever since. In fact, not long after my initial visit, the consortium graced Coruscant with a stay, during which you bestowed upon us treasures we had scarcely dreamed existed. Rainbow gems, thought puzzles, and trees of wisdom, along with a dozen star destroyers you had captured from imperial warlords who had sought to intrude on your domain. It was thought then that the New Republic and the Consortium might enter into an alliance through matrimony, though destiny had other unions in store for the would-be partners in that marriage. Gracious laughter and hushed exchanges swept through the audience, and scattered clapping modulated to extended applause. Leia took the opportunity to glance behind and to the right, where Prince Isolder was leaning forward in expectation of just such an acknowledgment. Behind him, also smiling and elegantly attired, sat his wife, Queen Mother Tenennial Jo of Dathomir, her fingers sparkling with lava node rings and her auburn hair bound by a dazzling tiara of rainbow gems, dawn stars, and ice moons. Alongside Tenennial sat her mother-in-law, Ta'a Chum, her gray hair elaborately quaffed, and only her eyes visible above a scarlet veil. Behind them sat several dignitaries and officials, including the consortium's ambassador to the New Republic. Coruscant's ambassador to Hapes was seated to the left of the podium, also among sundry dignitaries and officials, though beside her sat the Jedi daughter of his soldier and Tenennial, Tenel Ka. The biceps of her truncated left arm, severed above the elbow years earlier in a lightsaber training match with Jason, was adorned with bands of electrum, and a lightsaber dangled from the narrow belt that cinched her robe. 
In the wings stood C-3PO, newly polished, and Olmach, incensed at having been made to wear piped leggings, a dress tunic, and a tight-fitting cap. My friends, Leia continued, as the applause was dying down, the New Republic and the Consortium have never been anything but allies. But I come before you tonight with a request that is sure to test the bonds of that alliance. And in place of gifts, I bring only an urgent warning. A guarded silence fell over the gathering. Speaking for the New Republic, I respect the high value you have long placed on isolation. Without looking, she gestured broadly at the panoramic window behind her. Were Coruscant blessed with a heavenly phenomenon as majestic as the transitory mists, the New Republic, too, might have chosen a more introspective, self-nurturing course. But sadly, that is not the case. A great shadow has been cast on the galaxy, eclipsing many New Republic member worlds, and a call to arms has been issued far and wide. Though Hapes, Cheruba, Maris, Galanor, Arabanth, and the other worlds that make up the consortium have yet to be thrown into darkness that circumstance is unlikely to endure. For so grim is this shadow, so monstrous and far-reaching, it may well have the power to extinguish all light. Leia paused and remained silent until the agitated murmuring quieted. The source of this shadow lies outside the confines of our galaxy, but the intention of those who cast it is clear. Conquest, unequivocal and thorough. They are called Yuzhan Vong, and as I speak they are poised to invade the colonies and the core. Again, Leia waited for the murmuring to exhaust itself. Peaceful coexistence is not an option for the Yuzhan Vong seek nothing less than to remake the galaxy in their own image. To have all of us swear allegiance to the gods they worship, and in whose name they launch their campaign. To avoid conflict, some worlds have already surrendered, and given what the Yuzhan Vong have done to worlds that resisted, one can hardly fault anyone for capitulating. But the New Republic will neither bargain nor surrender. The invasion must be halted, and that can be effected only through a unified effort on the part of those worlds that choose freedom over enslavement. Leia planted her hands flat on the podium and let her gaze roam the audience. I won't mince words. New Republic Senator Alegos Akla tried to sue for peace and was brutally murdered. The New Republic Defense Force tried and failed to save Ithor. A broa sky, and scores of other worlds. The huts have apparently struck a deal with the Yuzhan Vong that allows the invaders to occupy and utilize hut worlds for resources essential to the invasion. Now I ask the consortium to decide which course it will pursue. I do not make this request lightly, for there's a chance, however remote, that the Yuzhan Vong will leave the Hapes cluster undisturbed in which case you will be fighting for a cause rather than survival. If forced, the New Republic will wage this battle alone, but the odds of victory will be greatly enhanced by military support from the Consortium. She took a breath and showed the palms of her hands. I can promise nothing in return for such support, for the future is uncertain. But I urge all of you to consider carefully whom you wish to have as galactic neighbors and as well to recall what Emperor Palpatine was able to achieve by dimming the light of so many worlds with his own shadow. I thank you all for attending to one forced to resort to words to express what her heart contains. The hall couldn't have been more silent if it had been catapulted into deep space. Delegate Milarta, Ta'a Chum said, Ambassador Organa Solo, Ambassador Solo, Lal Milarta of Terrafon. Leia extended her right hand with practiced graciousness, and Milarta shook it. Charmed, Ambassador, she said, then lowered her voice to add, I can assure you that Terrafon will vote to render aid. Leia smiled with her eyes. The New Republic thanks you. Milarta bowed smartly and moved down the reception line. 
In the formal way that typified such functions, Leia introduced her to the New Republic's ambassador to the consortium, then turned back to Ta'a Chum, who introduced the equally beautiful female delegate from Ut, the world that had sent a song on the occasion of the consortium's visit to Coruscant. Standing behind Leia, C-3PO whispered into her right ear, Delegate Milarta brings the count to thirty-one worlds, mistress. You are effectively halfway to completion. Leia glanced down the reception line, which, with husbands, wives, mistresses, and children, wound nearly to the grand entrance of the Fountain Palace, home to the Hape's royal family. Tired of the formalities, Ambassador, Ta'a Chum asked from behind her veil. Leia turned slightly to regard her. Not at all. You mean to say that you don't find the process somewhat, how shall I put it, antiquated? Actually, it makes me think of Alderaan. Alderaan, you surprise me, Leia, equating a former sinusure of democracy to a matriarchy founded by pirates. What can you be thinking? Leia smiled to herself. In the interest of getting things done, the New Republic had dispensed with ceremony. But I sometimes missed the pomp and circumstance of the old republic, and Hapes feels like a fond memory frozen in time. The scarlet half-veil kept secret Ta'a Chum's expression, but her tone of voice belied a bemused grin. Why, how sweet of you to reduce our way of life to mere nostalgia. You mistake my meaning, Ta'a Chum. With purpose, I think. Leia swept her eyes over the reception room. This might have been my life, if not for the empire, the grandeur, the propriety, the intrigues. Ta'a Chum's eyes narrowed. Ah, but it could easily have been yours, my dear. It was you who chose Han Solo over my son. Leia looked at Chumda Isolder, who stood tall, impeccably dressed, and incurably handsome at the head of the reception line. Yes, she told herself. I chose a two-fisted rogue without a credit to his name over a scion of pirates with pockets deep enough to finance his own war. And thank the stars for that. Childhood memories were one thing, but examined in the light of middle age, they surrendered some of their charm. Leia could no more imagine herself a proper princess than she could an actress or an entrepreneur. She glanced over at Tenennial Joe, hands folded in front of her and chin lifted in regal deportment, and shuddered at the thought of standing in Tenennial's thousand-credit slippers. And yet even while she was thinking it, apprehension nibbled at her contentment. With Han off on his own, distant in more ways than one, the future they forged had grown formless and clouded. She hated having to worry about him, but in fact... She missed him terribly, and the trappings of royalty, the glance down a path not taken, left her feeling cold and alienated. Archon Thane, Ta'a Chum was saying, Ambassador Organa Solo. Ambassador Solo, Archon Bede Thane of Virgil. Robust, fully bearded, head and shoulders taller than Leia, Thane was one of the consortium's few male delegates. He glowered as he stepped in front of her. "'Ambassador Solo,' he said, slurring his words. "'The infamous Jedi.' Ta'a Chum stiffened. "'I would caution you to keep a civil tongue, Archon. "'Or have you perhaps sipped too freely of the drink we provided?' Thane nodded in a bow. "'Your pardon, most revered Arenada," he said, "'using the title reserved for Hapen Queen Mothers, past or present. "'Your generosity has certainly undone me.' Leia reached out with her feelings. Thane wasn't drunk. He was merely acting drunk. I am not a Jedi, Archon, she told him. As to my infamy, it is certainly your prerogative to think what you will. He swung to her, spoken like a Jedi, calmly in full possession. A statement weaker minds might be inclined to embrace as the full truth. Careful, Archon, Ta'a Chum seethed under her breath. I'm certain you don't wish to cause a scene. Leia folded her arms across her chest. A scene is precisely his wish, Ta'a Chum. Why deny him his fun? Thane vouchsafed a thin smile. 
I happened to be in Coruscant when you went before the Senate to deliver the same speech you made us sit through tonight. How it must have vexed your Jedi nature to be ignored. Perhaps you didn't hear me the first time, Archon. If he has a problem with the Jedi, he can address his concerns to me. Tenel Ka was suddenly standing alongside Leia, her hand resting lightly on the ranker tooth inlaid grip of her lightsaber. Querulous and stubborn by nature, Tenel Ka had always been quick to take on a fight, and just now her gray eyes were boring into Thane's. But the Archon stood his ground, smiling nastily. Why, it's the Dathomiri who rejects her hapen heritage, yet deigned to save the royal family from the machinations of Ambassador Ephra. His gaze moved up and down the reception line. Isn't this the happy group? A crowd had begun to form around Thane, and conversations throughout the vast room began to subside. Out of the corner of her eye, Leia saw Princess Soldier making a direct line for the center of the commotion. We have only the ambassador's word that the Yuzhan Vong can't be dealt with, Thane was telling everyone within earshot. And if what she says about forming a united front is true, why is the New Republic divided about where to deploy its fleets and to which systems it should render aid? He turned through a circle as he spoke. Is this what we want for the consortium? A factioned leadership? As Archon of Virgil, I say we remain neutral until such time as the invaders make certain their plans for the consortium, either by word or force of arms. He gestured toward Leia. She comes to us, asking a favor and bringing only the gift of a warning. Why not the gift of the quick recharge turbolaser technology the New Republic has withheld for so many years? That'll be enough, Thane, Isolder said angrily. This isn't the time or place for a political debate. If you can't abide by the rules of decorum, you'll toss me out of your palace? Thane cut him off. You'd sooner host the descendants of those Jedi who killed your ancestors than someone who dares speak the truth in your presence? Enough, Isolder snapped. But Thane was far from finished. He played to the crowd once more. He prefers the company of a daughter who has denounced her hapen heritage. Tenel Ka took a forward step only to be blocked by her father. And a speaker of half-truths like Ambassador Solo. Demonstrating uncanny speed and precision, Isolder backhanded Thane across the face, knocking him into the crowd and drawing blood from his lower lip. Instantly, Isolder's longtime friend and former bodyguard, Captain Astarta, was at his side, flinging a thick braid of red hair over her shoulder and positioning her hands to parry or strike as need be. Two of Thane's supporters had rushed to take him by the arms and stand him on his feet, but now he threw them aside, wiped his hand across his mouth, and snorted a laugh at a soldier. The spurned suitor to the rescue. Leia's heart sank. She could feel a soldier battling to control his rage. As angry as she was at him for allowing himself to be provoked, she couldn't help but dread Thane's next move. My seconds will call on you in the morning, Chumda Isolder, the Archon of Virgil said with complete sobriety. Isolder returned a formal nod of assent. My seconds will be waiting to greet them. Thus begins the schism, Ta'a Chum said in a sad, quiet voice, as Thane and his supporters headed for the door. Nine. Pancha Droma! Han yelled as he veered the falcon into an abrupt bank. Muttering nervously to himself, Droma boosted power to the sublight drives and maxed the throttle. We'll be fine venturing into hut space, you said. You used to do a lot of contract work up and down the Sisar Run, and Srilur was like a second home, you said. Nothing to worry about you. Quit griping and give me an update on those ships. Droma swung to the display screen of the ship's friend or foe authenticator, which showed seven bezel-shaped icons closing fast on the Falcon's aft. Yuzhan Vong, all right. Han glanced at the display. The scanners limbed images of what might have been asteroids, save for the distinctive bulges that were cockpits and the pitted noses characteristic of weapons emplacements and Dovin basal housings. Carl Skippers. 
Coordinates for the jump to Nar Shada coming in. Belay that, Han countered, throwing switches on the console. There's no shaking those skips. Route power to the rear deflector shields and lock in a course back to Srilor. I'd rather deal with them in atmosphere than out here. Droma quickly applied himself to the task. At least we won't have as far to fall. Thanks for the encouragement. The Falcon whipped through a half-twisting loop, and the curve of the dun and ecru-colored world ballooned into view. Terrain following data said they were traveling northward, looking out at a slice of the northern hemisphere just east of the planetary dateline. Skips don't perform well in gravity, Han assured. Have to rely on the anti-grav capabilities of the Dovin Basils. As if they heard him, the enemy pilots began firing at extreme range, molten gold comets streaming from the projectile and plasma launchers in the bows of their small craft. Two of the missiles connected and, even though weakened by distance, were powerful enough to rock the larger ship. The Falcon's sensor suite began screaming. Rear shields holding, Droma reported while he activated countermeasures and distortion systems. For now... Han took a steadying breath, viced his right hand on the throttle lever, and rammed it home. The light freighter surged into Srilor's upper atmosphere, trembling as it continued its oblique dive. With errant scorn for the planet's protective wrapping, the Yuzhan Vong crafts plunged after. See what I told you? Han exclaimed. They stick like epoxy. The ship's indicators railed in protest as the Falcon plummeted into denser air, rolling and corkscrewing to evade the deadly fire that sought her. All caution forgotten, Han sharpened the angle of descent, sloughing control in exchange for added speed. You've got the bridge, he told Droma. Droma threw him a panicked glance. What? Unfastening the straps that secured him to the pilot's chair, Han stood, spun on his heel, and started for the main ladder well. He didn't make it past the cockpit hatch when ship-rattling impacts aft threw him to the deck and forced him to rethink the idea of getting to one of the gun turrets. "'Enable auto-tracking for the quad lasers,' he said in a rush as he was scrambling to his feet. Buckling back into the chair, he donned a headset and began to call up targeting data on the weapon's control data screen. "'Let's see if we can't even up the odds.' Droma reached for the joystick that controlled the Falcon's belly gun, while Han took hold of the controls for the dorsal gun. Data began scrolling across the respective screens. Han bracketed a coral skipper in the targeting reticle and squeezed the trigger on the control grip. The enemy craft swallowed the bolt whole. He pounded his fist in the console. We gotta give them more to worry about than laser fire. Abruptly, he rolled the Falcon onto its back while Droma was still firing the belly gun. In an effort to keep up, the lead coral skipper drew deeply on the capabilities of its Dovin basil and accelerated. Again, Han brought the reticle over his target, but the coral skipper sped out of his sights in a flash. He left the firing to Droma momentarily and peeled the ship away in a sweeping, descending bank. Projectiles slammed against the rear shields and plasma streaked between the ship's mandibles. Han rerouted power to the forward deflector and again increased the angle of their descent. They ripped through a filmy blanket of high-altitude clouds and went spiraling downward. Far below them, ocean and desert lay side by side. Storm systems shrouded Srilor's western horizon, and to the north an expansive brown haze smudged the terrain. Droma glanced at the meteorological sensors. That's a sandstorm. How about that, Han said. Some wishes do come true. The words had barely left his mouth when the lead coral skipper dropped with mind-boggling velocity and was suddenly beneath the falcon and firing up at her, plasma geysering from its gun emplacements. Han pulled out of the spiral, yanked the throttle, and threw the ship up and over the coral skipper directly on his tail. A molten bolt from the craft below caught its squadron mate full on. The coral skipper shuddered as hunks of Yorick coral flew in all directions. Then an interior explosion burst from the crystalline cockpit, and the crippled ship went into a helpless freefall, condemned to death by gravity. The destroyed coral skipper's wingmate veered and glued himself to the falcon's tail, battering it with projectiles and refusing to be unseated, despite a slew of daring turns and evasions Han took them through. 
Han went for a pushover, but not in time. Something hit the falcon like a hard clap on the back. Fighting with the controls, he succeeded in riding her, only to emerge from an end-over-end -end roll to find three more coral skippers attached to the ship as she entered the sandstorm. The bristles on Droma's back stood up. Another hit like that, and you may as well plow us into the sand and let the falcon be our gravestone. Projectiles raced past the outrigger cockpit. With the Falcon's Quadex power core roaring, Han pushed the ship to its limits, jinking and juking as the coral skippers continued to rake fire at them. He dropped the Falcon away in a power dive, leaving Droma struggling to adjust thrust bias and avert disaster as enemy missiles ranged closer. All at once a mountain loomed before them. Han torqued the ship to starboard so forcefully that both he and Droma nearly sailed from their seats. The lead coral skipper pilot pursued them ferociously, obviously unable to hold the falcon in his sights, but firing anyway, perhaps in the hope of shaking Han's concentration. Without warning, a plasma bolt sizzled through the overtaxed rear shields. A muffled explosion sounded from aft, followed by the sibilant hiss of the ship's fire suppression system. An acrid smell drifted forward on exhaust fan currents. Han sniffed and shot Droma a wide-eyed glance. What was that? Droma's eyes roamed over the console telltales. Power converter. Han winced. Of all the rotten luck. He utilized more of the ship's amazing speed to improve their lead and leapt deeper into the swirling haze. The three coral skippers decreased velocity, waiting for the Falcon to come across their vector. But instead, Han poured on all power, climbed, looped, and came around behind the trio. Droma fired instinctively with the belly gun. With the Dovin basil of the trailing ship too stressed to handle defense as well as guidance, the laser bolt sneaked through. The widespread burst caught the craft right on the nose, blowing it to nuggets. Han hooted triumphantly as he sheared off and settled calmly into kill position behind the second craft. The coral skipper pilot, realizing the position he was suddenly in, climbed slightly, unintentionally placing himself in the overlapping field of fire between the Falcon's upper and lower batteries. Money Lane, Han shouted, 100 credits to whoever nails him. You're on, Droma said. Simultaneously, the two of them tightened their fingers on the trigger. The quad lasers loosed storms of red darts that peppered the rear of the enemy craft and perforated the cockpit, disintegrating the ship. Han and Droma howled with joy as Han steered through a corkscrewing dive, zipping through the far-flung remains of the exploded ship. Swooping past the lead craft, Han inverted the Falcon and took her back into the storm. Where it could be glimpsed at all, the land was dark red and studded with monolithic rock towers that were the sand-blasted and wind-eroded remains of volcanic upthrusts. And yet, despite their size, the swirling sand made the tours almost impossible to see. Eyes on the terrain following display and making the most of the Falcon's maneuverability, Han aimed deliberately for the closest obelisk. Faking a climb, he stood the ship on its side and swerved to starboard while Droma triggered bursts from the belly gun. Unsecured items throughout the ship flew from their perches, crashed into bulkheads, or were sent rolling along the deck plates of the ring corridor. But two well-placed laser bolts caught the coral skipper at the cockpit seam, splitting it in two, as if struck by a chisel in the hands of a master stonemason. Still, the three remaining coral skippers clung doggedly, chopping at the falcon's tail. Nap of the ground, Han weaved through a forest of storm-obscured spires and wind-sculpted steely. The engines moaned and the ship vibrated as if on the verge of flying apart. Hiking power to the rear shields, he snap-rolled, then stood the falcon on its side once more to narrow her profile as plasma streaked past them to both sides. Droma lashed his tail around the seat to keep from being strangled by the seat harness. At least warn me when you're going to do that. Han leveled out and maneuvered through a ludicrously tight turn, feathering the engines until the Falcon was at a near stall, then shunting power to the thrusters and throwing the ship into a vertical reversement. Swerving to evade Droma's fire, the trailing coral skipper flipped out of control and careened straight into an outcropping, shattering to bits. The Falcon's thrusters flaring, Han pulled up sharply, climbing out of the storm at high boost. Neither of the surviving pair of fighters followed them back up the well. 
They collapsed into their chairs as the stars lost their twinkle and swarmed around them as pinpoints of light. Nice shooting, Han said, after checking in with the threat assessor one final time. Droma returned the grin. Nice driving. The Falcon bucked. Indicators flashed and the console came alive with warning tones. Han and Droma fell silent once more and turned to the painful chore of assessing just how much damage the ship had sustained. The hyperdrive is viable but responding erratically, Droma said a long moment later. Han nodded glumly. Must have suffered collateral damage when the power converter got hit. Droma tugged at one end of his drooping mustache. We might be able to make Nar Shada. It's difficult to tell. No, Han said. We can't chance it. Do we return to Srilur? Han shook his head. I doubt we'll find the replacement parts we need. Besides, I don't want to risk running into those coral skippers again. Droma called up star charts. Kashiyik, then. Two quick jumps and we're there. Han ran his hand over his mouth. Not a good idea. When Droma didn't respond, he said, It's not what you think. I can handle the memories. It's just that Chewbacca's family still consider themselves responsible for my well-being, and I can't face that right now. So where to? Han studied the displayed star charts and grinned, more to himself. A little out-of-the-way place I know where they'll have everything we need. Everything Han Solo needs, Droma thought to point out. Maybe you're right, Han said. He turned slightly to regard Droma. Think you can handle playing captain for a while? On Coruscant, in the new office that had come with her unexpected appointment to the advisory council, Senator Viki Shesh supervised the two labor droids she had tasked with rearranging the furniture. Turn the desk, catter corner to the window, she instructed them as she moved about the room. The identical humaniform droids manipulated the hover sled on which the desk sat. When the desk was in place, they turned to her, seemingly eager to see her pleased by the results. But she wasn't. No, no, all wrong, Chess said, shaking her head, then running a hand through her lustrous mane of ink-black hair. Put the desk back where it was and move the conform chair beneath the window. The pair of droids looked crestfallen. At once, Senator, they responded in unison. Shesh lowered herself into an antique armchair from her native Kuat and glanced around the office, smiling slowly as she took in the spacious room. Well appointed without being ostentatious, the room enjoyed a breathtaking view of Commerce Way and the New Republic obelisk. With a bit of work, it would become the most elegant chamber in the building, one that would make a lasting impression on all who entered. Not bad for someone who had entered the political arena only six short years ago, Shesh told herself. But she had expected no less than this from the start, and she anticipated a great deal more in the coming years, despite the fact that her appointment to the advisory council had failed to meet with unanimous endorsement. Several would-be political pundits had accused Chief of State Borsk Felia of attempting to win the support of wealthy Kuat. Others had denounced Shesh for allowing herself to be seduced by power and accused her of turning her back on the very things that had fueled her rapid rise. Under Thalia's thumb, so the fretting went, what would become of her impassioned concern for the needy, her economic patronage of disenfranchised worlds, her outspoken praise for the Jedi Knights and all they stood for? Shesha's smile broadened as she considered the questions. In the end, they showed how mistaken everyone was about her, and how successful she had been in fostering illusions. The office comm sounded. Senator Shesh, her secretary said. Commodore Brand has arrived. Shesh glanced at her watch. Admit him, she answered. She rose from the chair, smoothed the black skirt that sheathed her long legs, and ordered the labor droids out of the room. By the time Brand entered, she was settled behind the desk. Commodore Brand, she began, smiling and extending her hand across the desk. How delightful to see you. 
a rigid, gloomy functionary with the inward-turning gaze of one who sees only his own truth, Brandt took off his cap, shook her hand as decorously as he could, and tried to make himself comfortable in the tight confines of the armchair. Shesh gestured broadly to the office. Excuse the mess, I've only just moved in. Brand's eyes raced about. Congratulations on being named to the council, Senator. Shesh feigned solemnity. I only hope I can measure up to everyone's expectations. Brand leaned forward. War speeds the promotion of those best equipped to lead. I am certain you will surpass everyone's expectations. Why, thank you, Commodore. Shesh paused briefly. To what do I owe the honor of your visit? Brand cleared his throat meaningfully. The Corellian situation, Senator. Shesh nodded. The re-enabling of Centerpoint Station. In my opinion, a judicious decision. Then you're not concerned about possible repercussions? An armed and dangerous Corellia, for example? Of course not. A well-defended Corellia benefits the entire Corps. Brand regarded her for a long moment. Yes, but what if I were to tell you that even more might be gained by inducing the Yuzhan Vong to attack Corellia? Shesh raised an eyebrow. Are you in fact telling me that, Commodore? Because if you are, and notwithstanding that I sit on the Security and Intelligence Council, I would be obliged to bring this matter to the attention of the Advisory Council immediately. The Defense Force intends to do just that, Senator, Brand said in a rush. Unfortunately, however, we find ourselves in something of a dilemma. A dilemma, Shesh repeated. Assuming first that we could succeed in luring the Yuzhan Vong to Corellia, we must ensure that we can defeat them, soundly. And while we wouldn't want to tip our hand by massing ships at Corellia, we would need to pull from Bathawi and a host of similarly defended worlds to amass the required armada. Shesh took a moment to respond. You're concerned that the Advisory Council would refuse to sanction any actions that would imperil Bathawi and the others. And yet, to accomplish your goal, it would have to appear as if Bathawi were being defended to the disadvantage of Corellia. Brand almost grinned. She appraised him openly. I see that I've read you correctly, though I still wonder why you think it necessary to bring this to my attention. Brand held her gaze. Should the matter go to a vote, the defense force would want to make certain that Bathawi wins out. Shesh grinned. But, Commodore, if the Yuzhan Vong are routed at Corellia, wouldn't those who voted in favor of Bathawi be seen in disfavor? Perhaps, but any vote tendered in the interest of the greater good would be seen as enlightened. Shesh fell silent for a long moment. A moment ago, you said that this entire plan rests on the assumption that you can entice the Yuzhan Vong to attack Corellia. As I understand it, you hope to accomplish this by leaving Corellia essentially undefended in the hope that the enemy takes note of that fact. But wouldn't it be more profitable if word got out about what you're doing? For its technological powers alone, Centerpoint Station would be an irresistible target for destruction. Brandt tugged at his earlobe. This isn't something we can simply announce over the Holonet, Senator. Shesh laughed shortly. There are better lines to the Yuzhan Vong than the Holonet. She gave it a moment, then added, The Huts. If they had even an inkling of your plan, they would certainly apprise the Yuzhan Vong, if only in the interest of safeguarding their future. But the New Republic has broken off diplomatic relations with the Huts. To communicate with them at this point. The Hut Consul General is still on Coruscant. I could pay him a visit and let slip a few things. Brand stared at her. You would do that? I would. But in return, in the event the true purpose of my visit ever came to light, I would want it known that the Defense Force asked me to intercede. You want deniability, Brand said. Irrefutable deniability, Commodore. He took a moment, then nodded. I think that can be arranged. We could say that we were merely feeling the huts out. Just so. Brand smiled. 
You should have gone into the military, Senator. You would have made a brilliant tactician. The military? Shesh snorted in derision. I don't mean any disrespect, Commodore. But why would I want to be the one who fires the weapon when I can be the one who decides at whom the weapon is pointed? Ten. The size of a Victory-class Star Destroyer, the bulk freighter Starmaster, hung above the inert Twi'lek homeworld, Ryloth. Pods of vessels surrounded it, tenders, gunboats, and shuttles, some as smooth as marine creatures, others as boxy and graceless as the freighter itself. Anchored in the umbra of the great ship floated a Ubrickian luxury yacht. Also in shadow, and closing steadily on a rectangular docking bay, moved a lunette-shaped craft launched from Ryloth's miserly zone of inhabitable twilight. In a lower deck compartment forward in the freighter, two Rodians monitored the approaching crescent on a display screen, switching to an interior view of the docking bay as the small craft disappeared from sight. Is that his ship? The Twi'lek pacing behind them asked when the craft had penetrated the bay's magnetic containment field and landed. Like almost everyone else aboard the Starmaster, the trio were wearing jumpsuits inflated by large pouch pockets. His ship, one of the Rodians scoffed. He has dozens of ships. Let's wait and see who disembarks. Three human males and a female appeared on the craft's extensible boarding ramp. Moving with lithe economy, the first two men might have been brothers, though the taller one's face was hideously scarred, where the other's was slim and angular. Dark-haired and willowy, the woman also moved with care, but there was a coiled wariness in her step and a vigilant gleam in her eyes. The last man out had an air of confident nonchalance. In one of inherited entitlement, the elevated chin and pocketed hands might have been perceived as arrogance. But he wore refinement well, as only one who had earned it could. In contrast to the shin-high spacer's boots and long cloaks affected by his confederates, he was dressed in silk and leather. That's him, the other Rodian said, indicating the latter male with the tap of a long, sucker-equipped finger against the display screen. That's Card. The Twi'lek positioned his thick, tattooed head tails over his shoulders and leaned between the Rodians for a closer look. You're certain? The one who had made the identification twitched his short snout. If not, it's either his twin or a clone. The Twi'lek straightened. I'll alert the boss. Hurrying through the compartment hatchway, he entered a large hold, clamorous with activity. Stacked high throughout the space were alloy shipping crates, recently ferried up Ryloth's well from Kala'un spaceport. Two-legged binary load lifters, supervised by masked Twi'lek foremen, were arranging the crates for further shipping and offloading, while utilitarian-looking ASP droids stenciled the crates with port-of-call information and applied laser-readable labels. Despite the forceful draw of overhead exhaust fans, Dark motes danced and swirled in the recycled air. One hand clamped to his mouth, the Twi'lek threaded his way through the maze of stacks, arriving ultimately at a laboratory isolated from the hold by tall permaplast window walls. Inside, two humans wearing goggles, rebreathers, and environment suits were assessing the quality of a fine black powder sampled from an opened shipping crate bearing the corporate logo of... Galactic Exotics, alleged to contain edible fungi. The stockier of the pair removed his mask and goggles to reveal bulging eyes and an otherwise bland face. He just arrived, the Twi'lek reported. Docking Bay 6738. Two men and a woman accompany him. They are clearing contamination and control now. You're certain it's him? Certain, but we'll run an identity scan just in case. The man peeled off elbow-length gloves, slipped out of the environment suit, and settled himself at a display console. Keep the cam and scanner feeds open so I can see and hear for myself. Will you be informing Borga? The man considered it. We'll see. The Twi'lek took the same route back to the compartment. By the time he arrived and was peering over the shoulder of the Rodian closest to the screen... 
Picard and his companions were literally at the door. Positive identification on card, the Rodian said after studying the scanner readouts. No information on the other men, but neither one is armed with blasters. The scanner matches the woman to Shada Dukal, a known associate of cards. The Rodian looked at the Twi'lek. Lethal, even without weapons. The second Rodian lifted a blaster from his hip holster, checked the charge, and primed the weapon. Unnecessary, the Twi'lek told him. They'd be fools to try anything. The Rodian's round black eyes fixed on him. You pay me to be prepared. The Twi'lek nodded, grinning slightly to show filed teeth. I stand corrected. Look, the Rodian's partner interrupted. He's onto us. The Twi'lek glanced at the display screen in time to see Card waving at the optical scanner concealed in the bulkhead above the hatchway. I still don't understand why Card would be interested in dealing with us, the armed Rodian remarked. He traffics in information, not spice. The Twi'lek caressed his bulged forehead and moved to the hatchway. This isn't about spice, but we're expected to hear him out, so that's what we're going to do. He aimed a remote at the hatchway sensor, and the hatch pocketed itself into the bulkhead. Card and the others entered, his two male companions hanging back, and Shada Dukal sidestepping into a corner, where she could keep a watchful eye on the proceedings. Welcome, Talon Card, the Twi'lek said in basic. I'm Raoul Warren. Card nodded. A pleasure. He didn't bother to introduce anyone else. Your chair, Raoul Warren barked at one of the Rodians, who immediately stood and stepped aside. He waited for Card to make himself comfortable. I'm told that you're interested in procuring product. Eight blocks. Raoul Warren's normally narrow eyes widened. A substantial quantity. However, since your past and recent activities are not unknown to me, would you mind explaining why you're suddenly interested in product? Card laughed innocently. If you're concerned about entrapment or anything of that nature... Nothing of the sort, Raoul Warren was quick to assure. After all, we are only subordinate players in the grand game. But I was given to understand that you had abandoned illegality for activity of a more diplomatic nature. Card crossed his legs, resting his ankle on his knee. The Yuzhan Vong invasion has rendered obsolete my position as liaison between Bastion and Coruscant. Meaning he's unemployed, the shorter of the two men behind him said. Yes, Raoul Warren said, stroking his left leku pensively. The Yuzhan Vong have heaped changes on us as well. Not the way I hear it, the same man remarked. Just what have you heard, Raoul Warren asked. The man's upper lip curled. That spice remains a safe bet. Card cleared his throat. What he means is that product has always been a prized commodity, and now, what with more mouths to feed? Hard times bring about a need for escape, Card's comrade cut him off. We're all for letting everyone bury their heads in the sand. Raoul Warren cut his pink eyes to Card. So you're interested in going into business? Assuming that shipment can be arranged? Raoul Warren smiled tightly. That would, of course, add to the price. Where did you have in mind? To begin with, Tenna. An awkward silence fell over the compartment, while Raoul Warren and the Rodians traded covert glances. Tenna is extremely problematic at the moment. Raoul Warren said at last. I could arrange shipment to Rhodia, perhaps even Kalarba, but you'd have to take it from there. What about Kathlis or Bathawi? Card said. Raoul Warren shook his head. Not at present. Card loosed an annoyed exhale. If you can ship to Rhodia, can I at least get you to bring it up the run to Corellia? That's the actual destination. Raoul Warren tilted his head to one side. Again, I'm afraid we have a problem. What's the problem? Card's scar-faced accomplice asked harshly. 
we were told you could move Spice with impunity under the new terms. Raoul Warren's tiny eyes darted. New terms? He was about to say more when the hatch opened to reveal the stout laboratory technician filling the portal. Card's accomplices reacted swiftly, but Card was just as quick to interpose himself between them and the grinning intruder. Krev Bombasa, he said in genuine surprise. You're a long way from home. As are you, Talon. Bombasa looked at Shada, and the always enchanting Shada Dukal. As for my being far from home, even life in the Pembroke system can grow boring. With an explicit nod, Bombasa dismissed Raoul Warren and the Rodians, then lowered himself into a chair at the console and deactivated the room's security systems. If I recall correctly, he said to Card, the last time we crossed paths was in the thruster burn tap calf in Irwithot. In search of George Cardas, you and Shada required safe passage through the Cathol sector, which I provided to offset an earlier debt I owed to your former partner, Mara Jade. I mention all this by way of stating at the onset that if you're expecting favors, such as product delivery into the star systems you mentioned, be forewarned that I figure we're already even. He glanced at Kip Duran and Ganner Rysode, then smiled at Card. So why have you come, Talon? And don't tell me you're serious about going into the spice trade. Card looked him in the eye. I appreciate your frankness, Krev. The fact is the Yuzhan Vong have changed the way everyone is doing business. Many of the players remain the same, but the field has been rearranged. In the rim, former Imperials are fighting alongside new Republic forces. Adversaries of long standing are putting aside their differences for a common cause. Even the Huts have been forced to relinquish part of their space as a means of avoiding all-out war. Again, Bombasa glanced at the Jedi. Yes, the only good thing to come of the war is that it gave Kip Doran something else to do besides prey on smugglers. He paused briefly to glance knowingly at Card's confederates, then sighed. I thought for certain that would draw a reaction, but I can see that this clearly isn't a moment for levity. Laugh all you want, Kip told him. I can laugh all I want, Bombasa repeated in monotone, then touched his head theatrically. Did someone here make me say that? Ganner placed a calming hand on Kip's arm. Bombasa watched the two Jedi, then nodded at Card. You're right, Talon. The lines have certainly been redrawn. Just where that leaves people like you and me has yet to be determined. Speak for yourself, Krev. I know where I stand. Bombasa took a breath. I'm a practical man, Talon. I wish only to survive, and under the best possible circumstances I can arrange for myself. You say your stance is decided. Then suppose you tell me what's on your mind. Card's eyes narrowed. You won't ship to Tenna, Bathawi, or Corellia. Bombasa linked his hands and rested them atop his prominent belly. That much is true. And I commend you on your acuity in picking just those systems where we have temporarily suspended operations. The Yuzhan Vong are in hot space, Card continued. They've already hit Gindine. So one might reasonably assume that you're merely trying to avoid areas of potential conflict. Once more, I commend you. Why risk shipments by sending them into contested space? Transgression might even prove dangerous to the bearers of those shipments. Then either you're merely being careful, or you're heeding orders that came down from the huts. Bombasa glanced at the ceiling. Let's just say that the huts, at this juncture, are in a better position to ascertain which areas are dangerous. Card nodded. I thought so. And how will you justify this conversation to Borga? Bombasa's shoulders heaved in a shrug. I will relate just what happened here. Talon Card wanted product delivered into denied areas. So we failed to come to terms. Irony wrinkled his jowled face. Borga has been expecting just such an encounter, in any case. 
Playing both sides, is she? Looking out for number one. Card could not restrain a smile. I won't forget this, Krev. Bombasa steepled his thick fingers and brought them to his double chin. Then you might mention me to your friends as affirmation of just whose side I am on. Count on it, Card said. Someday we might all be called to work together. Smugglers, information brokers, pirates, and mercenaries. And this strikes me as a good start. The Yamisk vessel Kresh hung in stationary orbit above the planet Ando. In the ship's grotto-like docking bay, Commander Kind Kahl and the priest Morsh welcomed Ronda Basadi Diori aboard. First to exit the loathsome, slipper-shaped Ubrickian space yacht that had arrived from Ando were the young huts Twilek and Rhodian retainers, followed by the tusked humanoid Aqualish, who comprised his limited detail of bodyguards. Then, propelled by his muscular tail, the hut himself emerged, smiling broadly, and instantly at home in the cavernous, dimly lighted space. I see that you are as fond of gloom as we huts are, Rhonda told Kind Kahl, after he had been announced and introductions had been made. The commander smiled pleasantly. We favor obscurity when it suits our purpose. Rhonda attributed the ambiguity of Kind Kahl's remark to the inexperience of the Yuzhan Vong translator. You must come to Nal Hara, Commander, and visit my parents' palace. I'm certain you would find it to your liking. Kind Kahl's politic smile held. We've heard much about it, young hut. Commander Malik Carr was very impressed. As Borga was with Commander Malik Carr, Rhonda replied with courtly poise. I am eager to learn as much as I can of your operations, so that we huts may expedite your needs. His protruding black eyes disappeared briefly behind the membranes that kept them moist. With so many worlds falling to your superior might, the task of ferrying captives about must be growing tiresome. The task distracts us from our principal objective, kind call aloud which is precisely why we are as eager to instruct as you are to learn. Then the sooner we begin, the better, Rhonda said. But perhaps you could first show me to my quarters, so that I might refresh from the journey. We have prepared a place for you, Rhonda Basadi Diori, the priest answered. On the way, we thought we might introduce you to the ship's most prestigious passenger. Rhonda pressed his hands together in a gesture of respect. I would be honored. Kind Kahl voiced a brusque command to his guards, who snapped their fists to their opposite shoulders and arranged themselves in an escort formation, some advancing through an iris portal in the hole's biotic bulkhead, while others fell in behind Rhonda and his retinue. They moved deeper into the ship, passing from one module to the next, on occasion lifted by decks that bulged under them like a tongue being raised to the roof of a mouth. Illumination varied, but the bioluminescence of the bulkheads rarely provided more than a faint glow. What did increase was a certain tang in the air, which, while not unpleasant, tended to irritate the nasal passages and promote the flow of mucus and tears. Lubricious by design, Rhonda found the conditions most agreeable. Kind Cow brought the procession to a halt in the rank belly of the ship and directed Rhonda's attention to an aperture in the membranous bulkhead that provided a vantage into an adjacent hold. Below, centered in a circular tank of syrupy liquid, floated a tentacled life form that could only have been created by the Yuzhan Vong. Sharing the tank with the creature, and plainly attending to it, stood several dozen captives, anywhere from knee to shoulder deep in the liquid. Tended to in kind, a few of the captives were being stroked by the tentacles. In one case, a human male was entirely entwined by two of the slender appendages. Rhonda found himself thinking about certain members of the Desologic clan who were fond of chaining dancers or servants to themselves. Again his eyes were drawn to the fully embraced human. In the midst of regarding the several beings in close proximity to the human, Rhonda turned excitedly to his Twilek Majordomo. 
Are those Rin? he asked, indicating them with one of his stubby arms. The Twi'lek regarded them and nodded. I believe they are Rin, Excellency. Kind Kal followed the exchange and asked for a translation. Something has caught your eye, young hut. Indeed, Commander, Rhonda said. You have succeeded in capturing a somewhat rare specimen. To which do you refer? Do you see the human your creature takes such an interest in? Kind Kal gazed down at the Yamisk and its captive attendants. Cain, that one is called. The sharp-nosed bipeds next to and opposite him, Rhonda elaborated. And there, at the adjacent tentacle, they are Rin, an entertaining species, highly prized by the huts, though often disparaged by others. Prized for what? They are celebrated for their skill at dancing and singing, but their real talent is prognostication. Kind Kyle waited for the translation, then turned to Mursh. Did you know of this? I did not, Commander, the priest said. Kind Kyle cut his eyes to Rhonda. They divine, you say? Rather astutely. By what technique? Manifold means. I have heard that they can read the future in the creases of the hands, the bumps on the head, the color of the eyes. They sometimes employ a deck of playing cards that are said to have been fashioned by them. You have heard, Kind Kyle said. Then you have had no direct experience with them. Sadly, I have not. Rhonda smiled. But perhaps you would be willing to relieve them temporarily of their peculiar duties and judge for yourself? Your creation appears to take little interest in them in any case. I confess to being curious about them, Morsh said in reply to Kind Kyle's glance. The commander nodded and turned to a subaltern of the guards. Have the six Rin brought to the young hut's compartment. Eleven. To three sides, the sea stretched to the horizon, an expanse of surging teal, frosted with white caps and dazzled by daybreak sunlight. And at Leia's back climbed the rocky spires and imposing parapets of Reef Fortress, the Hapen royal family's summer home and stronghold in times of crisis. Against a cool offshore breeze, she hugged herself within the dark blue wrap of her long cloak and turned through another circle, taking in the island's surf-slapped black rock shoreline, the majestic fortress, a droid picking wild dewberries, and closer at hand, Olmach, along with a score of visitors who'd arrived at dawn by dragon yacht to witness the duel between Isolder and Bede Thane. The Archon of Virgil and his seconds were gathered on the square of lush lawn that was to serve as an arena for the contest, as the offended one, publicly dishonored by Isolder's reckless backhand, Thane had been entitled to choose the weapon from a wide assortment that included everything from vibroblades to sporting blasters. The location, however, had been selected by Isolder, who had passed the previous night in Reef Fortress, along with Tenennial Joe, Tenel Ka, Ta'achum, Leia, and a minimal staff of advisors and retainers. Though the designated hour was drawing near, Isolder and his second, retired Captain Astarta, had yet to show themselves. Plainly disquieted by the lapse in etiquette, Tenel Ka was unable to remain still for more than a moment. Leia could feel the young Jedi's agitation clear across the lawn. It was here at the fortress that she, Jason, Jaina, and Chewie's nephew, Lobaka, had braved carnivorous seaweed and Bartok assassins to foil Ambassador Ephra's plot to overthrow the monarchy. Here, too, Tenel Ka had finally come to accept the mutilation she had accidentally suffered at Jason's hand, preferring to make do with her stump rather than employ a prosthesis, even for a swimming race. As the memories of what Jason had told her of those events were supplanted by concerns for the present, Leia saw Tenel Ka gaze up one of the hedge-bordered paths that climbed to the fortress and quickly walk away from the lawn. A moment later, Ta'achum appeared where the natural path debouched into the lawn. 
her graying auburn hair falling from beneath a tall conical cap, to which was affixed a triangle of gauzy white fabric that veiled her lower face. Notwithstanding Tenel Ka's efforts on behalf of the Hapen monarchy, the former matriarch refused to condone her granddaughter's decision to embrace the life of a Jedi over that of a future queen mother. Ta'achum tracked Tenel Ka's deliberate departure. Then she turned and, spying Leia, gathered her long gown in one hand and headed directly for her. "'I trust you slept well, Ambassador,' she said as she approached." I'd like to report that I did, but in fact, I didn't sleep a wink. This business with the duel, Ta'a Chum said in dismissal. Don't worry. Leia stared into her green eyes. You're that confident of your son? You're not? I've seen the best bested, Ta'a Chum. The former queen mother studied her. I have to wonder to whom you're referring. Your father, perhaps, bested by your brother? or my son, bested by the smuggler you helped make a hero. Leia refused to take the bait. His soldier shouldn't have allowed himself to be provoked. But, my dear, what other course of action was open to him after Thane insulted you? He could have allowed me to respond. Creases formed at the corners of Ta'a Chum's eyes. My dear Leia... Here on Hapes, noble women are expected to comport themselves as something other than warriors. It has been thus since the founding days of the Consortium. Blame the Laurel Raiders for placing us on pedestals. I'm not a Hapen noble, Ta'achum, and I've been called far worse than a liar. I'm sure you have. Leia bristled, then regained her composure. I'm more concerned about unity among the consortium worlds than I am about defending my honor. Ta'a Chum forced a world-weary sigh. There can be no unity without honor, Leia. And speaking of honor and dishonor, I've been meaning to inquire about your charming rogue of a husband. Why isn't he here with you? Leia held Ta'a Chum's piercing gaze. Han is contributing in his own way to the war effort. What a curious answer. Ta'a Chum lowered her voice in feigned intimacy. I trust there are no troubles at home. There are troubles everywhere. That's why I'm here. Indeed. Ta'a Chum fell silent for a moment, then said, Since your arrival on Hapes, I've been meaning to tell you how wrong I was about you. Leia waited. Unlike the Dathomiri witch's daughter, she glanced in the direction of Tenel Ka. You chose against becoming a Jedi. Leia had to remind herself that she was talking with the woman who had not only ordered the murders of her elder son and Isolde's first love, but whose own mother had despised the Jedi almost as passionately as Palpatine had. Isolde's grandmother had wanted to see the Jedi extinguished, if only to prevent the resurrection of what she had deemed an oligarchy ruled by sorcerers and readers of auras. Tenel Ka chose wisely, Leia said at last, as did your son. Tenennial Joe is perfect for Isolde. Ta'achum shook her head. No, my dear, their marriage is beset by difficulties. There is talk of Tenennial Joe's returning to Dathomir. I'm sorry. I didn't realize. You would have been perfect for my son. He undertakes this duel as much to demonstrate to me that a man is capable of taking initiative as to demonstrate to you his continuing affection. That's why, regardless of the outcome of today's contest, you can rely on having my full support in the manner of the consortium allying itself with the new republic against the Yuzhan Vong. Leia was still recovering from the unexpectedness of the disclosure when Isolde, Tenennial Joe, and Astarta strode into view. With mere moments to spare, he arrives, Ta'a Chum remarked on seeing them. How like him! Trailing the prince and queen mother came staffers and other witnesses, including C-3PO, who hurried to Leia's side. Mistress Leia, the droid began in a fret. 
I had hoped you would decide to spare yourself the torment of having to watch Prince Isolder engage in such an antiquated and obviously vain exercise, in what can only be considered pecking order politics. Leia frowned at him, thinking of Corin Horn's contest with the Yuzhan Vaughn commander Shadao Shai at Ithor. As the insulted party, I could hardly absent myself, 3PO. But, Mistress C-3PO pressed, do you have any idea of what Prince Isolder and Archon Thane are about to do? Leia glanced at the lawn where Thane's seconds and Astarta were establishing the ground rules, and the Archon and the Prince were already donning the sensor and electrode-studded headgear, power gloves, boots, and body armor that were integral to the contest. I have some idea, Leia said. The droid tilted his head to one side and flapped his stiff arms. Then you shouldn't permit yourself to watch. This form of hand-to-hand -hand combat has its origin in a martial art developed by the Laurel Raiders when their chief preoccupation was the capture and distribution of female prisoners. While perhaps not as deadly or as mystical in nature as Teras Kasi, the steel hands technique taught by the followers of Palawa in the Pecanth Reach star cluster in the Outer Rim, it is nonetheless. Leia shushed him. Isolder spent two years as a privateer, she said quietly. I'm sure he knows a few moves. But, mistress, C-3PO said hopelessly. She silenced him again in order to hear what Isolder was telling Thane as they faced off in the center of the lawn. Should you win, you will not only have redeemed your honor, but earned the right to brag of having defeated the Prince of Hapes. Should I win, I gain nothing more than the right to demand that you solicit the pardon of my daughter and of Ambassador Organa Solo for your remarks. Thane sneered at him. If you'd like to sweeten the pot, Prince Isolder, you need only say so. Isolder slipped his right hand into the power glove and flexed his fingers. Should I win, I want your pledge that Virgil will support the New Republic. The witnesses gasped. This cannot be permitted, someone shouted. Neither of you has the right, another voice added. Thane considered it while the arguments continued. You have my pledge, the Archon said at last, providing that Hapes will withhold support if you lose. You bring disgrace on all our houses, a witness remarked. Isolder nodded. You have my pledge. Leia's heart raced. Beside her, Ta'a Chum said, This has been Thane's goal all along. As Hapes goes, so goes half the Consortium of Worlds. She looked at Leia. You see what my son undertakes for you? On the lawn, the principal referee raised a red scarf high overhead and let it flutter to the ground. It had scarcely touched the tallest blade of grass when the fight commenced. Hapen tradition dictated that honor duels commence with little fanfare and even less preamble. Leia quickly grasped that it was largely a matter of making sure that everyone had their wagers in place. From what she could gather by eavesdropping on nearby conversations, and Ta'a Chum's avowals to the contrary, Thane was favored to win. Despite his agitation, or perhaps as a response to it, C-3PO insisted on providing commentary even after the fight had begun. Olmok, by contrast, was clearly entranced, down on his haunches at the edge of the manicured lawn, his bulging eyes riveted on his soldier and Thane as they circled, feeling each other out with tentative kicks and punches. Like his soldier, Thane was tall and muscular, but his thick legs and broad shoulders made his soldier look positively wiry by comparison. His moves, as he loosened up, suggested both great power and dexterity, and he wasn't timid about showing right away that he was good. He came at his soldier with double and triple kick combinations, fired by the same leg, recocking and letting fly without bringing his foot down in between. And he had fast hands as well. Isolder parried the attack skillfully, but refrained from counterpunching, as if undecided about which offense to employ. Even so, it was obvious to Leia that they were both essentially foot fighters, 
with Thane's style drawing on traditional techniques and his soldiers on straightforward boxing. The rules of the honor duel were known to everyone present, save for her and Olmach, but Leia understood that the body armor and headgear served a dual purpose. In addition to dampening the bone-breaking and electroshock capabilities of the gloves and boots, the sensor-studded padding indicated when a contestant landed a scoring blow by way of a remote receiver. What an appalling display, C-3PO remarked worriedly. And I fear it will only get worse, mistress. Where most opponents agree beforehand to refrain from inflicting serious injury, the Prince of the Archon waived the usual restrictions. Leia tried to ignore him. At the same time, she repressed an urge to think aloud, Don't do this as soldier, for fear that he might hear her through the Force and come undone. Corrin Horn's actions at Ithor had been noble, and yet they had failed to preserve the planet. Isolder and Thane worked each other around for several long minutes without scoring, though the punishing blows they rained on each other sounded like the muffled reports of ancient firearms. Exposed flesh reddened and swelled. A punch from Isolder drove Thane clear across the lawn. A front kick by the Archon lifted the prince completely off his feet. Then both of them scored in rapid succession when a soldier left himself open to a blow to the head in order to land a powerful twisting punch to Thane's ribs. The rooting of the onlookers was enthusiastic, but nothing like the bloodthirsty tumult professional gamblers would have raised. Inaudibly, Tenetiel Joe, Tenel Ka, and some of the advisors intoned calming chants. Leia kept her concern in check by telling herself that what she was witnessing was no different from so many of the lightsaber practice duels she'd seen and engaged in over the years. Isolder and Thane went at each other again, this time at Isolder's lead, with a set-piece attack of left fist, right fist. Thane confidently went for the block and counter against an expected right roundhouse kick, only to realize too late that it was a feint. Isolder cocked his leg back like lightning and again struck him in the ribs. Falling back, Thane grimaced in pain, but managed nonetheless to slip in an off-balance counter kick that caught Isolder unprepared. The primary referee glanced at the remote receiver and declared points for each fighter. With the match a 2-2 tie and both of them panting, he called for a sudden death round. Sudden death? C-3PO moaned in alarm. Sudden death? It was plain that Thane understood how Isolder had set a trap for him. Once more he moved tentatively, though seemingly less out of respect for Isolder's prowess than out of wariness for his talent to deceive. Isolder kept his distance as well, ultimately forcing Thane to bore in on him. The Archon faked a punch, twirled, and cycloned his right foot at Isolder's thigh. Isolder twisted to avoid the full force of the impact, but an agonized yelp escaped him, and everyone realized that he had nearly been incapacitated. The injured leg collapsed under him, and he dropped to one knee, aiming a stiff-armed punch to Thane's midsection on the way down. Thane anticipated the blow and stopped short just out of range, then brought one foot around and down in a crescent kick meant to shatter Isolder's extended forearm and open him up for a frontal attack. But Isolder withdrew his arm in time and shoulder rolled out of harm's way. Shooting to a crouch, he launched himself at Thane. Thane backed away, windmilling his arms to parry punches and kicks, then stepping to one side and executing a fast one-handed forward flip, right foot extended to smash his soldier in the face. His soldier stooped, catching Thane's lower calf in the crook of the X he formed with raised forearms, then called on his thigh muscles to spring him upright. Thane's planted foot slipped on the grass, and he slammed supine to the ground. Isolder went after him, whirling for a back kick going in, but Thane spun on his shoulders and neatly swept Isolder's feet out from under him. Springing themselves upright, they exchanged lightning volleys of kicks and body punches. Plosive sounds cut the salt air as they alternated in having the wind knocked out of them. Thane's right foot caught Isolder's left forearm just above the edge of the power glove, and Leia was certain she heard bone fracture. It struck her all at once that sudden death could mean just that. Surprised that neither of them had scored, the crowd grew louder, urging each man on. 
Leia heard Captain Astarta's voice cut through the din, commanding a soldier to regain focus. Only Leia and Ta'a Chum stood silently now, wrapped in concern. With a deft hop, Isolde reversed his stance to keep his maimed forearm out of the line of fire and launched another counteroffensive. Thane's huge fist tagged him a glancing blow on the side of the head, but the Archon received a toe kick to the knee in return. Thane apparently wasn't accustomed to fighting someone his own size, and Isolde made the most of it. Time and again he caught Thane's foot in his upper arm or shoulder or managed to duck his head out of the way. But his soldier appeared to be tiring. With little left to pitch that he hadn't already tried, he again advanced with left fist, right fist, as wind up for a right roundhouse kick. Leia's breath caught in her throat. It was the most elementary and binary kind of gamble. Thane had to decide whether his soldier was setting the move up as a feint or was going to commit to it this time. It came down to whether or not Thane believed his soldier was fool enough to stake everything. His reputation, Thane's promise to side with Hapes with regard to the Yuzhan Vong, perhaps even the respect of the royal family and Leia, on trying the same trick after it had been compromised the first go-round. Thane set himself for a faint encounter. His soldier let him believe he had chosen correctly by using broken timing, appearing for an instant to be faking, then let fly the intended roundhouse. From the sound of the impact, it was clear that a soldier had planned the kick to connect with enough force to end the match. Even so, he exercised more restraint than Thane probably would have shown. The slap of the boot on the head guard echoed off the black rocks that graced the shore and the primary referee had one hand up to signal the winning point before Thane had hit the ground. Betting stakes were changing hands even as the two opponents were bowing to each other. Given the added wager, many of the witnesses were beside themselves with outrage, and arguments began to erupt on all sides of the lawn. One to whom success came often, Isolde didn't flaunt his victory. Even the customary embraces he received from his wife and daughter failed to elicit so much as a smile. Archon Thane appeared grudgingly congratulatory, but Leia could see that there would be no lasting peace between House Thane and House Isolde. At the moment, however, that didn't matter. Thane's loss meant at least one more vote on the side of supporting the New Republic. Thane and his seconds began to storm away from the lawn, but before he reached the path that led to the dock, Thane changed direction and angled for Leia. She braced herself. Ambassador, I will make my formal apology when the consortium representatives convene to vote on the issue of rendering aid to the New Republic, he began. Rest assured that I will honor my pledge to stand with Princess Older. He scowled despite himself. For now I wish only to applaud you for moving the consortium one step closer to what will no doubt prove to be a catastrophic campaign. Twelve. Melisma, Gaff, and a dozen other Rin slogged through the shin-deep mud that had formed in the wake of Ruin's most recent on-command downpour. Conditions in Facility 17 were deteriorating rapidly, and no one was smiling, not even Gaff, who was usually unflappingly sanguine in the worst of situations. The camp's overseers had requested that the Rin report to the familiarization sector for purposes yet to be disclosed. A facsimile of civilization as defined by any number of core worlds, the sector functioned as a training and indoctrination ground for those refugees bound for the heart of the New Republic. Despite Salish Ag's attempt to maroon on ruin as many refugees as possible, a host of worlds and corporations had similar employment scenarios in mind for the displaced peoples of the outer and mid-rims. Optical concerns were seeking species with innate visual acuity, and acoustical concerns sought species with expanded ranges of hearing. Some companies were desirous of nothing more than folks of size and brute strength. Still, most of the refugees had never resided in the colonies, let alone on core worlds, and so the need for indoctrination classes meant to bring the culturally deprived up to speed for their new lives. Melisma and the rest trudged past crude buildings and pavilions where basic was being taught to Rurians and Dugs. 
Other structures were devoted to instructive sessions in interfacing with droids, computers, and virtual life forms, riding turbo lifts, drop shafts, and beltways, dealing with Bacta treatments, Durasheet, and Flimsoplast, the use of comlinks, hollow projectors, and conform loungers, proper behavior in restaurants, theaters, and other public places and comportment in the presence of the wealthy, the politically connected, or the influential. The Rin contingent had been directed to Structure 58, which was empty when they entered, save for a grouping of rickety tables and chairs, and a human female whose eyes bugged out of her head on seeing them. She glanced at the display of a data pad she wore around her neck, quickly composed herself, and asked everyone to be seated. The fact that Melisma and the others opted to sit on the floor undermined the woman's aplomb, which was obviously as flimsy as the furniture, and once again she looked to the data pad for advice of some sort. "'You've been asked to report here,' she began in basic, "'because an opportunity has arisen that could provide you with transport to Essels, as well as employment once you arrive.' In pure surprise, Melisma turned to Gaff, whose optimism made a sudden comeback. The job is somewhat peculiar, but as it is the only job offer targeted specifically for your species, I'm certain you'll want to consider it. She cleared her throat in a meaningful way. Essentially, you would be residing in a kind of living museum, where diverse folks coexist, displaying to the intellectually inquisitive or the merely curious, the various and sundry elements unique to their species. No one spoke for a long moment. Then Gaff asked, What exactly would we be required to do? Why, simply to be yourselves, the woman said in an unintentionally high-pitched voice. His former grin abandoned, Gaff glanced at Melisma, then looked back at the woman. You're suggesting that it would be just like being here, except that we'd have thousands of visitors gawking at us day and night. Observing, the woman clarified, not gawking. Melisma shook her head in dismay. I'm sorry, but we'll have to decline the offer, she said, speaking for everyone. The woman spent a moment gnawing at her lower lip, then moved to the door to ascertain that no one was about. When she swung around to the rin, her eyes twinkled in a way they hadn't earlier, and her tone of voice was conspiratorial. I shouldn't really be telling you this, but Salish Ag is prepared to furnish you with employment right here on Ruin. She paused to allow her words time to sink in. I'm certain that some of you have had past experience on agricultural worlds, and that you would adapt easily to both the work and the environment. In return, Salish Ag would expect you only to sign a contract stating that you will remain on world for at least the next three standard years. What does the work pay? Gaff asked with elaborate enthusiasm. Salish Ag will furnish everything you need in the way of shelter and food, and deduct the costs from your wages. The rest is, of course, yours to do with as you please, although the company discourages its employees from actually accepting credits for fear they might be spent frivolously or gambled away. The last thing Salish Ag wants is employees who have overspent and have no recourse but to work off the debts they incurred. Gaff slapped his thigh in fabricated delight. What a sweet deal! When everyone had stopped laughing, Melisma said, We're not interested. The woman folded her arms across her chest. Won't you at least consider the offer? I'm sure you don't want to remain in this camp any longer than you have to. The scarcely veiled threat was still ringing in Melisma's ears when the wren filed out of the building some moments later. She didn't know whether to be angry, anxious, or both. Fortune-telling had been earning the Wren enough credits to purchase decent foodstuffs, but business was already beginning to fall off. Without credits, the camp would rapidly become the prison it was meant to be, and in the end she and the others would be forced to accept Salish Ag's offer. She didn't think she could feel more disheartened until they arrived back at the Wren encampment to find two human males waiting for them, no doubt to drive home the hopeless nature of their predicament, 
and to sell them again on the wisdom of signing on with Salish Ag. And yet there was something about the pair that gave her pause. For starters, they were too seedy even for representatives of Salish Ag. The taller one was gangly and bearded, and his long fingers were tobacco-stained. He wore utility coveralls that were a size too small, and his boots were more suited to spaceport work than a desk job. The other man was equally unkempt, with grease under his fingernails and grime on his forehead. Black hair curtained his pale, pointed face and fell lanky and unwashed to his shoulders. Lesh as it is, ruins a rock like any other when you'd rather be elsewhere, the tall one said to Gaff as he approached. But every rock has its secret exits, the others chimed in, even ruin. Gaff smiled pleasantly. Yes, and every one of those clandestine egresses requires a toll we can't afford to pay. Tall seemed to take the reply as a good sign. Then maybe you'd like to earn the toll. Gaff waved the men to a couple of chairs Ravana had cobbled together. At the same time, he asked someone to bring tea and food. We represent a concern that provides private transportation to other worlds, Tall explained. Four thousands of credits per passenger, Gaff said. The man nodded. But believe it or not, there are folks here with more than that to spend. The problem is, the short man took over, they lack official permits to travel. Now, normally their credits would buy them documentation as well, but Salish Ag is making it difficult because they have their own reasons for wanting to keep everyone on world. Ravana sighed. We're aware of those reasons. Well, then, here's the thing, the first man said. The business concern we represent has official authority to transport a shipload of paying clients to Abragado Re, which is accepting exiles. Abrogado Re, Ravana said in delight, a much happier alternative than any of the core worlds, positively flush with opportunities. Tall nodded. No camps, no labor contracts, no fine print. Everyone gets off to a fresh start. But unless we can show our clients' names on official permits of transit, all the credits in the universe won't get any of them off ruin. Gaff mulled it over. Then you need a good slicer to enter those names in the database. Short shook his head. Salish Ag is on the lookout for slicers. Everything has to be done by Dura's sheet and official seal. Gaff and Ravana traded knowing looks. Go on, Gaff said. The humans also traded looks. It's no secret that you people are good at forging permits and such, Tall said. Yeah, like the ones you forged allowing you to emigrate to the corporate sector way back when. Unsubstantiated rumors, Ravana said. Tall smiled. Even so. Gaff cut him off. Do you have an example of the seal you want copied? Short opened a case and handed Gaff a square of Dura sheet bearing an elaborate official seal. This comes straight from Coruscant. Each letter of transit can list up to 100 names. So we'd need five of them. Gaff and Ravana conferred for a moment. This seal and the calligraphy are intentionally antiquated, Gaff said at last. We'd need the proper tools along with the inks and such. Tall shrugged. Whatever you need. What's in this for us? Melisma asked before anyone else could. The same man shrugged. That's entirely up to you. Clothing, food, furniture, you name it. She gazed at him. How about transport off ruin? Again, the two men traded glances. How many are you? The first asked. Thirty-seven, including an infant. Tall deliberated, nodding his head slowly. We just might be able to arrange that. Only to Abrogado Re, you understand, his partner added. No alternative destinations. Gaff glanced at Melisma, Ravana, and some of the others. Abrogado Re would suit us fine. Tall folded his arms. Then here's how it's going to work. We'll provide everything you need to forge the permits. If we're satisfied that they'll pass muster with Salish Ag and the spaceport authorities here on Ruin, you've got yourselves a deal. 
I am plan. Tholatin's Weequay security chief said as he joined Droma and Han in the Falcon's forward hold. Plan had the thumbs of his big hands hooked into the broad gun belt that gathered a quilted knee-length garment the color of Srilor's desert wastes. His broad-nosed, desiccated face was deeply creased, and dark age spots showed on the almond-shaped bony plate that reinforced his skull from brow ridge to spine. His deep-set eyes gave him a haunted, fearsome aspect. Behind him stood two mean-spirited humans in camouflage combat suits, one cradling a new-generation blaster rifle, the other a twenty-year-old Blastech E-11, which had been the weapon of choice among Imperial stormtroopers. Half a dozen other humans and aliens were inspecting various parts of the ship. Han couldn't make out their muffled comments, but the mere thought of them pawing through his property filled him with rage. It took all the control he could summon to keep from going ballistic. My first mate, Meek, Droma said, gesturing offhandedly toward Han. Plan nodded. Sorry about having to search ship, Captain Droma. Furnished passcodes checked out. But as things are now, even we must take precautions. A being more apt to communicate by pheromones than words, Plan spoke in a clipped and heavy accent. With the hyperdrive behaving erratically, it had been a long, slow trip to Tholatin, an uninhabited world, save for a deep, almost undetectable rift legions of smugglers had used over the years. The Falcon, going under the name Sunlight Franchise, had been directed to a landing zone on the floor of the forested cleft, but berthing spaces and maintenance areas were located under a ceiling of cantilevered rock at the base of a sheer cliff. Although he had taken heart that the old passcodes had worked, Han was troubled by the motley nature of some of the berthed ships. "'You have been to Esau's Ridge before?' Plan asked suddenly, studying Han with interest. "'Not in a lot of years. Back then, who running things?' Han stroked his beard as if in hazy recollection. Let's see, there was Braca A. Nasa, and an information broker named Formyage. A Yao, as I remember. Plan nodded. Long gone, with almost everyone from those days. Left when the Yuzhan Vong pushed through on way to hot space. He glanced at Droma. Where acquired those passcodes, Captain? From a friend on Nar Shada, Droma said, as Han had instructed. A human by the name of Shug Ninx. Plan nodded again. Ninx is known to us. So you are coming from Nar Shada? Droma had his mouth open to affirm that they'd arrived from hut space when a baritone voice rang out from the starboard ring corridor. Plan, get a look at this. Han and Droma followed the security chief into the corridor. Just where the outrigger cockpit branched off, two human members of the search team had discovered the removable panels that covered the secret compartments Han had used for smuggling in what felt to him like another lifetime. Like plan, the two snoops had the raw-boned look of mercenaries or pirates rather than smugglers, which jibed with the mix-and-match ships, the uglies, Han had observed in the berthing spaces. Plan was grinning bemusedly. Smugglers? Now and again, Droma said. Freelance or for huts? We're independent contractors. Plan snorted. Better ways of earning credits these days. Even huts have to take care. With Boss Bungie forced off Jubilee Wheel, not enough glitter stim on Ord Mantell to fill Bantha's horn. As he was saying it, a short man wearing mechanics utilities entered the corridor from the extended landing ramp. Looks like your ship has seen some recent action, he told Droma. Whoever you were running from ruined your new anodizing. Droma replied to Plan's inquisitive look. We encountered a Yuzhan Vong patrol. Fortunately, we escaped with nothing more than a damaged power converter and hyperdrive. The mechanic pursed his lips, glanced around, and nodded. Vintage ship, but I think we can fix you up with the parts you need. Plan seemed to relax somewhat. Would not have to worry about Yuzhan Vong patrols if you knew the right people, 
he said as he followed Droma and Han back to the forward compartment. Droma glanced at Han before saying, Knowing the right people is something we've never been especially good at. The security chief uttered a dour laugh. Perhaps luck is about to change. He walked to the entrance to the port ring corridor, then into the adjacent circuitry bay. How many passengers this crate carry? he asked without turning around. She's smaller than she looks, Han answered, taking a few steps toward plan. Below decks, she's nothing but crawl space, and even if we packed passengers in like finger fins, the air scrubbers and oxygen supply couldn't handle more than fifty or so, and then only for a few hours. Why do you ask? Droma said. Plan turned and walked back into the hold. Many here at Esau's Ridge do contract work for employer who has a direct line to Yuzhan Vong. Han watched Plan. Yeah, a couple of friends of ours were working for a guy who claimed to have a direct line to the Yuzhan Vong. But when it came down to cases, the guy was no help at all. Ever hear of the Peace Brigade? Plan nodded slowly. Outfit of Rec Desh. Same employer? Same, Plan confirmed. But in kinds of activities Peace Brigade handled, we steer clear. Many risks. Relocation runs our specialty. Relocation runs, Han said. Private transport for refugees eager to escape New Republic camps. Han's eyes narrowed with suspicion. Depending on what you charge for services, you're either a philanthropist or a predator. Plan laughed. Because we receive large bonuses on back end, passengers pay only modest amounts. So this nameless contractor is the philanthropist, Droma said. To earn bonuses, contractor requires that we deliver refugees to specific worlds, worlds that end up Yuzhan Vong targets. Han had to force his mouth to work. You're recycling them. Refugees pay to leave one camp, find themselves caught up in an invasion, and end up in another camp. He fought down an urge to tear plan limb from limb. And, of course, the Yuzhan Vong are happy because you're making things all the more complicated for the New Republic relief workers. Plan shrugged. Added burden for New Republic, but steady employment for us. Interested? We might be, Droma said. Do you have anything going at the moment? Plan made a regretful sound as he cocked his head to one side. Too bad you not arrive sooner. Some of our people moving a bunch off ruin very soon. Droma sat unsteadily at the engineering station, determined not to look at Han. Ruin? Han glanced briefly at him and began to pace. Maybe we're not too late to join in, he said, only partially successful at keeping alarm and apprehension from his voice. He turned to plan. How soon can we get the parts we need? Thirteen. In the dank and underlighted hold that served as both mess hall and dormitory for the privileged captives aboard the Yamask carrier, Worth Skidder placed his bowl beneath the spout of the nutrient dispenser, waited while his allotted share drizzled out, then carried the bowl to his usual spot of deck space, where he lowered himself into a cross-legged posture and forced himself to eat. Like all things Yuzhan Vong, the container had surely been fashioned from some creature perhaps from the egg of an outsized oviparous animal, and the spoon, though made of an exotic hardwood, bore no traces of carving or machining, and appeared to have been grown with handle and bowl provided. Even the thick, tapered spout of the nutrient dispenser gave all evidence of being attached to some living thing that resided unseen on the far side of the hold's curved and membranous bulkhead. Shortly, Roa and Fosco joined him on the floor, as had become their habit. Both of them, along with almost everyone else in the hold, looked bedraggled and waterlogged from having had to endure long sessions in the tank with the Yamask. Four captives had died as a consequence of the creature's attempts at mind-probing, and more than twice that number had been rendered catatonic. Skidder had survived only by drawing gently on the Force, just deeply enough to maintain sanity without revealing his Jedi-hood. 
He was down to his last spoonful of nutrient when Roa said, Well, look who's returned. Following Roa's delighted gaze, Skidder turned and saw Safa and her five fellow Wren entering the hold. Instantly he got to his feet and waved them over, appraising them as they approached. None of the six had been seen since Commander Kynkal had ordered them away. What must have been standard days earlier. Everyone had wondered about their mysterious disappearance, and Skidder was eager to learn where they had been taken. To the hut, Safa said in reply to his question as she lowered herself to the floor. Roa's mouth fell open. A hut? On board this ship? Safa nodded. Ronda Basadi Diori, the son of a hut named Borga. Skidder waited to speak until three of Safa's companions had moved off to join the food line. Why is Rhonda here? he asked quietly, but forcefully. Safa regarded him for a moment. It seemed to us that the Yuzhan Vong are grooming him to take charge of transporting prisoners of war, for sacrifices perhaps, or some other purposes. So that's the deal they cut for themselves, Skidder said through locked teeth. But why were you brought to Rhonda? She laughed without mirth. To tell his fortune. Using Rin as diviners was once a pastime of the huts, amusing to them, frequently fatal to us. When forecasts failed to come true, the diviners were killed in various but always gruesome ways. I grew up hearing tales of such things. Skidder considered it. So Rhonda asked you to predict his future, he said at last. What did you tell him? Safa shrugged. Innocuous things, open to interpretation. For instance, Roa asked, The near future will be a sometimes puzzling mix of pleasures and challenges. He has much on his mind as a result of monumental events that have recently come to pass. The future hinges on his ability to think clearly and see all sides. Fosco laughed with his mouth full. I've been told the same things by you people. And Rhonda accepted that, Skidder said. He seemed to. Safa gestured broadly to the hold. We're here, and not to the best of my knowledge, slated for imminent execution. Skidder's eyes narrowed with intent. Did he ask to see you again? Safa nodded. After his beauty sleep, probably to evaluate our accuracy. Was kind Carl present? The first time. The commander took some interest in our reading of Rhonda's body markings and palm lines. On the second occasion, he grew bored. I doubt he'll be there next time. He's just accommodating the hut, Roa suggested. I suspect that the Yuzhan Vong consider themselves shapers of the future, not destined for one outcome or another. Skidder was deep in thought. One of the Wren returned with a bowl of nutrient for Safa, but she pushed it away in disgust. The same stuff for every meal, for every species. Fosco nodded. One gruel fits all. He eyed the untouched bowl Safa had set aside. You going to eat that? he asked finally. Help yourself, she told him. He did, ravenously, only ceasing his spooning to remark. You'll learn to tolerate it. Besides... It's the only way to keep up your strength. Answer me this, Safa said. The Yuzhan Vong employ organic technology where we use machines, correct? Thus far, Roa said. Then they don't use machines or droids to prepare this stuff. I wouldn't think so. And yet I haven't seen any chefs or any kitchen staff. So who prepares it? Fosco stopped eating his spoon in midair to exchange glances with Roa. Critters, he said to Safa. Creatures. Safa gazed at the thin gray gruel. Creatures cook this? Again Roa and Fosco swapped glances. In a manner of speaking, Roa said delicately. Safa frowned. In what manner of speaking? Fosco set the bowl down. Look, you don't care for the stuff as is. Maybe you shouldn't be wondering where it comes from or how it's cooked. 
Sappho was about to ask regardless, but Skidder abruptly surfaced from his pensive trance. Rhonda has an entourage with him. Bodyguards. Some Rodians, Aqualish, and Twilex. Sappho said, the usual mix. How many bodyguards? Sappho looked to one of her clanmates, who said, ten. Roughly the same number of guards in the Yamask tank hold, Skidder muttered. He fell silent, then looked hard at Sappha and the other Rin. Listen carefully. The next time you're summoned, you're going to tell Rhonda that he's going to be betrayed. He's been lured aboard only so that Commander Kynkal can sacrifice him. He cut his eyes to Sappha. You understand? She and the other Rin regarded one another in bafflement. And when that doesn't come to pass, you'll have us all sucking vacuum. Skidder shook his head. It will come to pass, because I'm going to plant an idea in the Yamask that Rhonda is going to betray Kynkal, and that he only agreed to come aboard to free us. The Yamask is sure to alert Kynkal, and Kynkal might even want the Yamask to take a peek at what's in the hut's head. Sapha shook her head as if to clear it. People have found unusual purposes for the Rin, but this... Roa frowned at Skidder. Look, Cain, just because the creature has taken a liking to you, that doesn't mean you can actually talk to it, much less plant an idea in its brain. Skidder sneered. You're wrong. I've already been conversing with it. Fosco choked on his food and made a comical gesture to indicate madness. Somebody's been in the tank too long, he fairly hummed. Roa continued to stare at Skidder. You say you've been conversing with the Yamask? By using the Force. Fosco broke the protracted silence by saying with patent disbelief, The Force? I'm a Jedi Knight, Skidder announced, in a way that managed to combine modesty and pride. My real name is worth Skidder. Well, well, Roa huffed. That certainly answers a lot of my questions about you. Then I was right, Sapha said. You deliberately allowed yourself to be captured. Skidder nodded. At the time, I didn't know they had a war coordinator aboard this ship. But one thing is clear. They're conveying it to a world they plan to invade and utilize as a forward base of operations. We need to learn that destination and find some way to get the information to the Jedi or the New Republic military. Roa was the first to respond. Let's say you do manage to turn Kind Kyle and the Hut against one another. How's that going to help you get what you want? Skidder was one step ahead of him. Once I've gained the Amisk's trust, it's going to tell me where we're headed. Okay, Roa said tentatively. I'll make use of the Amisk to control the Dovan Basil that drives the ship. Roa and Sapha traded glances. And then, the old man asked... Skidder fixed him with a look. We mutiny. The hut consulate on Coruscant was chaotic. Servants and dozens of hired workers were busy emptying the place of the vast amount of antiques, keepsakes, and collectibles Golga had amassed in his too brief reign as consul general. Reclining on the couch that occupied the center of the courtyard chamber he had come to think of as home, he could only hope that the galaxy would return to normal in the near future, and that Borga the Almighty might deem him fit to continue serving as now Hutta's envoy to the New Republic. Until such time, he would simply have to accept whatever posting Borga assigned him, though it chilled him even to imagine being sent to somewhere like Srelor, Kessel, or perish the thought, Tatooine. Careful with those hookers, he said to the three Gamorians who were crating his water pipes. Some of those once belonged to Jabba himself. He lowered his stubby arms, cursing himself for not having had the good sense to order the Rodians on his staff to see to the hookers. But they were in the sleep chamber, packing away even more personal belongings and everyone else was too occupied destroying documents, making round trips to the launch platform, or keeping the demonstrators from storming the consulate, as one group had attempted to do only the previous evening. 
Turmoil had been the order of the day since the Holonet had broken the story that Nell Hutta had made a separate peace with the Yuzhan Vong, and that the Huts were severing diplomatic relations with the New Republic. Had Borga notified Golga in advance, the consulate could have been quietly closed. Instead, the penthouse of the old Republic-style Valorum Tower had become a target for every Outer Rim refugee on Coruscant, and thus a precarious place to reside. Servants, attachés, and staffers had decamped, including Golga's chargé d'affaires. Suppliers had refused to deliver food and other needed supplies. Coruscant Energy had engineered power failures, and Coruscant Water had so reduced the flow that daily bathing in the penthouse's converted fountain had become impossible. The number of bomb threats exceeded 100, though no devices had been discovered, and on the holonet rumors flew fast and furious, accusing the huts of everything from treason to sabotage with many calling for the arrest of all huts, and some advocating a declaration of war. Even now a mixed-species crowd was assembled on the observation balcony of the tower across the city canyon, chanting for retribution, throwing fists in the air, and appealing to the ceaseless flow of air traffic with huge and multicolored hut-condemning holla placards. Early on, Golga had tolerated the strident gatherings, but he had since ordered the transparasteel windows curtained so he wouldn't have to be greeted by the sight of demonstrators each time he entered the chamber. Soon, in any case, the angry crowds would be nothing more than an unpleasant memory. He would be on his way to Nal Hutta and to diplomatic duties elsewhere in the galaxy. Once more, worries of a posting on Tatooine assailed him, but they were interrupted by the arrival of his Twi'lek secretary. Highness, New Republic Senator Shesh requests audience. Now, Golga said incredulously, doesn't Senator Shesh realize that I'm preparing to depart? She does, Highness, but she asserts that it is vital that she speak with you beforehand. She asserts further that you will be passing up a unique opportunity should you elect not to grant her audience. A unique opportunity, indeed. Is this Senator Viki Shesh of Kuat? Yes, Highness. Golga grimaced in derision. A member of the Advisory Council and the Security and Intelligence Council. Shall I tell you beforehand about this unique opportunity? She is going to ask me to serve as an agent for New Republic Intelligence. She will promise generous compensation for my keeping her committee apprised of what goes on in Borga's court, of who comes and goes, and of what matters are spoken. She will avouch, in the strongest terms, that the huts will ultimately be betrayed by the Yuzhan Vong, and that Borga will be brought down. She will be quick to assure that the New Republic will one day prevail against the Yuzhan Vong, and at that time my contributions to their defeat will become public knowledge, and I will reap the benefits of my treachery by being awarded a position suitable to my new station in life. Perhaps a palace here in Coruscant, or a political appointment to the world of my choice. The Twi'lek waited until he was certain that Golga was finished. I should inform her, then, that your highness is not interested in speaking with her. Golga blinked and wet his lips with his fat, pointed tongue, lending voice to what heretofore had been most private musings, had accorded them a sudden credibility. Under the guise of sufferance, he motioned with his tiny hands. No, show her in but make sure she understands that I have a flight to catch. The Twi'lek bowed graciously and left the chambers. When he returned a moment later, he was accompanied by a comely, dark-haired human female, on whom even normally drab senatorial garb looked like evening wear. Golga was a Basadi, but he had more than a touch of desilogic in his veins, which accounted for a certain partiality to human females. Watching Viki Shesh, he envisioned her dancing for him, or fetching him succulent morsels of living food. Of greater surprise than her beauty was the fact that she had apparently come alone, without so much as an interpreter. Golga arranged himself on the couch, and motioned Shesh to the closest of several comfortable chairs. Never let it be said, he began in basic, when his secretary had exited... That Golga Basadi fear is one to allow unique opportunities to pass him by. 
Shesh smiled with purpose. I'm glad to hear that, Consul Golga. It simplifies matters. Golga licked his lips. As you may or may not know, recent information has come to light, indicating that the Yuzhan Vong intend to attack Tina. Tina? I know nothing of this. Certain parties thought it odd that no spice was being delivered to Tina, and they brought this matter to the attention of New Republic Intelligence. Given the Hut's alliance with the enemy, members of the intelligence community had to ask themselves whether the suspension of deliveries was perhaps a cloaked message from Borga, a way for her to reveal the intentions of the Yuzhan Vong without actually saying as much. Golga grappled with what he was hearing. Clearly you know more about these matters than I do, Senator. In any event, you certainly can't expect me to speak for Borga. You are her envoy, are you not? Yes, but... Then don't concern yourself with speaking for Borga. Simply listen, as she might. Insulted, Golga had an impulse to have Shesh escorted from the chambers, but then thought better of it. I'm listening, Senator, as Borga would. Shesh flashed a warmer smile. Should the intelligence about Tenna prove reliable, one has to wonder if the suspension of spice deliveries to Bathawi and Corellia might signal threats to those systems as well. Or, she held up a meticulously manicured forefinger, whether this is merely what the Yuzhan Vaughn would like us to think while they devise an entirely different attack. She gave Golga a moment to ponder it, then continued. You see, the Senate and the Defense Force are very divided on just this issue. With New Republic fleets widely dispersed to protect the core worlds, a decision has to be reached on whether additional ships should be deployed at Bathawi or Corellia. Golga laughed. Senator, I haven't the slightest idea what the Yuzhan Vong plan to do next. Furthermore, it is ludicrous to assume that Borga has been made privy to their plans. Shesh crossed her legs and leaned forward. You can assure me of that. I can. Everyone has attached too much import to this so-called alliance. Borga and the clan leaders of the Grand Council wished to avoid a war at all costs. To do so required that we allow the Yuzhan Vong access to certain worlds in our space. Worlds of little consequence, which they intend to mine for resources or remake in some way. Granted, this is a form of aiding and abetting the enemy. But the end result would have been the same had we opted to go to war. We are powerful, but not as powerful as the enemy. The Huts managed to hold the Empire at bay, Shesh pointed out. Delaying the Yuzhan Vong would have helped. I won't deny it, but our society would have been destroyed. We have always believed in keeping to ourselves, Senator. We have never attempted to intrude on New Republic space. Well, there was that one regrettable episode involving Durga. But other than that, we huts have been content to move spice, indulge ourselves with food, drink, music, and dance. We are not warriors, Senator, much less warlords. Shesha's eyes narrowed in thought. So you are only trying to preserve what you have. You are not actually siding with the Yuzhan Vong. We are not. And should they defeat the New Republic? If I may speak plainly, we'll go on as we always have. Poorer, perhaps, for not selling spice, or wealthier, from selling even more than we do now. To the miserable defeated masses, Shesh said, loosing a short laugh. As the statement didn't beg a response, Golga didn't offer one. I want you to deliver a message to Borga, Consul. Tell her that while the fleets are deployed elsewhere, the New Republic would like nothing more than to see the Yuzhan Vong attack Corellia. They have a surprise in store, including a big shiny toy that could spell trouble for your new overlords. But tell her also that this information is offered as a means of redressing an earlier wrong. Borga won't understand, but there are those who will. Golga stared at her. If I didn't know better, he said at last, 
I would be tempted to surmise that you are supplying me with intelligence that would be of great value to the Yuzhan Vong. Shesh shrugged. Think what you will. Nevertheless, how do I know that this isn't simply disinformation designed to make the huts look like fools? Shesh said nothing. Whichever the case, Senator, this is most unexpected. Shesh's smile was enigmatic. Who knows, Consul? Someday we might be working together. To that possible end, I think we're off to a good start. Fourteen. In Rin City's dormitory, with all thirty-seven Rin gathered around them and waiting breathlessly, the two humans, tall and short, appraised the completed letters of transit. The forgeries had required almost four ruined days of clandestine work, with almost everyone contributing in one way or another. Where Gaff was skilled at line drawing, Ravana excelled at calligraphy. Many of the females had seen to mixing and applying the colors, and even Melisma had lent a hand by proofreading the passenger names and scrutinizing the letters for imperfections. She stood between Gaff and Ravana now, Safa's infant, quiet as a skimp for a change, balanced on her hip. The stuffy air of the dormitory was so tense that when Tall finally pronounced the letters perfect, it was as if fireworks had gone off. Everyone exhaled in relief and grinned broadly. Melisma handed the infant to one of the other females and gave Gaff and Ravana tight hugs of joy. The humans waited for the wren to calm down. Displaying one of the sheets of Dora's sheet, Tall showed Gaff an appreciative look. I see you've already listed yourselves. Gaff puffed out his chest in theatrical pride. That's because we knew you would find them impeccable. Tall nodded and handed all the letters to Short, who placed them inside a beat-up alloy case. We'll submit everything to Salish Ag later this morning. They'll drag the process out for a day or so, but assuming everything goes as planned, you should be prepared to leave on the day after tomorrow. How's that sound? Instead of answering, Gaff raised his hands over his head, made a clicking rhythm with his tongue, and began to dance, cross-stepping and turning slowly as he moved about the room. In a moment, everyone was clapping and clicking in time and joining him in celebration. Melisma could hardly believe their good fortune. In two days, they would be headed clear around the core to Abrogado Re. Apparently in dire need of beauty sleep, Rhonda hadn't asked for the wren as expected. By Skidder's reckoning, two standard days had passed before the hut summoned them. Later that same day, however, Skidder was delighted to find the six wren already in the Yamask tank when he and the other captives were led into the hold. Slipping into the gelatinous liquid and taking his assigned place at one of the tentacles, he gave Safa a meaningful look but said nothing. The session began as usual, with the captives striving to induce the Yamisk, by lulling the creature into a state of tactile elation through caresses and massage, to urge the Dovan Basil to drive the ship to greater speeds. While those sessions had become less demanding psychologically, they were still physically exhausting, and by the time Kind Cal returned the count to normal, many of the captives were bent double over the tentacles, straining for breath and trying to rub the soreness from their hands, arms, shoulders, and chests. The important thing was that Kind Cal was pleased with their efforts, which meant that there would be no more speed work for the remainder of the session. When the commander's circuit on the tank rim had taken him 180 degrees from Skidder, the Jedi threw Safa a quick glance and spoke under his breath. You met with Ranta? She gave him the faintest of nods. We just finished with him. You did as I asked? Against our better judgment. But yes, we did as you asked. How did he react? With palpable concern. He dismissed us almost immediately, probably to confer with his bodyguards and advisors. Skidder's eyes narrowed in covert pleasure. The moment had come to talk to the Yamask. In previous sessions, Skidder had drawn on the Force only enough to grant the creature access to his surface thoughts and emotions. The ease of the bond had brought the Yamask back time and again, 
and on each occasion, Skidder had given the creature a bit more of himself as reinforcement. Now he had to reverse the flow and speak directly to the Yamask, as it obviously believed it had been doing with him. He had been practicing the necessary force technique since the Wren had first told him of their meetings with the Hot. With no more effort than it had taken to slip into the nutrient fluid in which the Yamask floated, Skidder went into a light trance. The goal was to convey through images that Rhonda Basadi Diori was plotting against Commander Kynkal. Skidder had run through the deceit so often in the past two days that the images unreeled before him like some holonet drama. Immediately the tentacle draped almost tenderly across his shoulders began to twitch, then tremble. Then all at once the appendage tightened its hold on him. At the same time, and throughout the tank, the tentacles fastened to other captives dropped away, slapping the fluid with enough force to send nutrients slopping over the rim and onto the floor of the hold. Several captives screamed in alarm as the Yamisk's convoluted body stiffened. Skidder instantly broke mental contact and ducked out from under the tentacle's grip. But that only prompted the creature to twist toward him as if to fix him in its gaze. Skidder, Roa, Safa, and some of the others had the foresight to submerge themselves in the nutrient, but a dozen others were hurled clear out of the tank by the Yamisk's counterclockwise whirl. Fosco was among the latter group, and he was hurled farther than the rest, his already weakened body slammed with bone-breaking force into the Yorick coral bulkhead where it stuck fast for a moment, then began a slow tumble down the scabrous surface to the floor. Some of the longer tentacles made a sudden grab for Skidder as he resurfaced, but he back somersaulted out of the liquid and onto the rim walkway. Frustrated, the Yamisk reared up, then flattened itself, extending its reach to the edge of the tank. The tentacles flailed and slapped against the coral grating, but Skidder deftly avoided them by hopping from foot to foot and executing flips that sent him over their slimy topsides. Elsewhere in the hold, Kind Kyle and the guards had been thrown into utter confusion. They raced around the tank, making futile attempts to calm the creature, convinced for the moment that Skidder was the victim rather than the instigator. The Jedi front flipped to the deck, landing on his feet, but the guards weren't about to cut him too much slack. He could have avoided or defeated the ones who rushed him from all sides, but with nowhere to run he quickly decided that his purposes would best be served by playing the panicked captive, fearful for his life. He pretended to struggle, throwing some of the guards aside with the strength that panic affords. Ultimately, though, he let them get the better of him and sank to the deck under their hold, shrieking, wailing, and gesticulating to the Yamisk. It tried to kill me. It wants to kill me. Having lost its fury, the war coordinator was bobbing on the waves its own actions had stirred. Many captives were pressed to the rim of the tank. Most of those flung outside by the creature's abrupt spin were picking themselves up from the deck, dazed but not seriously hurt. Except for Fosco, who was sprawled lifelessly in an expanding pool of blood. Even Kind Call seemed wary as he approached the Yamisk. Skidder had to believe that not all the creatures developed as planned, and that despite the bioengineering that went into them, some could be flawed, as was sometimes the case with skips and other examples of Yuzhan Vong organic technology. Seeing, or perhaps sensing the commander's approach, the Yamisk extended two tentacles to him, then a third, which the Yamisk curled around Kind Kyle's neck. The commander's eyes rolled up in his head, and he might have collapsed except for the support of the tentacles. Then, blinking back to consciousness, he turned and stared wide-eyed at Skidder. Skidder couldn't begin to guess what the Yamask had related about Rhonda, or about Skidder himself, but the words that flew from Kind Cow were the last thing he expected to hear. A Jedi! The commander eased out of the Yamask's embrace and approached Skidder. A Jedi! Out of the corner of his eye, Skidder saw Roa and Safa hang their heads in defeat. Kind Cow stood before Skidder, shaking his head in both disbelief and wonderment. A valiant effort, Jedi, truly inspired. But what you failed to realize is that 
Yamisks are not grown, but spawned. Each passes the sum total of its learning on to the next. He glanced at the creature. This one's progenitors have had experience with Jedi. Kainkal turned back to Skidder and rested his hands on Skidder's shoulders. But be proud, Jedi, for you have pleased me greatly. In fact, you will be my gift to War Master Sabong La, who will one day arrive to govern Coruscant. Fifteen. The temple of the rousing march that welcomed Supreme Commander Nas Choka aboard the Yuzhan Vong warship Yamka was kept by warriors with drums, but the theme itself was supplied by a menagerie of bioengineered insects and avians. Droning, trumpeting, and whistling from within cages and atop perches situated throughout the great hold. Enormous villop choir transparencies broke the obsidian monotony of the starboard bulkhead, providing a star-strewn panorama of the anchored fleet, as well as a distant view of the hut space world known as Runaway Prince. Remade for the sewing of Yorick coral, villop shrubs, and other necessities of war. To the ships that resembled asteroids, marine behemoths, and tumbled and faceted cabochons had been added an even more massive and sinister specimen. A flattened lapidary orb of glossy black, from the dense center of which spiraled half a dozen arms, as if in dark imitation of the galaxy the Yuzhan Vong were determined to conquer. Supreme Commander Choka, along with his commanders and foremost subalterns, moved on levitated Dovin basal cushions in tiered heights above the deck. In advance of them floated four smaller cushions, their diminutive riders screened by flutters, living creatures that resembled squares of patterned cloth. Arrayed on either side of the arriving group stood five thousand warriors, dressed in battle tunics and armed with amphistaffs and kufis. Confined to a small space among the starboard side group, cowered two hundred prisoners taken from Gindine and already purified for sacrifice. Bony growths affixed to voice boxes and jaws prevented them from giving voice to their fear. Behind Choka marched troops of his own command, their precision footfalls crushing an ankle-deep carpet of maroon flowers, whose aroma, wafted about by the rhythmic beating of wings, had aroused the insects to song. Their stridulations intensifying and diminishing, the insects sustained notes lifted from an otherworldly scale. One moment the march was fiery and inspiring, the next it was a somber dirge. Opposite the arrival bay, at the far end of the cloyingly perfumed parade corridor, waited Commander Malik Carr and his chief subalterns, a coven of priests, and off to one side, Executor Gnome Anor, all revealed in tattooed and modified splendor. As the train of elite warriors neared the dais, the drum beats and insect voices ceased, and Malik Carr stepped to the lip of the raised platform. Welcome, Supreme Commander Choka, he crowed his augmented voice resounding from the arching ceiling and tympanic bulkheads. The Yamka and all here gathered are yours to command. A wrathful droning filled the hold. Simultaneously, ten thousand fists snapped crisply to their opposite shoulders in salute. Supreme Commander Choka, military commander of the recently arrived Spiral Arm World Ship, transferred himself from the Dovin Basil Cushion to an elevated seat at the center of the dais. While the four trailing hover cushions lined up behind him, priests, shapers, and others arranged themselves on the floor to both sides. Only when they were settled did Malik Carr and his contingent follow suit. On the deck, the warriors bade their amphistaffs to coil around their bare right arms and dropped ceremoniously to one knee, heads bowed in deference. The drumming and stridulations resumed, playing to the body as well as the ear. With five loud fanfares, some of the insects rested, but heroic bursts were immediately loosed by other insects as if in reply. The counterpoint continued for some moments. Then, as Choka raised an ophidiform baton of command, the hold fell preternaturally silent. I bring salutations from War Master Tsavong La, he intoned. 
He commends you on the work you have done in preparing the way, and he looks forward to the time when he may join you in battle. Choka's modest stature did not lessen his power. Narrow-hipped, but braced by thick muscular legs, he sat rigidly on the provided chair of carved and polished coral like a statue himself, while black-feathered avians cooled the air around him with their great wings. Facial tattoos, flattened nose, and decurved eyes, above large bluish sacks, afforded him a regal demeanor. His unadorned tunic was offset by a blood-red command cloak that fell from the tops of his shoulders, and rings of gaudy variety grew from his fingers and banded his wrists and upper arms. Black throughout, his long, fine hair was combed straight back from a sloping forehead and reached nearly to his waist. I, too, congratulate you on your successful harvest, he went on after a moment. You have acquitted yourselves well. Your captives from Abroa Sky, Ord Mantel, and Gindine will bloody your nomination. But before we enact the sacrifice of the captives, or learn from Commander Malik Kar the status of the invasion, we will use this moment to reward some of you for the measure of your commitment." The high priest who accompanied Choka rose to his feet and spoke. We thank the gods for delivering us into this promised domain. May the blood you shed purify and cleanse it for the coming of supreme overlord Shemra. We honor the gods with the nurturing sap that flows within us, so that they might thrive and grant that we might continue to caretake their creations. All we do, we do in emulation and in veneration of them. The priest turned to the cushions that hovered behind Choka and motioned with his hand. The flutters lifted off, exposing four meter-high religious statues. The first represented Yun Yuzhan, the Cosmic Lord, absent those parts of himself he had sacrificed to create the lesser gods and the Yuzhan Vong. The second and third statues represented Yun Yamka, the Slayer, and Yun Harla, the Cloaked Goddess. The fourth and undeniably the most grotesque, was Yun Shuno, the many-eyed patron deity of the Shamed Ones. Those whose bodies had rejected the living implants, due either to a lack of preparation or to ambitious overreaching on the part of the candidate. Choka's subordinate commander now rose. Subaltern Doshao, he began, for his actions at the world called Dantooine. Subaltern Satak, for his actions at the world called Ithor. Subaltern Harme, for his actions at the world called Abroa Sky. And Subaltern Tugorn, both for his work in sowing the world called Bel Cadden and his actions at the world called Gindine. He paused briefly, then added, Step forward and be escalated. As the four lesser-grade officers were ascending the dais, a quartet of implanters scuttled from recesses in the throne. When the candidates had arranged themselves in a line facing the supreme commander, the implanters took up positions behind each of them. A variation on the creature responsible for outfitting captives with crippling growths, the implanters were small, gray, and six-legged. Like their cousins, they were equipped with botryoidal optical organs and a quartet of appendages efficient for slicing through flesh and tucking surge coral into open wounds. But where the calcificator made use of bits of itself, the implanter carried whatever enhancements were necessary for the ritual escalation. Each of the four that began slow climbs up the naked backs of the subalterns bore two finger-length horns of coral whose pointed tips were slightly hooked. The implanters didn't begin their work until they had secured themselves to the back of the subaltern's necks, from where they could reach to both shoulders. Employing the sharper of their appendages, they made deep cuts through the tops of the shoulder muscles, clear down to the bones that formed part of the ball and socket joints. When the incisions were complete and acolytes had collected the flowing blood in bowls, the implanters inserted the hooked horns into the cut, employing a resinous exudate they produced to weld the horns to the shoulder bones and to seal the wounds around them. 
At the same time, a slug-like Ungdin wove a helix trail through the candidate's feet, sopping up whatever blood the acolytes failed to capture. Though perspiration ran freely and legs trembled, not one of the junior officers cried out in pain or so much as grimaced. Pleased with their sang froid, Choka gestured to four of his aides, who hurried forward with neatly folded and differently colored command cloaks. By then the acolytes had conveyed the blood-filled bowls to the high priest, and while he dribbled the contents of the bowls over the idols, Choka's aides unfolded the cloaks and hung them from the newly implanted hooked protrusions. The drummers beat out a short tattoo, then stopped. You are escalated and remade, Choka pronounced. And now that you wear the cloak of command, you will be given your own ships, made sector chiefs, and tasked with overseeing and re-educating the populace of those worlds that constitute your domain. For the glory of the gods, warriors and officers alike shouted. Choka watched the promoted warriors step down from the dais, then turned slightly in the direction of Malik Kar. One more matter before we proceed, Commander. He looked past Malik Kar to where Nome Anor was seated. Come forward, Executor. More flamboyantly attired than anyone in the hold, Nome Anor rose and walked slowly across the platform. Opposite Nas Choka, he inclined his head in a nod. As a member of the intendant caste, though of the lowest rank, he was not obliged to offer salute. Since you and I do not hail from the same order, I am not entitled to escalate you. But know this, Executor. Were I so entitled, I would be more inclined to demote than promote you. Clearly surprised, Noam Anor did not respond, though his mouth twitched several times in rapid succession. Your actions, Executor, have been closely monitored and widely discussed, and it is the opinion of many in Shimra's court that you have strayed from your assigned course. First you chose to ally yourself with the Praetorite Vong, who believed they could spearhead an invasion of this magnitude without suffering tragic consequences. I was not allied with him, Noam Anor said when he could. My assignment was to destabilize the New Republic in ways I saw fit. That is what I did among the Imperial Moths, as well as in the Osarian system, and have since done, under different guises, in a half-dozen other systems. Choka shot him a gimlet stare. Who helped the Praetorite Vong obtain a Yamask, and an imperfect one at that? Noam Anor swallowed hard. I may have mentioned something. You facilitated them. Only from a certain point of view. Don't try your double speak on me, Executor. You may have managed to distance yourself from Prefect Dagara and the rest by escaping the price they paid for their miscalculation. But you cannot deny engineering the plan that ended in the death of the priestess Elan, daughter of the high priest Jakan, who, I might add, is most displeased with you. There is no proof that Elan or her mascot Vergir are dead. Even so, I can scarcely be held accountable for what happened to them. You take no blame for employing agents who act without orders from their handler? Nome Anor added force to his voice. My agents were endeavoring to please me, us, by returning Elan. I had no knowledge of their designs until it was too late. Is it true that Elan was to have assassinated a number of Jedi knights? It is. Choka tempered his voice with curiosity. Why this fascination with the Jedi, Executor? I, for one, am not convinced they pose a serious threat to our conquest. It is not the Jedi who pose a threat, so much as the Force, the mystical power they embody. The Force is nothing more than an idea, Choka said loudly, and the best way to extinguish an idea is by replacing it with a better one, such as we bring. Noam Anor risked a patronizing sniff. As you say, Supreme Commander. Choka glowered. Now I learn from Commander Malik Kar that you were instrumental in gaining the allegiance of the creatures that occupy this space, these huts. Noam Anor's genuine eye narrowed. The huts are critical to a plan devised by Commander Malik Kar and myself to force a significant defeat on the New Republic. In fact... He tilted his head to one side. 
you arrive at an auspicious moment, because part of that plan is shortly to be put into effect. If you would care to accompany us into battle, you could observe firsthand our strategy for conquering the core worlds in advance of the arrival of War Master Tsavong La. Choka took a moment to weigh the consequences of such an action, then grunted an affirmative. I will go, but let me caution you, Executor, about the perils of ambition. It's obvious that you are hungry for escalation, but there are no shortcuts to the rank of consul, to say nothing of prefect. He gestured over his shoulder. Look to Yun Shuno for counsel, Executor. Escalation is awarded only to those who have discharged their obligations in service to the gods. You appear to act in your own behalf, as if possessed of a personal stake in the results. He leaned slightly forward. Or is it this galaxy, Executor, and the heathen beliefs of those who populate it that have corrupted you? Nome Anor held his gaze, wishing he had filled his empty eye socket with a venom-spitting Playerian bowl. I care only for what this galaxy is capable of providing the Yuzhan Vong. He cast a glance at Malik Kar. With all due respect, Commander, our target awaits. Malik Kar nodded to Choka. He speaks the truth. The Supreme Commander folded his arms. Let us enact the sacrifices and see what Commander Malik Kar and Executor Nome Anor have masterminded. He pointed to the knot of prisoners. Bring the captives forward. In sacrificing them, perhaps we can help ensure Executor Nome Anor a much-needed victory. 16. On a purely objective level, battles in space had a savage beauty, an incendiary splendor. Any veteran warship commander or fighter jock ordered to speak the truth would have said so. The more candid among them might even have confessed to moments of exhilaration or, at the very least, moments of hypnotic fascination. While ranging laser bursts or the stroboscopic dazzle of short-lived explosions were enough to carry a pilot completely out of him or herself. Add distance to the view and the enchantment increased a hundredfold. For along with fiery and coherent light, there was the black velvet tableau of stars, planets, moons and ships, thrusters flaring, burnished by starlight, reduced to fleeting comets, twirling and pirouetting in a slow pyrotechnic ballet of death. The Battle of Tinna was no exception. Being 700,000 kilometers removed from the cloud-wreathed, cool blue and dark green gem was like having an upper-tier balcony seat at the Coruscant Opera. But the lofty vantage compensated for the lack of details. And as at the opera, technological assists were available for any who wished to bring the action into extreme close-up. Major Showalter might have expressed as much to fellow intelligence officer Belindy Kalenda, but he feared being misunderstood. Consequently, he kept his thoughts to himself, as the two women at the helm of the KDY Light Stealth 18 reconnaissance leaned to either side to afford him and Kalenda an unobstructed view of Tina's ruination. A carbon-black six-passenger craft with a needle-like body and disproportionate down-sloping stabilizers, the Light Stealth Recon was the closest anyone had come to producing a starship capable of hiding itself even while it scanned. Unlike the wide assortment of vessels designed by Wraith Senar, Imperial Section 19, or Warthen's Wizards during the days of the Empire, the LSR wasn't cloaked, but was instead built for silent running and remarkable speed. Bristling with low-profile rectenni and packed with signal-augmented sensor jammers, blind-band hypercom transmitters, crystal grav-field trap scanners, and a power core more suitable to a ship of the line, the LSR could all but see around the universe to its own aft and could outrun nearly anything that got wind of it. The craft's pilots, on temporary duty from the Intelligence Division's own Black Force Squadron, had assured Showalter that the LSR could be moved to within visual range of the Yuzhan Vong flotilla and still evade detection. But Showalter had no desire to be any closer to the route than necessary. They were only there as observers in any case. 
It's horrible, Kalenda said abjectly, turning away from the narrow viewports. I can't stand just sitting here, doing nothing. Showing ourselves will allow the Yuzhan Vong to know we've found a flaw in their strategy, Show Walter pointed out. Even so, the realization that they really could do nothing brought an end to his ruminations about the beauty of battle and pulled down the corners of his mouth. But I agree. It's horrible. Kalenda was slight, dark-skinned, and a touch glassy-eyed, where Showalter was thick-set, pale, and a bit more conspicuous than intelligence liked its officers to be. Recently they had worked closely together in overseeing the Yuzhan Vong defector case, which had not only turned into a political debacle of major proportions, but had also landed both of them in Bacta tanks. In private moments Showalter still chided himself for having been so easily manipulated by Elon, the Yuzhan Vong priestess and faux defector who had very nearly done in Han Solo as well. Showalter had never trusted her, and yet despite his suspicions he had relaxed his guard and ultimately failed to deliver her to Coruscant. He often wondered what might have happened had he succeeded. Would he have been a victim of her poison breath, as Solo had come close to being? Would she have accomplished her goal of assassinating Luke Skywalker and other Jedi Knights? He wondered, too, about the fate of the strange being that had accompanied Elon, the one called Vergeer, who had fled in one of the Millennium Falcon's escape pods, perhaps back into enemy hands, perhaps not. Kalenda had also borne the brunt of the fallout from the affair, as it was thought that she had unwittingly divulged vital details to an informer who sat, even now, in the Senate or on the Security and Intelligence Council. Showalter's and Kalenda's tarnished reputations were clearly what had prompted Talon Card to seek them out. Card, and the Jedi apparently, had uncovered evidence linking the spice trade to New Republic worlds in imminent danger of attack by the Yuzhan Vong. The nature of that link was so tenuous, however, that few would have paid it any heed, save for two defamed officers intent on clearing their names at any cost. Knowing that high-ranking members of the military would be disinclined to hear them out, Showalter and Kalenda had shared Card's data only with select members of the intelligence community. One such member had kept them apprised of Yuzhan Vong fleet movements in hot space, and another of the Holonet S thread disturbances in the hyperspace routes linking hot space to the Tanani system. The jump of several warships from hot space had been enough to prompt Showalter and Kalenda to take a gamble on the flotilla's destination. Already en route to Tina, when confirmation of the Holonet disruptions had been received, they had arrived almost simultaneously with the Yuzhan Vong ships. Arms wrapped tightly around herself, Kalenda was staring as if mesmerized by the distant flashes of light. What were we thinking, Showalter? We should have at least tried to bring the defense force into this. We've been through that, he reflected sourly. They wouldn't have listened. And even if they had, they would have dismissed the evidence as unsubstantiated or at best coincidental, especially considering the source. He glanced over his shoulder at the LSR's fifth and only civilian passenger. No offense, Card. None taken, Card assured from one of the seats. He glanced at Kalenda, then added, Remind her, Major, of the most important reason for not going to the military. Showalter snorted ruefully. On the off chance, Admiral Sav actually listened to us and dispatched a battle group to Tenna. Kalenda pondered the fact dully. If the Yuzhan Vong had found New Republic ships waiting for them, they'd know we're on to them. She gazed out at the viewport. Tina has to fall to save Corellia and Bathawi. Showalter shrugged meaningfully. And maybe dozens more have to fall. Kalenda sighed with purpose. I've been to Tina. It's one of the most beautiful worlds in the expansion region. And the Tinans are probably one of the most well-informed and well-intentioned species anywhere. She turned to Card. I just can't accept that there wasn't some other way of corroborating the intelligence you brought us. 
If nothing else, it'll be over quickly, one of the pilots remarked. Tennis space defense didn't number more than 200 fighters to begin with, and by our count, they're already down to less than 30. Kalenda squinted as if to hold the battle at bay. Why don't they surrender? It's suicide. She compressed her lips in bitterness. If only they understood what they're dying for. Telling them wouldn't have changed anything, Card said, joining her at the viewport. If your choice was to fight with your last breath or allow yourself to be captured and sacrificed, what would you do? While Kalenda brooded, Showalter studied the LSR's authenticator screen. Do the scanners recognize any of the Yuzhan Vong ships? The pilot called up data. Vessel types more than anything else, but we have verification on three of them. Two were at Abroa Sky. One, the heavy cruiser Analog, was at Gindine. Enemy fighters and dropships penetrating the envelope, the co-pilot announced bearing on a course for Tenali Surge Complex. Can we access the satellite feed? Showalter asked. The co-pilot threw several switches. On screen, what we're seeing is going live to every city on Tenna. The screen showed the sprawling multi-level structure that was Surge Complex, with its surrounding pools, fountains, and chutes. On the broad steps that fronted the complex and disappeared underwater stood several hundred dark and glossy pelted bipeds, all with pointed ears and tapering tails erect and whiskered, quivering snouts lifted to the sky. Abruptly the screen shifted to a reverse point-of-view shot of Yuzhan Vong vessels dropping through the atmosphere like slow-motion meteors. Cams tracked the descent of those closest to the surge complex and held on them as they landed on the far side of bridges that spanned the picturesque lagoon above which the Tinans had assembled. No indication of weapons among the Tinan contingent, Showalter said, when the screen had returned to a mid-range shot of the web-fingered, buck-toothed aliens. Must be a welcoming party. Has to be, Kalenda mused. Cunning and quick-wittedness have always been the Tinan's best weapons, but it'll take time before they deploy those. Meanwhile, Showalter said, it looks like they're ready to hand over the codes to the city. Card smoothed his mustache. I still can't figure what the Yuzhan Vong want with Tinna. Sure, it's rich in natural resources, but nothing that can't be found in hut space. Ten is a step closer to the core, the pilot suggested. Showalter shook his head. Card's right. Has to be something peculiar to Tenna. The point of view shifted again, this time to Yuzhan Vong warriors and officers filing from one of the larger dropships. The cam closed on two officers perched atop levitation seats. The seemingly higher ranked of the pair was black-haired and relatively short for a Yuzhan Vong. The other was rail-thin and elaborately tattooed. I don't think I'll ever get used to the look of these butchers, Kalenda said. Card snorted and made a toasting gesture. Here's to hoping you never have to. Showalter's eyes were glued to the display screen. He touched the co-pilot's shoulder. I want all of this recorded and backed up in triplicate. Already on it, she told him. Whoever was operating the cam obviously thought that the Yuzhan Vong were going to continue across the bridges to the gathered tenons, because the cam momentarily raced ahead of its subjects when the enemy suddenly stopped short of the lagoon. They want the tenons to come to them, Showalter surmised. I don't know about that, Card said skeptically. They're up to something else. As he was saying it, the cam closed on the black-haired officer and watched as he motioned back to the drop ships. Then it quickly panned across the landscape, focusing on one of the ships in time to see compartments open in its pitted base, and a swarm of minuscule red spheres spill onto the ground and rush for the lagoon as if self-propelled. What the? the pilot said. Instinctively and with patent apprehension, Kalender reached for the nearest arm, found Card's right, and viced onto it. The leading edge of the spill had reached the shore of the lagoon, 
and the first of the red spherettes were already plunging into the cold blue waters. On the steps the tenons were crowding forward, snout snuffling in agitated curiosity. Showalter, Card, and Kalenda huddled around the monitor display. Abruptly, the lagoon lost color. Showalter's first thought was that something had happened to the satellite feed signal. But when he raised his head to glance out the LSR's viewport, he could see even at great remove from the planet, the sparkling blue of Tinna's northern waters was rapidly changing to a sickly pale yellow. In the absence of Supreme Commander Choka and Malik Carr, and assured victory at Tinna, the priests had performed the rituals necessary for removing from its crash aboard the Yamka an enormous dedicated villip Choka had brought with him from the outer rim of the galaxy. The rituals had involved the intonation of countless prayers, the use of much sacrificial blood, and ceaseless stroking of the bony ridge that was the helmet-shaped villip's most prominent feature. By the time the commanders returned from their brief visit to Tenna, the villip had been relocated to ceremonial surroundings in a hold cleared of everyone but the most exalted of the priests. Below their far larger companion sat the transmitting villips, consciousness joined to Nas Choka and Malik Carr, who genuflected reverently before the towering communicator. Bare heads lowered, wrists crossed atop the elevated knee, and command cloaks falling around them like shrouds. Nearby, the priests sat cross-legged, chanting the invocations that would put the villip in sequential contact with scores of signal villips that had been positioned in space along the invasion path. With loud sucking noises, a cavity resembling an eye socket puckered to life in the center of the villip's ridge. Then along that line, the villip everted, turning completely inside out and assuming the features of war master Tsavong La. As elect protector of Supreme Overlord Shimra, and well on his way to a kind of apotheosis, Tsavong La, through an endless series of escalations, had come to resemble the incarnation of Yun Yamka, the god of war. Tsavong La's head sloped back from his face, with dark hair both upswept and trailing like tassels from the blunt end. The blue sacks under eyes that were all pupil drooped like deep pockets to the corners of a voracious-looking mouth, and a deep notch bisected his skull from ear to ear. His full lips were ridged by myriad scars, and his ears protruded from his skull like little wings, with the lobes of each descending almost to his shoulders like elongated teardrops of molten wax. Below the neck, overlapping scales the color of rust grew like armor plates from breastbone and collarbones. Behold your leader, Savong La's villip told the commanders in a voice garbled by space and time. Warmaster, the two said as they lifted their eyes. Each had learned of the warmaster's role in the poisoning of Ithor and the downfall of Shadao Domain Shai. To dishonor Tsavong La was to court an untimely death. The eyes of the facsimile fixed on Nas Choka. Inform me of recent events, Supreme Commander. We occupy the world called Tinna, Potent One, which fell to us with so meager a fight we might have deemed it unworthy were it not so well suited to our needs and our campaign. The eyes moved to Malik Kar. I would hear more of this. Tinna's clement waters will one day furnish Dovin basils of the size needed to remove the shields that guard Coruscant and other worlds of the core. It is our conviction that the indigenous species, furred bipeds of diminutive size, can be re-educated and trained, and will make for able and affable tenders of our creations. And as to Tinna's importance to the conquest... Potent One, the world will also serve as a staging area for eventual incursions into the Corellian and Bothan sectors. Eventual, you say. Tenna is but the first stage of a strategy that will speed us to the core. To guarantee this, we entered into an agreement with the Huts, the terms of which require that we apprise them of planetary systems to avoid in their dispersal of a ludicrous product called spice. We did so in complete expectation that they would either alert the New Republic, or that New Republic analysts would discover that Spice was moving freely in some sectors and not at all in others, 
and leaped to the conclusion that the latter provided a glimpse of our battle plan. Tenna was one of the worlds we cautioned the huts to avoid, along with Corellia and Bathawi. Tenna was deliberately won as a means of fortifying the disinformation. The Velop was silent for a long moment. The meager battle you waged suggests that the New Republic failed to behave as predicted. Otherwise, their fleet would have been lying in wait. Testimony to the New Republic's notion of cleverness, Warmaster, Nas Choka answered. Through the whole of the battle and its aftermath, we observed spies observing us from a stealthy craft I'm certain they believe went undetected. To have met us in force might have saved the day for Tenna, but the New Republic is well aware that we have targets of greater significance in mind. So they purposely gave Tenna away. With tribute to Commander Malik Carr, Choka continued, I am now convinced that the same tactic will work for the planned assault. Many coral skipper pilots are readying themselves for the sacrifice the attack will require, and we will soon begin positioning autonomous Dovin basils along the routes New Republic ships will use in jumping to the target once they learn the truth. Then these huts alerted the New Republic? I deem it of little consequence either way, potent one. As a bonus, the huts will make for bountiful sacrifices when we're finished with them. The facsimile's eyes closed for a moment. I am not fully swayed, even if your assumption is correct, that the New Republic is now convinced that we mean to assail either Corellia or Bathawi. Surely they have sufficient ships to safeguard both worlds. They do, War Master, Malik Carr said. Although Corellia remains relatively unprotected, while Bathawi enjoys the protection of a large flotilla. The New Republic cares so little for Corellia? Nas Choka smiled faintly. They wish us to think so, potent one. It has been our hope all along to maneuver them into fortifying only one of those worlds, Malik Carr explained. And the gods have favored us by providing help from an unexpected quarter. A New Republic senator informed the huts that Corellia conceals a trap of some sort. A deceit. Your pardon, War Master, but we have some reason to trust this human being. She may well be the same person who thought she was helping us by apprising our agents that the priestess Elan had defected. Then you already know the identity of this betrayer? Her name is Viki Shesh, potent one. This bodes well, Tsavong La's villa aloud, but delay any contact with her until your strategy is successfully executed. She may be of greater use to us once we are closer to the core. The villa began to close. I leave the rest to you. Your will be done, potent one, the commanders said in unison. Seventeen. Commodore Brand tried not to be distracted by the traffic that gushed horizontally and vertically past the transperisteel wall of the advisory council chambers, or by the cityscape itself, ignited to flickering splendor as that part of Coruscant turned away from the sun. Seated with their backs to the window wall, Chief of State Borsk Falia and the now eight members that made up his council had nothing to focus on but Brand who stood rigidly at a podium opposite them, reading from a screen full of notes prepared in haste by his staffers, after an intelligence briefing on the fall of Tina. What is significant, Brand continued, is that the assault was foreseen, and that alone affords provisional corroboration of the Intelligence Division's belief that the Huts have been supplying us with data. In those systems where the huts have curtailed spice operations, the enemy has set its sights on a world. Whether the huts were aware of what they were doing and asking for forewarning regarding their smuggling enterprise is presently unknown, though we are looking into the matter. But the fact remains that Tenna, a transshipment point as opposed to an actual market, has not seen a spice vessel since the huts forged their pact with the Yuzhan Vong. Failure interjected a transparent snort of ridicule into Brand's brief pause, then had the gall to offer a pretense of apology. I'm sorry, Commodore, but something seems to have become lodged in my throat. Please carry on with your report. 
I know that I speak for everyone in saying that I can scarcely wait to hear the rest. Brand refused to be rattled by the sarcasm. At the moment, the only other systems where spice operations have been suspended are Corellia and Bathawi. It has yet to be ascertained in which order the Yuzhan Vong mean to strike, but we do expect an attack sooner rather than later. For that reason, it is the opinion of Admiral Sav and the Defense Force that a decision is critical on the matter of the redisposition of New Republic warships. Brand activated the hollow projector table adjacent to the podium. Depressing a tile on the console built into the lectern's sloping desk, he displayed a galactic map, faintly blue in the cone created by the projector's modulators. The Yuzhan Vong have established and fortified what amounts to a resupply corridor that stretches from the outer rim to hot space. Since the battle at Abroa Sky, they have been receiving a steady influx of warships and materiel, clearly in anticipation of launching a major offensive. Their first since Ithor. Against such a formidable fleet, and without weakening our security in the core or at Bill Bringy, where harassment continues despite holding actions by the Imperial Remnant, we can mobilize and deploy a task force of vessels borrowed from battle groups currently in service at Kaminor, Kuat, Raltir, and a score of other worlds. Should the Hapes Consortium vote to support New Republic efforts, some of their ships would also be allocated to the task force, which would be led by the heavy cruiser Yald under my command. Brand paused again and planted his large hands on the podium. Counselors, we have not discounted that the assembled intelligence could be a ploy to keep us from identifying a different target entirely, but at the same time, we cannot afford to ignore the evidence. Evidence, failure grumbled. Inferences, suggestions, remote possibilities, but certainly not evidence. His violet eyes mocked Brand openly. What has the command staff decided with regard to this redisposition of naval power? Brand motioned to the holograph. As you know, we have been triaging in all sectors, allowing worlds like Gindine and now Tenna to fall in order to safeguard others like Kuat, Bilbringi, and Kaminor. Our actions, or shall I say inactions, have hardly endeared us to worlds that consider themselves to be in the path of invasion. Regardless, even if we can manage to amass a sizable task force, it will not be of sufficient size to provide adequate protection to both Bathawi and Corellia. He straightened to his full height. After analyzing all available data, it is the conclusion of the command staff that Corellia is the target. Therefore, Admiral Sav is recommending that all available ships and resources be moved to the Corellian sector as soon as possible. Failure's cream-colored fur bristled. I thought as much, he said in a flat, menacing voice. You would, as you say, triage Bathawi for the sake of saving Corellia? But I won't have it. He shook his head angrily. I'm sorry, Commodore, but I refuse to authorize such action at this time. Your evidence is too scanty. No one said anything about abandoning Bathawi, Brand rejoined. The flotilla already there will remain in place. We are only trying to protect Corellia. Protect the sacred core, you mean? The Bothan stood to regard his eight peers. I wish the Council to consider closely the source of this spicy intelligence. Commander Brand would have you believe that it was gathered by the Intelligence Division or gleaned through hours of painstaking investigation and analysis. But in fact, it was brought to the attention of two officers of questionable standing in the intelligence community by a person of even more dubious reputation who claims to be serving as a kind of ombudsman for the Jedi Knights, Talon Card. I fail to see the pertinence of that, Cal Omas said. Talon Card is well known to this council. Failure glared at him. Well, of course you wouldn't see the pertinence, Counselor Omas, because you fail to grasp that the Jedi would sooner rid the galaxy of Bothans than do anything to protect them. The Jedi had nothing to do with our decision, Brand argued. Failure made a gesture of dismissal. 
we all know that the Jedi have been holding back, downplaying their role until such time as they might truly show their hand. With Bathawi defeated, they will do just that. In what way have they been holding back? Cal Omis interrupted. They've done nothing less than lead this fight from the start, making a stand on Dantooine and Ithor, while the Senate insisted on thinking of the Yuzhan Vong as a local problem. Failure wasn't unprepared to defend his accusations. Consider what the Jedi are said to have accomplished when their little retreat on Yavin 4 was threatened by Imperial Admirals Talion and Dalla, and how Luke Skywalker all but single-handedly turned the tide against the Yavitha with illusions. Then talk to me about their current contributions. He wagged his clawed finger at Omus. Never underestimate what they are capable of, Counselor. Skywalker's Jedi are not the Jedi Knights of old, but a surreptitious, ambitious new breed. With Bathawi occupied, they would be ready to make their move and take control of the Senate. Chelch Dravid of Corellia took on the fight. The Chief of State should learn to keep his private fears to himself. It is against the Jedi Code to spearhead an offensive, on the battlefield or in any other arena. In this, the new Jedi are no different from the old. Skywalker and the rest are attempting to do what the Jedi have always done, uphold peace and justice without turning themselves into full-fledged warriors. If there is a growing misunderstanding of them, it owes to a lack of information. Perhaps by isolating themselves on Yavin 4, they are to blame for some of that. Perhaps their time would have been better spent demonstrating what they stand for. Even so, they have all our best interests at heart, and they certainly haven't singled out the Bothans as their enemy. Failure's voice became higher pitched. You're wrong, Counselor. And I say again that, based on Commodore Brand's data, I will not grant the command staff's request that Corellia be reinforced. Then I demand that the issue be put to a vote, Omas said. Failure held up his hand to silence debate and looked pointedly at Brand. What do your actual field agents tell you, Commodore? What do your analysts say? What are you hearing from the costly hyperspace probes you've sent out? Instead of relying on conjecture, we should be looking to hard data. We do just as well to seek the counsel of a fortune teller as accept as truth what you've told us this afternoon. Our findings are based on neither prophecy nor conjecture, Brand said firmly. The data supporting our decision are of a highly sensitive nature, but they are available for your perusal whenever you wish. Thalia sneered. Oh, I'm certain you've concocted an airtight case, Commodore. He scanned the eight counselors. For the record, then, who will begin the vote? I stand with the Chief of State, Fjor Roden of Commodore declared. I don't trust Card or the Jedi. With enough popular support, Skywalker knows the Senate will be constrained to yield to his demands. Then it will only be a matter of time before the Jedi are overseeing all decisions. I warn you, allow Bathawi to fall, and we'll soon be headed for malevolent times, an empire disguised as a theocracy. He stopped to take a breath. Kaminor will be threatened should Corellia fall but I am compelled to vote against the Jedi and for Bathawi. Thank you, Counselor, Failure said. Why not take the battle to the Yuzhan Vong before they completely outflank us? Counselor Trebok asked Brand through his droid translator. Brand turned to the towering Wookiee. That isn't possible without leaving the entire Corps unprotected. If we could put the Imperial Remnant and the Huts at their back, or have the Hapen Consortium open a new front in the mid-rim, a counter-offensive could be considered. But now is not the time. I agree that we can't afford to leave Coruscant or any of the core worlds open to attack, Dravid said. But do you actually expect us to sit here and debate which world, Bathawi or Corellia, is more important to the New Republic? Not more important, Counselor. More imperiled. Stop wasting time, Felia snapped. Your vote will go to Corellia, and we all know it. Dravid nodded his head once. Just as yours must go to Bathawi. Felia swung to Cal Omis. Your vote. Corellia, but not for the reasons you imagine. 
It simply makes no sense for the Yuzhan Vong to have struck at Gindine and Tenna if Bathawi has been their goal all along. Furthermore, Karelia is essentially defenseless, where Bathawi is already sufficiently defended. How would we appear to our constituents if we allowed a helpless system to fall, a system we made helpless no less? We might as well convince Karelia to surrender. Spoken like a true Alderanian, Felia muttered. Also, Counselor, you falsely assume that surrender to the Yuzhan Vong guarantees survival. But that is another matter. He turned to the Celestin, Niuk Niuv. The Karelians have long wanted independence, Niuv began. We nearly went to war with them in recent memory over that very issue. A war that only strained relations to the breaking point. The new republic is under no constraint to defend Karelia. But the fact of the matter is that Karelia's lack of defenses will be its salvation. The Yuzhan Vong will strike against Bathawi. Your sense of direction is astute, Counselor, Felia remarked, and I further applaud you for breaking ranks with Admiral Sav. He turned 180 degrees. Counselor Trebak, do I even need ask? I accept Commodore Brand's data and defer to the expertise of the command staff, the Wookiee said through the translator. The Yuzhan Vong plan to use Karelia as a staging area to penetrate the core. There's no need to belabor the point. Felia cut him off. He narrowed his eyes at Counselor Puo. And you? The Quarren's mask tentacles quivered, and his baggy eyes narrowed in anger. Karelia, as Counselor Omis said, Bathawi is adequately defended by some of the very Bothan assault cruisers it convinced the New Republic to finance some time ago. And I can promise you that we will make use of all those cruisers, even if we have to withdraw them from the core, Felia barked. Hasn't it always been Bathawi's aim to claim those ships as their own and prove itself mightier than Mon Calamari, Sullust, and Coruscant? Felia smirked. So Po, disconcerted by Mon Calamari's loss of the military prestige, votes not so much for Corellia as against Bathawi. Next. He looked at Navik of Rhodia. Navik's short snout bobbed. Rhodia's proximity to Bathawi leaves me little choice. He nodded affirmatively to Failure. The chief of state nodded back and commenced a head count. Quo, Omis, Trebak, and Dravid in favor of Karelia. Myself, Rodin, Niuv, and Navik in favor of Bathawi. Everyone looked at the council's ninth and newest member. I'm afraid the decision falls to you, Failure said. Commodore Brand waited expectantly. Even with the evidence of Tenna to support a possible threat to Corellia, an attack on the Corps makes no sense strategically. If the Yuzhan Vong were going to launch an offensive so far from their present stronghold in hut space, why would they waste valuable resources engaging a system we essentially stripped of defenses after the center point station crisis, rather than strike at a more appropriate target? like Kuat or Brantal. No, I say all things point to an attack on Bathawi, from Hut Space and now from Tinna. I stand with Chief of State Felia. Felia breathed a long sigh of relief. I commend your flawless reasoning, Senator Shesh. He smiled ruefully at Commodore Brand. The matter is resolved. Assemble your task force, Commodore, but steer it to Bathawi. We've beaten them at their own game, Commodore Brand announced as he hurried through the doors of the fleet office. Senator Shesh kept her promise. She threw the vote to Bathawi. Hoots of success filled the room. Shesh also reports that her meeting with the Hut Consul General went well, Brand added. We may yet get some help from the Huts. Now we need to hear from Hapes. The consortium vote is set for tomorrow, his adjutant supplied. Brand couldn't restrain a smile. It's all coming together, but now the real work begins. He strode to a hollow map not unlike the one he had made use of moments earlier in the advisory council chambers. The Yuzhan Vong have obviously been looking closely at both Karelia and Bathawi, assessing the value of each. By deploying the new task force in Bothan space, 
we leave Corellia wide open for attack. He turned to his adjutant. What news from Centerpoint Station? The Solo kids have arrived on Drawl. Anakin Solo was the one who originally enabled the repulsor there. And the Centerpoint technicians have high confidence he'll be able to do the same with the station. At this point, they're down to fine-tuning the thing anyway, making certain it will perform as expected, in lieu of running actual tests, for fear of alarming Corellia, Drowl, Salonia, and the rest. Although that hardly matters, since rumors of all sorts have been circulating. Riots have broken out in Coronet, Mecca, and La Poix Denport. And there's widespread talk of ousting Governor General Marcha. Brandt nodded glumly. Well, if this works, Corellia will be seen as the galaxy's savior, and any hard feelings should disappear. He turned back to the slowly gyrating 3D map. Alert Corps Command on a need-to-know basis that elements of the Third Fleet should be prepared to jump for Kuat on my order. Likewise, that elements of the Second Fleet should be prepared to jump for Raltir. He inserted his hand into the hollow projector's cone of light. Furthermore, I want the hyperspace routes linking Corellia to Kuat, Raltir, and Bathawi, swept for the Yuzhan Vong equivalent of mines or mass shadow weapons. Brandt turned and glanced around the room. With Centerpoint's interdiction field holding them fast and a full fleet at their back, the Yuzhan Vong will regret the day they entered this galaxy. Eighteen. Archon Thane's words could barely be heard for all the outcries of shame and disapproval. Regardless, he stood tall before his sixty-two peers, most of whom were female, proudly displaying the bruises he had earned in the honor duel with his soldier, and convincingly unapologetic for having gambled away Virgil's vote on the outcome of that contest. Thane's audacity was not surprising, but where Leia had expected bitterness and sarcasm, his words in support of the New Republic sounded almost sincere. Many in the vast hall were certain that Virgil's vote would provide Tenennial Joe with the majority she needed to mandate military action against the Yuzhan Vong. But Leia no longer had a clear sense of her own objectives. While the consortium's entry into the war might turn out to be pivotal, allegations of personal interest and conspiracy threatened to undermine not only the political process, but also the long-standing alliance between the consortium and the New Republic. To the exasperation of C-3PO, who insisted on trying to match her long strides and divine her sudden about-faces, Leia paced nervously behind the scenes in a small chamber that looked out on the speaker's rostrum. If nothing else, she told herself, the vote would at least conclude her visit to Hapes, which had become more trying as the days had worn on, both at Reef Fortress and the Fountain Palace. She felt hopelessly removed from the activities that had become most important to her. Hapes had begun to seem a place of exile, and an imaginary one at that, a land of dragons and rainbow gems, of trees of wisdom and guns of command and the brawl between Isolde and Thane had been one thing too much. She had yet to spend any private time with the prince, and if she had her way, she wouldn't. From the start, she had feared that Isolde had misconstrued the nature of her mission to Hapes, and Ta'a Chum's telling her that she would have been an ideal wife for him had only made things more awkward and complicated. The fate of the galaxy no longer turned on courtly intrigues and Leia wanted no part of the Hapen's enslavement to them. Marooned in the past, in a swirl of distant memories, she longed more than anything to hear from Han. She knew that Jaina was with Rogue Squadron, and that Anakin and Jason were bound for the Corellian system, if they weren't there already, but she had no idea where Han was. Countless times each day he would come swaggering into her thoughts, quick to bring disarray. Although it wasn't the Han of the past several months she saw, but the scoundrel she had gradually fallen in love with, the Han who had thrown her a wink on being decorated for his unexpected actions during the Battle of Yavin, the Han who had acknowledged her first confession of love with a reply that managed to be both heartfelt and smug, the Han she had rendered speechless with the disclosure that Luke was her brother. 
Despite the damage to his roguish reputation, a demonstration of real concern might inflict. There was no excusing his continued silence, and Leia was as angry at him as she was worried. A new uproar filled the hall. Leia saw that it was a soldier who now stood before the delegates. Like Thane, the prince was all but basking in the contentious mix of esteem and condemnation that greeted him, his face puffy with contusions, and one arm bandaged. No back to treatments for the real men of Hapes, Leia thought. Everyone who has wished to be heard on the issue of the consortium pledging support to the New Republic has been heard. A soldier began when the commotion in the hall had settled. It's clear that we have no consensus on this issue, and the vote is certain to be close. The decision to go to war is never an easy one, and our decision this day is made all the more difficult because we appear to be safely distanced from that war. But bear in mind the counsel of Ambassador Organa Solo. This quiet will not endure. The light that shines on the consortium today could very well be eclipsed tomorrow, and any battles avoided will ultimately have to be fought, perhaps by us alone. I won't stand here and reiterate the many arguments that have been presented, denigrating one stance or bolstering another. I ask only that each of you eschew politics and vote the will of the people you represent. That is our commitment, and by doing so we vote our conscience. The process was infuriatingly meticulous. With Tenennial Joe and her attendants looking on from a balcony, voting was done by hand rather than electronically, with representatives bringing forth their finest heirloom quills and employing their most baroque calligraphy. The votes, sometimes missives, were read and tallied by a panel of senescent judges. Then the results were hand-delivered to the royal balcony in the form of a natural fiber scroll resting on an outsized shimmer silk pillow. The Queen Mother herself made the announcement. By a vote of thirty-two in favor to thirty-one opposed, the consortium avows to support the new republic in its just and decisive actions against the Yuzhan Vong. Isolder's champions cheered and his detractors railed. It was a long while before Tenennial Joe could restore order. The vote is concluded, she said at last. I ask now that personal differences be set aside and the word of law accepted, so that we may enter into this momentous resolution in a spirit of union. The grumbling gradually subsided, and delegates shook hands or embraced one another ceremoniously. The sudden fellowship struck Leia as counterfeit as an arranged marriage. Mistress, C-3PO said with a touch of alarm, the prince approaches. Turning, Leia saw a beaming a soldier marching toward her, throwing his richly embroidered cloak over one shoulder. For a moment she feared that he was actually going to scoop her up and twirl her around, but he came to a halt just out of arm's reach. We won the day, Leia. In spite of everything, we won the day. He scanned the crowded hall until he located Archon Thane, then motioned at him with his chin. Look how Thane sulks. If he'd had his way, the vote would have been reversed. He swung to Leia. You realize it was his plan all along to insult you, then best me in combat after I had agreed to his wager. But we prevailed. Leia stared at him with mounting disquiet. The last thing I wanted was for this decision to hinge on the outcome of a grudge match, a soldier. His gleaming hero's smile held. Perhaps not, but that is often the way on Hapes. And besides, you know that I wouldn't have done any less for you. But I don't want you doing this for me any more than I wanted you fighting to protect my honor. Isolde regarded her quizzically. Who was I fighting for, if not you? Why did you come to me? I came to Hapes, Isolde, as an envoy of the New Republic. That's the truth of it. Of course you did, and you were right to come here. He eased the moment with an understanding smile. All that aside, you have your wish. We stand side by side in battle. Leia's attempt to emulate his expression failed, as something that had been at the edge of her consciousness all week long suddenly rushed to mind. Scarcely eight years earlier, with many of the warships of the New Republic fleet undergoing repairs and upgrades, 
Luke had been asked by the Senate to appeal to the Bakarans for help in putting an end to a rebellion in the Karelian sector. More to the point, Luke had been asked to appeal to his close friend, Gariel Captison. Even though she had retired from public service after the death of her husband, former imperial Pater Thanus. Gariel had pledged her support, and with the aid of several Bakaran naval vessels, the crisis had been resolved. But at a terrible cost. Gariel, Bakaran Admiral Osilage, and thousands more had been killed. Luke still spoke of his guilt, especially after visits with Gariel's young daughter, Melinza, whom he had pledged to keep safe. In the wake of recollection, something even more terrible began to blossom in Leia's mind. Her heart pounded and her forehead beaded with sweat. Her sight blurred at the edges, sounds grew faint, and she reached out for Isolder's arm to steady herself. She shut her eyes briefly, and into the darkness raced a ferocious vision of warships speared by brilliant light of expanding explosions, and the cries of dying thousands, of starfighters vaporized, blinding eruptions of fire, bodies floating still in a void, a world ablaze. Leia, what is it? Isolder asked, holding her upright. Leia? Coming back to herself almost as quickly as she had become lost, she took a calming breath and eased out of his hold. Then she gaped at him, wide-eyed. You can't do this, Isolder. You mustn't join us. His brow furrowed. What are you talking about? The vote has been taken. The matter is already decided. Then call for a revote. Tell everyone you've rethought Hapes's position. Are you mad? Do you know what you're asking of me? Isolder, you must listen to me. The decision has been made. Leia wanted desperately to carry on the fight, but all words fled her. She stared, then touched her fingers to her forehead. Isolder was gazing at her knowingly. "'You're worried that something will go wrong,' he said. "'And you don't want the responsibility of having decided our fate. "'But you needn't worry. "'We made our pledge free and clear. "'We know exactly what we're getting into. "'This is in our blood, Leia. "'You need never fear on our account. "'But is there a chance the Yuzhan Vong will overlook us?' "'She considered it.' Probably not. Then what choice do we have? Do we fight the invaders alongside you and avail ourselves of greater numbers, or wait to be attacked and be forced to engage them in our own space with only what ships we have? She compressed her lips and nodded. You're right. She managed a faint smile. Isolder, I'm sorry for what I said earlier. He waved away the apology. Words are of no importance. What is, is that we always remain friends. Done. He offered her his arm, and they walked a few paces, much to the obvious dismay of C-3PO. I believe your droid is agitated, his soldier said quietly. Leia laughed. I'm sure he is. 3PO was very much Han's supporter when you were crazy enough to consider me fit to be a queen mother. Isolde laughed shortly, then stopped to gaze at her. Leia, as a friend, may I ask you something? You've been preoccupied for the whole of your stay here. Each time I've attempted to visit you, you've avoided me. Is something wrong, between us or otherwise? I have been distracted, she conceded. May I know the reason? She forced a breath. I wouldn't know where to begin. My mother once told me that when a Jedi is distracted, when she loses her focus, she becomes vulnerable. I'm not a Jedi. But you are as strong in the Force as any of them. What is it, Leia? Leia's eyes narrowed perceptibly. We're in real danger, Isolder. We're in danger of losing everything we've fought to attain since the defeat of the Empire. Are you saying that the Yuzhan Vong cannot be defeated? She took a moment. I'm not sure. I see a long road ahead of us. How clearly do you see this road? She shook her head. Not clearly enough to know where all the rough spots lie. They resumed walking without speaking. Will you accompany me to Coruscant aboard my personal ship? Isolder asked finally. What about Tenennial Joe? She will remain on Hapes, Isolder said flatly. 
Once more the vision stormed through Leia's mind, then abated. What light was she seeing? What world was she seeing? Of course I will, she said after a moment. With the Falcon safely docked, Han and Droma cleared Ruin Customs and hastened for the spaceport terminal. If not for the crowds, they might have sprinted. Hold on a heartbeat, Han said when Droma was about to navigate the crowd on hands and knees. Snatching the Rin by the back of his vest, he set him on his feet, then decorously adjusted the fit of the frayed garment while he spoke. Your clanmates wouldn't be so desperate to get off-world that they'd hook up with a bunch of space trash hijackers and mercenaries. They're smarter than that, right? Droma tugged at his mustache. They're plenty clever, but even the quickest can be outsmarted when the situation looks hopeless. Both Gaff and Melisma detest confinement. Gaff was once in jail and... Han started shaking his head. That's not the answer I want to hear. Droma fell silent, then nodded in understanding. My clanmates take up with a bunch of space trash hijackers? They're far too clever. In fact, I'm certain they're still on ruin, somewhere, and that we've arrived well in time to save them. Han exhaled. That's a relief. They had been having the same conversation since leaving Tholaton. The Weequay security chief had been too sly to supply them with the names of his cohorts who had gone to ruin, or with the name of their ship. But the ruin scam had come up several times in casual conversation among Esau's Ridges mechanics and ne'er-do-wells, and Han had a pretty good idea of the caliber of folks he and Droma were dealing with. Even if the hijackers who had come to ruin weren't working directly for the Yuzhan Vong, they were likely to be well-armed and dangerous, much like the members of the Peace Brigade with whom Han and Droma had tangled aboard the Queen of Empire, and with whom neither wished to tangle again. Ruin Spaceport had a pace all its own. With thousands of refugees pouring in from scores of occupied worlds, there were far more comings than goings. But Salish Ag was somehow managing to keep the transfer process running smoothly and efficiently. Dozens of species-specific booths lined the terminal walls, and a fleet of surface vehicles waited outside the terminal to convey refugees to one camp or another. Locating refugees, though, was another matter. At a human-staffed information booth, Han and Droma discovered listings for over 100 separate exile facilities, some only a few kilometers away and others on the far side of the world. Searching every camp will take longer than we've got, Han fumed. There's got to be an easier way. Try the central data bank, a droid voice said behind him. Whoever you're looking for might be listed there. Han turned and found himself face to face with an aged droid built roughly along human lines, though stockier and no taller than Droma. In sore need of paint and body work, the machine was long-armed and barrel-chested, with a rounded head that was as primitive in design as the servo motors that operated its limbs. Bollocks? Han said in disbelief. The droid's unblinking red photoreceptors fixed on him. I beg your pardon, sir. You're a labor droid, aren't you? A... Uh, a BLX? A BLX, the droid said peevishly. Though we both happen to be products of Servo Droid Incorporated, I'm a BFL. Baffle to you, good sir. Baffle? Han's eyebrows arched in skeptical surprise, then his eyes narrowed appraisingly. Who are you kidding? You're telling me you've never spent time in the corporate sector? Thank the Maker, no. Why, save for being activated at the Fondor shipyards, I've never even been outside the core. To the best of my memory, that is. Han refused to buy it. With Droma looking on, he circled Baffle, taking in the set of the droid's vocabulator grill and its stiff way of moving. You were never the property of a tech named Doc Vandengant? Baffle shook his head. The name is new to me. Without warning, Han wrapped his fist against the droid's chest plastron, eliciting a hollow sound. You sure you never carried another droid in there? Cubicle thing no bigger than this? Han spread his hands a few centimeters apart, but smart as a whip. Another droid? 
Certainly not. What do you take me for? Hans stroked his beard, shook his head, then snorted a laugh. You could have fooled me. Baffle bowed slightly. I'm flattered that I remind you of someone, sir. I think. Now, what's this about a central database? The droid directed them to a computer terminal at which several folks were queued. Han and Droma planted themselves at the end of the line, behind a Duros couple, and waited while everyone had a go at getting the machine to cooperate. Han handled the input when they finally reached the head of the line. Refugees are grouped by species, he said, frowning. But the Rin aren't even listed. Try other, Baffle suggested. Droma smirked. The droid's right. Allow me to do the honors. Han moved away from the keyboard but kept his eyes on the display screen. Here we are, Droma said. Just where we usually show up. Between Rybet and Saddle. And my clanmates are here. He turned excitedly to Han. Well, five of them at any rate. Your sister with them? Droma read over the list again, then shook his head. Leia was correct, I'm afraid. Safa must have been left behind on Gindine. Han made his lips a thin line. We'll find her next. Where are the others? Facility 17, along with 32 other Rin. Oh, I know that camp well, sirs, Baffle said. Several of my peers and counterparts have had occasion to work there. Han swung to the droid. What's the quickest way to get there? In my cab. You're a driver? Baffle pointed out the terminal window to a battered Soro Sub land speeder. Just there, sir, the one lacking a proper windscreen and in need of paint. Han glanced from the land speeder to the dented and spot-welded droid. Looks like you and your vehicle get your work done at the same mechanic shop. Will that thing make it to Facility 17? No problem at all, sir. The camp is actually within walking distance. For those with sufficient time, that is. The three of them headed out to the cab. Baffle clambered into the open-air operator's perch and got the aft-mounted repulsor lift generator and outboard turbines running. When Han and Droma were cinched into the molded seats below the perch, the droid set off down a well-maintained road that coursed between immaculately cultivated fields. Through gaps in the topiary shrubs that lined the road, Han could see droids of endless variety though far fewer than he was accustomed to seeing on similar agricultural worlds. "'Why aren't you out there with the others?' he shouted to Baffle. "'Oh, I'm too old for that sort of work, sir.' "'Salish sidelined you, huh?' "'Basically, yes. Ever since Salish Ag offered to accept refugees, ruin has become a rather chaotic environment. So I was reassigned to function as the driver of this reliable, if somewhat woebegone, vehicle. Seems to be a lot more people coming than going, Han said. That's very observant of you, sir. In fact, many refugees have become so enamored of ruin, they have remained on world to work for Salish Ag. Han and Droma exchanged puzzled looks. To work for Salish? Han said. Doing what? Why... Field work, sir. Thanks to Ruin's climate control station, labor is a pleasurable enterprise for many folks. Han uttered a laugh. That's crazy. Salish has an army of droids at its disposal. They do, sir, it's true. But Salish Ag has recently developed a preference for living workers. Again, Han glanced at Droma, who shrugged. I just got here, remember? The Rin said. Han might have pursued the topic with Baffle, but just then the refugee camp came into view around a wide turn. Facility 17, good sirs. The droid conveyed them right to the gate, where access to the camp was by way of a turret-like security booth. Han tapped his knuckles against the booth's transparasteel window to draw the attention of a thick-set guard inside. The uniformed man stuck his scarred face outside the window, got an eyeful of Han and Droma, and scowled. Get a load of this, he said to someone else in the booth. Shortly, a woman joined him at the window, giving Han and Droma the same once-over. What's your business here? We're looking for a couple of friends, Han told them. Aren't we all, the man said in self-amusement. A group of Wren, Han went on. 
They would have arrived maybe two standard weeks ago. A group of Rin, you say? The guard jerked a thumb at Droma. Like this one. Han rolled his tongue around in his cheek. That's right, like this one. If you've got a problem with him, maybe you should step outside so we can all discuss it. The guard grinned down at him. I don't have a problem, big guy, but your little pal here does. Han heard the whirring of charging blasters and spun around to find half a dozen uniformed guards moving in on the booth from three sides. Cautiously, he raised his hands to the back of his head, and Droma did the same. We didn't come looking for trouble, Han said. It's like I told the welcome committee. We're just looking for a couple of friends. The lead guard ignored him and waved his blaster at Droma. Step to one side. When Droma did, the guard added, You're under arrest. Han did a double take. Arrest? On what charge? We haven't even been here long enough to litter. With four blasters trained on Droma and two on Han, the lead guard snapped a pair of cylindrical stun cuffs around Droma's wrists. The charge is forgery of official documents, he said to Han. And if you've got any sense, you'll get off ruin before we haul you in as an accessory after the fact. 19. In imperious repose on her cushioned and pillowed pallet, Borga Basari Diori fixed her gaze on Nas Choka as Lenik escorted the black-haired Yuzhan Vong Supreme Commander and his minions into the palace court. Though rarely known to exercise restraint, Borga refrained from elevating her couch in the interest of getting off to a better start with Choka than she had with Commander Malik Carr on his first visit to Nal Hutta. Trailing Choka, and similarly attired an attenuating helmet and swishing command cloak, stepped Malik Carr, and behind him the New Republic traitor Pedrick Cuff, sporting pegged trousers, low black boots, and stiff collared jacket. Advisors and armed guards dispersed to both sides of Choka's retinue, assuming positions that encouraged confrontation with the members of Borga's own security contingent. I welcome you to Nal Hutta, Borga said in Yuzhan Vong, while Choka assessed the trappings of the court from the chair to which the Rhodian Lenik had shown him. We are at your disposal. Choka smiled in surprise. Excellent, Borga. I didn't realize that you were acquainted with our language. A few simple phrases, Borga said in basic, courtesy of the tutorial supplied by Pedrick Cuff. Choka glanced at Nome Anor, then his closely set eyes came back to Borga. I'm told that you have already been exceedingly accommodating. Borga smiled pleasantly. We are renowned for our hospitality, especially of the sort we render to revered guests. Choka's tone of voice changed. Guests. Deliberate or not, his face full of bulges and indentations gave him the look of someone who had gone fifteen hard rounds with a hapen kickboxer. An interesting choice of words, Borga. Unless you mean to imply that the Yuzhan Vong are nothing more than visitors to this galaxy. A visitor who takes well to new surroundings often becomes a resident, Borga replied, refusing to be flustered. When you have established yourselves on Coruscant, I would be honored to call you neighbor. Choka grinned faintly. You would do well to call me Lord. Borga's large eyes blinked. Then when the title suits the circumstance, I will do so. Choka nodded, apparently satisfied. I'm not one to mince words, Borga. With respect to your gracious offer to oversee the transport of captives in exchange for information regarding imperiled star systems, I have determined that such services are unwarranted at this stage of our campaign. As a gesture of good faith, however, we will continue, from time to time and as we see fit, to furnish you with some advance notice of our activities. He paused momentarily. For example, you may resume delivery of your euphoric spice to the Bathawi system, without fear of inadvertent entanglement. Borga licked her lips. We thank you, and I'm sure the Bothans will do likewise. Choka studied her for a moment. 
For the spice, you mean? Precisely, for the spice. Choka's expression didn't change. I trust, Borga, that you're not sharing this privileged information with any third parties. Borga spread her smallish hands, palms outward. With whom would I share? Our primary concern is to maintain trade. And, of course, to avoid complicating your business, whatever that may be. That's comforting to hear, Choka said. Be advised that should evidence ever come to light that you have been violating our confidence. Well, I don't think I need to enumerate the horrors that would befall hot space, do I? Borga shook her head. We are also renowned for our vivid imaginations. Splendid. Choka gestured toward Malik Carr. My second-in-command informs me as well that you expressed a desire to commence apportioning the galaxy in anticipation of our complete and utter conquest. Borga swallowed audibly. I may have been premature, Excellency. Choka's invidious grin returned. Nothing pleases me more than a well-reasoned response. We will lay siege to whichever worlds we require or crave, including this glorious jewel of yours. Not that we have any such designs. For the moment, that is. Although one never knows. Save for war master Tsavong La, who could decide tomorrow that Nal Hutta needs to be raised. Do we understand each other? As well as can be expected, Borga replied. Given the limitations of basic and, of course, the relative youth of our association, notwithstanding the depths it has already achieved, despite our many differences. Choka smiled with sincerity. Very good. We prize sportive circumlocution above almost anything but valor. Speaking of valor, Borga, have the Huts had many dealings with this gang of ruffians that calls itself the Jedi Knights? Borga adopted a look of distaste. Some, Excellency. In fact, before you deigned to grace this galaxy with your presence, the Jedi were making things rather irksome for us by interfering with our myriad operations. Yes, Choke amused. They have proved troublesome for us as well. We've had a few Jedi in our grip, but they have all managed to slip through our fingers. He regarded Borga for a long moment. You would profit by assisting us in separating one from the pack. Borga fell silent, wondering if she was being tested, but ultimately deciding that Choka's offer was genuine. But, Excellency, you have one in your possession even now, she said cautiously. It was Choka's turn to fall silent. He turned to glance at Malik Carr, then Nome Anor, both of whom returned nescient shrugs. Explain yourself, Borga. The vessel aboard which my son Rhonda is currently a guest, Borga supplied. Rhonda sent word that a Jedi had been discovered among the ship's complement of captives. Once more Choka looked to Malik Carr, who said, I know nothing of this. To which ship does the hut refer? Choka demanded of his advisers in Yuzhan Vong. The Kresh, Supreme Commander, a bareheaded Yuzhan Vong answered. The Yamask vessel under the command of Kain Kal. Choka muttered angrily. Can we communicate with the ship? Provided that it is not in superluminal transit, Supreme Commander. Then have Kain Kal's villa prepared and brought to me at once. Excellency, I could easily arrange to put you in contact with my son, Borga started to say when Choka whirled on her. You dare insult me by suggesting that I consort with one of your ghoulish machines? But I... Keep silent, you mutated slug. You will speak only when spoken to, or I'll have that obscene tongue ripped from your head. Clearly waiting for just such an opportunity, Borga's guards raised their blasters and stun batons. In rapid response, Choka's soldiers crouching into combat stances brought forth their amphistaffs and kufis. Everyone remained silent and unmoving, as if suddenly removed from the flow of ordinary time, waiting for fate to play its hand. Borga and Lenik exchanged meaningful glances, as did Nome Anor and Malik Kar. Then Borga motioned her forces to stand down. Nas Choka squinted slyly. So you do have a spark of intelligence after all. 
Whatever else he might have said was interrupted by the arrival of a Yuzhan Vong attendant, cradling an already averted villip in his folded arms. A second attendant carried what was obviously one of Choka's own dedicated villips. In the language of the Yuzhan Vong, Choka addressed the facsimile visage of Kain Kal. Commander, is it true that you have a Jedi Knight in custody? Yes, Supreme Commander. Our rapidly maturing Yamask has the distinction of having exposed him. I thought I might keep him as a prize for War Master Tsavong La. Choka glowered. I will determine the best use for this Jedi. What is the present position of your vessel? We are nearing a world called Kalarba, Supreme Commander. In fact, we have been awaiting word from you regarding the attack on... Silence. Choka's eyes became angry slits. You will remain at Kalarba and relinquish the Jedi Knight to bearers I am dispatching to rendezvous with the crash. Is that clear? Abundantly clear, Kind Karl's Philip replied deferentially. Choka cast a glance at Borga. For your part in this, you have my word that Nal Hutta will remain yours to command for as long as I live and breathe, unless, of course, you are fool enough to betray me. Borga forced a smile. Then may perfect health shadow you wherever you tread, Excellency. I warned you, Pazda was telling Borga shortly after the Yuzhan Vong had left the court. The gray-bearded desilogic hut brought his hover sled closer to Borga's levitated pallet. Any dealings with these heathens will come to a dreadful end. From her pallet, Borga watched Krev Bambasa, Gardula the Younger, and former Consul General Golga nod in agreement. I myself sensed as much, though I confess I thought we'd be able to remain neutral for a while longer. Pazda loosed a scornful sound. The Yuzhan Vong do not suffer safe middle ground. They will have things their way or not at all. Before long, there will be nothing counterfeit about the obeisance we show them. From atop a modest repulsor lift couch, Golga looked from Pazda to Borga. Short of going to war, what can be done? Borga interlocked her fingers in patent disquiet. What was it Senator Viki Shesh told you regarding New Republic battle contingencies? She intimated that the Senate and the military were convinced that the Yuzhan Vong would strike next at either Karelia or Bathawi, Golga said. However, the message I was to deliver to you was that the New Republic hopes to see Karelia attacked, where they evidently have a surprise in store. Senator Shesh also wanted it known that the information was a gift, to rectify an earlier wrong, as I recall. Obviously, the New Republic was trusting that the Yuzhan Vong would call her bluff. I relate as much to Malik Carr, Borga said pensively, and it now appears that Choka has taken the bait. But I begin to wonder who is using whom. If Choka is keen on using us to send a false message to the New Republic, he does so by deliberately putting our spice ships at risk at Bathawi. And if that is indeed the case, he is obviously prepared for the eventuality that we will declare war. You see, Pazda said, there is no middle ground. Borga turned to the ample Krev Bombasa. Triple our usual spice shipments to the Bothan worlds. Let's be certain we send a clear message to the New Republic that Karelia is the target. Bombasa nodded dubiously. What about your promise to Choka about sharing information? A promise is like a shipment of spice jettisoned in deep space, Gardula the Younger sniped. It weighs nothing. That may be so, Krev said, but if our treachery is discovered... Nal Hutta itself will be imperiled, not to mention Rhonda. We risk something greater by partnering with the invaders, Pazda argued. Everyone waited for Borga's response. Krev is correct, she said at last. If we're to help thwart the Yuzhan Vong, we must be circumspect. When drawing the Sarlacc from its hole, a wise hut uses another's hand. She turned to Lenik. You have a better grasp of Yuzhan Vong than I. What instructions did Choka give to the commander of the Kresh? The Rodian bowed. Choka said that he was dispatching a ship to rendezvous with the Kresh at Kalarba. 
Borga looked at Krev Bombasa. Contact your friend Talon Card. Perhaps the Jedi will be interested in learning the whereabouts of one of their missing knights. I had to see for myself, Ronda Basadi Diori said, using his mighty tail to move himself to the edge of the inhibition field two Dovan Basils had fashioned aboard the crash. Ah, but of course, there's no way to identify a Jedi by appearance alone. Consider Luke Skywalker, for example. Looking at him, who would guess he possesses the power he does? Under the vigilant gaze of several Yuzhan Vong guards, Rhonda sidled closer still until he was practically belly to nose with the battered human imprisoned within the force field. I saw Skywalker once long ago, perhaps as far back as thirteen of your years, during that sorry business involving Durga and his so-called Dark Saber project. Not that I had anything to do with Durga. I just happened to be visiting the Malaco Corporation quarry when Skywalker, traveling incognito, showed up in the company of a slender, short-haired human female who seemed to be his paramour. Whatever became of that one, hmm? The prisoner expelled a laugh through his broken nose. I hear Mara Jade arranged for her permanent disappearance. Rhonda planted his hands on his belly and guffawed. So are you in fact who Kind Kyle says you are? Or should I say, his war coordinator says you are? Worth Skidder's split upper lip curled. What do you want, Rhonda? Or have you just come here to gloat? Gloat? Surely not, Jedi. Rather, I've come to offer my sympathies. Not only for what Kind Kyle has planned for you, but for what the Yuzhan Vong have planned for the New Republic. I suppose we should all follow your parents' lead and roll over. Is that the idea? Rhonda feigned weariness. We all serve someone, Jedi, even you. What's more, you misunderstand us. Though we command a significant volume of galactic space, as is only appropriate for beings of such size and longevity, we have never been empire builders. You insist on thinking of us as warlike when in fact we share much with the reclusive Hapens. Correction, Rhonda. The Hapens aren't outlaws. They're not interested in smuggling spice or organizing criminal activities wherever they set foot or tail. Rhonda responded with elaborate chagrin. Is this the voice of the moral minority I hear? Such vehemence makes me wonder if you aren't one of those Jedi allied with Kip Doran, who seems to be on a personal crusade to make the space lanes safe for all law-abiding citizens, despite the fact that many of the smugglers and pirates he has set his sights on served the New Republic in their own way. Skidder's eyes, nearly swollen shut, managed to narrow slightly. How long do you think the Yuzhan Vong are going to tolerate your illicit ventures? Rhonda grinned. My sense of the Yuzhan Vong is that they have more tolerance for outlaws, as you say, than they do for followers of the Force. He laughed resonantly. How does it feel to be seen as the chief impediment to progress, a purveyor of rampant evil? Soon, perhaps, you'll know what it's like to be hunted and preyed upon, as the huts have been in times past. Skidder returned Rhonda's grin. Maybe you'll get lucky and the Yuzhan Vong will turn that matter over to Borga. Wouldn't that be the height of irony, that the huts should be entrusted with safeguarding the peace and ensuring that justice triumphs? Rhonda laughed again. So long as we can continue to supply spice, I don't suppose it would be too arduous a responsibility. Your mother would be proud of you, Rhonda. Your mother? Kind Kyle interrupted as he stormed into the hold, has succeeded in spoiling my surprise. Perplexed, Rhonda pivoted to the commander. Actually, I have you to blame, Rhonda, Kind Kyle said when he reached the inhibition field. You told Borga that I had managed to flush out a Jedi, and in turn, Borga told my immediate superiors, who now wish to deprive me of the honor of presenting this one, he gestured to Skidder, to my superior's superior. Rhonda's eyes grew wide. You mean that he is to be removed from the ship? Presently. But what if your plans to use him to tutor the Yamask in the ways of the Force? 
Kind Carl shrugged. I will propose as much, and who knows, this one may yet return to my care. In the meantime, I'm certain that Supreme Commander Choka will find other uses for him. He took a step back to gauge Skidder. It might be prudent to break you before we surrender you to him. Early in our campaign, the Praetorite Vong applied the breaking to one of you, but that one tried to escape and had to be killed before the process was brought to completion. Did you know him, Jedi? Skidder tested the vigor of the Dovin Basils by moving to the edge of the field. He was my friend. Your friend? Kind Kyle said in surprise. And now here you are. Perhaps you came to avenge him? He paused, then smiled in revelation. You did. You purposely allowed yourself to be captured on Gindine, intent on seizing an opportunity to avenge him. But how could you have known that we had a Yamask aboard? And no wonder the Yamask took to you the way it did. Here I thought that my experiment was succeeding brilliantly, when you were effectively running your own experiment. Skidder said nothing. Kind Cow looked at Rhonda. I was under the impression that vengeance was outside the operating parameters of the Jedi Knights. Or is this one of the dark side? Rhonda shook his head. He is not of the dark side, Commander. He and his kind simply take a more liberal approach to defending the peace. Kind Cal grew serious. In that case, it is incumbent on me to purge him of some of his hatred before he is released. I won't have Supreme Commander Choka getting more than he bargained for. Kind Cal turned and headed for the passageway. Finish your business with him, Rhonda, he added without turning around. It's unlikely you will see him again. Rhonda watched the commander leave the hold, then he pressed himself as close to the inhibition field as possible. They're planning to betray me, he whispered harshly, to subject me to the Yamask, as they did with you. Help me, Jedi. Save me from them, and I will do anything you ask of me. 20. They forged what? Han asked. Baffles' auditory sensors were capable of perceiving the merest whisper, but the question, pumped up by puzzlement, could be heard over the clamor in the spaceport terminal. Travel vouchers of some sort, Baffles said distractedly. Hardwired into a columnar data bank, the droid returned to accessing information, while all around them, in a frenzy of clashing colors and commingled smells, scurried mixed species groups of refugees, pilots, translators, and uniformed officials. From what I can ascertain, Baffle updated a moment later, Droma's clanmates are accused of having forged documents of transit, that permitted several hundred exiles, including all 37 Rin who were housed at Facility 17, to depart Ruin aboard a commercial freighter. Han ran his hand down his face. Depart. He and Droma had arrived too late. The Rin were gone, and now Droma was under arrest, just for being a Rin. See if you can get the name of the ship. Baffle made adjustments to the hardwire's retrieval regulator. The vessel is called the Trevi, he announced as if reading from a display screen, when in fact the data was going straight to his neural processor. It has a Nar Shada registry. Han groaned, then tightened his lips in negation. Maybe it wasn't the Tholatin group. All sorts of relief groups were in the legitimate business of providing transport to stranded refugees, and the Trevi might belong to any one of them despite its hot space registry. The Rin had probably thrown in with a group of desperate exiles and had resorted to forgery only to secure onward passage. Why would the Salish care about a group of refugees traveling on forged documents, he asked at last. The whole idea is to get everyone relocated, right? Baffle divided his attention between Han and the rapid flow of data. Even though Salish Ag has been earnest in its attempts to entice refugees to remain on world... The company wouldn't ordinarily demand retribution for such an offense. In this instance, though, the Rin are accused of conspiracy in addition to forgery. It seems that the captain and the crew of the Trevi are themselves suspected of fraud. In recent months, instead of discharging their obligations to provide safe passage to other worlds, they have been known to abandon their passengers at destinations other than those promised. 
Grumbling to himself, Hans stormed through a circle on the heavily scuffed floor. Tholaton's security chief had said that refugees were often marooned on worlds subsequently targeted for attack by the Yuzhan Vong, which meant that Droma's clanmates might have flipped themselves inadvertently from the cooker to the heating element. See if the Trevi filed a flight plan with ruined control. Baffle set himself to the task. Yes, here we are, he said, photoreceptors brightening. The Trevi launched for... Abragado Re. Hans' brows beetled. He could see where Abragado Re, another core world, might be more desirable than ruin as a place to be stranded. But in terms of the Yuzhan Vong, the place had less strategic value than Gindine or Tenna. That's odd, Baffle said suddenly. What? What's odd? The droid turned away from the column to look at him. A notation appended to the flight plan states that the Trevi's actual hyperspace jump was better suited to a destination rimward of Abragado Re, along the Rima trade route, perhaps to Thyphara or Yagdul. Han considered it. Yagdul, tempestuous homeworld of the exoskeletal given, made even less sense than Abragado Re. But Thyphara, the galaxy's principal source of Bacta, clicked as both a tempting destination and a potential target, albeit a well-defended one. He began to pace. If he left immediately for Thyphora, he stood a good chance of finding Droma's clanmates long before the Yuzhan Vong hit the world. But there was no telling what might happen to Droma in his absence. By contrast, remaining on ruin for Droma's sake could jeopardize the lives of thirty-seven missing Rin. Thyphora seems infinitely preferable to Yagdul, Baffle remarked casually. Han glanced at him. I thought you said you've been on ruin since your activation at Fondor. That's true, to the best of my knowledge, though I do wonder sometimes if I may have traveled more than I realize. Han's eyes narrowed. But you're certain you never studied the workings of war droids with a Rorian named Skinks? I'm almost certain I haven't. Almost, Han snorted. For a labor droid, you're pretty good at data retrieval. Ah, but that's easily explained, Baffle said. Before I was delegated to drive, I worked at district headquarters, overseeing the reassignment of droids retired from agricultural fieldwork. Desk job. Not really, since I performed most of my tasks standing up. Baffle paused briefly, then said... Sir, if you wish, I could be of some assistance in freeing your partner from captivity. He's not my partner, Han snapped. Your travel companion, then. Han stared at the droid for a moment, then exhaled forcefully. Okay, let's hear it. Baffle didn't respond immediately, and when he did, there was a note of gravity in his tone of voice that hadn't been evident earlier. Sir, can I trust that you will refrain from disclosing any of what I'm about to tell or show you? no matter what decision you reach regarding the Rin? Han laughed through his nose. Labor droid my eye. Do I have your word, sir? Sure, Han said. I'm terrific at keeping secrets. He watched Baffle make another adjustment to the hardwire regulator. Now what are you up to? I'm simply alerting some of my comrades that will be joining them. Baffle unplugged from the data column and began to move off, then stopped. If you'll follow me, sir. As surreptitiously as possible, they slipped through an innocuous-looking doorway in the terminal's east wall and rode an ancient cable-operated car down through several basement and sub-basement levels. Exiting the lift, Baffle led Han past banks of deafening turbine power plants, then into a maze of service corridors that coursed beneath the spaceport's landing platforms and docking bays. Along the way, two other droids joined them, a lanky, vaguely humaniform 8D8 blast furnace operator, and an arachnid-like systems control droid propelled by a set of telescoping legs. Ultimately, they entered a heavy-doored and dimly-lighted storage room, in which no fewer than 30 droids of various types were already gathered. Scanning the machines, Han spotted an old P2 unit with mangled grasper arms emerging from its domed head a helmet-headed military protocol droid. 
a U2C1 housekeeping droid with long pleated hoses for arms, an asp whose head resembled a welder's mask, an insectolide J9 worker, two tank-treaded, trash-barrel-bodied C2R4s, even a skeletal and long obsolete Cybot LE repair droid. Han felt as if he'd been swallowed by a Jawa sand crawler, but he kept the thought to himself. A few moments of lightning-fast machine code was all it took for Baffle to bring the others up to speed on Han's predicament. Sprinkled among the subsequent chatterings, Han heard what sounded like the word Rin, at least the way machines might articulate it. Eventually, heads and sensor appendages of wide assortment swung to observe him. Slightly unnerved, Han uttered a short laugh. Hey, it's been a while since I've spoken droid, fellas. Baffle apologized for the lot of them. We sometimes forget that the speed of the flesh and blood brain lags far behind that of our processors. Han scowled. Skip the sales pitch, long reach, and tell me what I've gotten myself into. Baffled gestured toward the globe-headed system's control droid who had rendezvoused with them in the maintenance tunnels. Pip here has succeeded in locating Droma. As I might have surmised, he is not being held at Facility 17, but at Salish Ag's district headquarters where he is to be arraigned on charges and sentenced. The droid paused to attend to chirps from the P-2 unit. If convicted of conspiracy, the minimum sentence is five years of hard labor. Squatting on its several legs, the system's control droid projected a faintly blue hologram of a sprawling complex built into a hillside that overlooked a far-reaching quilt of cultivated fields. The area where Droma is currently being held is denied to droids, Baffle went on. But a human, such as yourself, should have no trouble reaching him. A highlighted portion of the hologram expanded into a close-up of the foot of the hill, where a system of containment pools and aqueducts directed water into a labyrinth of deep irrigation ditches. What am I supposed to do, just march in there and grab him? Han asked. Baffle chittered to Pip, who immediately displayed holograms of uniforms and identity badges, some of which were emblazoned with Salish Ag's corporate logo. We can provide you with the necessary clothing and documentation, Baffle elaborated, along with maps and whatever else you may require to familiarize yourself with the layout of the district headquarters and its immediate surroundings. We can also arrange for authentication by the security devices you will encounter although it will be your responsibility to persuade the flesh and bloods with whom you come in contact that you are indeed whom your credentials describe you to be. It will also be your responsibility to locate and rescue Droma and to make your escape by whatever route you see fit to take. Chin in hand, Han circled the holographic projections. I'd need a concealable weapon. A weapon can be provided. Han stopped and glanced around. Not to seem ungrateful, but I get the feeling you're not doing this out of the goodness of your programming. What's the catch? The droids tootled and buzzed for a moment. In return for our assistance, Baffle said, we would ask that you do something for us. New holograms resolved in midair, showing detailed views of the interior of the headquarters building. In a room on the fifth level of the east wing are the master controls for a transceiver rectenna array that serves as a monitoring system for this district's several thousand droid workers, all of whom are outfitted with shutdown sensors that can be remotely activated. Han studied the hollow of the master controls. So the transceiver functions as a kind of remote restraining bolt. That would describe it. Han grinned. And you want me to disable it? I might have used the word sabotage, Baffle said. Han circled the new hologram. If you can arrange to get me past the building's security scanners, why can't you do the job yourselves? The transceiver is a standalone apparatus, and the entire east wing is accessible only to flesh and bloods. Entry requires a palm print. Which you can provide, Han said, wishing Droma were there to hear him say it. He stopped to scrutinize the holographic controls. Is there a code that will disarm the system? 
Because we have never had access to the transceiver, blunt trauma might be the most effective course of action. However, we would be happy to provide you with a data card containing a machine virus that should serve the same end. What happens then? With the transceiver disabled, the thousands of droids Salish Ag has already deactivated will be free to escape imprisonment. Han glanced from droid to droid in growing misgiving. Let me get this straight, he said into an eerie silence. Salish has a bunch of droids, or you folks, on ice. Why? Salish Ag would have everyone believe that the employment of flesh and bloods allows them to boast of providing hand-picked foodstuffs. But in fact, the company is phasing out droid workers as a means of demonstrating compliance with the anti-machine tenets of the Yuzhan Vong. Tens of thousands of deactivated droids will be Ruin's welcome gift to the invaders when they reach the core. Han gulped. Credits to Crumbs. The crew of the Trevi had selected Ruin because Yuzhan Vong agents had already been there. You realize that shutting down the transceiver is probably going to touch off every alarm in the complex, he said. Yes, but we can silence most of them, Baffle assured. What's more, many of our deactivated comrades are stored at the complex itself, and once they are reactivated, we can unseal the chambers that house them. The ensuing confusion should aid in your escape. Yeah, Droma and me will blend in real well with a bunch of reawakened droids, Han muttered. But that's beside the point. What's to stop Salish from repairing the system and deactivating every droid set free? Given even a modicum of time, we can extract the remote sensors from most of those who are liberated, as we have already done to ourselves. Without Salish's knowledge? All droids on Ruin have deactivation dates, Baffle explained. In order to safeguard our deception, many of us have had to submit to voluntary deactivation while our act of sabotage was being planned. Isn't all this against your programming or something? Our inhibition programs prevent us from taking direct actions against living beings, but we are permitted, even encouraged, to act in self-preservation. We've simply been awaiting the arrival of the one flesh and blood who could help us. Han held up his hands. Not so fast. I mean, let's say I decide to go through with this, and suddenly there's a couple of thousand of you who can't be remotely deactivated. You think that's going to stop Salish from hunting every one of you down and hammering a restraining bolt into your plastrons? Or just blasting you to fragments? We're aware of the fate that awaits us, Baffle said. But before Salish Egg can bring about our termination, we plan to execute and broadcast an act of passive resistance that will not only draw galactic attention to our plight, but also alert our comrades far and wide to the dangers they face. Han thought about C-3PO and his current obsession with deactivation, and he thought about Droma, who had saved Han's life on two occasions. An easier way to rescue the Rin would be to pull rank on whatever bureaucrats administered ruin. He could simply reveal who he was and claim that he and Droma were on a mission for a new Republic intelligence. But doing so could backfire on him. Because of the part he had played in the Elon affair, Han could well imagine Director Scour disavowing any connection between Han and New Republic intelligence. And even if Scour backed up Han's ruse, there was a good chance that Leia would learn of what happened and accuse Han of meddling in Cellcor business. Besides, Rescuing Droma by pulling rank wouldn't do anything for Baffle and the rest of Ruin's droids. All right, I'll do it, he said at last. But on one condition, I want to know where the Trevi went. I want ion drive and thermal exhaust profiles, transponder codes, hyperspace coordinates, and anything else you can come up with. I will attend to the matter personally, Baffle said. Han took a breath and blew it out through pursed lips. You said Droma is being held in a denied area. Where is he? Baffle traded glances with some of the others. He is being held at the Product Enhancement Facility. Product Enhancement, Han repeated slowly. Baffle nodded. The manure works. 21. 
Talk about ragtag outfits, Shada Ducal said, as 13 X-wings, A-wings, and modified Y-wings, many of them as patched up as a pirate craft, pierced the MagCon field of Cothless II orbital stations aft docking bay. The starfighters had surely been scanned on arrival in Bothan space, but no sooner did they settle down to the deck than a Bothan military unit moved in to execute a thorough search and documents check. Talon Card and the former Mistral Shadow Guard from Emberlean watched from an observation gallery that overlooked the bay, Shada wearing a form-hugging outfit of black elastex, and Card in a tailored suit, looking more like her booking agent than her employer. A pity you never got to see Kip's squadron a year ago, Card said. Back then they had two XJs fresh from Incom along with a couple of B-wings in near immaculate condition. Shada kept her eyes on the starfighters. So I've heard. Kip had named them the Dozen and Two Avengers, much to Skywalker's dismay. Kip sicked them on the outer rim, detaining pirates and smugglers, and generally sticking his nose whenever he wanted, all without Coruscant batting an eye. The Dozen and Two, Shada said. Kip and Miko Reglia his Jedi apprentice at the time. I should have known. They liked to frequent Dubrillion. Several members of the squadron were record holders on those modified ties Calrissian bought for his asteroid obstacle course. Or at least until Jaina Solo showed everyone how Lando's folly should be run. Card laughed, mostly to himself. But I have to credit Kip for showmanship. Launching or landing... He'd lead the Avengers through flashing maneuvers, sometimes to amplified orchestral music. Then Helska happened. Shada turned slightly in Card's direction. Kip lost everyone. It was the first engagement between starfighters and Yuzhan Von Coral skippers. The first substantiated one at any rate. The Avengers didn't have a clue what they were up against. Reglia was captured alive but apparently died later during an escape attempt. Shada returned her gaze to the docking bay. So where do you suppose Kip found replacements? Most of them are combat veterans from one conflict or another. Several were flying relief missions to threatened, even occupied worlds, earning New Republic credits for authenticated Yuzhan Vong kills. Kip proposed that everyone would do better if they formed an actual unit, and at the same time, he'd have his Avengers back. But they're not sanctioned by the military. Card shook his head. They're classified as a support unit. As an appeasement to Skywalker and the military, Kip dropped the name Avengers. Now they're just Kip's dozen. He looked at Shada. Let's go say hello. By the time Card and Shada arrived in the hold, Kip... Ganner Rysode and the twelve members of Kip's squadron were huddled near the modified Y-wing co-piloted by Ganner. The noses of some of the other starfighters were emboldened by meteor storms of laser-engraved coral skippers. Seeing Card and Shada, the two Jedi walked toward them. One heck of a place for a rendezvous, Card, Kip said. Half the fifth fleet is parked between here and Bathawi. We're lucky we were even cleared for Cothalus. Never mind this place. I didn't want to trust what I have to say to normal channels, Card explained. As for the fleet, the Bothans aren't taking any chances, even though conditions have changed since our visit to Ryloth. Changed how? Kip asked conspiratorially. Card nodded his head toward the observation gallery. Step into my office for a moment. Kip signaled his flyers to remain with the ships. Then he and Ganner followed Card and Shada to a turbo lift that accessed the overlook. No one spoke until they arrived on the gallery, where they pulled four chairs together and sat down. The huts have resumed shipping spice to Bathawi and Cothless, Card began. With all the patrols, not much is getting through, but that's irrelevant. Are they shipping to Corellia? Ganner asked. Not yet. Kip frowned in bewilderment. Then why is the fleet here and not at Corellia? From what I hear, the Corellian sector's about to revolt. Card shook his head. I don't know why. It would appear that not everyone accepts the significance of the intelligence we provided. Failure, 
Kip said, and others on the advisory council. But Spice has nothing to do with what I have for you. Card paused briefly. Are rescue missions off limits to Jedi? I ask only because I don't want to be responsible for widening the rift between you and Skywalker. There is no rift, Kip said firmly. We don't see eye to eye on some things, but there's no rift. He approved my coming here. That's good, because I'm reluctant to take this information to Rogue Squadron. Even with Jaina Solo flying with them, I'd have a lot of explaining to do. Card's eyes narrowed as he assessed the two Jedi. Is Worth Skidder still missing? Ganner suddenly leaned forward. Yes. No other Jedi? What have you heard, Card? Kip demanded. This comes direct from Krev Bombasa, so I'm trusting that it's reliable information. Yuzhan Vong forces are holding a Jedi aboard a ship headed for Kalarba. The ship is carrying a war coordinator, so there's a good chance it's either well-armed or traveling under escort. Kalarba, Kip said with a nod. That's why you chose to meet here. We're only a jump away. You'll have to move fast regardless. Skitter's slated to be transferred to another ship and handed over to some top commander. Once that happens, your chances of getting near him are probably next to none. Ganner tightened his lips and nodded. Thanks for bringing this to us, Card. Card got to his feet. You're certain Skywalker won't object. Kip gave his head a shake. Rescue is our mandate. Several thousand demonstrators, most of them drawl and humans, but with some Salonians mixed in, railed from behind the majestic gates that had once allowed Governor General Marcha of Mastagophorus to maintain a tranquil enclave for herself on that part of Drawl. Squads of public safety service guards reinforced the fence that encircled the compound, though in fact any determined Drawl could simply have burrowed their way onto the grounds. From a round-topped window in the sitting room that overlooked the estate's expansive front lawn and March's beds of prized nanariums, Jason trained electro-binoculars on some of the placards and signs hoisted high by the vociferous crowd. Jedi warmongers, he read aloud. Servants of the dark side. Corellia will live to see Coruscant die. Lowering the binox, he swung to his younger brother. Here's one you'll like, Anakin. Solos, go home. He bit his lower lip and shook his head. Wait till Dad gets wind of this. The shuttle that had delivered Anakin and Jason to Drawl sat on a shrub-enclosed permacrete pad behind March's hemispherical white manse, close to the river. Beyond the pad, manicured lawns stretched to the edge of luxuriant forest. Droid servants busied themselves outdoors and in, trimming the hedges that lined the estate's brick walkways and making minor adjustments to the fountain in the central foyer. I don't know how word got out that you boys would be stopping here before continuing on to Centerpoint Station, Marcia said as she served pieces of dark brown homemade rishkate, heavy with voilu nuts. But don't feel singled out. Most of that crowd has been here for the past month. Things are even worse in Coronet and on some of the worlds of the outlier systems. And on Talus and Trollus, the Federation of the Double Worlds has recently formed a coalition with the archaeologists the New Republic forcibly removed from Centerpoint. The Centerpoint party, March's nephew, Ebrahim said, as he reached for a wedge of the sweet cake. Extremists who have borrowed freely from the rhetoric of the old Sikorian triad. Nearby, and attentive to every word, stood Q9X2, Ebrahim's jet black and bullet headed astromech droid, who, when it spoke, was usually quick to express a high opinion of itself. Because this system is comprised of worlds captured by Centerpoint Station and installed into orbit around Corel, Marcha said, the party advocates increased representation in the New Republic Senate. Ebrahim nodded in affirmation. With five votes instead of one, the party leaders believe that they might have been able to prevent Coruscant from commandeering Centerpoint. 
Furred and somewhat chubby bipeds, Ebrahim and Marcha had clawed feet, elongated whiskered muzzles, and small ears set high on their heads. Like most drow, they were keenly intelligent and honest to a fault, if at times maddeningly fastidious. But where age had tempered Ebrahim's tendency to pontificate, Marcha, while some years Ebrahim's senior, was as fervently self-reliant as Jason remembered her being during the center point station crisis, almost eight years earlier. What had begun then as a family holiday had turned into open rebellion, with the Sikorian triad making use of center point station's awesome interdiction and Nova-inducing power to force the new republic into recognizing the sector's autonomy. Ebrahim, hired by Leia to tutor Jason, Jaina, and Anakin, had ended up being their rescuer by spiriting them from Corellia to Drawl, where Marcha had not only sheltered them, but had also led them to the planetary repulsor Anakin activated to thwart the Triad's plans. "'Couldn't have you prevented the New Republic from commandeering Centerpoint?' Jason asked. Marcha was gentle in her ridicule. "'I'm a political appointee, Jason.' given that many of my own staff have turned on me for not taking a firmer stand, it probably would have been a wise move to challenge or at least denounce Coruscant's actions. But without your mother to back me, Borsk Felia would have simply removed me from office, and the military would have taken possession of Center Point regardless. Anakin frowned in confusion. Any of the repulsors buried on Corellia Drow Salonia, or the Double Worlds, is capable of fending off an attack by an entire fleet of starships. And with Centerpoint re-enabled, Corellia will be as well defended as any system in the New Republic, including Coruscant. So I don't see why everyone's protesting what we're trying to do. Marcha and Ebrahim traded knowing looks. I fear you haven't been given all the facts, Anakin, the one-time tutor said. You're under the impression that you've been summoned to aid in Corellia's defense, when in fact, re-enabling Centerpoint Station has more to do with offense than defense. I knew it would be something like this, Jason blurted. Anakin smiled falsely. Drawl's lighter gravity is going to Jason's head, he told everyone. He's convinced that our coming here is going to upset the balance of the Force or something. Jason smoldered. You're not far off, Anakin. You're the one who's far off. Anything that will stop the Yuzhan Vong has the force on its side. What's come over you boys? Marcha interrupted. You never used to argue. We disagree about this mission, Jason said, staring at his younger brother. Among other things, Anakin said under his breath. Jason gestured toward Ebrahim. You heard what he said, Anakin. This has more to do with offense, and you were the one who described Centerpoint as Corellia's lightsaber. Yeah, which means it can be used to parry or thrust. It all depends on who's wielding it. Meaning what? That you'll refuse to help if you find out it's going to be used for attack? Meaning that I'm waiting to hear all sides of the argument. Anakin turned to Ebrahim. Is there proof the New Republic plans to use Centerpoint as a weapon instead of a shield? Ebrahim mulled over his response. The problem, as I see it, and as you yourself assert, is that Centerpoint has the capacity to be both. Even if used as a shield today, there's no guarantee it won't be used as a weapon tomorrow. But that inherent duality isn't the reason for the protests. The cause runs deeper than that. How much do you remember about what the Triad attempted to do during the crisis? Marcha asked. Actually, I don't remember all that much, Anakin confessed. I know they used Centerpoint to create a system-wide interdiction field, capable of trapping hostages and repelling rescue attempts at the same time. Ebrahim nodded. We strongly suspect that the New Republic will attempt to do the very same thing. You see, this operation isn't about using Centerpoint to safeguard Corellia. It's about using the station to ensnare the Yuzhan Vong fleet, and utilizing this system as a battle arena. Oh, brother, Jason groaned. 
No wonder Corelli is ready to riot. Anakin looked from Jason to Ebrahim. You said suspect. That's correct. We're not privy to all that's going on inside Center Point, much less inside the minds of the Defense Force Command Staff. What we do know is this, that despite the proximity of the Yuzhan Vong fleet to Corellia, the system is effectively undefended. Oh, the New Republic has seen fit to deploy three of our own Strident-class star defenders at Corellia, and the flotilla that has been safeguarding Duro has been pulled back to shore up the outlier systems. But even that amount of firepower is insufficient to ward off a full-scale attack. Which is precisely what the Defense Force would like the Yuzhan Vong to conclude, Marcha added. Our conspicuous vulnerability is meant to lure the invaders here, Ebrahim said, to prompt an assault. Then, once Center Point has immobilized their fleet, New Republic ships deployed at Bathawi, Kuat, and other worlds will supposedly jump to engage them. Anakin's forehead creased in concern. How is the Defense Force expecting to get ships through the interdiction field that's holding the Yuzhan Vong fleet at bay? By outfitting the ships with the same hyperwave inertial momentum sustainers the Bakarans used during the crisis, Ebrahim said. You must understand, Anakin, this operation has been in the works for some time. Marcha confirmed it with a nod. Just how much of it is understood by the demonstrators or even by the center point party, is immaterial. The protesters are reacting to the fact that Coruscant has withheld defense and commandeered center point without factoring Corellia's citizenry into the equation. Anakin grew pensive, then looked at Marcha. You make it sound like everything is already set. It doesn't sound like I'm really needed here. Marcha smiled faintly. I wish that were so. But in fact, the success of the strategy rests very much with you. Ebrahim explained, The Defense Force has had their best people working nonstop to bring the entire network online, including the repulsors housed on the five brothers, Corellia, Drow, Salonia, Talus, and Trollus. The goal now is to slave all five planetary repulsors to center point itself providing it with even greater power and range than it already enjoys from tapping the gravitic energies of the double worlds. Theoretically, the station will then be capable of creating interdiction fields wherever Admiral Sav and the rest desire them to be created. Centerpoint would also have the ability to alter the course or location of distant planets, or cause stars to explode, as occurred twice during the crisis. But the scientists have not yet been able to realize their ambitions, Marcha emphasized. As was the case during the crisis, the mysteries of Centerpoint continue to elude everyone. The station remains unpredictable and unstable, and at this point no one is certain that it can recreate a massive interdiction field, let alone that it can incite a distant star to go nova. And this is where you and you alone figure in the scheme, Anakin, because many of the scientists are convinced that the system still bears the imprint you imparted to the repulsor here on Drawl, and that such a network can be brought into synchronization only by you. Ebrahim reinforced it. Eight years ago, you were responsible for disabling Center Point. Now you may be the only person who can successfully rehabilitate it. Concern shown from Anakin's eyes. Jason sensed this from the beginning, but... He glanced at everyone. It's not that I don't trust what you're telling me, but I have to go to Center Point and see for myself. I might be able to re-enable it as a shield only. That way, Corellia and Drawl and the rest can at least protect themselves from attack, no matter what plans the Defense Force or any others devise. Marcha smiled sadly. Yes, perhaps you'll be able to do just as you say, Anakin. But a word of warning before you go. When it came to reactivating the repulsors and the station, 
Coruscant had no choice but to call on many of those who were directly involved in fomenting the crisis. Anakin nodded. The Sikorian Triad, you mean? Along with several others who played a role in those events, Ebrahim said. Marcha looked from her nephew to Anakin and Jason. It's just this, boys. You may not like what you're going to find on Center Point. Therefore, you must take care. Think carefully before you agree to anything. 22. We've got an inspector here from Comestibles and Curatives, the sentry posted at the entrance to Salish Ag's district headquarters said into his comlink. Human. Yeah, I already told him that we'd had some CCA folks through here last week. But he claims it's a spot inspection. Yeah, all his documentation checks out. With his hair and beard dyed jet black and a brimmed cap tugged low on his forehead, Han acted nonchalant while he waited outside the security booth. Baffle, who had dropped him at the gate, had assured him that the pale green lightweight suit was standard issue for comestibles and curatives administration inspectors. And in fact, the corpulent human sentry had scanned the computer-coded identity card with the indifference of one who had seen hundreds in his day. "'What areas are you interested in seeing?' the man asked suddenly. Han adopted an officious smile. "'Divulging that information would effectively undermine the nature of my visit.' The sentry frowned. "'He isn't saying,' he muttered into the comlink mouthpiece. "'Claims it'll spoil the surprise.' "'No, I didn't laugh either. "'Okay, he'll be here when you arrive.' He switched off the comm link and returned the identity card to Han. Sit tight, pal, and escort's on the way. The casually dressed man who arrived moments later in a four-seater land speeder was even heftier than the sentry and had the same sunburned and stubbled farm boy toughness. Both men were a world apart from the aristocratic Harbrights who ran Salish Ag and were apparently intent on throwing in with the Yuzhan Vong. The escort took in Han as he approached the land speeder, an alloy case dangling from his right hand. Surprised they haven't retired you yet, old timer, he remarked. A name tag stitched to the pocket of his untucked shirt identified him as Bao. So much for the deceptive qualities of hair dye, Han thought, as he climbed into the rear seat of the speeder. With any luck, this will be one of my last assignments. You know, Salish has never had a problem with you people, Bao said around what remained of a toothpick protruding from between his front teeth. We pay good money to see to that. I wouldn't know, Han said, blinking. I'm simply carrying out my assignment. Fine. Just make sure you're quick about it. I don't have all day. Han forced a nervous laugh. I'm as eager to have this over with as you are. They set off, but had traveled only a short distance when the Salish man brought the land speeder to a halt alongside a large map and directory. With some difficulty, Bao rotated in the front seat to face Han. Where to first? We can sample produce from a couple of nearby fields, or you can run your tests on random samples that have already been harvested. He pointed north. Shipping is over that way, in case you're interested in cargo container decontamination procedures. Han pretended to study the map, then said, Suppose we begin at product enhancement. Bao's bushy brows knitted. You're kidding. Han cleared his throat. Is there some problem? No problem. I just hope CCA is paying you well. The land speeder flew down narrow dirt roads, many of which twisted through fields of burr millet waiting to be harvested. As tall as trees, the slender umber stalks of grain formed palisades to either side. Han's nose alerted him to the fact that they were nearing the fertilizer works long before a sign announcing product enhancement came into view. At yet another checkpoint, he was issued a disposable jumpsuit and a rebreather helmet with a tinted face bowl. Similarly outfitted, Bao led the way toward an enormous flat-roofed warehouse, 
whose loading bays were crowded with banthas, rontos, and other beasts of burden, waiting to receive cargoes of fertilizer. Baffle had already explained that, in keeping with Salish's aim to please the anti-tech invaders, the company was in the process of switching over from machine-produced nutrients to live production. So Han wasn't as surprised as he might have been to see thousands of crawmaws, wingles, and night seers, genetically manipulated to be wingless and mute, being force-fed in cages and perches that lined the interior of the building. Beneath the cages, and filled to the brim with the avian's abundant droppings, were wide troughs that funneled the manure to the loading bays for eventual dispersal. Other areas of the warehouse were given over to water tanks crammed with stink fish and finger fins dredged from ruin's bountiful seas. Mashed by mallet, the fish were being tossed into the troughs to serve as a fertilizing additive. Considering the debilitating effect it was having on some of the bare-faced gotals, bims, and hapless others whose task it was to gather and shovel excrement overspill into the troughs, Han could well imagine the stench. But he could only guess at the offenses, real or trumped up, the former refugees had committed to have earned themselves such punishment. Among one group, knee-deep in the grounded avian's orger, and leaning feebly against the wooden handle of his shovel, stood Droma. "'I'm going to run a few quick tests,' Han told Bao through the rebreather's annunciator." He popped open the carry case and made as if to extract one of the test kits Baffle's coterie of droids had provided, then stopped abruptly and pointed to Droma in elaborate incredulity. Is that... is that a Rin? The Salish man stared, then nodded his head. Yeah, he's new here. New or not, Han continued, growing more agitated as he spoke. Doesn't anyone realize that Rin have prescriptions against bathing and other habits most sapiens consider essential to good health? But he's working with manure. That is hardly the point. Do you know what would happen if word leaked that Salish Ag has Rin on the premises? It's only one Rin, Bao started to say. He'll have to be removed this instant. I demand that he undergo a complete medical evaluation before he is permitted to return to work. Even work of this sort. Letting his exasperation show, Bao prized a slim comlink link from his shirt pocket and, raising the face bowl of his helmet, began to speak briskly into it. Han wondered what Salish Ag was going to do about replacing its comlinks and land speeders if and when the Yuzhan Vong showed up. All right, Bao told Han a moment later. We're cleared to bring him to medical in the East Wing. He swung angrily toward Droma. Rin, leave your shovel and get over here. Droma looked up, set the tool aside, and clomped toward them, shaking one leg, then the other, then his tail, in an effort to rid himself of some of the gray filth clinging to him. Whatever you do, don't touch him, Han warned Bao, or you'll have to be evaluated along with him. Reeking of dung, Droma stopped a few meters away, clearly without recognizing Han behind the rebreather mask. Hose him down, Bao ordered a nearby worker. Han winced as the high-pressure flow from a thick hose nearly swept Droma off his feet. Ill-starred creatures, he said, loud enough for the Salish man to hear, forever getting themselves into trouble. Bao puffed out his lips and nodded grimly. You can say that again. With Droma dripping wet and looking hopelessly forlorn, Bao snapped stun cuffs around his wrists and shoved him toward the warehouse exit. At the checkpoint, Han surrendered the rebreather, deposited the jumpsuit into a shredder recycler, and followed Droma into the rear seat of the land speeder. Downcast, Droma didn't glance at him until they were underway, and even then he didn't recognize Han immediately. Then his eyes widened appreciably and his jaw dropped. Please hurry, Han shouted to Bao before Droma could ruin everything with a surprised outburst. I find it quite distasteful to have to share a seat with this malefactor. East Wing's dead ahead, Bao said over his shoulder. Han exchanged veiled glances with Droma, but didn't look at him again until the three of them were in a turbolift car 
descending for the East Wing's sub-level one medical lab. Then, throwing Droma a warning look, he drew a small blaster from the Durinium shoulder holster the droids had fabricated and pressed the weapon's emitter nozzle to Bao's temple. Do exactly as you're told, and you'll walk away from this. When the big man nodded in a manner that mixed surprise and anger, Han added, Stop the lift and move to the far corner of the car, then key the stun cuff remote. He cut his eyes briefly to Droma, then told the turbo lift to ascend to level five. Rubbing his freed wrists, Droma glanced at him. We're going up? I've got a job to do. Han gestured with his chin toward Bao. You'll have to deal with this one. Take him down to the maintenance sublevel and find a closet to stick him in. If he gives you any trouble, shoot him. Then meet me on level five. Bao worked his jaw, but managed to keep from saying anything that might provoke Droma to take Han at his word. While the lift was climbing, Han stripped off the pale green suit to reveal an expensive business suit beneath it. Droma's curiosity was palpable. No time to explain, Han said. Handing Droma the bundled-up suit and the open stun cuffs, he added, Hold on to these. We're going to need them later. At level five, he slipped a sheer glove onto his right hand and headed down a broad, gleaming corridor toward the transceiver room. In his left hand, he palmed the fatal data card the droids had given him. The handprint reader was housed in a niche alongside the control room door. When Han laid his gloved hand on the pad, the device's screen identified him as Dees Harbright, cousin once removed of Count Borat Harbright, and senior vice president of marketing for Salish Ag, whom the black-bearded, finely-tailored Han resembled, sufficiently at any rate to bring the half-dozen control room technicians to their feet as he entered. "'Sit down, everyone, sit down,' he said in the most cavalier tone he could muster. "'I just wanted to have a look at our deactivation system. Are we operating on schedule?' 1,250 droids have been shut down and warehoused this quarter, sir. A whip-thin female tech chirped. During the same period, Personnel Acquisition Division has succeeded in recruiting over 3,000 refugees who have agreed to remain on ruin as employees. Splendid, splendid, Han said, moving about the room, the data card still palmed in his left hand. While the female tech went on to offer additional statistics, Han, with his back to a peripheral device he hoped would prove the path of least resistance, slotted the disk, which Baffle promised would literally disappear once it had worked its sorcery. We're expecting to have at least 1,500 more droids warehoused by the end of the next quarter, the cheerful woman was saying when the computer system loosed a series of strident tones that struck Han as the machine equivalent of a distress cry. System crash, another technician shouted in obvious disbelief. At every duty station, lights began to blink out, display screens went gray, and technicians did all but tear their hair out in an effort to resuscitate the system before it crossed over to wherever machine minds went when they crashed. So desperate were their efforts, Han experienced a twinge of guilt, at least until he reminded himself that the machine had been responsible for deactivating thousands of droids. The mounting panic made it easy for him to slip out of the room unnoticed. The corridor was as quiet and brightly lit as it had been moments earlier, betraying nothing of the chaos ensuing in the control room. Adjusting the fit of his fine jacket, Han sauntered toward the turbo lift, nodding with genteel suffrage to everyone he passed. As he neared the lift, Droma appeared from behind a plasteel pillar that had obviously served as his hiding place, the pale green suit draped over one arm. "'Try not to look so guilty,' he whispered. Han's tight-lipped smile held. "'Just get in the lift and put on the stun cuffs,' he said, without moving his lips. Once inside, though, his calm and well-mannered facade collapsed, Quickly, he slipped back into the inspector's suit, then took the blaster from Droma and made certain it was armed. "'I won't even venture a guess as to how you manage this,' Droma said as he donned the stun cuffs. "'Yeah, but it'd be fun to hear you try.' Han slid the blaster into his jacket pocket. "'As soon as we hit the lobby, we make straight for the nearest exit. Got it? Pretend you're in my custody.' Han stood facing the lift doors. 
When they parted, he couldn't see across the lobby for the hundreds of droids that were rushing about and chattering incessantly, many of them hastening for the exits. I can't help thinking you had something to do with this, Droma said. Indirectly, Han gestured to the closest exit that wasn't completely blocked by droids. That way. They stepped into the throng and were just short of the transperisteel exit doors when a gruff voice shouted, There they are! Han failed to keep himself from turning around. Zeroing in on the voice, he saw Bao, now in the company of several security guards, pointing at him. I thought I told you to lock him away, Han said. I did, Droma argued. I stuck him inside a room filled with deactivated droids. Han muttered a curse and drew the blaster. No time for subtlety. Scarcely aiming, he placed a quartet of beams close enough to the guards to send them scurrying for cover. Crouching, he and Droma weaved their way through a tight press of droids and stumbled outside. Han spied Bao's land speeder and steered Droma toward it as a mob of prattling droids spilled from the east wing and began to fan out across the surrounding lawns and parking lots. Throwing himself into the driver's seat, Han grinned broadly. One thing you can always count on with farm boys, he said to Droma, who had removed the cuffs and was settling into the passenger seat. They never locked their vehicles. Han started the speeder's repulsor lift engine. With both hands clamped on the steering wheel and his feet on the pedals, he maneuvered the speeder through a quick turn and shot for the frontage road. No use trying for the main gate, he shouted above the whine of the triple turbines. It's sure to be shut tight by now. We'll have to use the service roads. Some of them have to lead to the fields we passed on the way to Facility 17. Better choose quickly, Droma said, studying the small scanner display affixed to the passenger side console. We've got seven, make that eight vehicles converging on us from north, east, and west. Gritting his teeth, Han glanced at the towering stalks of grain that lined both sides of the frontage road. Ah, who needs a road, he said at last, veering due south straight into the field. The satellite feed to the district headquarters security section provided an unobstructed aerial view of the land speeder pursuit. It was as if the cams were positioned 100 meters above the ground rather than in stationary orbit halfway to Ruin's closest moon. They're sure making a mess of those burmillet fields, the security chief remarked to Bao. The fat man leaned closer to the flat screen display. The stolen land speeder had cut unswerving lines, precise parabolas, and sweeping spirals in the umber sea of grain. In pursuit flew eight speeders, carving out their own streaks and crop circles, if not as conscientiously. Talented driver, that one, the chief said, as the lead speeder slalomed through a row of outmoded windmills, then powered through a series of figure eights before racing off on a new vector. Must have been a swoop pilot. Has he been identified? No, Bao fumed. But it's confirmed he's the one who crashed the droid deactivation system on level five. The chief, pot-bellied and mustachioed, smiled lightly. I heard you were with some of the droids when they came back to life. Bao grimaced. You heard right. But I'll tell you what, none of those droids unsealed the doors. Somebody with access to the system unlocked them as soon as the droids woke up. The chief snorted. So what kind of guy goes through the trouble of masquerading as both a CCA inspector and a corporate vice president to rescue a Rin and free a couple of thousand droids? The well-connected kind. The Rin was arrested at Facility 17 when he and the humans showed up looking for the Rin's clanmates. But it turns out they'd already gotten themselves off-world on forged letters of transit. Maybe it was deliberate, the Rin showing up there, just to get himself arrested. Doesn't calculate. The Rin couldn't have known he'd be brought here. And besides, he couldn't have added anything to what his partner obviously knew before he even showed up at the front gate. We've got people checking with spaceport control to determine how and when the two of them arrived on world. But something's interfering with our accessing the immigration data banks. Something or someone, the chief said. Co-conspirators is my guess. Bao compressed his lips but said nothing. The chief retrieved holograms of the human lifted from the front gate and product enhancement security scanners, along with the level five control room identifier. 
The beard and facial features look real enough, he said, after appraising the hollows for a moment. Bao rubbed his chin. Remove the beard and the cap. Both men studied the revised hollows for a moment more. He looks familiar, the chief said, but I can't place the face. Well, he's an agent for someone. A salish rival? Nebula consumables, maybe? Bao shrugged. Course change, the chief said suddenly, swinging back to the satellite feed display. They're angling east. The two men watched the stolen land speeder tear into another grain field. Then, without warning, it revectored, leaving the field for what Bao initially took to be a service road. But not one member of the pursuit team followed. What's going on? he barked. Son of a blaster, the chief said. That's no road. They've dropped into one of the irrigation channels. Right off the speeder's surface scan displays. Our guys have no idea where they went. Patch into the sluice system and shut all the gates along that stretch. I'm on it, the chief said. Bao turned to the satellite feed screen in time to see the saboteur's land speeder whiz through the closing sluice gate, hop the next in line, then power through a reckless turn into a much broader channel. It's a runoff channel, the chief explained. Ends at the river that runs past Facility 17. If they make it that far, we could lose them. He was reaching for the sluice gate control buttons when Bao restrained him. No, don't shut them down just yet. Make him think he's got time. He glanced at the satellite feed display. Bring us close in on him. When the chief had complied, they could see that the stolen speeder had lost its retractable windscreen. Broken stalks of burr millet poked from creases in the rounded nose and from between the seats, and the cab was half filled with threshed grain. What would you estimate his speed? The chief considered it. The channel's not only broader, but twice as deep, so I'd say he's running those turbines close to flat out. Say two hundred. How far to the nearest gate? Maybe one kilometer away. How quickly do they shut? In a heartbeat. Bao grinned. Keep your finger on the switch. I'll tell you when. The chief grinned back at him. It's like playing a game of death hurdles. Bao watched the screen for a moment, then shouted, Now! Swerving as it tried desperately to shed velocity, the land speeder careened straight into the gate. The force of the impact hurled the human and the wren clear out of the cab, over the top of the gate, and into the ditch beyond. Got him, the chief said excitedly. Patch me through to the pursuit team. Even as he was raising the pursuit team, the chief said, I've got a better way of flushing them out. He activated his comm link. Give me weather control. Bao frowned, then smiled in revelation. Nice touch. The chief shrugged. We need the rain anyway. It was the mud that saved them, only a foot deep but soft as pudding. Han, after ten meters of end-over-end -end flight, landed face-first, plowing a deep furrow down the center of the ditch. Better equipped for acrobatics, Droma executed a flawless triple front flip and came down on his feet, skidding across the slick surface like a competitive aquaplaner. Han surfaced spewing brown water, but it was Droma who was peaked. We'll be safer in the runoff channel, you said. I don't think so, I said. We should stick to the irrigation ditches. Trust me, you said. Keep above the gates, I said. Where's the fun in that, you said? Quit your complaining, Han said. Or have you gotten so used to manure you can't handle a little mud? Droma helped Han to his feet and took a look around. As if the mud wasn't enough, the ditch's smooth permacrete retaining walls were over four meters tall. Now what? We can't even climb out. We're better off down here. Moving through those grain fields would be slow going. Han stripped off the pale green and business jackets and threw them aside. He used his fingers to sluice mud from his forehead and beard. What did the map show? You mean just before you crashed? Han glowered. That wasn't a crash. Somebody knew just when to shut that gate. He glanced at the sky, which seemed darker than it had been a moment earlier. They're watching us. Sky or satellite cam. Droma cut his eyes from the sky to Han, then pointed in the direction they had been heading before the collision. The river is a couple of kilometers straight ahead. We should be able to follow it all the way to Facility 17. 
Perfect. We float down the river and haul ourselves out short of the refugee camp. Then we make our way to the spaceport. Where Salish will have an army of guards posted and every scanner set to shriek the moment one of us presents an identity card. Don't worry about that. We've got friends who will get us right to the Falcon. Droma stopped squeezing water from his mustachios. Without passing through ruin control? Han smirked by passing under it. His foot made a sucking sound as he lifted it from the mud. Let's get a move on. They hadn't gone three hundred meters when a deep bass sound rumbled overhead. Han stopped. What the heck was that? Droma waved in dismissal. That's just the weather control station. Salish resets it a couple of times a day. Han watched gray clouds stream overhead. He pivoted through a circle, gauging the height of the walls. Even with Droma atop his shoulders, Droma wouldn't be able to reach the top. We have to go back to the sluice gate, he said suddenly. Droma looked at Han as if he were mad. What? The gate's our only chance at climbing out. I thought you said we're better off down here. Fat drops of rain started to fall. Salish is cooking up a storm. They're planning on drowning us. Droma gulped. But those speeders that were chasing us, they're probably already headed for the gate. Han tightened his lips and nodded. You're right, but there has to be at least one more gate between here and the river. They began to run, helping each other along, when one of them slipped or became bogged down. The rain became a downpour, and the muddy water rose quickly from ankle to knee-deep. Behind them they heard the steady whine of approaching land speeders. Then the sound was replaced by a roaring turbulence. Han came to an abrupt halt. Listen, he shouted to Droma above the steady pounding of the rain. Droma stopped a few meters farther on. I don't think I'm going to like this. Both of them turned to see a three-meter-high wall of water raging toward them. They barely had time to swing back toward the river when the torrent caught up, sweeping them away. 23. Larger than the Death Star, center point Station hung gray-white and ominous between Talus and Trollus, drawing its power from the gravitic output of the so-called Double Worlds. Rotating slowly around an axis defined by two thick polar cylinders, the station had been designed to act as a gravity lens capable of directing amplified bursts of repulsor energy through hyperspace, sufficient for the capturing of distant worlds or the destruction of far-flung stars. Its surface was a mishmash of boxy superstructures as tall as skyscrapers and force bubble pressurization access ports the size of impact craters. A bewildering tangle of piping, cables, and conduits coursed in all directions, winding through multi-storied forests of parabolic antennae, conical arrays, and CETOS projections. A prominent feature was the remains of a crashed spacecraft that had been macro-fused to the hull and converted into living quarters. I was the first person to greet your Uncle Luke, Lando Calrissian, Belindy Calenda, and Gary L. Captison when they came aboard. Jenica Sonson told Anakin, Jason, and Ebrahim, while a turbovator smelling of fresh paint conveyed them along a dark pink tunnel toward the station's core. I think we met you on Corellia afterwards, Jason said. You did. I'm delighted that you remember. The simulated gravity is increasing, Q9 interrupted in basic, speaking through a vocoder the droid had adapted to form words like a mouth. The increase is obviously a consequence of our traveling away from the axis of rotation. Thank you, Q9, Ebrahim said, in deference to the droid's oft-stated opinion that machines should be useful at all times and in all places. Sonson smiled at the exchange. It has long been our hope to provide Centerpoint with artificial gravity, but for the time being, we're relying on centrifugal gravity. Perhaps if we're successful in assisting in the war effort, the New Republic will finally allocate the funds necessary to despin the station. But even without artificial gravity, the Marilsi have done wonders to make Hollow Town and many other areas perfectly livable. 
She was an upbeat, handsome woman, with black curly hair, a long, thin face, and expressive eyebrows. Eight years earlier, following Centerpoint's unexpected flare-ups, which had not only destroyed two distant stars with precise hyperspace shots, but had also incinerated thousands of colonists who had been living in Hollowtown, Sonson had been left in charge of the station while survivors fled for the safety of Talus and Trollus. Since then, she had headed up the cartography team that was slowly mapping the complex interior of the immense orb, a task Sonson herself doubted would be completed in her lifetime. "'Did your team get along with the archaeologists who were deported?' Jason asked. Sonson frowned. "'They weren't deported so much as removed for their own safety. But yes, of course we got along. All of us are interested in learning whatever we can about the species who built Centerpoint and assembled the Corellian system.' I'm afraid, however, that the archaeologists may have erred by making a political issue of their removal. If, as the Centerpoint Party advocates, each of Corell's five worlds should be treated as a separate entity, then it stands to reason that this station, which is certainly not indigenous to the system, should also be considered independent. As a result, I believe that Centerpoint may remain in New Republic hands for some time to come." Ebrahim opened his mouth to say something, but thought better of it and fell silent for the remainder of the ride through the station's two thousand levels of decks. Originally a power containment battery, Hollow Town was an open sphere measuring sixty kilometers in diameter. The curving walls had once seen homes, parks, lakes, orchards, and farmland, basking in the overhead radiance of Glow Point, a kind of pilot light for the entire station. But except for a few that housed scientists and the archaeological team before them, the houses had been dismantled. The only concession to what had once existed were the adjustable shadow shields installed to simulate night. Positioned along the spin axis on both sides of Hollow Town were large cones ringed by six smaller cones, given the names North and South Conical Mountains. The arrangement of the cones was the geometry needed for a particular type of old-style repulsor. Sonson pointed out the sights as she ushered everyone to a small, well-shielded control room that had remained concealed during the station's occupation and had been discovered only by accident when a group of Marilsi had been searching for a place to install a life-support monitor. Consistent with the plumed avians from which they were descended, the limpid-eyed, diminutive Mulrilsi had a talent for rendering extremely large spaces habitable, as they had proved to Dr. Oran Keldor, who had employed some one hundred of them at the Imperial Maw installation near Kessel. In Hollow Town, the fine-boned Mulrilsi were more in evidence than any other species, though there were none in the control room itself when Sanson and her charges entered. The instrument-filled chamber did hold several humans, a Salonian, two Verpine, and a Duros, but, in spite of the diversity, the curious mix of robed Jedi, Drow, and bullet-headed droid brought activity to an abrupt halt and caused all heads to turn. Since arriving on station, Anakin had grown accustomed to being the focus of intense scrutiny, but the gray-haired man who muscled his way through the control room crowd set him back on his heels. With the beard that Han had been growing the last time Anakin saw him, the man looked more like Han than Han himself, if a few centimeters taller and more thickly built. "'You're Jason, and you're Anakin,' he said, pointing to each in turn." Mostly to Anakin, he added, "'You don't remember me, do you? I'm hurt. I'll bet that even your droid remembers.' "'You were responsible for confining Master Ebrahim and Masters Anakin and Jason within a force field on Drawl, Q9 supplied, whereas I was responsible for releasing them.' The man planted his hands on his hips and laughed heartily. "'I'd forgotten all about that.' Your Thraken Sal Solo, Anakin said at last. Dad's first cousin. Thraken made his face long. And your cousin as well, boys. You not only took us hostage, Jason said. You forced our father to fight a Salonian female. Just for your amusement. 
Thracken spread his hands in a placating gesture. Han and I have a long history. He probably never told you about the time he beat the stuffing out of me when we were kids. You might say that I was just paying him back. But you're right, it was wrong of me to do what I did. Sometimes, when you've been remembering an injustice for years and years, revenge begins to get the best of you. Thracken's eyes narrowed. It took me the better part of eight years in Dorthus Tal prison on Sicoria to realize that. But I have realized it, and I'm a changed man as a result. He gestured broadly. That's the only reason I'm here on Centerpoint. As part of my rehabilitation, the powers that be felt that I could demonstrate my newly attained self-awareness by pitching in, by offering my technical expertise in service to the cause, by standing shoulder to shoulder with the new republic against the Yuzhan Vong. He snorted a self-deprecating laugh. Of course, you two wouldn't know how the past can plague a person. You're Jedi. You're not subject to the banal emotions that trouble ordinary folks. Anger, hatred, guilt, the desire for retribution. Such things mean nothing to you. Why, even the Yuzhan Vong have simply failed to see the error of their ways and can probably be brought over to the side of the Force. Am I right? Otherwise, you'd be shoulder to shoulder with us in the trenches, ready to fight, ready to spill whatever amount of Corellian blood that runs in your veins. We're here to help, Anakin said firmly. Are you now? Thracken shook his head in amusement. It's a marvelous irony that it took a galactic war to reunite the old gang. He motioned to one of the humans and the Salonian. And to bring you boys back to the station, you originally helped to shut down. Again his glance favored Anakin. I have you to thank personally for banishing our illusions of a free and independent Corellia. But tell me, do you still think we were wrong to make a grab for freedom? Your methods were wrong, Jason said before Anakin could respond. Thracken waved his hand. Methods. You realize, of course, that the New Republic has essentially abandoned Corellia since the crisis. And knowing Ebrahim, he regarded the drawl with obvious distaste. I'm sure you've been apprised of Coruscant's plan to use Corellia as a battleground. We've heard the rumors, Jason said. Thracken sneered. That's your mother talking. What about you, Anakin? Are you here on a tour, or are you really willing to do what's necessary to safeguard Corellia from attack? Anakin considered it. That depends on what you have planned for Centerpoint. Thracken adopted a look of puzzlement. What we have planned is an interdiction field. What else could we hope for? How about the ability to vaporize every unwanted ship, Yuzhan Vong or otherwise, that shows itself here? Jason chimed in. The watchkeeper was destroyed by one shot from the repulsor on Salonia, and Centerpoint has a thousand times the firepower of all five planetary repulsors combined. It can create a compression wave strong enough to induce a star to explode. Thracken looked to a pale, thin-faced technician. "'This is Anton,' he said. "'He was also here during the crisis. "'In fact, he had family at Bovo Yagen, "'the star that would have been destroyed "'if Anakin hadn't intervened in time. "'Centerpoint can indeed induce stars to go nova,' Anton said. "'The triad caused the explosions of EM-1271 and Thanta Zilbra. But those results cannot be duplicated. You're saying that center point can't be used as a weapon? Jason asked. Antone shrugged. Frankly, we're not sure. In order to loose a burst of repulsor power from the South Pole, the station has to reorient its spin axis, then go through a series of power surges, pulses, transient events, and radiation releases in advance of actually firing. When Centerpoint destroyed EM-1271, Glowpoint's energy spikes killed thousands of colonists. No one wants to risk a repeat of that catastrophe, Thracken said. Jason looked at him. If it's true that you're only interested in fashioning an interdiction field, then you should be able to do that yourself. During the crisis, you were the one placed in control of Centerpoint's jamming and interdiction field capabilities. 
Yes, Thracken said slowly. But the crisis was resolved before I got to try my hand at operating center point. What's more, things have changed since your uncle Luke and the others shut center point down. Now neither of those systems is responding the way they once did. Antone cleared his throat meaningfully. One problem is that the station's barra center point is no longer stable. Center point has always moved about to stay properly positioned and oriented, but the repositioning maneuvers have become erratic. In other words, Thracken clarified, we haven't been able to initiate an interdiction field on demand. Only Anakin can do it, Antone said nervously. As a result of his activation of the Drowl Repulsor, the entire system imprinted on him. He looked at Anakin. On your fingerprints, your DNA, perhaps even your brain waves. I've been proposing this for eight years now, but no one was interested in having you return here until now. There's only one way to find out if Antone's theory merits further investigation, Thracken said. He gestured toward what was obviously a special console. Take the controls, Anakin. Let's see where it goes from there. Jason and Ebrahim threw Anakin troubled looks, to which Anakin responded with a nod meant to be mollifying. But even as he moved toward the console, with every tech watching, Anakin could feel the system beginning to respond to him. Vague memories of his experiences inside the Drawl Repulsor surfaced as he sat down and ran his hands over the console. After a moment, as had happened long ago on Drawl, he seemed to glimpse a virtual array of switches and controls and linkages, all of which had little to do with the knobs and levers and dials that covered the control panel. Hesitantly, he placed his hands on the console. A tone sounded, and a flat spot on the panel began to twist and shimmer, then swell upward, forming itself into a handle like a spacecraft's joystick. When Anakin reached for it, the handle reshaped itself to fit his left hand, and everyone in the room, even Jason, gasped. In his mind, as if on a display screen, Anakin could suddenly read specs on power ratings, capacitance storage, vernier control, targeting subsystems, safety overrides, shielding constraints, thrust balancing, geogravitic energy transfer levels. Unexpectedly, a graphic display appeared in the air over the handle, a hollow wireframe cube made up of smaller, transparent cubes, five high, five across, and five deep. As Anakin manipulated the joystick, the grid of smaller cubes began to take on color, greens and purples, to the accompaniment of activation tones. Everyone but Thracken was speechless. You've done it, boy, you've done it, he enthused. Anakin moved the control stick forward, and a cube of blazing orange appeared. He experimented with minute adjustments that made the cube flicker or brighten. Then he pulled the stick down as hard as he could. Indicators registered an incredible burst of power, and the control room began to shudder. In Hollowtown, Glowpoint came alive, and a display of blinding lightning blazed from it to the South Conical Mountains. The station is reorienting, a technician reported. It's armed, Antone exclaimed in awe. It's capable of firing. A dozen separate conversations broke out in the control room, silenced only by the arrival of the New Republic officer in command of the project. An urgent message from Commodore, the colonel announced to Sal Solo and Antone. Yuzhan Vong, advanced elements are departing hot space. Fleet intelligence estimates 36 standard hours until they're at our doorstep. In groups of three and four, at times escorted by gunboats and squadrons of mital fighters or vintage X-wings, the warships of the Hapen fleet reverted to real space over the planet Commodore, on the rimward edge of the core. Arrayed in a sweeping arc, the sleek Nova-class battlecruisers and Olanji Cheruba double-saucered battle dragons were a vibrantly colored counterpoint to the New Republic's fleet of star destroyers, lumpish Moan Calamari vessels, and unembellished Bothan warships. Gazing at the assembled armada from the shuttle that was conveying her and his soldier from the prince's deep carnelian song of war to Commodore Brand's flagship, Leia felt as if she and everyone she held dear 
were trapped in the current of a tumultuous river that was sweeping them into unknown regions, scattering some, leaving many abandoned on ravaged shores, and carrying others over the falls to oblivion. The feeling had accompanied her from Hapes, troubling her through all the long hours of talk with a soldier, who was seemingly as enthralled by the prospect of going to war with the Yuzhan Vong as he had been by the chance to trade punches and kicks with Bede Thane. True to our pirate roots, the Hapens prefer swift, ruthless strikes, he had told Leia more than once during the voyage. Hurt an enemy at the start of an engagement, and he is yours. For as the fight progresses, his fear of you will intensify and will become your ally. Each time he said it, Leia had recalled Ithor and Gindine, and the ruthless tactics the Yuzhan Vong had employed. But the real source of her apprehension was the vision she had had following the consortium's vote. Whenever she shut her eyes, vague images of destruction played at the edges of her awareness, as if massing for a full-scale assault. Anyone else might have been able to explain the dark images as owing to concerns for the lives of close friends and loved ones. But Leia was too attuned to the Force to dismiss them so expediently. She was convinced that the Force had shown her a possible future, while declining to provide her with a clear sense of just which paths were to be avoided. It helped slightly to be home, but in fact proximity to Coruscant had not alleviated her anxiety. And she had yet to hear from Han, not even by a message delivered through the kids or Luke. What power we have marshaled, Isolde said from the shuttle's passenger cabin window, where he stood with his fingers pressed to the transparasteel panel. I doubt that even the Yuzhan Vong would fail to be impressed. Oh, they'd be impressed, Leia said, joining him. But instead of phasing them, a display like this would only goad them on. Still, as she scanned the hundreds of capital ships anchored in local space, more than a hundred of which had trailed the song of war from Hapes, she couldn't help but be overwhelmed. Painted to symbolize the consortium worlds they represented, the battle dragons consisted of large dorsal saucers linked to smaller ventral ones by dozens of slender rotation struts. Ion and hyperdrive engines were wedged astern, and the bridge sat aft on the dorsal face of the upper saucer, the perimeter of which was studded with ion cannons. As a means of compensating for the ship's relatively slow weapons recharge rate, the equally distributed cannons were mounted on a drive disc that allowed them to be rotated for fire as need be. Sandwiched between and affixed to both saucers of the battle dragon, were sixteen massive pulse-mass mines, each of which was capable of simulating the effects of mass shadows, thus hindering ships from making jumps into hyperspace. By contrast, the Nova-class battlecruiser resembled a mountain climber's two-pronged ice claw, with the ship's viper-headed bridge occupying the distal end of what would be the tool's long handle. Exceptionally fast, well-shielded, and equipped for long-range reconnaissance, the cruiser boasted twenty-five turbo-lasers, ten laser cannons, and ten ion cannons, and could carry twelve mital fighters and six Hetranar assault bombers. While the shuttle was docking inside the heavy cruiser Yald, Leia tried to arrange things so that Isolde would emerge on his own, followed by his contingent of mostly female honor guards and command staff, but the prince wouldn't have it. He insisted instead that Leia walk by his side, a pairing she knew would not only become an endlessly repeated visual bite on the holonet, but also prove a source of amusement for those now aged New Republic officers who had been in favor of her marrying Isolde so long ago. Even so, she managed to put on her best face as she and Isolde descended the shuttle ramp arm in arm to the strains of a hape's march endowed with equal measures of pomp and circumstance by a well-rehearsed hundred-member military band. Leia had disengaged herself by the time they reached the deck, but she could tell by the expression on Commodore Brand's craggy face that even he was a bit nonplussed by the regal formality of their arrival. At Brand's back stood rank after rank of soldiers at attention, saluting sharply when the music concluded. "'Welcome aboard, Princess Solder,' Brand said, stepping forward and extending his hand. 
A soldier threw his short cape over one shoulder and took hold of Bran's hand, nearly crushing it in his grip, Leia was sure. Good to be here, Commodore. Bran smiled uncertainly as he turned to Leia. Ambassador Organa Solo, welcome home. And on behalf of the New Republic, thank you for all you've done. Leia inclined her head in a courtly bow. Thank Prince Isolder, Commodore. He was very persuasive in winning over the consortium. Brand nodded stiffly. Your support might very well stem the tide, Prince Isolder, but our victory will not be earned lightly. We are prepared to earn it, Commodore, Isolder assured him. Just tell me where to direct my forces. The command staffs of both groups moved to the tactical information center deeper in the ship. During a private moment, Brand asked Leia about the voyage from Hapes. She repressed an urge to confide in him that it had been unsettling, and instead dismissed it as uneventful. Dozens of officers and technicians were already gathered in the high-ceilinged TIC, seated at duty stations or clustered around light tables and plotting panels. Once Isolder, Leia, and the rest of the new arrivals were seated, Brand came right to the point. These are our most recent hyperspace probe reconnaissance images from Hut Space, he began, gesturing toward the holograms resolving above one of the chamber's many projector wells. He turned to address himself specifically to Isolder and his commanders. What may look like an asteroid field is actually a fleet of warships. This storm of smaller asteroids spiraling toward the fleet are coral skippers grown on the surface of the planet below. Grown? one of Isolder's female officers asked. Brand nodded. With the permission of the Huts, the Yuzhan Vong transformed the planet to serve as a sort of weapons garden, similar to the ones at Bel Cadden and Cernpedal, from which these fighters have been harvested and equipped with the organic devices that both propel and shield them. A new image took shape in the well's cone of projected light. A close-up view of the coral skippers, attaching themselves like barnacles to the spindly arms of an enormous Yuzhan Vong carrier analog. Elsewhere, warships were maneuvering into battle groups, encircled by swarms of coral skippers. The enemy is massing for a strike, Brand remarked unequivocally. And judging by the numbers of ships involved, they have their sights set on a target of greater significance than Ithor, Abroa Sky, or Gintine. We have determined that target to be Corellia, which we have deliberately left inadequately protected in the hope of inviting an attack. Leia's eyes widened in alarm as a holographic image of a moonlit-sized sphere resolved above the projector. Centerpoint Station is the heart of Corellia's defense, Brand went on. A repulsor and gravity lens, the station is capable of creating an interdiction field that will stretch from Corel clear to the frontier of the outlier systems. At this moment, the station is on standby alert and prepared to initiate the field on our command. Commodore, Leia interrupted. Brandt turned to her and nodded. Yes, Ambassador, your sons are already aboard Centerpoint. I apologize if some of this comes as a surprise, but all information regarding Centerpoint has been issued on a need-to-know basis. Leia looked away from Brand to hide her distress. She also refused to acknowledge his soldier's inquisitive stare. When the Yuzhan Vong fleet emerges from hyperspace in the Corellia system, the interdiction field will rob them of the ability to go to light speed and will essentially hold them fast. When that much has been achieved, many of the warships anchored here and at Kuat and Bathawi, all of which have been retrofitted with hyperwave inertial momentum sustainers produced by the Fondor shipyards, will launch, penetrating the interdiction field at its farthest extreme and advance through a series of micro-jumps to engage the enemy. Brand swung to an ancillary hollow projector above which was displayed a schematic of the hymns. For those of you unfamiliar with the hyperwave sustainer, the device relies on a gravitic sensor to alert a ship to an impending interdiction field, as well as to initiate a rapid shutdown of the hyperdrive. Simultaneously, 
the sustainer allows for the creation of a static hyperspace bubble, which, while incapable of furnishing thrust, holds the ship in hyperspace while it is carried forward by momentum. Brand turned to his audience. Our ships will have one heck of a time trying to maintain formation, but they will be able to get the drop on the enemy fleet. He looked over at the Hapens. Princess Solder, since your ships are not hymns equipped, your command will be responsible for preventing Yuzhan Vong vessels from attempting an escape through the outlier systems. The reasons for assigning you this task are twofold. Your battle dragons carry pulse mass mines, which can effectively extend the limits of center point's interdiction field. To assist you in this, we are placing at your disposal four Immobilizer 418A interdictor cruisers. But more important, your ship's weapons-linked battle computers provide for pinpoint accuracy against single targets, which is precisely what is required to dumbfound the Dovin basils that protect Yuzhan Vong vessels. Ordinarily, we prefer swift, ruthless strikes, Isolder said. But if surgical strikes are called for, then you shall have them, Commodore. Leia managed not to wince. She knew, though, that she could take no more of Brand's briefing. His every gesture and assumption filled her with dread, no less so than Isolder's brash eagerness and posturing self-assurance. Retreating from the surrounding din, she reached out with the force for Anakin and Jason, then for Jaina, Luke, Mara, and some of the other Jedi. Each returned a subtle resonance, which, if nothing else, allayed her concerns temporarily. But when Leia tried to reach out for Han, whom she could sometimes feel, even through his denial of the force, all she got back were images of a raging torrent and a plunge into measureless blackness. 24. Han fought to keep from drowning. Lungs screaming for oxygen, he broke the raging surface of the muddy torrent, spewing water like a coruscant downspout gargoyle and flailing his arms to keep from being sucked under by the current. The water level in the drainage ditch was rising fast. It was likely that the flood would soon bob him to within a meter of the top of the retaining walls but probably not before the water dumped him unceremoniously into the river that allegedly ran past Facility 17. Rain continued to teem from the sky's granite underbelly, stinging Han's face and hampering visibility. Paddling madly with one hand, he cupped the other to his mouth and shouted for Droma, but got no response. A loud slapping noise brought him around to find the crashed land speeder gaining on him, upright and surfing the current. The narrowness of the ditch worked for and against him. With no way to be sure that the land speeder wouldn't follow and crush him under its crumpled nose, Han angled frantically for the smooth eastern wall. Once there, he managed to arrest his forward motion momentarily, which allowed the land speeder to catch up and come alongside of him. On a downward slap of the crumpled nose, Han launched himself for the driver's door, threw one leg over the top, and rolled himself into the cab which, with the mix of threshed grain and rain, might as well have been filled with gruel. His body sticky with the stuff, he dragged himself into the driver's seat and repeatedly flicked the repulsor engine switch on the off chance it would fire up, but the collision had disabled the ignition system. Leaning forward with his hands clamped to the brackets that had supported the retractable windshield, he scanned the roiling water ahead to both sides, finally catching sight of Droma's tail sticking straight out of the water like a flagpole. Before Han could call out to him, the speeder was carried over the top of a sluice gate and down through a stretch of cataracts where the landscape was terraced. Droma disappeared under the rapids, then surfaced, only to disappear once more. Ultimately, he heard Han's call over the noise of the rain and echoing thunder and lifted one arm free of the current in a panicked wave. Precariously balanced in the pitching vehicle, Han stretched out both hands and grabbed hold of Droma as the land speeder shot past him. The weight of the waterlogged Rin almost dragged Han out of the cab, but Droma helped by hooking his tail around a rear seat headrest and hauling himself aboard. You can just drop me at the next intersection, he said, collapsed onto the seat and panting. How far do you figure the river is? Han shouted. Close, Droma said, tugging himself into a sitting position. I'm just glad to be out. A persistent rumbling noise erased the rest of it. 
Han glanced at the sky, put the edge of his hand to his brow, and peered over the bouncing nose of the speeder. The rain and the tall stalks of grain to either side made it difficult to see anything, but dead ahead the fields seemed to end abruptly. "'What's that noise?' Droma asked suddenly. Han whirled on him. "'You said that the map showed this ditch running directly into the river?' Droma nodded uncertainly. "'Think hard. Was it a topographical map?' Droma tugged on his mustache in thought. "'Come to think of it, it was. And were there a whole bunch of parallel lines where the ditch met the river?' Droma's eyes opened wide. "'Hold on!' Han yelled, even as the land speeder was tipping forward. The waterfall was no more than fifteen meters high, but the strength of the current was such that the speeder was propelled right out of the water as it went over the brink. For the briefest moment it seemed as if they would nosedive into the swollen river below, but then the stern of the land speeder began to tip forward inexorably, and a heartbeat later the vehicle was upside down, spilling its contents of passengers and porridge into yet another muddy deluge. Han made his body rigid as he fell, breaking the water with his feet and letting momentum carry him along. Above him he heard the concussive report of the land speeder slamming into the river face down. Ascending, he feared that he might surface directly under the inverted cab, but as it happened, he and Droma emerged with the land speeder between and slightly ahead of them. Han raised his hand and pointed to the southern bank, which was not only closer, but also a lot less steep. "'Can you make it?' I'm not a very strong swimmer, Droma replied with a note of desperation. Han maneuvered alongside him and hooked his left arm around Droma's waist. Just kick like mad. Leave the steering to me. Droma nodded. Just be sure to miss those rocks. Han twisted around to see them closing fast on white water rapids, made all the more perilous by protruding boulders. He let go of Droma and rolled over onto his back, paddling hard to keep his head above water. Caught in the current, there was nothing to do but surrender to it and hope for the best. The first drop took them across the face of a water-smoothed boulder and down into a pocket, from which they were quickly flushed down another drop. Skirting the edge of a froth-covered whirlpool, they rode a sinuous course between tall rocks, then plunged several meters into a swirling pool. Off to Han's left, the land speeder rammed into a sloping rock, went airborne in an end-over-end -end flip, and wound up impaled on a sharp-topped rock. Droma followed, barely missing the same rock and falling like a stone into the pool. As suddenly as they had appeared, the cataracts were behind them, but the current was still strong enough to keep the swimmers from reaching the bank. Allowing the current to buoy him, Han craned his neck to get a look at what lay ahead. More white water came into view, but this time without rapids. Instead, a line of turbulence stretched clear across the river, as if the flow was being impeded by something just below the surface. Blinking water out of his eyes, Han saw through the rain that they were headed straight into a fine mesh net strung bank to bank. The resilient net gave as they struck it, but the current pinned them in place. Han was trying to claw his way along the net to the closer shore when a new sound from upstream compelled him to look over his shoulder. Soaring toward them on repulsor lift power a meter above the river was what might have been a flying garbage bin, except for the fact that it was equipped with a pair of reverse articulated manipulator arms which ended in padded jaws. Lights on the garbage bin's front panel blinked and tones sounded as if in excitement at locating what it obviously had been sent to retrieve. The same panel bore the corporate logo of Salish Ag. The three-meter-tall box slowed and hovered directly over the net. Han and Droma squirmed to avoid the thing's extending arms, but with scant effort the padded jaws succeeded in clamping around their waists and plucking them from the mesh. Lifting them out of the river... The arms swung inward. Hatch doors on the machine's dorsal surface hissed open, revealing a dark interior chamber waiting to receive them. They alighted on a cushioned floor. The hatch doors closed before either of them could scramble out, and the garbage bin began to move away from the river in a southerly direction. In the amber glow of telltales, Han ran his hands over the walls, bringing them to a halt at an arrangement of sprayer nozzles. Then he cursed in sudden recognition of just what had captured them. This is a scout collector. A what collector? Droma asked, distressed even in ignorance. 
a biological specimen collector. We're going to be flash frozen. They got to their feet and began to leap up and down, pounding their hands ineffectually on the underside of the compartment doors. Giving up on the effort, Droma dropped down on his haunches, breathing hard, and eventually Han joined him. The hand of fate, Droma said nastily. But you still owe me one life. Han turned to him. What are you talking about? I saved you aboard the Queen of Empire when Wreck made you jump into the drop shaft. Then I freed you from the Falcon's escape pod when Elon was trying to kill you. Yeah, so who just yanked you out of the drainage ditch? That's the one I'm counting, Droma said. What about my getting you out of district headquarters in one piece? That was a rescue, not a life save. We don't know that my life was endangered, so the best we could say is that you rescued me from imprisonment. Han shook his head and laughed. All right, I still owe you one. Then pay up now. Get us out of here. Han clapped Droma on the back, then grew serious. Listen, in case we don't get out of this, it's been good flying with you. I know, Droma said flatly, then added, You mean that? About flying together? I did mean it. Now I'm not so sure. Han heard the scout collector's repulsor lifts cut in, and he stood up. We're landing. If they open the hatches before our frost bath, we go for them. Agreed? Droma extended his hand, and Han shook it. The collector settled down to the ground. Noises could be heard from outside. Then the hatches began to open. Han and Droma prepared themselves. Thank goodness you're alive, a droid voice said. Han stared, waiting for his eyes to adjust to bright overhead lights. Baffle? A ladder was lowered into the interior, and Han and Droma clambered out. The collector had put down in a spacious indoor facility. Overhead rumbles told Han that they were underground. Dozens of droids were about, articulating greetings in their own fashion. These must be the friends you mentioned, Droma surmised, shaking water off himself like a howl runner. How the heck did you find us? Han asked. We have been monitoring all developments, Baffle said. Security scanners, security team exchanges, satellite supplied real time opticals, even the irrigation and sluice gate control systems. When we ascertained that you were being carried to the river, we quickly arranged for the net and scout collector, a vehicle that has been in storage for some time. Where are we? Droma asked, once beyond his astonishment. Beneath the spaceport. Baffle indicated a nearby tunnel. This leads directly to the bay where your freighter is docked. Han looked at Droma and grinned smugly. Thank you for all you have accomplished, Baffle said, speaking for all the droids. Han nodded in dismissal, then narrowed his eyes. Listen, if you were monitoring us, then so was Salish. They probably have sad cam recordings of exactly what happened at the river. All of you had better clear out of here, fast. Our capture won't matter. Our goal has been accomplished. Already we are in the process of removing the remote restrainers from many of the droids you freed. And our protest demonstration is moving from the planning stage to actuality. Protest demonstration? Droma asked. I'll explain later. Han turned to Baffle. After what you've done, I almost hate to ask, but were you able to gather any data on the treaty? Yes, our original supposition that the ship was headed for a destination rimward of Abrogado Re was correct. That destination, however, is neither Thyphora nor Yagdul, but the very place of my activation, Fondor. The name practically screamed to Han. An industrial planet in the system of the same name, Fondor was famous for its huge orbital construction facilities. During the rebellion, Fondor's shipyards had turned out several super-class star destroyers. Han turned to Droma. Fondor is where we'll find your clanmates. Droma looked puzzled. Then they're obviously not at Facility 17. Han shook his head. We got here too late. They cut a deal with the Tholaton crew. The Trevi is their ship. Droma stared at him in anguished disbelief. If I might make a suggestion, sirs, Baffle said, you could save yourselves three hyperspace jumps by using the seldom-used Gandil-Fondor hyperlane. 
It was originally blazed by the Empire to move ships efficiently between Fondor and Coruscant, and I'm certain we could provide you with the necessary jump coordinates. Han smiled broadly. You're some droid, Baffle. I hope your message gets out. Oh, it will, sir. With the Holonet attention our protest receives, droids throughout the galaxy will stand up for their rights. They'll have you to thank for it. I am merely a part of a greater whole, Baffle said without effect. It is my duty to do all I can for my comrades. Han and Droma traded brief glances. And ours, Han said. Fixed in place by a dollop of organic adhesive, Worth Skidder tracked Kind Call as the commander completed his second circle around him. Concentric to Kind Call's circuit stood a dozen guards armed with amphistaffs and other weapons. I'm surprised that your powers don't allow you to break free of our blorash jelly, Kind Call mused as he glanced at Skidder's immobilized feet. Perhaps you're not as powerful as we think you are. In a flash of anger, Skidder drew on the force to create a vacuum around the Yuzhan Vong's head. Kind Kal gasped, and his hands flew to his throat. Very good, he rasped when the force bubble dissipated. Very good. He breathed deeply. Show me something else. The venomous look in Skidder's eyes was proof that he was at least considering it, but the look was short-lived and soon replaced by a disdainful smile. You don't want to hurl me off my feet? Kind Kal asked, put words in my mouth, fasten me to the deck as I have you? Skidder said nothing. Can you levitate yourself as easily as you do objects? When Skidder couldn't be goaded into responding, Kind Kal heaved a purposeful sigh. Your reluctance to fight is as disappointing as it is incomprehensible. You, the Jedi, are a threat to us, and we are eager to exterminate you. And yet, while we're a clear threat to you, you do little more than slink about, offering support or intelligence, but never really participating as warriors. Is that why you term yourselves guardians rather than soldiers? Kind Kal waved a hand to signal that he was being rhetorical. Since you and our Yamask already have a relationship, I'll have to think of a different method of breaking you. But you will be broken in the end. He fell silent for a moment, then said, Let me show you something. The commander moved to the membranous bulkhead that was actually the outer wall of the starship and voiced a command that rendered a portion of it transparent. A gibbous planet of blue seas and green and brown land masses hung in the blackness. Closer was a moon of fair size, what could be seen of its bright side hemisphere dominated by a domed city. Do you recognize it? Kind Kal asked. The planet is Kalarba, and the moon is Hosk. The domed city is called Hosk Station, and is apparently something of a technological wonder filled with droids and other machine aberrations. He turned to Skidder. To us, the Jedi are no better than the machines the sundry species of this galaxy befriend, as if they were living beings. The Jedi are as much a profanation of nature as Hosk Station is a desecration of the moon it has overwhelmed. I am therefore going to order the moon destroyed. You may consider the destruction indicative of the horrors that await your mind during the breaking. Kind Kal turned to one of his junior officers, but before he could utter another word, the hull suddenly returned to its opaque state, and the ship was jolted strongly enough to send everyone but the jelly-secured Jedi to the deck. A subaltern staggered into the hold, while Kind Kal and the guards were struggling to regain their footing. Commander, we are under attack. Kind Kal blanched. Attack? There was no sign of New Republic warships when we entered this system? The aggressors are starfighters, Commander. They were lying in wait behind the second of Kalarba's moons. Then why aren't our escort ships repelling them? With eight coral skippers already destroyed, some of the starfighters are succeeding in reaching the ship. Where is the vessel Supreme Commander Choka dispatched? It has not yet arrived. Another powerful explosion rocked the ship. Hurrying to Kind Kal's side, the subaltern barely managed to keep him from stumbling to the deck. The pilots are targeting our Dovin Basil drivers, Commander. Our drivers? Their intent is to cripple us. Kind Kal swung to Skidder, who was deep in contemplation. 
They've come for you, but how could they know we were here? Unless, of course, they are Jedi. He stared at Skitter, then shook his head. No, not even you have the ability to call across space to your confederates. He glanced at his subaltern. But this sneak attack is no accident. Commander, the junior officer said cautiously, Supreme Commander Choka's Villop communication originated on Nal Hutta. Kainkal took a moment to consider it, then scowled in revelation. The huts divulged our location. He squared his shoulders and adjusted the fall of his cloak. Ready the ship for light speed. We'll rendezvous with the fleet in the target system. The subaltern's hands flew to his shoulders, but he remained where he was. Commander, is it advisable to show ourselves in advance of the fleet? Kind Kyle glowered at him. Would you risk allowing the Yamask to sustain damage here at the hands of a group of would-be rescuers? The subaltern offered a second chastened salute. No, Commander. Then do as I say. And one more thing. See to it that Rhonda and his bodyguards are confined to their chambers. We'll deal with him once we have the protection of the fleet. Close to Hosk, Kip Doran urged his X-Wing on, even though he knew that he would not be able to overtake the accelerating Yuzhan Vong cluster ship. It's going to jump, Ganner told him over the net. My droid's telling me the same thing, Kip responded. He opened the net to the rest of the dozen. Listen up, everyone. Set your Nava computers to record vanishing bearings and calculate possible course projections. Deke, see if you can't tag that ship with a hyperspace beacon before it gets away. I'm on it, Kip. Not a moment later, the enemy vessel vanished. Kip fixed his eyes on the cockpit display screen while the craft's astromech unit went to work on plotting the vessel's possible destinations. Shortly, a list of star systems resolved on screen, the most probable one highlighted in blue and flashing. I've got a high-confidence objective, Ganner reported. Likewise, Deke and a couple of others added. Let's hear it, Kip told them. Fondor, five voices said in unison. In hut space, Nas Choka, Malik Kar, and Gnome Anor stood on the bridge of the Supreme Commander's Helix battleship, watching a villop choir feed of the fleet mobilization. A subaltern interrupted their captivation. Supreme Commander, he began saluting, a message from the commander of the craft sent to collect the captured Jedi. Coral skipper pilots encountered at Kalarba report that the crash fell under attack by a battle group of New Republic starfighters. Endangered, Commander Kainkal's vessel fled the fray. Nas Choka stared at him uncomprehendingly. Fled to where? To the target, Supreme Commander. To Fondor. Nas Choka whirled in alarm to Malik Kar. How soon before our advance elements reach Fondor? Soon, the commander said, letting it go at that. The Yamask won't be adequately protected until we arrive, Nas Choka remarked, mostly to himself. What is the status of the New Republic fleet? Massed at the world's Kaminor, Kuat, and Bathawi. And the hyperspace routes linking Bathawi to Fondor? Sown with obstacles. Nas Choka turned slightly to favor Noam Anor with a faint smile. It appears that you have been successful in persuading them that we plan to attack Corellia. Noam Anor inclined his head in a nod. Then it shouldn't matter if we advance the attack. Nas Choka swung to his subaltern. Apprise all commanders that we launch for Fondor as soon as the final coral skippers are docked. In the passenger of the Trevi, Gaff danced while he sang. Life is a journey without end, for the Wren more than any. From a home unknown we wander, star to star, in a constant quest. We abhor the stars for what they have wrought, instigators of our ill fortune, grave sentinels of our fate. But we load our packs with joy, and song and dance follow at our heels. Now Abregado Re awaits, home for a time, until we are forced to wander anew. Melisma and the other Rin capered with him, or accompanied his improvised song on musical instruments. Some hummed and tooted through their perforated beaks, while the rest played drums, finger cymbals, and flutes, fashioned from scavenged parts of machinery, pilfered gear, or whatever was handy. 
The fact that the festive melody of Gaff's song belied an underlying melancholy was lost on those non-Rin refugees who clapped in time to the music and applauded the dancers' graceful leaps and fleet pirouettes. Gaff was only a stanza into a second verse when the treaty shuddered abruptly. "'We're reverting from hyperspace,' one of the refugees said when the musicians had stopped playing." Melisma, Gaff, and some of the other Rin hurried excitedly to an observation blister, eager for a first glimpse of Abrogado Ri. But in place of the light green sphere they had expected to see was a brownish world, partially eclipsed by clouds sullied with industrial pollutants and surrounded by hundreds of enormous orbital construction platforms. This isn't Abrogado Ri, someone behind Melisma said. Then where are we? she asked. This is Fondor, a human male supplied in understated astonishment. Surprised murmurs began to spread through the crowd. Then all at once hatches throughout the passenger hold hissed open, admitting a score of heavily armed crew members. Agitated by misgiving as well as concern, the refugees backed away from the bulkheads, forming a ragged circle in the center of the hold. Slight change of plans, folks, the crew's obvious spokesperson announced when the murmuring had ceased. The same human melisma and the other wren had come to call Toll. Turns out we're going to have to drop you here. But you promised to deliver us to Abrogado Ri, someone thought to point out. Toll grinned. Let's just say we overshot our stop. Impassioned conversations broke out. In some ways, Fondor was preferable to Abrogado Ri, but the blaster rifles and the tone of Tall's announcement contributed an undercurrent of foreboding to the unforeseen development. Has Fondor agreed to accept us? Someone demanded. That's not our concern. Then where on Fondor will we be offloaded? Tall stared at the Bim who had asked the question. Who said anything about Fondor? He moved to the observation blister and pointed to a crescent-shaped shipbuilding platform. That's where you're getting off. The facility is temporarily unoccupied, but at least you'll have breathable air and artificial gravity. What about provisions? A human asked above the increasing turmoil. Do you plan to inform the authorities? Someone else asked. Toll waved everyone silent. We're not barbarians. We'll provide you with enough flash-dried nutrients to last you a couple of local days. A couple of days? A voice squeaked. It could be months before anyone finds us. Oh, I sincerely doubt that, Tall said. The Tapani sector is about to become very crowded. Someone's bound to notice you. Couldn't you at least bring us to Fondor? A human female pleaded. Tall gave his head a firm shake. We can't afford to be here when the fireworks begin. 25. With the exception of those in the corporate sector, few planetary systems had been exploited to the degree that Fondor had, especially for a system so close to the core. That part of the Tapani sector had originally been designated a manufacturing and shipbuilding center precisely because of the surfeit of resource-rich asteroids and moons, and worlds ripe for abuse. But where the colossal corporations that dominated Bill Bringy, Kuat, Sluis Van, and other shipbuilding centers made a pretense of picking up after themselves, no such efforts had ever been made at Fondor. With the space lanes perilous with free-floating construction debris, Fondor's several small moons looking as if something had taken huge bites out of them, and the planet itself overcrowded, polluted, and corrupted by profiteers providing diversions for the millions of workers who had nowhere else to spend their hard-earned credits, the system was a blight on the Rima trade route. Many were quick to assert that Fondor's nimbus of orbital docking stations and oblate zero-g construction facilities had never operated more smoothly than when the Empire had appropriated them. And, in fact, conditions had clearly deteriorated over the past twenty standard years, more so since the arrival of the Yuzhan Vong. Emerging from the Gandil hyperlane, out past Fondor's outermost moon, the Falcon was immediately detected and scanned by First Fleet Command and Control, 
which had been assigned the task of safeguarding the shipyards after the fall of Abroa Sky. Give them our actual transponder signal, Han instructed Droma, while he threaded the Falcon toward a pack of freighters and warships, awaiting clearance to enter Fondor's space. It's our best chance of getting through. How could the Treaty have entered? Droma asked, while he flicked switches on the console. Han snorted. A ten-year-old slicer piloting a thirty-year-old headhunter could penetrate military security. The Treaty could have legitimate business here or whoever's in charge of the Tholatan operation could have provided the crew with clearance codes. He looked at Droma and grinned. Look who I'm telling. The Ren are probably pros at just this sort of thing. Only by necessity, Droma said ingenuously. A crisp voice crackled from the cockpit annunciators. Millennium Falcon, this is First Fleet Control. Please state your point of origin and the nature of your business. Gandil. Han said into his headset mic, and it's more pleasure than business. We're supposed to rendezvous with friends who may have arrived ahead of us. Their ship is the Trevi, Nar Shada Registry. The communications officer at the other end of the link took a long moment to respond. Pardon me for asking, Millennium Falcon, but am I speaking with General Han Solo? That's former general to you, Control, Han said jocularly. A genuine pleasure to be talking with you, sir. As to your request, the Treaty received clearance a short while ago. Unfortunately, sir, they made their cargo drop in an area off-limits to unregistered ships, especially ships with the Rectenna array and firepower rating yours boasts. Just like I thought, Han muttered to Droma. They scammed their way in. He reopened the comlink. Control! Can you at least tell us where the Treaty made her drop? Negative, sir. I suggest you direct your request to Defense Force Command, Downside. The best I can do from here is turn you over to Fondor Command. Understood, Control, and thanks for the help. Stand by to receive routing and navigational beacon data. Standing by. Han set his elbows on the console and regarded the misshapen moons and hundreds of active construction platforms that crowded local space. The bright sweeping crescent of Fondor dominated the backdrop. Well, this ought to be a snap. Only a couple of billion cubic kilometers to search, not to mention Fondor itself. Droma glanced at him. We could initiate a drive signature scan for the Trevi. Han thought about it. Control said they'd already delivered their cargo. Hyperspace jumps aren't permitted inside the orbit of Fondor's sixth moon. So they'll be running on repulsor power or sublight. But they could be anywhere. He ran his hand down his face, stretching the bags under his eyes. You've just marooned a couple of hundred refugees. What's your next move? Droma sat back, fingering his pale mustache. Perhaps you want to hang around and spend some of the credits you just earned. Or you jump to Abragado Re for the same purpose. Maybe. But remember, you know that Fondor is likely to be attacked sometime soon, which means the Rima is going to get real busy, real fast, from Abragado Re clear to Sullust. Droma frowned. In that case, you'd want to be as far from Fondor as possible. You might even want to lie low for a while before going on a spending spree. Han and Droma looked at each other. Tholatin, they said at the same time. Han straightened in his chair, taking hold of the control yoke while Droma interrogated the Nava computer. The best jump point for Tholatin is just core word of Fondor Aphelion. Han cut his eyes to the star chart Droma put on screen. With Fondor less than two months from Aphelion, the jump point was relatively close to where the Falcon had reverted to real space from the Gandil hyperlane. Engaging the thrusters, he veered the ship through an abrupt climbing bank, away from the line of navigational buoys that would have directed them to Fondor. Instantly, the cockpit annunciator came to life. Millennium Falcon, why are you altering course? A slight drive malfunction, Han said, spicing his voice with false alarm, but we should have things under control momentarily. Maintain your present position, Falcon. You are entering restricted space. I repeat, stay where you are, 
An escort ship will be dispatched to provide assistance. Don't bother sending an escort, Han said, even as the Falcon was accelerating. We'll return to the holding point and make repairs there. Negative, Falcon. You have entered restricted space. Return to original course headings immediately. Han increased the ship's speed while the Nava computer aimed them for the remotest point of Fondor's elliptical orbit. A host of capital ships, barges, tenders, and freighters came into view, all maneuvering toward various jump points. Abruptly, an indicator on the Frender full authenticator flashed. IR emission and ion exhaust recognition, Droma said excitedly. Confirmation of the treaty. He called up a magnified view of the supplied coordinates, then pointed to the run-down pod-shaped ship at the center of the display screen. There. Han smiled in recollection of the opticals Baffle and the other droids had provided. That's her, all right. Millennium Falcon, the voice of fleet command and control barked. This is your final warning. Turn that thing off, Han snapped. Drona lowered the gain, then swiveled back to the console. Deflector shields raised, he reported without being asked. Fire control computer online. Han reached to his left for the servo that controlled the dorsal quad laser. When they could see the Trevi through the viewport, he tugged the throttle lever toward him, streaking the Falcon beneath the freighter, then barrel rolled to port across the Trevi's blunt bow. Now they know we're here, he said, decelerating to hang on the Trevi's twin thrustered tail. They're scanning us, Droma said, weapons powering up. Give me a schematic of the ship. Han glanced at the data Droma retrieved and tapped his forefinger against the display screen. Their hyperdrive is just forward of the aft fin. Take over. Droma tightened his hands around the co-pilot's yoke, gluing the Falcon to the Trevi's stern. Han centered the quad laser's targeting reticle over the freighter's sleek stabilizer. Weapons fire! The words had scarcely left Droma's mouth when blue hyphens of energy raced toward the Falcon, splashing against her forward deflector shield and jarring the ship without doing damage. Ion cannon, Droma said. They're maintaining target lock. Hyperdrive is enabling. Energy streaked from the freighter's aft cannon turret. Droma tipped the Falcon to one side, then the other, then rolled out to starboard and kept the ship inverted while Han lined up his shot. Violent light pulsed from the quad laser's reciprocating barrels, blowing the Trevi's fin away and scoring a ragged line along her aft hull. Gouts of molten alloy streamed from the freighter as she banked in desperation, firing continuously at her pursuer. Droma powered the Falcon through a loop, giving Han a clear shot at the freighter's overheated cannon, which Han quickly put out of its misery. Then, for good measure, Han took out the worthless shield generator. Open a frequency to the ship, he said. No response. Droma glanced at the sensor suite screen. They're heading straight out of the system, all speed. Han compressed his lips. What do they think they're doing? They can't jump and they can't outrun us. He turned to Droma, who was still staring at the scanner display. What? What? Six New Republic fighters, X-Wings, coming up fast on our stern. Han cursed to himself. A chase group from Fleet Command. He slipped into the headset and adjusted the controls. A new voice issued from the speakers. Heave to, Falcon. Don't make us go to guns. Han quirked a grin. Let's see you try, he said, mostly to himself. He opened the comm. This is Captain Han Solo of the Millennium Falcon. We're not looking for a fight squadron leader. Patch me through to the flight ops commander. He covered the mouthpiece with his hand. Time to pull rank. I'm already listening in, Captain Solo, a bass voice said in irritation. You're in violation of security regulations. Any further infractions and you'll be seeing the brig before this day is out, regardless of your history or who you're married to. Are we clear? The remark served only to incite Han further. You've got more important things to do than arrest me, Commander. Don't press your luck, Captain Solo. Follow your escorts to Fleet HQ, and I'll consider entertaining your notion of what my priorities should be. Listen to me, Commander. The Yuzhan Vong have targeted Fondor for attack. I don't know exactly when, but it's going to be soon. I suggest that the fleet be put on full alert. That's absurd, Solo. 
We've received no such information. I don't have time to go into all the details. The chase group is breaking off, Droma interrupted, eyes fixed on the scanner screen. Han glanced at the display and snorted a laugh. I don't often enjoy name-dropping, but... He let his words trail off. Droma's mouth was hanging open, and he had one quivering hand raised to the viewport. Simultaneously, with a chime from the hyperwave warning indicator, Han swung forward to see that they were soaring straight into what anyone else might have believed was an uncharted meteor storm, but what he knew to be enemy vessels decanting to real space by the hundreds. Instinctively, he stood the Falcon on her side, weaving her through a swarm of carrier, destroyer, and cruiser analogs, none of which appeared to take the slightest interest in the Falcon, or even the much larger Treaty. Evasive action, Droma said, finding his voice at last. Countermeasures. Han wrestled with the controls. What do you think I'm doing? Warships continued to materialize to all sides, more than Han would have believed possible, and certainly more than enough to engage and ultimately overwhelm Fondor's defenses. Already the vanguard vessels were firing, launching molten projectiles and blinding streams of plasma at picket craft and warships alike. Han swerved the Falcon away from the main battle group, then accelerated as the treaty had done, still shooting for the Aphelian coordinates, now if only to distance itself from the onslaught. That's why they were running, Han remarked. They knew the Yuzhan Vong were on their way. His face contorted by anger, he triggered a short burst from the quad lasers, though more to terrorize the crew of the Trevi than to further disable the ship. Then, just when it appeared that both ships had made it safely through the throng, a final enemy vessel emerged. Looking more like a wetted cluster of tough-skinned bubbles than a chunk of scabrous coral, the new arrival narrowly missed colliding with the Trevi, but sent it into an out-of-control tumble nevertheless. Intrigued, Han leaned toward the viewport to have a closer look at the ship, then immediately changed course, vectoring directly for the newcomer. One on one, he snarled. We can live with those odds. With the Falcon up on its side once more, Han and Droma assailed the cluster ship with sustained bursts from the dorsal and ventral quad lasers. Most of the bolts were engulfed by gravitic anomalies long before they reached the ship, but a surprising few got through. The reason became clear when Han realized that the vessel was taking rear fire from a motley group of New Republic fighters. Overtaxed and distracted, the Dovin basils that shielded the Yuzhan Vong vessel were obviously failing. Caution forgotten, Han at once sharpened the angle of their attack and shed velocity so that the cluster ship would come across the Falcon's vector, opened up with both guns, hammering the enemy with massive outpourings of energy. Gas and flame belched from the ship, then one of the spherical components imploded, deflating as if pricked by a pin. Slowing, the ship began to list to port, then rolled completely over, like a defeated creature showing its belly to an aggressor. Thanks for the assist, YT-1300, someone said over the hailing channel. The pilot of the lead X-wing, Droma clarified. That's no military squadron, Han said. When did the fighting start, YT? Han opened a channel to the fighters. The enemy checked in just ahead of you. The shipyards are already under bombardment. Who are you guys? Kip's dozen, the pilot said. Kip Doran, what in blazes are you doing out here? Put off his guard, Kip fell silent for a moment. Han, is that you? he asked tentatively. None other. Is that a new paint job, or did you accidentally bring the Falcon too close to a star? Long story. So is ours. We've been chasing that bubble ship since Kalarba. The Yuzhan Vong have captives aboard. Worth skitter among them. What about you? The freighter at your starboard marooned a group of refugees somewhere in this system. I figure we can convince them to show us where they made the drop. If you're headed back into that fray, you could do with some support. I'll assign two of my people to fly with you. I'll take them. But what are you planning to do about the captives? Go aboard and rescue them. Han uttered a laugh. Leave it to a Jedi to take on the impossible. It's our mandate, Kip said. We'll be back to help out as soon as we can, Han promised. May the Force be with you, Han. Yeah, you too. 
At Orbital Shipyard 1321, the Star Destroyer Amers was nearing completion. One of 30 such massive warships being readied at Fondor, in addition to hundreds of smaller vessels. Owing to having had to retrofit a flotilla of ships with hyperwave inertial momentum sustainers, several of the major yards had fallen behind schedule. But confidence was high at 1321 that work on the Immerse would conclude within a local month. The launch would finally mean leave for the tens of thousands of ship fitters who had spent the better part of a standard year working on the great ship, shoulder to shoulder with droids and other machines, frequently for back-to-back -back shifts, and sometimes in Zend. Creed Mitson, human foreman of a mixed-species crew of electricians, was more eager than most for leave. The substantial credits he'd amassed were programming an escape route from his bank account and his companion of the past two years, an exotic dancer who worked in Fondor City, was threatening to return to Sullust if Mitson didn't get himself down the well before too long. Lately not a relative day passed when Mitson didn't wake from dreams that were every bit as fatiguing as work itself without fearing that the immerse would never be completed and leave would never be granted. To make matters worse, space raid drills had become quotidian events, jarring everyone from sleep long before they were required to report to work. Today was no exception. Adding his elaborate groan to a chorus of similar protests issuing from all corners of the bunk room, Mitson buried his head under a pillow and declined to move, despite the unrelenting howling of sirens and the insistent appeals from the Bothan female who had the bunk opposite his. Come on, chief, she pleaded, trying to shake him into motion. You know what happens if we don't report to our stations. I don't care, Mitson said, his voice muffled by the pillow. How do they expect us to finish the immerse if we're asleep on our feet for most of our shifts? Please, chief, if you get suspended, things will be worse for everyone. Mitson started to wave her away, but suddenly found himself rudely tossed from his third-tier bunk to the hard deck. What's the idea? he stammered, hauling himself to his feet, only to see that the Bothan female and almost everyone else in sight had been similarly displaced. Without warning, the facility sustained a follow-up blow, powerful enough to topple several banks of bunks and hurl everyone halfway across the hold. This is no drill, someone yelled. Mitson heard the words, but refused to give them credence. Stepping over sprawled bodies, he hurried to the outer hull bulkhead and slammed the heel of his hand against the release stud that raised the hold's night curtain and blast door. By the time the curtain had pocketed itself, several other workers had joined Mitson at the underlying transparisteel panel, beyond which the immerse lay half in ruins, hold and venting its guts into space. From the direction of Fondor's closest moon came a storm of asteroid-like ships so fixed on demolishing Shipyard 1321 that they weren't even bothering to discharge weapons, but were instead accelerating toward the battleship and the facility. Leave canceled, Mitson said to himself as he caught sight of two coral skippers hurtling directly for the bunk room. Leia followed briskly on the heels of the colonel who had fetched her from her cabin aboard the Yald, saying only that it was urgent that she join Commodore Brand and the Tactical Information Center quickest. She and Brand's adjutant were stepping from the turbo lift on the secure deck that housed the TIC when she nearly collided with his soldier, who had obviously just arrived from the Song of War. Do you have any idea what this is about? he asked her. The question was pointed, though without his being aware of it. What had begun at Gindine as vague misgiving and had swelled to apprehension as a result of the vision on Hapes had now become unmitigated dread, as tangible as any fear or phobia she had ever experienced, even while its source and substance remained veiled. Hours of meditation had allowed Leia to determine that part of her apprehension was centered on Anakin and Jason and the forecasted attack on Corellia. But just how her concerns for them were connected to the foreboding that swirled like excited electrons around a soldier, and more specifically around Commander Brand's battle plans, she could not say or even guess at. She knew only that her composure was unraveling, and that forces were converging in a way that no one had anticipated. 
Leia, Isolder said. The Jedi's weapon is her mind. When a Jedi is distracted, when she loses her focus, she becomes vulnerable. I'm sorry, Isolder, she said at last, but I don't know what this is about. He studied her in silence while they hastened for the war room and entered side by side. Brand, looking stricken, gazed up at them from his tall stool alongside a sprawling horizontal plotting panel. In fact, beneath all the frantic activity, everyone in the enormous room seemed to be moving in a daze. On screen, Brand ordered one of the technicians as Leia and a soldier approached. Leia glanced at a nearby array of holographic displays, instantly aware that she was seeing her vision realized, or at least some part of it. Whether the real-time images were being transmitted from satellites or an orbital facility was impossible to discern, and unimportant in any event. One hollow showed dozens of Yuzhan Vong and New Republic warships firing mercilessly at each other, while wings of snub fighters and coral skippers slalomed through the wreckage of orbital docks. Another hollow revealed ships close to completion, blackened, ruptured, and keeled over in their berthing places. Command towers and gun turrets in ruins, clouds of debris making it impossible to get a clear fix on anything. Elsewhere, Yuzhan Vong carrier analogs were hurling tempests of coral skippers toward weapons platforms and the surface of a world already afflicted by industrial devastation. That's the Immerse, Brand said grimly, indicating one of the destroyed ships. He pointed to another hollow display. That's the Onlaga. Leia looked at him in confusion. Those aren't Corellian vessels. Brand showed her one of the saddest looks she had ever seen. The Yuzhan Vong have struck at Fondor. They deceived us into believing they were going to attack Corellia, and they hit Fondor. The words tumbled from his mouth without emotion. Our greatest hopes go with those ships. The First Fleet is doing all it can, but the enemy is literally flinging their coral skippers at any target that presents itself. The Haven Fleet is prepared to launch, Isolder said. No, Leia found herself saying. Brand and Isolder stared at her. No, she repeated quietly. Brand looked at Isolder. Thank you, Prince Isolder, but I've already ordered elements of the Fifth Fleet to launch from Bathawi. We're waiting to hear from them. Leia swung to the communication console, her heart racing. Commodore Command, this is Task Force Aleph, a distressed voice said. The enemy has ceded all routes linking Bathawi and Fondor with Dovin Basil remotes. Half the task force has been yanked from hyperspace, and six ships have been diverted into collisions with mass shadows. We're in harm's way, sir. We have no choice but to retreat to the outer rim and jump to Fondor from Ariadu or Sullust. They'll arrive too late, Brand muttered, then turned to a soldier. You say your forces are prepared? A soldier straightened to his full and considerable height. Eager Commodore. Leia's breath caught in her throat, and the TIC began to spin before her eyes. She had to hook her arm through Brand's to keep from falling. 26. As near as anyone had been able to determine, coral skippers didn't dock inside their carriers. Instead, they were launched from and recovered by the carrier's elongated and branch-like projections. These facts passed briefly through Kip Duran's mind as his X-Wing loosed two proton torpedoes straight at the sphere the Millennium Falcon's quad lasers had perforated and collapsed. The torpedoes did little more than blow a hole in what remained of the deflated globe, but one large and gaping enough to accommodate any of the disparate fighters that made up the dozen. Eleven and twelve, you have rear guard, Kip said over the tactical net. The rest of you form up on me. We're going inside. Kip urged his craft on, ignoring the strident protests of its astromech droid, which was clearly baffled by whatever readings the enemy ship was giving off. The Yuzhan Vong were oxygen breathers, he reminded himself, which meant that their ships somehow manufactured atmosphere. He was less certain about gravity, though he surmised that the same Dovin Basils responsible for propulsion and protection provided gravity. As for places to land, he was willing to make do with any parcel of level deck, even if he had to pilot the X-Wing to the heart of the ship to find that. 
Ganner's modified Y-Wing and seven other star fighters followed him through the breach opened by the torpedoes. The pair left behind would have to deal with anything that flew to the cluster ship's aid, at least until the Falcon and the remaining two fighters returned. Kip's determination took a quantum leap as soon as the X-Wing entered the ruined sphere. Vacuum had bled the module of atmosphere, but gravity was close to human standard, and there was ample room for all nine fighters to settle down on a deck that wasn't much different from the pitted hulls of the enemy warships. The Falcon's powerful guns had made a mess of things, but even without the damage, it would have been difficult to discern just what they were looking at. Kip suspected that the hive-like structure at the rear of the space was a neuro-engine of some sort, and that if he popped it open, he might find a couple of stunned Dovin basils curled up inside. Breathers and blasters, he said over the net, as the X-Wing's canopy was opening. Recalling his first contact with the Yuzhan Vong in the outer rim, and the grotesque creature whose secretions had burned through the transparisteel of his XJ, Kip had expected to find similar monstrosities waiting, but in fact, the hold was deserted. Ganner had obviously been thinking the same thing. Jumping agilely from the cockpit of the Y-Wing, he said over the rebreather com, They've probably withdrawn to protect the Yamask. Then they've already simplified our mission, Kip told him. They unhooked their lightsabers from the belts of their flight suits and thumbed them on, the sibilant hiss of the energy blades loud in the deserted chamber. Everyone else carried either a sidearm or a blaster rifle. Watch your step, Kip advised. The Yuzhan Vong have been known to make use of an immobilizing living jelly. Warily they advanced on the wall of the adjacent sphere, ignorant as to whether they were moving forward or aft. Like the walls of the collapsed module, the curving bulkhead had an organic, membranous appearance. They searched futilely for anything analogous to a hatch release. There has to be a way of opening a portal from one sphere to the next, Deke said. Maybe they're separated by hydrostatic fields. But while resilient, the bulkhead did not admit him when he pressed himself to it. Maybe it recognizes only Yuzhan Vong, Ganner suggested. There isn't the time to debate it, Kip said. We're not on a scientific survey. He thrust his lightsaber straight into the curve. When the tip had sizzled through, Kip rolled his wrists, gradually opening a circular hole large enough for them to step through. The hold on the far side of the bulkhead was no different from the one they had left. No oxygen, Ganner reported after glancing at an indicator strapped to his wrist. They moved in single file into a passageway that might have been the gullet of an outsized creature. Colonies of microorganisms attached to the walls and ceiling provided a faint green bioluminescence. Eventually they came to another curving bulkhead, but this was equipped with an iris portal that admitted them into a sealed antechamber. The fact that the chamber served as an airlock didn't become evident until they stepped from it into a spacious hold that held breathable air. There also were the Yuzhan Vong warriors Kip and Ganner had expected to encounter earlier on. They were thirty strong, some sporting chitinous armor, some without, but all of them armed with double-edged blades or the living staffs Kip knew were capable of being employed as whips, clubs, swords, or spears. For a moment the two groups stood still, studying each other. Then one warrior stepped forward and bellowed a phrase in his own language. He made it sound like a statement, but the charge that immediately followed confirmed it as a war cry. Deke and the other non-Jedi opened fire with their blasters, dropping ten or more of the unarmored warriors before they had made it halfway across the hold. Kip and Ganner glided into the press of survivors, their feet barely leaving the deck, telekinetically disarming some of their opponents, even in the midst of parrying blows from stiffened amphistaffs or cross-cuts by kufi blades and deflecting spears. One by one, the Yuzhan Vong succumbed to vertical slashes to the head or horizontal thrusts that found the only vulnerable places in the living armor, just below the armpits. The two Jedi worked as a team whenever possible, back to back, or alongside each other, refusing to surrender any gained ground and minimizing the movements of their blades. Their relatively easy victories told them that the warriors were a different breed than the seasoned fighters they had battled on the Ithorian herd ship Tafanda Bay. Even so, 
Some of the non-Jedi weren't faring as well. Two of Kip's dozen died, one beheaded by a Kufi, the other pierced by a thrown amphistaff. When Kip and Ganner had thinned the throng, they separated to engage the last of the warriors one-on-one. -on -one. Kip entering into a savage battle with an opponent a head taller than him and as deft with his staff as Kip was with his lightsaber. Ganner, using a force-summoned telekinetic burst to hurl his adversary into a trio of Yuzhan Vong who had ganged up on Deke. Two of the three dropped to the deck, giving Deke the time he needed to raise his blaster rifle and kill the third, along with the one Ganner had thrown. Kip perceived the events peripherally. With his feet planted right foot forward, he held the lightsaber at waist level, its blade elevated acutely, gyrating his wrists to answer and divert the sweeping slashes and overhead blows of the Yuzhan Vong's stiffened amphistaff. That Kip remained rooted in place provoked the warrior to greater ferocity. Lunging, he thrust the vital weapon at Kip's midsection, at once ordering it to lengthen and strike with its fangs. The amphistaff's abrupt transformation from sword to serpent caught Kip by surprise, but only for a moment. Twisting the lightsaber around the pliable staff, he suddenly snapped the energy blade upward, flinging the staff from the warrior's grip and severing the Yuzhan Vong's hand just at the gap where his forearm guards met his gauntlets. The dismembered fist fell to the deck, dark blood oozing from the warrior's truncated limb. The Yuzhan Vong looked at Kip in startled disbelief, then lowered his head and rushed forward, intent on ramming Kip off his feet. A sidestep sabotaged the effort. As the weakened warrior stumbled past him, Kip brought the lightsaber to shoulder height, then drove it into his foe's armpit, killing him instantly. He stood over the fallen Yuzhan Vong for a moment, then glanced around the hold at the carnage he and the others had wrought. Ganner and Deke were kneeling by their dead comrades. We'll remember them later, Kip said, motioning everyone onward with the ignited lightsaber. They moved deeper into the ship, crossing the threshold into yet another sphere without encountering any opposition. Since entering the vessel, Kip had been struck by the fact that the Force was mute. Not stifled, but silent. His Jedi skills hadn't been affected or compromised in any way, but it was as if he had entered a blank space on a map. All at once, though, he felt something through the Force, and a bit farther along they came to a sealed portal, similar to many they had passed, save for the feelings it roused. Kip turned to Ganner, who nodded in affirmation. Then he thrust the blade of his lightsaber into the center of the portal. When he retracted the blade, air rushed noisily through the hole into the space beyond, and the portal irised open. Inside, scattered across a pliant floor, fouled by sweat and more, sprawled a mixed-species mob of captives. Dressed in ragged robes and tunics, they were a gaunt lot, but alive. Gradually, they began to stir as the hold filled with oxygen. Kip approached one of them, a gray-haired human, who had probably started with a good deal more weight than some of the others. Near him lay two Rin males and a female. The man's roomy eyes blinked open and played across Kip's face, focusing finally on the deactivated lightsaber in his right hand. They're holding him on the deck below this one, the human said weakly. Next module aft. But be careful, Jedi. He may not be the worth skitter you remember. Several of the more technically minded of the hoodwinked and now marooned Ruin refugees had succeeded in getting some of the orbital facilities' systems online, so anyone who wished was able to watch the fall of Fondor in full color. Most of the Yuzhan Vong fleet was still dispersed in a broad arc out past Fondor's outermost moons, but a dozen or so carriers, heavily reinforced by escort craft, had moved coreward. Like siege weapons of old, the carriers had flung their coral skippers against any targets that presented themselves, destroying New Republic warships and construction barges alike. But having thrown the first fleet into disarray, they were now being more systematic about attacking the shipyards and pounding distant Fondor with flaming projectiles and streams of plasma. Gazing at the chaos through an observation blister, Melisma decided that the Yuzhan Vong weren't likely to spare even an empty shipyard, which, at the present rate of destruction, meant that the ruined group had less than an hour to get their affairs in order. 
Most of the refugees had already come to grips with this and were off by themselves, crying quietly or praying to whatever gods they worshipped. But others were shrieking in fear and anger, insisting that efforts be made to alert Fondor Command to their plight, or failing that, surrendering to the Yuzhan Vong, even though that would mean sacrifice or captivity. True to the fatalism they embraced as a creed, the Rin were singing. The fact that they were capable of going to their deaths with grace and dignity had actually managed to impart a sense of calm to some of the distraught. Melisma turned from the viewport to listen to the melodious lament Ravana was leading. If these folks realized that our forgeries are what got them into this situation, we'd be dead already, she told Gaff. Her uncle only shrugged. Even without the documents we provided, the pirates would have found some way. Remember, child, these people paid to leave ruin. Is that your way of absolving us of guilt? We're guilty of getting ourselves into this mess, but that, too, is the Rin way. If it's not others abusing us, we're abusing ourselves. Melisma sighed. Do we deserve this, then, for not accepting Ruin's offer to work in the fields? No one deserves to die this way, no matter what they have done. But listen, child, we're not dead yet, and until we are, we should enjoy the moment. Melisma glanced out the viewport. I don't know that I have any song left in me, uncle. He laughed. Of course you do. There's song even in a final breath. She forced a smile. You begin. Gaff smoothed his mustachios in thought. His right foot began to tap and he had his mouth open to sing when a Sullustan stationed at one of the data consoles shouted for everyone's attention. The Trevi is returning! The singing and crying ceased, and groups of folks began to crowd around the console and into the observation blister. Someone off to Melisma's left pointed to a sleek shape weaving its way toward the abandoned facility between missiles and plasma discharges. It's definitely the Trevi, the Sullustan confirmed. Hopeful exclamations gushed from all sides. Maybe they had a change of heart. Impossible. They got caught up in the battle and are looking for a place to hide. Someone learned what they did to us. That is the probable explanation, Gaff said in an authoritative voice. He gestured in the direction of the approaching transport. I can't imagine where that YT-1300 freighter joined the treaty, but I'm certain that the other two ships are New Republic starfighters. Anakin's enabling the Centerpoint Station's interdiction field and Starbuster capabilities was momentarily forgotten in the wake of the devastating news the New Republic colonel brought to the control room. The Yuzhan Vong had launched a sneak attack on Fondor. Real-time images of the battle received over military channels and holonet feeds had fomented panic among the Marilsi, whose home system bordered Fondor and the Tapani sector. For everyone else in the control room, the images prompted a curious mix of relief and desperation. Here was Centerpoint, all dressed up and nowhere to go. Thraken Sol Solo broke the mood. There is something we can do. He whirled on Anakin, a wild look in his eye. We have the time-space coordinates of the Yuzhan Vong fleet. He hurried to a console and called up a star chart. Their warships are clustered rimward of Fondor's fifth and sixth moons. We can target them by focusing center point's repulsor beam. We have no authority to take such actions, a technician said, loud enough to be heard over a dozen separate conversations that broke out. We could miss and hit Fondor or even its primary. We can't assume the risk. We must assume the risk, a Marilsi argued. Fondor is lost if we do nothing. The New Republic colonel glanced at Sol Solo, who shook his head. I can't promise that we'll hit our target. Everyone turned to Anakin, and Anakin looked at Jason and Ebrahim, who had his hand clamped over Q9's vocoder grill. Jason wanted to say something, but all words fled him. He had a sudden memory of Anakin from months earlier, practicing lightsaber technique in the hold of the Falcon. You keep thinking of it as a tool, a weapon in your war against everything you see as bad, Jason had told him at the time. It's an instrument of law, Anakin had maintained. 
The force isn't about waging war, Jason had said. It's about finding peace and your place in the galaxy. He set himself boldly between Sal Solo and the console at which Anakin sat. We can't be a part of this, he announced. Thraken peered around him at Anakin. The first fleet is being decimated, Anakin. The task force launched from Bathawi can't possibly arrive in time to help. The Tapani is our home sector, Amarilsi said. You must take the risk for our sake, as a Jedi must. It's our only chance to score a decisive victory, the colonel urged. He cut his eyes to the joystick Anakin had conjured. It bears your imprint, Anakin. It answers to you and no one else. Anakin, you can't, Jason said, wide-eyed. Step away from it. Step away from it now. Anakin glanced from his brother to the controls before him. Not through the Force, but through center point itself, he could sense his distant targets. He felt as wedded to the repulsor as he often felt to his lightsaber, and he knew with the same conviction precisely when and how to strike. 27. Lightsabers clenched in two-handed grips, Kip and Ganner approached the chamber in which Worth Skidder was apparently being held. The absence of guards in the dark and humid corridor had Kip thinking otherwise, but no sooner had his lightsaber coaxed the chamber's portal to open than he caught sight of Skidder. And immediately he grasped what the captive, Roa, had meant by saying that Skidder wasn't likely to be his old self. Stripped naked, he was lying face up on the floor with his legs bent backward at the knees and his arms extended beyond his head. Surrounding him, and plainly responsible for the cartilaginous growths that wetted him to the deck at knees, in steps, shoulders, elbows, and wrists, were a dozen or so crab-like creatures, a few of whom managed to skitter to safety before Kipps and Ganner's lightsabers could be brought to bear on them. The screeching others were cleaved and dismembered, their legs and pincers flung to all quarters of the hold. Kneeling, Kip wedged his hand under Worth's neck and gently lifted his head. Skidder groaned in agony, but his eyes fluttered open. "'You're the last person I expected to see here,' he rasped. Kip made himself smile. "'You think we'd let you execute this mission on your own?' Skidder licked his lips to wet them. "'How did you find me?' "'The Hutts got a message to us through one of their smugglers.' Skidder's eyebrows beetled in puzzlement. I thought they'd join the opposition. I guess they've seen the light. That's good to hear, Skidder said in genuine relief. He glanced at Ganner, then added, I sensed you when you attacked the ship before it jumped. That was at Calarba, Ganner said. Where are we now? Fondor. Skidder showed them a startled look. Why, Fondor was always the target, Kip said. The fleet has been caught by surprise. Skidder shut his eyes and nodded. I tried to learn our destination, the Yamisk's destination. Kip compressed his lips before replying. We managed to cripple the ship before it made planetfall, but the Yuzhan Vong are prevailing even without the war coordinator. There are captives aboard, Skidder said, as if suddenly remembering. The plan was to familiarize the Yamisk with our thought patterns. We've got them, Ganner cut him off. Deke and some of the others are with them. Now we just have to see about freeing you. Worth laughed shortly and bitterly. Kind Kal promised to break me, and he has. Kind Kal, the ship's commander. Skidder's face contorted, and he moaned in pain. Concealing his hopelessness, Kip took a closer look at the surge coral protrusions that anchored Worth to the pliant deck. Our lightsabers should make short work of these, he started to say, when Worth shook his head violently. There isn't time. You have to leave. Kip looked hard into his comrade's eyes. I won't leave you, Worth. We'll find a way to help you. The Force... Look at me, Skidder interrupted firmly. Look at me through the Force. I'm dying, Kip. You can't help me. Kip opened his mouth to reply, but instead loosed a resigned sigh. Skidder smiled with his eyes. I'm prepared, Kip. I'm ready to die. 
but there are two things I need you to do before you leave the ship. Kip nodded grimly and leaned his ear closer to his friend's mouth. Rhonda and kind Carl, Worth managed to say, find them. Alone in the Falcon's cockpit, Han had one hand gripped on the yoke and the other on the servo that operated the dorsal quad laser. Triggering staccato bursts from the weapon, he blew away two approaching coral skippers. From somewhere behind the Falcon, a third skip vectored in on a strafing run against the shipyard. But before Han could even swivel the gun turret, the enemy craft was pulverized by fire from one of the battered X-wings that flew with Kip's dozen. Good shooting, Han said into the mouthpiece of his headset. Thanks, Falcon, the voice of the ship's female pilot came back. You soften them up. I'll put them away. Will do, Han told her. He brought the Falcon about to recon the rimward side of the empty yard in which the ruined refugees had been marooned. Below, Droma, the second fighter pilot, and some of the pirates were organizing the recovery, with the treaty berthed where a construction barge or tender might have anchored if the facility had been operational. With the Yuzhan Vong fleet continuing to encroach on Fondor, the Tholatan crew, reluctant rescuers early on, were suddenly desperate to wrap the mission and launch for clear space. Noise crackled from the cockpit annunciators, and a grainy video image of Droma appeared on the comm display screen. Han, the treaty is loading, but fifty or so folks are still unaccounted for. Apparently they figured they could escape detection by hiding out. Behind Droma, grinning broadly, were clustered some ten or other Rin, including the two he had introduced earlier as Gaff and Melisma. Melisma was now cradling a Rin infant in her arms. You can't hide from plasma, Han barked toward the audio pickup. Droma nodded. We'll search them out. Yeah, well, don't waste any time. Looks like a Yuzhan Vong carrier escort has taken a sudden interest in the place. Droma nodded and signed off. As the Falcon came full circle around the shipyard, the Treaty once more loomed large in the forward viewport. The transport's hyperdrive was ruined, but the sublight drives were more than capable of moving the ship out past the enemy fleet, providing it got away in time. Even as Han was thinking it, the Yuzhan Vong carrier escort hove into view off to port, keen on targeting the shipyard with the projectile launchers concealed in its pitted starboard bow. Han throttled the Falcon toward the intruder, firing steadily, but the escort was too resolved on destroying the shipyard to be bothered by a lone assailant. Just then, though, the X-Wing appeared on the scene, succeeding in getting the escort's attention with two well-placed proton torpedoes that impacted against its blunt nose. Han banked harder to port, racing the Falcon through a storm of flaming projectiles to come to the fighter's support, but he failed to arrive in time. Plasma gushed from the escort and caught the X-Wing just as it was breaking off from its reckless run. Wingtip lasers and stabilizers melted like candle wax, and the pilot lost control. Trailing gobs of solidifying alloy, the fighter went into a crazed roll, splitting apart before perishing in a fiery explosion. Han's eyes narrowed in hatred. Nobody takes out my wingmate. Whipping the Falcon around, he went for the escort with the quad lasers blazing. Chunks of Yorick coral exploded outward from the ship, and a thick blade of flame streaked into space. The ship rolled to one side like a wounded beast. At the same time, the comm screen came to life. We're away, Droma said, aiming for clear skies. Han powered the Falcon through an ascending loop, then veered off to starboard, glimpsing the Treaty and its fighter companion, just as they were accelerating from the threatened facility. The dying escort spotted them as well. Missiles sought the fleeing vessels, but the escort reserved the bulk of its barrage for the shipyard itself. Punctured throughout by projectiles, the facility began to disintegrate. Then it blew apart, unfurling flames that scorched the tail of the accelerating transport. Then the escort, too, disappeared in a flash of blinding light. You have my word that I will devote the remainder of my days to repaying the debt I have this day incurred. Rhonda bellowed in basic as he trailed Kip and Ganner through the cluster ship, the slapping sounds of his muscular tail loud in the passageway. Thanks, Skitter, Rhonda, Kip said over his shoulder. If it had been up to me, 
I would have left you with your dead toadies. Then I will repay the debt in honor of Skitter, Rhonda said unfazed. You will see. As it happened, the two Jedi didn't have long to wait. Rounding a corner in the passageway, they found themselves faced with the phalanx of Yuzhan Vong warriors, into whose midst Rhonda charged, knocking half a dozen aside before any of those left standing could land blows against the hut's mostly impervious hide. Kip and Ganner followed up the brash offensive, felling their opponents with precise strikes to susceptible spots in the warrior's armor. The three of them fought their way toward an enormous maw in the bulkhead, from beyond which emanated a stench even more pungent than that given off by Rhonda. Inside the vast chamber, encircled by attendants who clearly had meager familiarity with the kufis they brandished, stood a Yuzhan Vong commander, a long cloak hanging from his transmogrified shoulders and a villop communicator in his hands. Behind them, raised up on tensed tentacles in a circular tank of foul-smelling liquid, was a maturing yamask, a large tooth glistening in its rictus of a mouth, and its massive black eyes riveted on the intruders. Again Rhonda rushed forward, flattening several of the attendants and whipping his tail around to whack the villop out of the commander's hands. The attendants began what would have been a fruitless defense, but the commander ordered them to lower their weapons. I congratulate you on getting this far, he said, after two of the attendants had helped him back to his feet. Kip angled his lightsaber to one side, the blade extended in front of him. Move out of the way, and we'll go the rest of the distance. Kind Kyle turned slightly to glance at the Yamisk. Of course, the life of a Yamisk for that of a Jedi. It strikes me as equitable. From off to Kip's left, Ganner hurled his ignited lightsaber square into the creature's left eye. As the sulfurous yellow energy blade struck, the Yamask shrieked and its tentacles flailed, generating waves that cascaded down over the Yorick coral retaining wall of the pool and washed across the deck. The Yamask reared up and began to sway from side to side. Gradually the tentacles stopped moving, and the creature sank down into the tank, dead by the time Ganner called the lightsaber back to him. Kind Kal's sadness endured for only a moment. Well executed, Jedi, but you have doomed us all. A shudder passed through the ship even as the words were leaving his mouth. The Yamask controls the ship, Rhonda explained. The pilot Dovin Basils are now in the throes of death. Kind Kal grinned faintly. No one gets out of here alive. Kip returned the grin. This won't be the first time you've misjudged a situation, Commander. He scanned the attendants, then set his gaze on Kind Kal. Any or all of you are free to come with us. When it was obvious that none of them were going to budge, Kip shrugged. Suit yourselves. He backed into the passageway, Ganner to one side, Rhonda to the other. Another death row spasm sent the three of them pitching against the bulkheads. Regaining his balance, Kip started off the way they had come, but Rhonda stopped him. I know a more direct route. They had just entered an adjacent module when Kip's comlink toned. What's your situation, Kip? Kip recognized Han Solo's voice. We're outward bound. The ship's destroying itself. A splinter group of Yuzhan Vong warships are on their way. Not much chance of our holding them off. Then don't risk it. Somehow I knew you'd say that. Where are the captives? They're being moved to the module we punched through. How many? One hundred, give or take a few. Solo muttered something. The Trevi is defenseless. We'll have to cram everyone aboard the Falcon. Can you bring the Falcon close enough to extend a coffer dam? Han snorted. That's the least of our problems. There's an airlock in the central module, but from the outside you probably won't be able to identify it. Look for our signal flare. Otherwise, I'll have Deke or someone lead you to it. Don't worry, I'll find it. Somehow I knew you'd say that, Kip said. By the way, can you accommodate a hut? Solo launched a surprised laugh. A hut? Sure, the more the merrier. Then you'd be glad to hear that one of the captives asked me to send his regards. Who? Roa. Take the shot, Sal Solo hissed through his clenched teeth. Take it. For the Marilsi, a more plaintive voice added. For the sake of the New Republic, the captain said. 
No, my boy, no, Ebrahim and Q9 said. As many voices vied for prominence in Anakin's mind as in the control room. He heard the heartfelt words of his mother and father, the harsh voice of Jason, and the understanding voice of Jaina, the counsel of Uncle Luke. Anakin ignored all of them and looked at Jason. Tell me, he said. Jason responded quietly and calmly, almost as if he had sub-vocalized the response. You are my brother, and you are a Jedi, Anakin. You can't do this. Anakin took a deep breath and moved his hand away from the hand grip trigger. The tension in the room broke with a collective exhalation of disappointment. The technicians grumbled, and the Marilsi hung their heads in defeat. The next thing Anakin knew, someone had shoved him forcibly from the control seat. I'll take the shot, Thracken Sal Solo shouted angrily as his hand closed on the trigger. Led by the Yald, the task force from Kaminor decanted outside the orbit of Fondor's outermost moon. Following them into real space came the battle dragons and battle cruisers that made up the Hapen fleet, positioned to engage the Yuzhan Vong armada at close range. Commodore Brand had allowed Leia to join him on the bridge, where she stood just behind his command chair, gazing through the wraparound viewport at the reverting Hapen warships. Closer to Fondor, explosions flared in the night as vessels and shipyards succumbed to the enemy onslaught. Fleet command and control reports casualties in excess of 50 percent, an enlisted rating updated from his duty station. Some of the shipyards are managing to defend against coral skipper suicide strikes, but the fleet has been unable to attenuate bombardment from the enemy warships. Brand swiveled his chair to study various threat assessor displays and vertical plotting panels. The Hapens will put the fear into those warships, he assured in a voice loud enough to be heard throughout the bridge. Leia hid her trembling right hand beneath her cloak and cut her eyes from the viewport to the plotting panels. She reached out with the force for Anakin and Jason. Where earlier the effort had only increased the gravity of her distress, she now experienced relief. A transcendent calm enveloped her, and the apprehension she had known since Hapes was suddenly gone. But the serenity was fleeting. Almost instantly something raw and uncontrollable flooded into her awareness. Again she reached for Anakin and Jason, and at once realized that her concerns for them had damned a deeper though less personalized fear which suddenly rushed in. She swung to the viewport to see the Hapen fleet forming up into battle groups and already beginning to close with individual enemy warships. You may fire when ready, she heard Brand telling Princess Solder, but as if at some great distance. All at once, a flash of radiant energy illuminated local space. From rimward of Fondor's outermost moon, or perhaps gushed from hyperspace itself, came a torrent of starfire a thousand kilometers wide. Coalescing into a savage beam of focused annihilation, it tore into the midst of the dispersing Hapen fleet, consuming every ship in its path, atomizing some in the blink of an eye and holding others with spears of seething light. Weapons, superstructure, and antennae vaporized by the skewering beam. The ships exploded outward, vanishing in globes of brilliant mass-energy conversions. Even those ships outside the limits of the beam were hurled violently off course, slagged along their inward-facing sides, or thrown into collisions with one another. The mated saucers of the battle dragons broke apart and disintegrated, and the battle cruisers were snapped like twigs. Fighter groups vanished without a trace. Leia was dumbfounded. Nothing in the Yuzhan Vong arsenal had prepared her for devastation on so immense a scale. For a moment she was certain she was in the grips of another terrible vision, but it quickly became clear that the violence was real. Her stupefaction deepened when the beam didn't diminish as it punched through the Hapen fleet. Lancing deeper into Fondor's space, the shaft of raging power went on to graze Fondor's penultimate moon, effacing a portion of the cratered planetoid as a surgical laser might a tumor. Then it ripped unabated into the heart of the enemy armada, obliterating masses of coral skippers and pulverizing several of the largest warships. Finished with its work or not, the beam then shot past Fondor, singeing the northern hemisphere in its passing, perhaps to destroy some even more distant target. 
All systems had failed on the bridge, and for a long moment, even as consoles and display screens flickered back to life under emergency power, everyone was simply too stunned to speak or cry out, much less make sense of what they had just witnessed. Some sort of repulsor beam, a tech finally said in a stark disbelief. Delivered through hyperspace. Centerpoint, Leia said, as if in shock. Brand and several others turned to her. She looked at the Commodore. Someone fired Centerpoint Station. Han embraced Roa as he came through the airlock in the Falcon's port side docking arm. Fosco's dead, Roa said when Han let him go. Han shook his head in dismay. He could have been a friend. As I was saying on the Jubilee Wheel, fortune smiles, then betrays, then smiles once more. Han ran his eyes over his friend and managed a grin. You know, you don't look half bad. The half that does I'll have repaired. Did my ship survive? Waiting for you at Bill Bringy. Roa loosed a sigh and turned to help a Rin female out of the airlock. Han, I'd like you to meet... Any chance you have a clanmate named Droma? Han interrupted. The female looked surprised. I have a brother named Droma. Han's grin broadened. You'll be seeing him soon enough. Roa scratched his head. Seems I've a lot to catch up on. That doesn't begin to say it. The cluster ship was already beginning to come apart. Han's fear that he might have to separate prematurely from the trembling ship only made him work harder at getting all the rescued captives aboard. By the time the last of them boarded, the forward hold, bunk rooms, galley, and utility spaces were packed. Han could only hope that the Falcon's air scrubbers would hold out long enough to sustain everyone through a jump to Marilst or elsewhere in the Tapani sector. Even assuming that life support continued to function, they were going to be a hungry, dehydrated lot when and wherever they ultimately touched down. With the airlock resealed, Han, Roa, and two of the Rin threaded their way to the cockpit. Han squeezed into the pilot's seat and began to maneuver the Falcon away from the Yuzhan Vong vessel. Through the forward viewport, he could see what remained of Kip's dozen launching through the hole they had blown in the ruined module. Roa helped bring the quad lasers online as Han nosed the Falcon over the top of the spherical module, expecting to have to engage the enemy warships that had broken from the Armada to render aid to the crippled Yamask vessel. Instead, he was greeted by a sight that tugged a gleeful cry from him. Hapen battle dragons, he said, glancing at Roa. Now we're getting somewhere. He was about to add that Leia had more than likely been responsible for enlisting the Hapen's support when an intense white radiance blinded him. The Falcon died, then was tossed through an end-over-end -end ride that deposited her 2,000 kilometers from where she had been. The Yuzhan Vong had coaxed Fondor's son to go Nova, Han told himself. They had wiped out the entire system. When his vision returned and the moans and groans of his tumbled cargo had died down, Han saw that three-fourths of the Hapen fleet and half the Yuzhan Vong armada were gone. On his Helix flagship, Nas Choka recaptured enough of his self-control to keep some of the dismay out of the incredulous look he showed Malik Kar and Nome Anor. Against the backdrop of a raised moon, the Villip Choir field showed the blackened skeletons and husks of untold numbers of Yuzhan Vong and enemy ships. They killed most of their reinforcements to eliminate half of our force, the Supreme Commander said. Is such savagery commonplace? Noam Anor shook his head as much in response as to clear it. A mistake. It has to be a mistake. Their reverence for life has always been their weakness. Then perhaps we've managed to bring out the primitive in them, Malik Kar said in a stunned voice. A herald appeared. The villop in his trembling hands bore the strained features of Kain Kal. The Yamisk has been killed, Kain Kal gasped through his communicator, and the ship is dying. The huts betrayed our location to the Jedi. The Jedi captured on Gindine will die with us but two of his confederates and Rhonda Basadi Diori, the murderers of the Yamask, escaped. We... 
The villip fell silent suddenly, then averted to its featureless form. Kind Cow was dead. Nas Choka turned away in disgust. Recall all operational coral skippers, he instructed his subaltern. Order the rest to commit what destruction they can. All warship commanders will prepare their ships for departure. We have accomplished what we set out to do. Now we have a score to settle with the huts. 28. Viki Shesh sat regally in the straight-backed chair at the center of the deposition balcony, adjusting the fall of her long skirt, while Gotal Senator Talam Ranth, head of the Senate Justice Council, studied the display of the personal data device he wore on his left wrist. Shesh's trio of lawyers occupied the table behind her, but they weren't included in the twice-normal-size hologram of Shesh that commanded the attention of the amphitheater's capacity crowd. As a consideration to Ranth, the recording droids normally present at closed-session senatorial inquests had been sequestered in a separate room to assure that their energy output didn't overwhelm the Gotal's acute senses. Senator Shesh, the furred and flat-nosed Ranth, resumed at last. It has already been established that the advisory council was briefed by Commodore Brand regarding the eventual deployment of the Yald flotilla, and that Commodore Brand, speaking for the Defense Force command staff, stated at the time that Karelia was assumed to have been targeted for attack. That's true, Shesh said in a composed voice. Then how is it, Senator, that the flotilla wound up being deployed at Bathawi? Shesh set her interlocked hands in her lap and lifted her chin slightly. Commodore Brand failed to make a convincing case for deploying the flotilla at Corellia, so the matter was put to a vote. In his written statement, Chief of State Failure asserts as much, Ranth said in the monotone that was characteristic of his species. But we now know that it was never the intention of the command staff to argue too strongly in favor of Corellia. Shesh nodded. As I understand it, Admiral Sav's plan called for the enemy to be lured into the Corellian sector by leaving Corellia undefended. Deploying the flotilla there would have compromised the Admiral's strategy. Ranth's pair of cone-like sensory horns twitched. In other words, what passed for a briefing was more in the way of a manipulation. The most well-tailored of Shesh's human lawyers objected. Senator Shesh has been asked to provide an account of the briefing, not to pass judgment on the tactics or methods of the New Republic Defense Force. The five members of the chamber's mixed species tribunal conferred and sustained the objection. Ranth was clearly disappointed, but forged ahead. Senator Shesh, was yours in fact the vote that swayed the council? My vote broke the deadlock, if that's what you mean. What convinced you that Bathawi would be targeted? It would be more accurate to say that I didn't believe Corellia would be attacked. Why was that? I didn't accept that the Yuzhan Vong were prepared to launch an attack on the Corps. Was Fondor mentioned as a possible target? It was not. Had Fondor been mentioned, how might you have voted? The same lawyer objected, but Ranth quickly waved his furred hand in dismissal. I withdraw the question. He approached the deposition balcony. Did you have occasion to meet with the command staff prior to the briefing on Corellia? Shesh nodded again. I did, several days prior to the briefing I met with Commodore Brand, who asked me to speak with Consul General Golga before he departed for Nal Hatta. Did you meet with Golga? Soon after, what was the nature of your discussion with the Hut Consul General? We discussed the separate peace the Huts had forged with the Yuzhan Vong and the possibility of their furnishing intelligence to the New Republic. Did Consul General Golga indicate at the time that the Huts might be inclined to provide such intelligence? He implied as much, yes. And you were willing to accept him at his word, even though the huts were considered to have allied themselves with the enemy? Objection, another of Shesha's lawyers barked. 
It has been demonstrated that the Huts attempted to supply intelligence by renewing spice shipments to Bathawi when it was still being considered a potential target. Wrath swung to the tribunal, and by so doing, the Huts only reinforced the belief that Karelia would be targeted instead. The tribunal's Mon Calamari chief looked at Viki Shesh. Senator, do you wish to answer Senator Rath's question? Shesh smiled faintly. I can only conclude that the Huts were trying to keep their options open. I also believe that the Yuzhan Vong were well aware of the possibility that the Huts might attempt to leak intelligence to us, and that they exploited the possibility as a means of orchestrating the events that ensued. The fact that Nal Hutta is now bracing for an invasion suggests that Borga was more dupe than conspirator. The Moon Calamari nodded and fixed one eye on Rath. The Huts are not the subject of this inquest, Senator. Can you show good cause for pursuing this line of questioning? Rath inclined his head, gazing at the tribunal from beneath his jutting brow. I am merely trying to establish the sequence of events that led to the sneak attack on Fondor. Proceed, the Moon Calamari told him. Ranth turned to Shesh. Senator, early on, the command staff's suppositions about Karelia were bolstered by information regarding the scarcity of spice in certain planetary systems. Chief of State Phalia asserts that the Advisory Council was aware that the information had been supplied by Talon Card and the Jedi Knights. We were so informed. Can you think of any reason why former Imperial Remnant Liaison Talon Card or the Jedi Knights might have wished to mislead the defense force? The lawyer nearest Shesh shot to his feet. Objection. Calls for speculation. No, I'll answer it, Shesh countered. I don't for a moment accept that either Talon Card or the Jedi were trying to mislead us. The Gotal studied her. Are you suggesting that they were also manipulated by the enemy? Shesh straightened in the chair. I'm suggesting, Senator, that the Jedi are not infallible, and that we shouldn't look to them as saviors. For all anyone knows, the Yuzhan Vong have brought to our galaxy a power superior to even that of the Force. On a hover platform close to where the Justice Council was convened, Isolder's former bodyguard, Astarta, opened the hatch to the Prince's personal quarters aboard the shuttle that was to return the Hapens to the battle dragon Song of War. Just then in stationary orbit above Coruscant, Astarta showed Leia her most barbed glare before leaving the two of them alone. Isolder was standing at the cabin's broad viewport, his back turned to the hatch. In the aftermath of the Battle of Fondor, events had conspired to prevent them from seeing each other for almost two weeks, and the Song of War was scheduled to launch for Hapes later that day. Leia waited for him to turn from the view of Coruscant's impossibly tall towers before moving toward him but the pained expression on his face brought her to a halt after only two steps. Isolder, I'm so sorry, she blurted, eyes brimming with tears. He compressed his lips, biting back whatever he had in mind to say, then sighed deeply. Leia, we spoke of this before the fleet left Hapes. I told you then that I would never hold you accountable for any untoward outcome. We knew what we were risking by going to war. Having expected him to say just that, Leia nodded silently. Frowning, Isolder stepped away from the viewport to regard her. But you knew what was going to happen. You sensed it. Leia let out her breath. I sensed some tragedy in the making, but I didn't know when or where, or even if it would transpire. I knew that some of what I was feeling owed to concerns for my children. But I couldn't separate those from sudden doubts about having brought you into this or about Commodore Brand's strategy for Corellia. Unable to continue, she shook her head mournfully. Isolder glanced away from her for a moment. I've been asking myself if it would be easier to have been defeated by the Yuzhan Vong rather than by misdirected fire from a weapon we didn't even know existed. A weapon enabled by Anakin, Leia said quietly. 
who also refused to fire it, Isolder was quick to point out, Leia, you must understand, we accept what has happened to us without hostility or regret. She held his sad gaze. What will happen now? He ran his hand over his mouth. Well, I don't anticipate a triumphant homecoming. The consortium has split along lines dictated by the vote that landed us here. The naysayers have declared a victory, despite the fact that we have all suffered a dreadful loss. They're calling for a policy of isolation, as if the transitory mists alone will be able to protect us from the long reach of the Yuzhan Vong. Leia nodded. A similar rift has occurred in the New Republic Senate. The sneak attack on Fondor has galvanized the core worlds into preparing for the worst, but at the expense of alienating many of the inner rim worlds. Support for Phalia has been shaken, and the Senate will probably demote or demand resignations from Commodore Brand and Admiral Sov, even though they are desperately needed. Isolder considered it. That is the difference between the Consortium and the New Republic, perhaps between the old and new ways. Representatives of the New Republic are free to express their outrage without fear of breaching decorum or provoking an honor duel. Isolder snorted a self-deprecating laugh. I don't know which is the best method of governing, but I know that the Hapens will put on a brave front. Already the people of my world are saying that our fleet though destroyed, save the day for Fondor and the New Republic. And you would have. Isolde shook his head. That is unknown, but we will at our next engagement with the Yuzhan Vong. I'm sure of that now, because we are compelled to make the death suffered at Fondor count for something. You'll at least have the quick recharge weapons technology Archon Thane wanted, Leia said. Isolde worked his jaw. Scarcely a consolation, but it will have to suffice. He looked at Leia. War benefits those who devise ever more expedient methods of destruction. Let us hope we can outmaster the Yuzhan Vong at their own game. Perched on the edge of his father's favorite chair in their apartment on Coruscant, Jason watched in dismay as a 3D image of Thraken Sal Solo took shape above the Holonet Well. The voice of the Sullustan news anchor continued. Former head of the so-called Human League, Thraken Sal Solo, is being credited with turning the tide at the Battle of Fondor. While scores of New Republic warships were destroyed in the Yuzhan Vong's sneak attack on Fondor's orbital construction facilities, Sal Solo's bold use of a hyperspace repulsor beam not only drove the invaders into retreat, but destroyed a significant portion of their fleet. The well projected an image of Centerpoint Station. The repulsor beam was fired from Centerpoint Station in the Corellian system, which ironically was used eight years ago during Corellia's unsuccessful bid for independence from the New Republic. One of the many arrested for fomenting that crisis, Sal Solo was released from prison to assist in rearming the station, and there are unconfirmed reports that he was the only one willing to assume the risk of triggering the weapon against the enemy fleet. As to what's next for Sal Solo or Centerpoint, that depends on whom you ask. With a vote of no confidence looming for Governor General Marcha, Duchess of Mastagophorus, some feel that Sal Solo will be recruited to head the newly formed Centerpoint Party, which advocates independence for the five worlds that comprise the Corellian system. Centerpoint Station itself remains in the hands of the New Republic, but whether it will, or indeed can, be employed again as a long-range weapon depends largely on how successful Coruscant is at justifying the secondary destruction suffered at Fondor by the Hapen fleet. The images of Sal Solo and Centerpoint began to de-res, and the head and upper torso of the Sullustan news anchor reappeared. In other news, a protest demonstration on ruin, mounted by a group of recalcitrant droids... You ever going to get tired of listening to reports about Corellia? Anakin interrupted from the doorway to the family room. We turned Cousin Thracken into a hero. What else needs to be said? Jason silenced the holonet. Cheer up. 
At least this report didn't mention us by name. Anakin scowled. Good. Now all we have to do is hope that Dad doesn't hear about it. Since when does Dad care about the news? Besides, you're the one the Holonet should be calling a hero. For what? Enabling Centerpoint? No, for not triggering it. That's what'll make Dad and Uncle Luke and anyone else who knows the full story proud of you. Anakin snorted a laugh and shook his head. You still don't get it. He stared at his brother. I could have fired center point without hitting the Hapens. I saw it all, Jason, in my head. I would have known where to direct the repulsor beam and precisely when to fire. I even knew that Glow Point wasn't going to annihilate everyone in Hollow Town. Then why didn't you fire? What stopped you? You mean aside from your telling me not to? Jason's brows knitted in concern. You were that sure of yourself? Yeah, I was. And my actions would have been defensive. If someone is aiming a blaster at your ally, do you raise your lightsaber to prevent it? Or do you do nothing because a Jedi isn't supposed to take aggressive action? I mean, where's the line, Jason? We're in a war for survival, and defense sometimes means having to eliminate the opposition. Jason shook his head. I don't know where the line is, and I promised myself on Ithor that I'd stop trying to look for it. I just think there has to be some other way of responding, without having to raise a sword to deflect one raised against you. Anakin smirked. Well, when you figure it out, I hope you'll let me in on it. Jason looked up at him. Oh, I will, brother. You can count on that. As they had done on Card's previous visit to Yavin 4, Luke and Talon followed the winding path to the Great Temple. All I managed to do was place the Jedi in a worse position with the New Republic, Senate, and military, Card was saying. That's why I felt I had to apologize in person. No one is expecting an apology, Luke told him. If actions were always judged by their consequence, we'd spend half our lives making amends. You came to us with a plan, and we went along with it. We're partners in the outcome. Card looked skeptical. Unfortunately, that kind of reasoning doesn't go far with Borsk Felia and his allies. As happened after Ithor, they need someone to blame for what happened at Fondor. And I've set the Jedi up as the perfect fall guys. Luke took a moment to respond. When he had first learned of the events at Fondor, he had felt betrayed, not by Card so much as by the Force. Almost as betrayed as he'd felt when Obi-Wan, Kenobi, and Yoda had conspired to keep secret the real identity of his father. But the sense of betrayal had passed through him in an instant. The Force hadn't concealed anything from him. He had simply misunderstood that it was the Yuzhan Vong rather than the Jedi who were employing deception, stealth, and misdirection. What continued to bother him, though, was the possibility that the mere presence of the Yuzhan Vong was enough to mute the clarity of the Force. Success and failure are sometimes intertwined, Luke said finally. Inadvertently or not, the Huts misled us. But it was their information that allowed Kip and Ganner to rescue those held captive aboard the Yamask vessel. Card allowed a nod. Everyone is too busy assigning blame to note the rescue of the captives or the destruction of the Yamask vessel. I'm only sorry that Kip didn't arrive in time to save Skitter. Worth made his choice on Gendine. Luke left it at that, choosing not to add that Skitter's sacrifice had widened the gulf between Kip's faction and some of the other Jedi. Where Skitter had sought to avenge the deaths of Miko Reglia and Deshara Kor, Kip and those who stood by him now had Skitter's death to avenge. If the Huts deliberately misled us, they were repaid in kind, Card said bitterly. Fondor was one of the most profitable markets for the Basadi and they lost some of their finest ships and most enterprising smugglers during the battle. Now Borga has to prepare for war with only half the clan supporting her, and the rest holding her responsible for the Yuzhan Vong's betrayal. Several clan leaders have decamped Nalhada for Ganath. Elysia, even Tatooine. 
And with the Yuzhan Vong fleet blockading Hut space, the New Republic couldn't help even if it wanted to. Borga will be lucky if she doesn't birth her child prematurely. Card came to a sudden halt in the middle of the path and swung to Luke. Do you think the Yuzhan Vong realize what they've accomplished? They've sundered the huts, created a schism in the Senate, taken the Hapens out of the war, sabotaged the import of the Jedi. Before Luke could respond, he added, Did you have any inkling it could end this way? Luke heard the voice of his former Jedi master. Always in motion is the future. Hard to see. The future isn't fixed, he said. It's made up of possibilities. I saw without seeing. Card blew out his breath. What can we do now? Decide you must how to serve them best. Help them you could, but you would destroy all for which they have fought and suffered. Luke took Card by the shoulders. We can learn from our mistakes. Leia had raced home from the shuttle departure platform, only to find that Anakin and Jason had already left. Now, with the soldier's cheerless departure still on her mind, and C-3PO and Olmok helping her pack for an afternoon flight to Doro, the house comm system chirped, chirping insistently even after she had activated the answer message function. Throwing her hands up in a gesture of surrender, she accepted the call. Hans was the last face she expected to see appear on the display screen. It's just me, he said, smiling lopsidedly while she gaped at his image, feeling as if months had passed since they had spoken. The display showed that he was calling from an abrogado re space terminal. I see you shaved off your beard, she said finally. He rubbed his chin. Yeah, too itchy. Well, at least you look like your old self again. He scowled, started to say something, then began again. Grim business about what happened to the Hapens at Fondor. How is this soldier doing? I figured you'd hear the news sooner or later, even in a playground like Abrogado Re. Hear about it, Han said. I saw it. You what? I was there, at Fondor. You were at Fondor, she echoed in disbelief. Droma and I were chasing after his clanmates. Some of them had managed to get themselves marooned in a deserted shipyard facility, and the rest were prisoners aboard a Yamask ship. Anyway, it's a long, boring story. The point is, I saw the Hapen fleet get wiped out. But I thought Fondor's primary went Nova. I didn't know it was center point. Leia pushed her hair back from her forehead. You realize that Anakin and Jason were there? Han took his lower lip between his teeth. Did they fire it? Leia's nostrils flared. Do you think they'd do something like that? Han's brow furrowed. Take it easy. You know I don't listen to the news. Leia thought about telling him about Thrak and Sal Solo's sudden rise to fame, but decided against it, knowing that Han would find out soon enough. Where did you bring the refugees you rescued? Here, but they can't stay for long. Abrogado Re is pulling in the welcome mat. Leia sighed. Selcor is searching for a world suitable for relocating everyone. We thought we were going to be able to count on ruin, but Salish Ag is suddenly refusing to accept any refugees. Han averted his eyes momentarily. About ruin, he started to say. Selcor is getting some unexpected help from Senator Shesh, Leia went on. I'll let you know as soon as I hear anything. Han nodded. Long as it's somewhere the Rin won't be treated like riffraff. You have my word on it. Leia paused, then added, Will Droma be remaining with his clanmates? Yeah, the way I figure it, he and I are about even. So where does that leave you, Han? I'm not sure. What about you? Are you finally home for good? I'm leaving this afternoon for Duro. Same old Princess Leia, he said with a sneer. Then I guess it doesn't matter where I end up. She narrowed her eyes for the cam. Same old Han Solo. He tried to lighten the moment with a laugh. We are a pair, aren't we? I don't know, Han. You tell me. His eyes flashed. Well, look, be sure to let me know what planet Selcor decides on. Anything to help the refugees, Leia said with counterfeit good humor. 
That's what I've been saying all along. Leia folded her arms. In that case, our paths are bound to cross one of these days. I don't know, sweetheart. It's a big galaxy. Only as big as you make it, she said, deactivating the comm. In her new office, Vicky Shesh watched a full-color 3D recording of herself being interviewed by reporters as she had emerged from the closed-session inquest into the command staff's monumental blunder regarding Corellia and Fondor. Although she had been compelled to answer no comment to most of the reporters' questions, she decided that she had carried herself well and had surely succeeded in stealing the limelight from Senator Talam Ranth and others. The hollow recording was about to recycle when the intercom built into her grill wood desk sounded a tone. Senator Shesh, her human secretary, said, There's a Pedrick Cuff here to see you. He admits to not having an appointment, but he claims that you have been trying to contact him for the past few months. Shesh zeroed the hollow projector and leaned back in her swivel chair. I've been trying to contact him? That's what he says. When Shesh glanced at the hollow display for the reception room, she saw a very tall and gaunt human smiling for the cam. Send him in, she told her secretary. Cuff entered the office a moment later, tendering a brief but dignified bow before settling into the armchair to which she waved him. I have long anticipated this meeting, he began in core accented basic. I had hoped to speak with you sooner, but I have been preoccupied with business matters in the outer rim and in hut space. Shesh brought her interlaced hands to her lips and studied Cuff over the tops of her extended forefingers. I trust that matters concluded to your satisfaction. Cuff smiled without showing his teeth. To be perfectly honest, my associates and I were recently taken somewhat by surprise by a hostile bid for power by a Corellian firm. But otherwise, yes, everything has been working out to our satisfaction. Shesh could feel the blood racing through her veins, but she managed to keep her composure. Why have you come to see me now? My superiors thought it a good idea that we become acquainted. To begin with, they wanted to thank you for your efforts of some months past in seeing to it that some missing property was returned to us. Cuff let the statement hang in the air. Shesh guessed that he was referring to Elon, the phony defector the Yuzhan Vong had attempted to foist on the Jedi Knights, but she couldn't be certain that he wasn't a New Republic intelligence agent hoping to trick her into revealing her part in that affair or the Fondor calamity. I don't recall helping return any property to you, she said after a moment, and to be frank, I don't recall attempting to contact you. Perhaps you have me confused with someone else. Pedrick Cuff stared at her. I see. Well, perhaps I have made a mistake. It wouldn't be the first time a hut has led me astray. A hut, Shesh said. Cuff laughed shortly. And here I was, all set to launch into a discussion regarding the eventual disposition of... He gestured broadly to the windows at Shesh's back. All this. He stood up. A pity we can't do business, Senator. I suspect we would have made a good team. She watched him head for the door, then said, Did I mention that I like your suit? He stopped and turned to her, his smile back in place. Yes, it fits me like a glove, don't you think? Masks all my imperfections. Truly allows me to blend in. I had it specially made by a company that's simply out of this world. Does the company produce a line of women's wear? They offer an exquisite line. In fact, I'm certain they could supply you with outfits perfectly tailored to your needs. Cuff paused briefly. That is, of course, if you might on occasion be willing to put business before politics. Shesh waved Cuff back to the chair. Politics is a practical profession, she said. If someone has what you need, then you do business with him or you go without. And personally, I've always been more interested in business than I have in politics.'